What's going on guys? This is Junior here and today I'm going to show you how to build a full stack application using Spring Boot in the back end and React JS in the front end. This course is more for intermediate and advanced developers. So if you're an intermediate developer or an advanced developer and you want to up your skills to become a software engineer or just up your skills in general, then this course is for you. And as you already know, in every course, we're going to be building an entire project. So the project itself is the course so that we can put everything that we're learning into practice. So before I give you an application demo of the application that we're going to be building, because I'm going to give you a demo of everything that we have implemented in this application, we need to understand what we're trying to build first. So this is why I have these two tabs open because I want to give you a feel of what it would be like if you were to do this in the real world. Because if you were asked to build some application, you wouldn't just go ahead and build anything you would need to have the definition of what you're trying to build in great detail. So before we go into the demo so that I can show you exactly what we did with the requirements that we had, let's go over the application overview. So I'm going to go over to this tab and we're going to go over the overview very quickly. So the application is a secure document management system. So the reason that I decided to do something with security is because I want to cover Spring Security version 6 in depth because Spring had a major update in Spring Security. So I need to cover this and to do this, we're going to do an entire application and use many different features and build on top of these features. So what is the application that we're building? So this application is a secure document management system. So we can imagine some organization, they need to manage certain documents. And these documents, they have sensitive information and they want to have some secure way to manage these documents. So that's why we decided to build a secure document management system. It's a robust and user friendly application designed to securely store, update, upload and delete documents. So this is the core of the application that we're going to be building that first line right here. So this application addresses the need for a centralized and secure repository for sensitive information, offering a seamless and efficient solution for document management. The secure document management system offers a comprehensive solution for organizations to securely store, manage, and collaborate on documents. So with robust security measures and user-friendly interface, it addresses the need of businesses requiring a reliable and secure document management platform. So you can think of maybe some government agencies or some other nonprofit or some hospital where they would want to securely manage their, their documents. So we're going to say that this is the application that they want to build. Some of the key features that they would like to have in this application. So we can imagine that we have a client or some stakeholders and they are telling us what they would like to have in this application. So the first feature is the user authentication and authorization. Obviously, since we're going to have security in the system, then we need to authenticate and authorize users. So users must authenticate themselves to access the system, ensuring secure access because we don't want anyone to access the application. And this is where Spring Security is going to come into play because I'm going to do a very in-depth implementation of Spring Security in this course. And they also want to have multi-factor authentication. So user can enable multi-factor authentication for an additional layer of security during login. Okay, so we not only want them to give us some kind of a token or a username and a password, we also want them to be able to set up MFA in their account so that when they're logging in, they're asked to put another piece of data that they should only have and also access control. So access control is a big thing because they don't want anyone to do anything on the documents. So we're going to have role based access controls that's going to allow to define user privileges based on their roles and permissions, maintaining data integrity because we don't want anyone to do anything on our data or in this case on our documents because that's what we're managing and only authorized users can perform action. So update, delete, etc on these documents. Okay, so pretty standard stuff that you see all the time, you use all the time, maybe in your banking application, but you never really see anyone teaching you how to do these things or a way that you can implement these things. So if you already know these courses that I created, I try to create real world applications. So that's the same approach that we're going to take in this course. And then for the document, so they want to have document upload. So users can easily upload documents to a user friendly interface. Supported documents format include, you know, document, Excel and PDFs, etc. And they also want to have a document search feature. So 
a powerful search feature enabling user to quickly locate specific documents based on you know metadata of the document the name the file extension and users should also be able to filter to search and go through different pages of documents advanced filtering options that's gonna make the entire experience more efficient because you know if you have a bunch of documents you want to be able to retrieve them as fast as possible and since this has a major security factor in it they also want to have an audit trail so if you guys don't know what this is you can quickly google it but you can think of it as just tracing so we need to know who did what and when so the system logs all user activities providing a detailed audit trail and audit logs help administrators monitor and review user actions for security and compliance purposes so if someone went in there and they deleted the document then we want to know who did it if someone uploaded a document we want to know who did it if someone changed something on a user or they did anything in the application we need to have this trail so that we can trace back what happened. So you hear all the time when, you know, there is something going on, there is maybe like some famous person in a court and they're pulling up all of their data. The judge might ask Facebook to pull up their data and then you can see everything that this person did for as long as they've been using Facebook or Instagram. So this is what this is an audit trail. So everything that you do is being logged somewhere just so that we can keep track of who is doing what. So these are like from a very high level, what they want the application to do. Obviously, this is not enough because it's not telling you what you need to build and how you need to build it and this is also very short because in a real world application like a true real world application there would be a lot more features that you would want to build or maybe not but later you would have to keep adding more features because one thing with clients or stakeholders or organizations they're just gonna have more needs they're gonna need more features and they're gonna ask you to build them and sometimes they don't even use them but they're gonna ask you anyway okay so from a very high level this is the application overview that's what they want so this is the first thing now this can be considered a non-functional requirement so it's really just plain english someone just put some bullet points and just put a document together explaining exactly what they want to do so you can consider this this non-functional requirements so the next thing that we need to look at as developers is the actual functional requirement so it's technically the same thing but with more steps like with more details so that's what this is so here is the functional requirements i'm making all of this up right i wrote the application overview i also wrote the functional requirements i created all these documents but in your case you would probably be given this document right so the people you're building the application for or the organization you're doing this for or the agency or whatever they're gonna know what they want and they will just give you this document. You will work with your developers and other people to come up with the functional requirements. So the functional requirements is really where we're gonna be focusing and we're gonna have to build all of these things one by one. And you can see it's uh, a lot more substantial than what we just looked at, which is just the application overview. So the next thing we're gonna do is to just go over these requirements because once we do this, then the application that we're gonna demo is gonna make a lot of sense and you're gonna see how all of it is coming together so that you really can have a very good feel of what this course is about. So that's what we're gonna be doing next. So let's look at the functional requirements. So for the user account, they want to be able to let a user create a new account. So we're gonna have no account and the application should allow users to create new accounts using their basic information. So just really just sign up to use the application and all emails should be unique. Okay, so whenever we're gonna create our classes, we wanna make sure that in our database, all of the emails are unique and also a password because they need a username. In this case, that's gonna be the email and a password to log in. And they also want the application to decide all newly created accounts until they verify their their email and they want to send a link to the email that the user used to sign up to confirm their new account okay so we're gonna have to build all of this stuff and this is typical right you sign up for something they send you a link to confirm your email you click on the link and your account is activated and then you can log into the system so that's just a way to mitigate bad actors from creating a bunch of accounts that are not real people like they just make up some emails and then they just sign up so we want to make sure that it's a real person people still create a bunch of emails and just sign up for things but we still want to do that because it's another layer of security only after verifying a new account should a user be able to log into the application so we're gonna have to build all of this now, before I go any further, you might be thinking, well, how are we gonna be building all this stuff? This is really just four points, right? But for these four points, you're gonna see that to build just this feature, 
or a sub feature. We are just going to do so much just to do just that. The second thing that they want is to allow users to reset their password. So the application should allow users to reset their password. The application should send a link to users email to reset their password and the link should invalidate after being clicked on. So after they click on the link in their email to reset their password, the link should expire. So we're going to be building on that and the application should present a screen with a form to reset the password when the link is clicked. Okay, that's pretty self-explanatory. If a password is reset successfully, then users should be able to log in using the new password. So if I reset my password successfully, then I should be able to use that new password to log into the system. The application should allow users to reset their passwords as many times as they need. Okay, so we want to allow people to be able to update their password as many times as they want to, because we want to give them this freedom in case they want to change it for more security. Moving on, let's go over to the multi-factor authentication. So they also want to have multi-factor authentication. The application should allow users to set up multi-factor authentication to help secure their account because that's going to add another layer of security in the authentication process. Multi-factor authentication should use a QR code on user's mobile phone. So you know we have all of these applications that you can use and scan a QR code so that you can use that to log in. So our client or our organization, they want to set up this feature. They want the users to set up MFA and they want the users to be given a QR code and they can use their cell phone camera to scan the code. And then every time they're going to log in, they're going to have this QR code that they can put in to log in. So again, what this means is that the application should allow users to scan the QR code using an authenticated application on their phone to set up multi-factor authentication. So I don't really have to explain this. I'm assuming most people already know what this is. So you use this application on your phone, you scan the QR code, then it pops up a number on your phone and then the number keeps changing every time. So every time you're going to log in, you need to give in this number. The application should ask users to enter the QR code from their mobile phone authenticator application in order to log in successfully. So even though I put my correct username and password, if I have MFA set up, then I should be asked the QR code in order to log in successfully. So we're going to have to build all of that. Let's scroll down a little more. Now for the login, the application should allow users to enter an email and password to log in. And if MFA phase set up, the application should ask them for the QR code after entering the correct email and password. So exactly what I just explained, even if you have the correct email and password, if you have MFA set up, then we have to ask you for the QR code. After six failed login attempts, user account should be locked for 15 minutes because we want to mitigate brute force attack. Okay, so that makes sense because we don't want someone to keep putting in bad passwords repeatedly. After 90 days, user password should expire, therefore can't log in until password is updated. So sometimes maybe not with social media because on social media you can log in for like a year or something but for a lot of other systems they have something called password rotation you have that also in aws so if you log in and you have a password they give you a period of time that you have to update the password i think company do that as well in their system so they ask you to update your password every like three months or something like that so even if the password is correct and there's nothing wrong with it they want you to change it again because it's just gonna make it more secure in case someone was trying to to break your password and figure out what it is because you're going to change it, then they're just going to have to start over. So in the end, they may never get to your password because let's say they have an algorithm running that's decoding all the passwords, or maybe they got a hold of the password somehow. But by the time the algorithm is done running and decoding all the password, then you've already changed it. And then for the user profile, the application should allow users to update their basic information while logged in. So if I'm logged in, I should be able to update my basic information, email, passwords, and things like that. And also the application should allow users to update their password, okay, and then update their account settings and also update their profile picture. Nothing really related to security, but we want to give users the access to do all these things in the application. And then we get to the document. So document list, the application should show a list of all the documents uploaded in the homepage. So whenever I log into the application, the homepage should show me a list of all of the document. The application should show some details, so name, size, owner, etc., about each document in the list. So this is exactly what we have here. Okay, so we're going to get to this in just a second. Just bear with me real quick. And then the application should allow logged in user to upload new documents. Okay, obviously the application should also have pagination for the document list. The application should allow to set how many documents to display per page. So if you look here, I can select how many I want to display per page and also should allow the search for documents by name. So results should also include pagination. So if I'm searching a document, I should also have pagination in the response. 
And lastly, the applicant should allow to click on a document to see more details. So to go to a detailed page of the document. So for example, if I click on this, you can see it's loading and then we have this detail page about the document. Okay, so let's go back here and let's scroll down. So the document details page that I just showed you, that's gonna show the details once we click on it. And the detail page should include the document owner because we need to know who owns this document. The document should allow to update the name, description of the document. Okay, so just do some basic CRUD operation on the document. And the application should allow to download the document and the detail page and also delete the document and the detail page. Okay, so this is for the document. Now for the access control, which is also really important. So user role. So so user should be given roles. Obviously, we're going to give them roles and roles should contain specific permissions. So those are going to be the authorities that's going to determine what exactly a user can do. And I'm going to explain the difference about these two in more detail as we get into the course. And then the application should grant different access levels. OK, so, you know, user, admin, super admin, manager, etc. And the application should only allow users with proper roles to be able to perform certain actions. So if I'm a user and I'm not allowed to, for example, delete a document, then I shouldn't be able to delete a document. So we're going to manage the access to the users depending on their roles. Application should only allow non-user role users to update account settings. So if I'm a user, I shouldn't be able to update my settings. And the same for roles. So application should only allow non-user role users, so users that don't don't have the user role to update their account. The application should only allow users with the delete document permission to delete the document. So really important because we don't want anyone to be deleting documents. So we only want someone with the delete permission on the document to be able to delete them. And then the application should allow non-user role users to view other users in the system. So if I'm a user, then I'm not allowed to see other users in the system. So you can see I have this link here to go to users. That's because I think uh, if I go to authorization, you can see I'm an admin. So that's why I can see it. But if I were to log in with someone with a user role, then I wouldn't be able to see this. And let's scroll down. So for the audit trail, which we talked about, we want to keep track of who created an entity. So who created a user or your document? We want to keep track of that. The application should keep track of when the entity was created. So in addition to who created it, we need to capture when it was created. And the same goes for update and also the time when the update occurred. So whoever did an update and when it was updated. So that's going to be the audit trail. We need to know who did what and when. OK, so that's going to be for the audit trail. We're just assuming that this is really important for them for maybe legal reasons or something like that. Now, I know all of this was kind of boring because, you know, it's a lot of text and there's nothing really interesting going on. But this is what you have whenever you're going to be building an application. Even if you're working for yourself, if you're a freelancer, you're going to have something like this. And it's going to be up to you to come up with a database design, an application design and make it all work all together. And then in the end, you're going to deliver something that looks like this with all of these features. Features. You're not going to be building everything at the same time. So you're going to be building one at a time until you have something that you can deliver to the client and then you will deliver it. Sometimes you will build something and it's complete, but it's not a deliverable because you can't give it to the client. So you just kind of build stuff and make progress. Even though this is boring, this is really what you get. Even if you're in school, like you're doing your master's or you're in college or university or whatever, they're going to give you something like this. I was in school, so I was given something like this. And the professor said, hey, give me a database design for this. And that's the assignment. And that's all they did. So for any developer who want to learn and really become a full stack developer, because right now, if you're not a full stack, it's almost like you're not a developer. Full stack is what everyone is doing because there's just so much to learn. And the more you learn, you're just going to become a full stack because there's just so much to learn unless you really don't want to become one. But as you dabble in different technologies, then inevitably you might just become a full stack. I'm just making the case for you so you understand exactly how this works. You don't just jump in and start writing code and things like that because you have to think about the design. And that's what we're going to be doing as the first thing before we start coding. So we have our functional requirements. We can break it down more, by the way, like we can break it down into more detail, but I'm just going to keep it keep it like this. Definitely understand that you can break this down even, even further, but we're not going to do that. This is enough. We're going to be building all of these all of this. So if you're in school, if you want to get a job, you want to build something substantial, something that can help you get a big job at a big company, or you're in school, you want to do your final project, then this is a super 
super loaded course that you can take and that will teach you not only all the skills that you need, but you can also use this application for your portfolio or you can put it on your resume. You will have all of these files so you can put all of this stuff or maybe you will tweak it a little bit because I'm using documents in this case, but you can change this to patient, students, um, drivers. It, you can just switch the actual main entity to be whatever you prefer. That's what we're going to be building in this course. It's going to be not a very short course. It's not going to be super long, but it's going to be not too short. Uh, that's the, that's the best way that I can put it because we need to build all this stuff and you need to learn how to do all this stuff. That's really how you become a real developer because if you don't do it, then you just don't know how. So you have to do it and you're going to have a lot of errors, a lot of problems, and you're going to work your way through the problems. And that's how you really cement the skills that you're learning and you're going to familiarize yourself with problem solving. So that's going to help you with your problem solving skills and just really understanding how this thing work, right? This software development thing. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to I'm going to do is to just go over the application because now that we know exactly everything that we're supposed to be doing, we're just going to see a quick demo and see how we did. That's what we're going to be doing next. I'm just going to go over to the next tab. So this is the application. This is the profile detail page. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go to the home page and I'm just going to go ahead and log out. So I'm going to click on log out. And you can see it says I've successfully logged out. Now I am logged into the browser. So as I type, it's going to try to autocomplete because I've been using this page. So I'm going to switch to incognito mode just so that I can type everything out as I'm showing you the demo. I've switched to a session without me being logged in. You can see it's all dark. It's not incognito, but you can see it says guest at the top. So I'm not logged in. So that's the login page and I can navigate to create an account and I can also go to forget my password. So if I forgot my password, I can go here, put in the email and then and click reset. We're going to demo all of these. So let's go to login because we have an account. So here I'm going to type in my email. So we'll get a raise at gmail.com and I'm going to tab over and you can see I have validation. And if I remove this, you can see I have form validation. So we're going to be using react hook form so that we can do all of this stuff. So I'm going to put in the email and I'm going to put in the password if I remember it. And you can see once I type a correct password, then I get the little tick because we're using React Hook Form so that we can build all of this nice user interface. And then I'm going to click on login. And when I click on login, you're going to see that this is going to change to loading. It's going to happen quickly. So I'm telling you so that you can pay attention. So I'm going to click it. You see it says loading. Now it's asking me to put in a verification code because I have two-factor authentication set up. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start recording my phone because I have the code on my phone and I'm going to show you how we're going to set this up as well. So I have it on my phone and I'm just going to start recording my phone right now. And then I'm going to place my phone on the side of the screen so that you can see the code that I'm putting in. So I'm recording my phone right now and I might blur some stuff because, you know, I'm using this for like my life, like real application that I use to login. So the ones that you see that are blurred, they're just like real account that I'm using, like my bank and stuff like that, because I'm using literally the same app that I use for these applications. So we're going to be building real world examples. So I'm going to put in the code. So the code you see on my screen is nine, eight and three and then zero, three, eight. So if I remove the eight, I'm going to do it quickly and put a zero and then try to verify. It's going to say it's not right. So before it changes, I'm going to put it back to an eight. And if I click verify and you can see I logged in successfully and it says QR code verified. OK, so I'm going to remove my phone from the screen. So once we get to the home page, you can see that we have the list of all the documents with pagination. So I can go over to the next page and you can see I have the next page and I can go to the previous page. So pagination is working as expected. I can also search documents. So if I go in search, let's search MO. You can see I have most wanted. And also I give these documents like really weird names so that we can pretend that these are like secrets. So I'm assuming this is like an agency with the US government and then they have like all of these very secure documents that they don't want people to see. So that's what we're building for them. So if I do like North or Korea or something, you can see it's sorting. So the sorting is working and we can also change how many we want to see per page. So if I go here and I click six and I scroll down, you can see now I don't have pagination anymore. And then I have all six and it says it's showing one through six out of six. And if I were to change this to four, which is the default, then it says one through four out of six. Okay. And the other two, they are here. And now it says five through six 
out of six. OK, so this is actually a very cool feature that I'm going to show you how to build. All right. So let's go back to the previous page. I can click on a document to see all the details. So remember, the requirement said that on the home page, we want to see some details about the document. So you can see when the document was created, the type of document. It's a PDF. You can see it here as well. The size of the document. So in this case, it's 36 kilobyte. And you can see that this is like a more human readable format of this. And the owner is Jasmine Pierce. I just made up these names. So if I click on this document, document. I know I can click on it not only because of the cursor, but I have this little eye icon here. So we know that we can see more. So if I click it, you see this animation. So let me do it one more time. Well, this is cached because if I click it now, it's going to happen so fast because we're going to implement caching as well. But if I do it again on another one, you see it's loading and then it shows. OK, so let's just look at this one since we already have it open. Well, this one is by me and I'm the one logged in. OK, so let's just use the first one just so we can mix it up a little. So I can see that the last person to update this document is me and I can't change that because that happens automatically. We don't want someone to tell the audit what it's supposed to be auditing. So that's supposed to happen automatically. This is also something that we need to talk more about. And I can see who is the owner of the document. So this is the owner this is the last time they logged in. That's their phone number. Now I can see some details about the document, but I can only update the name and also the description. So if I do uh, maybe a uh, secret and I put dash US so that we know it's the US secret and then I press update and you can see that it changes here as well. If I say artificial intelligence secret of the United States of America uh, working uh, with uh, Google, for example, and uh, Microsoft. OK, so we're just making things up. So now if I press update. And notice we got this updated automatically by itself. Now, because I have permission, I can delete the document and I can also download the document. So I'm going to click on download. I clicked it and you can see I have the document that I can download. I can click on save and you can see the document is downloaded here. And I'm going to say keep so that it can be downloaded. I'm going to just going to click on this folder, this little icon folder here, just so that we can see it. I'm going to bring it over so you can see it says AI secret. I'm going to make this a little bigger. It's downloaded here. It's not really any secret, obviously. <laughs> so I'm not going to open it because it's some dummy data that I have here, but I just wanted to show you that it's actually downloaded. But that's because I have permission. If I didn't have permission, I wouldn't be able to download it and I wouldn't even see the button. So this is all the features that we have for the document and the document detail page. And I can go back. So I'm going to click upload. That's going to open my file explorer. Let's go to my downloads and I'm going to pick the sales report and then press uh, open. And it says documents uploaded and now I can see I have seven. So we had six. Now we have seven. And if I go to the next page and I can see sales report and obviously I can click in, update it, et cetera, et cetera. I can give it a description sales report for the first quarter and then update. And we didn't have a description. Now we have a description. So these are the features for the documents. And I showed you that we can show six. So now if I scroll down, you can see we still have two pages because now we're showing one through six because we're showing six per page, but we have seven. So we have another page. So if I go to the next page, I have that last one. So everything is working as expected. I'm going to change that back to four. So in terms of documents, we have met all of the requirements. There's more that I can show, but I don't want this video to be too long. Now, the biggest part of this application is actually the user feature because that's where Spring Security is going to come into play. So if I click here, you can see that I have access to my profile, my password, settings, authorization, and authentication. So I'm going to go over to my profile by just clicking here. And you can see that if I click here now, it's highlighted because I am in my profile. But if I had to click on my password and I can click here, you can see that password is the one selected. So we're going to be using React Router to take care of all of this stuff. So for the profile, I can update my information. I can update the email, save, going to change that back and save. And also I have validation on this form. So if I cut this out. You can see the button is grayed out and it says bio is required. And now I can see if I can't do anything. We're going to make heavy use of react hook form. So I'm going to show you how to do all of this and just going to update it. It's updated successfully. I can change my picture. So I'm going to click here. So this is a picture of me looking at a painting, by the way, at a museum. So if I click here and I'm going to pick my famous picture that you guys already know, which is this one, and I'm going to open it. And you can see for a second, it says loading and it's changed here and also in the nav bar. I'm going to do it again. Just pay attention to this button. So if I go to downloads, images, and select this one, open, 
it says loading in an exchange. So hopefully you cut that. And then I can change my password so I can put my current password. And then I can add a new password, pass in another new password. I'm using the same password, update and password updated successfully and the form is reset and you see that this button is grayed out unless these are filled so if i go here and you know i put two then it's not enough it's the same here because we have to have a minimum of maybe three or five i think i set. so we have validation on all of these so if i start tapping more then it's filled so now i'm gonna put a a a a a so it's good these two should match so if i go here and I put some random string, you see the message is changed to new password and confirm password. They do not match. Okay. And we're going to be using React Hook form in real time to do all of this. So moving on to our settings. So our settings is really just things that we can enable and disable. I can click on making my account expired. So my, now my account is expired. And if I try to log in, I won't be able to log in. So I'm going to undo that. Okay, so you can see now it says it's updated successfully. I should be able to log in. If this is true, it's going to say my account is expired and I won't be able to log in. So I'm going to keep that. Is my account is enabled? Yes. Is it locked? No, it's not locked. So we're going to allow only people with admin or non user role users to do these things. So if you're a simple user, you can't update this information. And then we have the credential. So the credential is the password rotation. So after 90 days, my password is going to expire and I'm going to be required to change it. Otherwise, I won't be able to log in. So this is the credentials expired. This you can can't change because it makes no sense to expire your credentials. I guess maybe you might want to do that. Like if you're an admin, you're building an admin dashboard, you might want to make someone's credential expire so that you can force them to do it. But it's typically handled by the system. Like you set the period that you want them to change their password. But in this case, I'm just doing it the way that it's typically done, which is by letting the system determine when it's been 90 days, then their password is going to expire automatically without doing anything. So that's it for the settings and for the authorization. Remember, in the requirements we were asked to create roles so you can say I have rules or roles manager etc etc and these roles comes with different permissions so if i choose super admin you can see now i have delete document and i think also delete user i don't remember but i only give the delete permissions to super admin so if i go back to role Okay, so I don't have the user delete. So I have everything else on the document, but I don't have the delete of the user. So you can see I color coded them so that you can spot them easily. So for the user, I have to create. For the user, I have to read. For the user, I have to update, but I don't have the delete. But for the document, I have all four operations. If you wanna see that again, super admin, you can see the user delete. If I go back to just regular admin, I'm not going to go back to user because if I choose user, then I won't be able to change a lot of information on this page. So I'm not going to do that. So this is that. Now we're going to go to authentication. So that's where we set up our MFA. So as of right now, you can see I have MFA enabled. This is why I was asked to put in the QR code on my phone because I have this enabled. So I put this in an accordion because I don't want to show it because this is sensitive. So anyone can scan it and then they can have your code. So you don't want to do that. You want to give the user some, some control. But if I click it, you can see I have my QR code code you should be able to scan this whenever you're watching this you should be able to scan this and i don't know something should pop up on your screen maybe it's going to be invalid or something but this is where users set up their uh, multi-factor authentication so right now i have mine enabled and i can disable it so you see this button it's a little bit grayed out because i don't want to encourage people to not use mfa but if i click it now mfa is canceled now you see the button is very obvious because i want them to want to do it more than they don't want to do it and this is the last time i logged in so i'm just logging this here just to give the user some hints because they can see this and like oh i didn't log in on this date there's something wrong and then maybe they can talk to a manager or an administrator or something so this is really just a quick overview of everything now i do want to show you that if i log out now and I try to log in again. So we're gonna pass in the same email and then pass in the new password because remember I updated my password and I log in. You see this time I was not asked to enter any QR code or anything like that because I'm not using MFA. So if I go to my profile and go to my authentication, MFA is disabled. So I'm not going to be asked to enter any, any QR code. So I'm going to record my screen again, and then I'm going to go ahead and delete this. So I'm going to click and hold it or tap and hold it, tap on the little pin, and then I'm going to delete it. You can see it's the same email. So everything is working like it's working for like Google and I'm going to show you how to do all this stuff. So I'm going to tap remove account. And then I'm going to tap the little uh, check mark at the top right corner. 
Okay, so now I'm back to normal and then I'm going to click the little plus sign. But before I do that, I'm going to set up multi-factor authentication. So I'm going to click on the button. Okay, so it gives me this new QR code. Remember, every time it's a new QR code, it's not the same one. And then I'm going to click on the little plus, click on scan QR code. And then I'm going to bring it to my screen and then I scanned it and you can see it says Gatorade's LLC and then my email. So now if I log out and going to log back in. I keep watching my phone. You can see everything is changing at the same time. Remember all these other accounts, they're like real accounts that I have on my phone. So gmail.com and then I'm going to enter in my password, click login. Now I'm asked to enter the code and the code is 0765598. Press verify. And now I'm logged in. So this feature is working as expected. So now I'm going to show you some of the other things that you can do. So if I log in using a different account, so here I'm going to log in with Tom Hanks and then I'm going to log in. Okay. Login success. So you can see now I am Tom Hanks. And if I go here and I go to his profile, well, I'm logged in as him. So I am him and I go to authorization. He's an admin, but I want to show you a user. So I'm going to change him to a user. I think I have a user. Well, maybe I should just use a user just so that you can see what happens when someone who is not an admin login. But let me show you the users. I forgot to show you the users. So if I click on users, you can see it says user retrieve and you can see I have access to all the users. Now I'm not doing much with all of these users, but I just want to show you the, the permission base or the role base access level. So if I copy this person, because you can see obviously they're a user and I'm going to copy their email. Hopefully I remember the password I set for them. And also this is the system, by the way, I'm going to talk about the system because the system is what helping us doing some of the audit to keep track of who is doing what. So the system is also a user and I'm going to show you how you can uh, deal with that in many different ways. So let's go and log out. Then I'm going to paste this email and I think the password is this and log in. There we go. So now you see I'm logged in as uh, Jasmine and you can see now I don't see the user's link because Jasmine, if I go to Jasmine's authorization, she is a user and you can see she has very limited permission. She has no user's permission, just document permission. Well, she probably shouldn't have the document delete, but that's up to you if you want to remove it. Everything else is the same. You know, she doesn't have MFA, but she can enable it. Well, I'm logged in as her but we can enable it, disable it. Uh, everything is the same. We've already uh, gone over this. Change the profile picture if you prefer. But if I go back here, for example, and I say, oh, I saw, you know, Tom Hanks or Junior accessing these users and let me see if I can access. So if I do users, because I can just type it in the URL and press enter, you can see it says access denied because this person doesn't have permission to see this data. I'm not only not showing the link, but also they can't access it. So even if they try to, they won't be able to access it because she doesn't have enough permission to access this page. And that's a forward three, which is the access denied. So this is a combination of the backend react with Redux and also react router. And I'm going to show you how to build all of this stuff. So now what I want to test is the reset password and creating a new account. So let's go ahead and log out. Well, I'm going to copy this email. Well, this is not a real email, so I can't use this one. So we'll use my other email. So let's log out and it was get raise at gmail.com. And I'm going to put the password. Well, that's not what I'm doing. I'm actually going to reset the password. So to reset the password, right? I'm in the login page. So I will just click reset or forget password. It has validation as well. So if you don't pass anything and you click outside, you put it out of focus, then it's going to trigger the validation. And if I try to reset the password, it's going to do it as well. So let me refresh the page so I can show you that. That's just another way that you can do this. If I wanted, I could have just disabled this button, but I'm just showing you different ways that you can do it. So now this is not in focus. And if I try to reset it, it will come into focus with the error message. Anyway, just a side note. So I'm going to paste the email. Now I have a valid email and I'm just going to press reset. And then it says, we sent you an email for you to reset your password. So I have my email open and the other window. So I'm just going to bring it over and you can see I have the new email to reset my password and everything that's blurred. That's because this is the email that I use for student. I can't show you the student emails, but you can see the first email is the one that I received to reset my password. So I'm going to go ahead and click in it and you can see the link is right here. It greets me by my name. So hello junior, please use this link to reset your password. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it. 
and it's verifying just give it a second and now it tells me to enter a new password so here i'm just gonna enter another password and then i'm gonna press update okay so my password has been reset successfully so i'm gonna go back here and i'm just gonna well at this point you would just click let me bring this back so at this point you would just click to go to login but you know i'm, I'm logged into this browser so i don't want to use this browser so i'll go here and then i'll go back to login and i will paste and then put the new password and then i'm gonna click login since i have qr code set up with multi-factor authentication now i have to put in the code so i'll put that in and on my phone it's nine and then three three another three and seven and three and then i'm gonna press verify so i'm logged in successfully with the new password and now we can go ahead and see if we can test the create account so here i'm just gonna uh, do john doe john d at gmail.com and then i'm gonna give him a password and i'm just gonna click on well this has to be a real email this john doe is not gonna work because it's gonna send us an email so that we can confirm our account but let me show you what's gonna happen if i put an existing email like the one that we've been using so if i do that and then press register you can see email already exists use a different email and then try again because remember one of the requirements was that we need to have unique email addresses so this is one of the requirements right here so we can't allow the same email to be used multiple times to create multiple different accounts so i have another gmail account that i'm going to use which is a real one that's one that i use personally so i'm going to go ahead and blur it i'm just going to go ahead and paste it so that's a real email that i'm using and then i'm going to press register and you can see here it says account created check your email to enable your account so even if i try to log in with this account so if i go to log in and then i paste the same email and then i put the password and try to log in it says your account is currently disabled so until i click on that particular link that i got in my email and enable my account i won't be able to log in with this account so i'm going to bring over my email again so this is the new email and i'm just going to click and open it up and you can see it says your new account has been created uh, please click the link below to verify your account so I'm gonna go ahead and just click it again and you can see it says account verified you can log in now and that's gonna take me to the login page but I'm just gonna keep using the same uh, browser that I was using and now I'm gonna try to log in again I'm gonna click on login and you can see now I'm logged in successfully and you can see I have a default picture so if I click here and then go to my profile you can see everything is grayed out because I'm a user. So if you're a user, then you're not allowed to change your settings or update your profile or change your authorization or anything like that. OK, so this feature is working as expected. So I'm going to go ahead and log out and then I'm going to log back in with Jasmine again. So I think this is Jasmine and this is the password for her. Not the right one. There we go. Okay, so now I'm logged in as Jasmine. So I think I cover everything in terms of the demonstration of the application and everything that we were required to build as far as the requirements and the application overview are concerned. And I know this was kind of a long video, but I wanted to show you that this is real development. I'm not gonna use any crazy library. It's gonna be like pure React. Now I'm not talking down on any library like Next.js or the UI libraries for React or anything like that but i want to teach you the actual skills that you're gonna need to get a job or start your own company or become a freelancer or really learn those skills that's gonna take you to the next level so there's a lot going on in this application that i'm not talking about obviously because this is just a demo that's what you would do to your client who, or your agency but you're not gonna tell the agency hey we implemented this you know uh cash that's using a distributed cash and we have you know two three ec2 instances like they don't care about all this stuff they just want to see it working so that's what i just give you i just show you that we build everything that they ask and everything is working i haven't shown you anything about the audit so i'm not showing you how we're tracking who is doing what so all of this stuff is going in the background i haven't shown you anything about spring security i haven't shown you anything about redux store react react hook form like all of this stuff is going to come together in the course but i just want to show you what you're going to be building just so that you have a pretty good idea of you know the caliber of the course and if you would like to take it or not
but all the details are going to come a little bit later. So that's all I wanted to show you. So now you understand what we're going to be building in this course. And I'm going to tell you exactly all of the different technologies that we're going to be using just so that you really know what you're going to be learning, uh, because all of these things that I just showed you, they can be done with almost every other tech stack. You can use Node.js in the back end, or you can use Angular, Vue. You can pretty much accomplish the same thing with Svelte. All these frameworks, you can do all these things and accomplish the same result in the end we're using any kind of framework but you have to be careful about what you choose and how you make them work together and all that so i'm choosing spring boot in the back end when i started this course it was about spring security because i really wanted to give a new course on spring security because all the courses that i have on spring security they're really out of date and i know that i had to revamp the, those courses so I'm going to take a different approach this time and give you a very thorough implementation of Spring Security. So I would advise that you have some knowledge of Spring Security. You have done the configuration before because I'm going to introduce some new concepts that you're probably not going to find easily online, like some other stuff that I'm going to show you how to uh, completely customize uh, Spring Security so that you can build this user feature and make it work exactly the way that you want to make it work. So I think that's everything that I wanted to say for the introduction, and I'm going to give you guys all of the code with all of the files like everything that we're going to be doing in this course you're going to have access to and it's going to be periodic so every section is going to have its own source code and all of the resources are going to be given to you so you don't have to worry about anything you're going to get all of the source code all of the data everything so you will have access to everything so the next thing that i'm going to be doing is to just give you an overview of the structure of the course and how we're going to go about teaching everything obviously it's based on lectures and it's online because because, you know, I'm not in a classroom or anything, but I want to give you an overview of the structure of the course so that you understand exactly what you're going to be learning, how you're going to be learning it and what we're going to be doing. So that's what we're going to be working on next. Now let's take a look at the structure of the course. So the course is all online, so it's all videos. And the way that I'm going to do it is by giving you a presentation. So before we dive into every feature, so we have the functional requirements and it's per feature, right? So every time we're going to build one feature and I'm going to give you one section with all of the videos concerning this feature. And then you're going to have the source code and all other resources that we use to build that one feature. So it's going to be a presentation. So if I'm going to introduce something new, like say I'm going to talk about V, for example, to start the React application, or I'm going to talk about the backend application or the database, then I'm going to give you an overview. So there's going to be like maybe like one slide show you exactly what we're going to be doing and then some of the concepts that you need to understand. So it's going to be presentation. I want to get these things clicking in your brain. You can see I put the little light bulb here. So I give you a presentation and present the concepts to you. So if you're going to build a login, I can present what it means, you know, authorization, authentication, blah, blah, blah. And then I explain, you know, some of the trends in the industry and stuff like that and what's been happening, maybe throw in some fun facts about some stuff that I, you know, learn. And then we're going to move over to the implementation of the video. So it's going to be presentation, concepts and then videos. Now, I can't stress this enough. You have to watch the videos. That's how this course is delivered. You cannot come to a classroom or you cannot send an email or anything like well you can send an email if you if you want to because you know you have the email but the way that you consume the course is by uh, watching the lectures so you really have to watch all of the lectures and i would encourage you to watch them uh, in the same order that they are presented in the course structure and in the lectures we're going to be writing all of the code so if you want you can write the code with me if you don't want to you can just watch because i know uh, different people have different ways of doing things. So if you just want to watch what I'm doing and then maybe take the source code, take a look and then try to do it uh, because you need to build muscle memory. Watching me do something is not going to teach you how to do it because the moment that you try to do it, boom, it breaks. You have an exception. You have a problem. And I didn't have this problem. <laughs> um, maybe I did but I'm making a course. Maybe I solved it. Maybe I forgot to mention that in the lectures, or maybe I mentioned it, but you still got the same error. So you don't really learn to know how to do something until you actually do it. So I will encourage everyone to write the code as I'm writing it, but as I required, do your style, whatever you want to do. 
also really important is questions. You need to ask me your questions. Now there is one caveat to that, and that is before you ask me a question, you need to do some research. Because sometimes if you do a quick Googling, you get the answer right away. So instead of sending me a message, wait for me to reply because I'm only gonna reply within 24 hours. You might send me the message, I just happen to be on my phone and I can just write you back and I just happen to know what the answer is. So I can just say, hey, this is the problem, this is how you fix it. Other times I might not be on my phone. I might be driving or I might be somewhere. So I might not respond until hours later. So before you ask me a question, you should try to see if you can solve it yourself or try to Google the response. So if you have a problem, just look in the console, see what the problem is, and then um, try to Google it or try to find a solution somehow, either online or uh, looking at some other resources or something. And then if you're really stuck, like you can't find a solution, then you ask me the question. Now, don't get frustrated. If you can't find a solution, don't beat yourself. Just go ahead and ask me the question. But I would encourage you to at least try to see if you can find a solution. And then maybe that, that's going to save you time. Because, you know, if I don't answer until after three hours, then you're stuck for three hours and you need to move on with the course. Or maybe you're going to watch the lectures. But anyway, there's something that's not working and you don't know how to solve it and you need to know how to solve it to move forward. So I would encourage everyone to try to find the answer yourself. And then if you can't, then jump into Discord, go to the appropriate channel in the Discord, and I'm going to give you the Discord access as well. And then just go there and then ask me your questions. And if you don't want other people to see the question, you can contact me directly. If it's something unrelated to the course, you need some advice on your career or something like that, then you can send me a direct message. But don't hesitate to ask your questions. And finally, the resources. So I'm going to give you all of the resources. So everything that we do, I'm going to see if I can keep it very organized and give you all the source code at the end of every section because the course is subdivided into sections. So at the end of every section, you're going to have a source code lecture. There's not going to be any lectures there. It's just going to be the source code for the progress that we've made in the course. So if you're taking this course, just know that at the end of every section, the last lecture of that section is where the source code and the resources are. So just go there grab the source code for that particular section and then maybe run it or change it or learn whatever you need to learn from the actual section where we just build a feature. And last thing that I want to mention, I kind of like talked about it a little when I was talking about questions. The best way to reach out to me is through Discord. So if you're taking this course, just go to the last lecture of the section and you will see that I give you access to the Discord server. That's the easiest way to um, reach me to ask me all of your questions because it's like a text message to me. I have the app on my phone, so it just kind of like pops up on my phone and I can look at it right away. If I don't know the answer, then I can give you some guidance to uh, where you can find it until I can research the problem and then give you the solution. Um, but just know that the best way to reach out to me is through the Discord server, and I'm going to give you guys the access to the Discord server, so I'm going to give you the link at the last lecture of this section. This is the introduction section. That's where the link to the Discord server is going to be. So just go there, click on the link, access the Discord server. You just click it, it's asked you to join, then you just click join and that's it, you're in. And then you'll see all the different channels. If you have a question about the back end, you click on the back end channel, ask me the question there, front end, uh, SQL, etc. All right, so that's everything that I have. And if you have a better idea, you can just send me a message as well. If you have something else that you think would help most people or everyone, then you can let me know. Then maybe I can incorporate it in, in the course as well because I'm really open. All right, so presentation to give you the concepts. Then we jump into the video lectures and then up to you if you want to write the code or not, or maybe you're going to write them later. Make sure you ask me your questions and all of the resources are going to be in the last lecture of every section. Now I want to talk about some of the prerequisites for the course. Everything that you're seeing on the screen is just things that I could just think of that you probably need to know about. There's a lot more going on that would not fit on the screen that I'm just going to talk about or maybe you're just going to see it on the course. But at a very minimum, this is what I want you to be familiar with. Now I'm not asking you to have any kind of level in any of these technologies because it's a lot of technologies and some of you maybe are beginners. You're just trying to take on this challenge of taking this course, maybe intermediate, whatever the case might be. But what I'm asking is to be somewhat familiar with these technologies. So for the front end, you really need to have the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So if you're coming into a React course, 
obviously your JavaScript is pretty strong. So I'm expecting you guys to know the newer syntax of JavaScript, like arrow function and things like that, because that's what React uses. React uses a lot of uh, a very declarative approach with a lot of functions. React is really just a bunch of functions. You can have classes, like if you're defining some services and things like that, but it's almost always a bunch of functions in React. Unlike Angular, where in Angular you have a bunch of classes and interfaces, but in React it's almost always a function. So you need to have a pretty solid understanding of JavaScript coming into this course. And of course, TypeScript. So if you know TypeScript, that's good. TypeScript is really easy to pick up. I haven't had anyone telling me that it was hard for them to learn TypeScript. So TypeScript and JavaScript, I'll put them in the same bucket. So just make sure that you're familiar with JavaScript and TypeScript. And then React. Remember, this is not a beginner's course. I have a course for beginners. So if you feel like you need to take another course, maybe you can start with this course. And there's like plenty of courses that you can take online for free on React. So I would encourage you to not take this course if you've never worked with React before, because this is not for beginners. Unless you know who you are and you know you can take on anything, uh, because I'm not trying to discourage anyone uh, from taking a course. But if you feel like you can take it, you'll, you'll figure it out, then go for it. But just know that it's going to be pretty advanced with Redux. If I'm going to talk about state management and stuff like that, and you've never worked with React and you've never worked with Redux, then it's it's going to be a little bit confusing. And for the UI, I was going to use Tailwind CSS, but I decided to go with Bootstrap because it was faster for me. I know I can do the same or even better with Tailwind CSS, and I already have a microservice course in the making, and it's using Tailwind CSS. But the UI is like the least important thing in this entire course or on this entire slide, the least important thing is this bootstrap icon that you see here. If you want, you can change everything in the course using Tailwind, or you can write your own CSS or use Material UI. You can change anything you want in the UI. It's really the least significant item on this, on this slide. So don't worry too much about Bootstrap. Use Tailwind if you prefer. Do whatever. It doesn't really matter. Now I'm using a very specific version of Bootstrap, uh, like a like a different template of Bootstrap. It's still Bootstrap, but the colors are different. It looks a little nicer. And I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do this. And then Redux. I will be showing you a lot about Redux, but it would be good to have some experience working with Redux and the Redux toolkit because I'm gonna make heavy use of uh, of the toolkit. Uh, really, it's just gonna be the toolkit whenever we're gonna create the services to communicate with the backend Spring Boot application. So it would be nice if you have heard and even if you haven't worked with Redux, but you have seen Redux and you know what it is and what it's for. It's really a state management. I guess you can call it a library. So it allows you to manage the state of the application. And if you really know what you're doing, you do your configuration right, and it's going to be like a breeze whenever you're building new functionalities and you need to fetch data from an HTTP server like we're going to be building. So Redux, Redux Toolkit, make sure you, you are familiar with this with these concepts. And then for the backend, since we're going to be using a Spring Boot application, then you need to know Java. So Java, you need to be decent uh, in Java and then SQL. Now for SQL, we're not going to be writing a lot of SQL, uh, but I'm going to make a case for you because in this course, we're going to be using Spring Data JPA. We're going to be using Spring Data JPA in a fairly advanced way. Uh, Spring Data JPA is actually very big that there's a lot you can do with Spring Data JPA, like stored procedures and all kinds of crazy stuff. But I'm still going to show you something that's not just preliminary. I'm going to show you something that's a little bit more uh, in the intermediate area because I, the application is not super complex either. So in terms of how complex JPA can be and in terms of the complexity of, of our application, then we're not really doing much uh, with JPA. But just know that it's not going to be just a simple entity and then that's it because we have to do all of these mappings with the documents and with the users and all that stuff. So JPA can handle all of that. I'm going to show you how to do that with JPA. I'm also going to show you all of the SQL queries that we would do if we were designing this because if I was to build this as a real world application, I would never use JPA. But I know a lot of people like like JPA, they want to see JPA. So I decided to build a course using JPA, but preferably I would never use JPA for anything. <laughs> I would just write my raw SQL queries because I feel more comfortable in terms of the performance of my application and I have complete control of my queries because sometimes I look at the queries that JPA is generating, um, they're questionable, <laughs> but I just like to have control of my um, of my SQL and all my of my data. So even though you see SQL here, I guess you should be familiar 
with the concept like you're not gonna see sql and wonder oh what is this so you should know what it is but it's mostly gonna be jpa and then i'm gonna show you the equivalent of what jpa generated to show you some of the differences between when you use jpa and when you write your own sql but you will not be writing any sql unless you want to you can type along with what i'm doing but you don't have to and then spring boot of course because this is a spring boot application and i'm gonna be using postgre for the database so i'm gonna show you how we're gonna spin up a docker container and then set up our Postgre database and all that so you don't have to install anything on your computer if you already have it installed great if you don't then i'm going to show you how you're going to spin up a server and then just do everything using containers and also we're going to be using uh, pj admin for the ui for postgresql and for that also i'm going to be using a docker container so i'm going to show you how to do this and then lastly docker so we're going to kind of dockerize the application now i have a previous course uh uses spring boot in the back end and angular in the front end another advanced course and i have a very extensive configuration for spring boot now this configuration is also going to be i would say almost as extensive as the last one but not as much because this application is a little bit smaller but it's still going to be significant and also there's been an update in docker like a lot of things have changed like we don't even have docker compose anymore well we still have it but it's merged with docker so it's now one command instead of docker compose it's still going to be docker and then you can pass and compose and then do other things so there's been some upgrades that happened over the last few months and you also need to learn all these new new things or new ways of doing things so i'm going to show you that as well as long as you're familiar with these technologies i'm not going to say from a scale of one to ten you have to be at a five or seven or anything like that i'm going to leave that you know to your discretion you can be just beginning if you feel like you learn fast you can pick this up real quick because you can watch the lectures a million times then sure go for it you need to have some kind of experience and you need to understand certain things before you you go into it because it's it's a little bit advanced so this is what i would say that you should be familiar with coming into the course but again there's other things like http you need to know you know the different methods in http you need to understand http because if we're using an api using rest then you need to understand what rest is and what an http is what an api is so all this stuff they're just not on this slide and you need to know all these things so as i go through the course i'll do my best to explain everything to the best of my ability if you have some knowledge about these things then it's uh, it's gonna be a plus and that was just one example there's like so many different concepts that i'm gonna be touching on in this course that you know i don't want to overwhelm you but just know that you should come prepared to learn as much as possible and again there's not gonna be any fancy library i'm not gonna start doing this and then i'm just gonna install the library and make it do everything for me <laughs> uh we're gonna do everything step by step one by one code it all out from line one to line i don't know ten thousand or something like that so we're gonna build everything from the ground up type in everything no fancy library with react nothing fancy with uh, spring boot nothing crazy no crazy ui nothing like that it's just gonna be pure serious software development hope you guys are ready and again don't get stuck because this thing can be a little bit frustrating ask me your questions and i should be able to help you so now what i'm gonna do is to show you what you need to have installed on your computer so that you can follow along so that's what we're gonna be working on next so I'll quickly go over what you need to have on your computer to follow along with the course. So the first thing is you're going to need to have Java installed and there's plenty of videos on YouTube and online blogs that you can use to understand how you can install it. In this course, I'm going to be using the latest version of Java and as of the recording of this lecture, I think the version uh, that's the latest is 21. So I'm going to be using Java version 21, the latest version of Java uh, in this course. So make sure you have Java installed on your computer and then you set the class path and everything like that. Just make sure that Java is, is running on your computer. And then Node.js because we need Node.js to run vid commands so that we can start the React application. But that's going to be a little later in the course, so you don't have to download this right now. You can download it later. I'm going to install the latest version right before I start uh, working on the front end. So I'm just going to wait until then and then I'm going to do that. So if this version changed, because I don't know how often they change those versions. So uh, it might not be version 20, but whatever the latest version is, whenever I'm going to start the front end, then that's the version that we're going to be using. Node version management is a whole thing in itself. Managing the different versions of a node is just it can be crazy sometimes. <laughs> um, so just know that, you know, for everything that we're going to be doing, I would give it probably a, maybe a year and then it's going to start breaking. <laughs> At least some of the things will start breaking. So you have to constantly be updating nodes and things like that. And I've had to do this and it's, it wasn't, 
it wasn't pleasant. So just know that I'm going to wait until I'm going to be working on the front end and then install the latest version of Node right before I start recording the videos. And then for my IDE for Java, I'm going to be using IntelliJ. Now, I know IntelliJ is, uh, you have to pay for it. They have a, a community version. Uh, if you can use that, that's just fine. But I have a paid version. I think I got it for free because I was a student uh, and I still have the license. So I got a free version because I was a student. I'm no longer a student, but I still have the license. So IntelliJ for my backend IDE. And if you want to use something else, feel free to use it. You can use Visual Studio Code, whatever. It's really up to you. I'm not going to force any ID on anyone, but just know that I'm going to be using IntelliJ. And for the front end, I'm going to be using VS Code. I'm pretty sure everybody knows VS Code. So that's going to be the one that I'm going to be using for the front end. And for our database, I'm going to be using PostgreSQL. And I've been working with PostgreSQL for a long time, but I don't really have a lot of content on PostgreSQL. So I've exclusively been using PostgreSQL in all of my new content. It's going to be PostgreSQL for this course. And then I'm going to be using PG Admin. I'm going to be using the online version and I'm going to spin up an instance of PG Admin using a Docker container. And I'm going to show you how to do that as well um, so that you don't have to install it. But if you already have it installed, great. If you have another client that you want to use with Postgre, then you can do that. But it's going to be PG Admin in the browser in this course. And for my terminal, you need a terminal. I'm on a Mac. I think you can install Alacrity on the Windows computer. I'm not sure. I never tried to do that. But I'm going to be using Alacrity, Alacrity. Okay, I, however you say this. I really like this terminal, like a lot. <laughs> uh, it's one of my favorite uh, terminal of all time. But I'm going to be using Alacrity for my terminal. And I'll be switching to iTerm because I have iTerm installed. And iTerm is nice. So I'll be switching between the two. And then Docker, if you want, you can install Docker. If you already have, like, for example, Postgre on your uh, computer, then you don't have to install Docker. But I would encourage everyone to have an instance of Docker running and then play with Docker because Docker is like took over the entire industry in, in terms of uh, deploying things and scaling up and scaling down. Like all of these big cloud providers, they're using Docker in the back end. So it's really a technology you need to get your hands on and understand how it works and play with it. It's going to save you a lot of time, a lot of resources, and it's just going to look good on your on your resume. And I'm going to be using the terminal to interact with Docker. But I think by now they have a client for pretty much all operating system or all, all the major operating system. I've never used Docker with a client like this, like my entire time of using a Docker. I've always use the terminal. I never really like thought about the client, but I know that recently they have created clients for all major operating systems. So feel free to use one. I'm just not going to use one in this course. I'm just going to use the terminal to do everything, but feel free to do that. So that's everything you need to have installed. But again, if you know what you're doing, you know, you don't need to install this, then it's all fine. I'm just showing you what's happening so that you're aware, but it's not like, Hey, you must do this in order to take this course. It's really not like that. You can use any ID you like any front end ID or text editor you like. You can use MySQL or any other database you like any other database that's going to work with JPA, any client, any terminal or command line, whatever you want to, you want to use. Okay. So that's everything that we need to do in order to begin. And I think that I'm going to start with the first feature and the functional requirements. So we're going to take a look at that again, and then we're going to start thinking about how we're going to go about doing this, how we're going to go about building this feature, because we're going to be laying the foundation of the entire application or the backend, uh, which is like, the backbone of the application. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So now we're going to begin and we're going to go back to the functional requirements that we need to have for this application. And we're going to start with this user feature and then we're going to do everything one by one. So we're going to decompose it into all of these uh, main points. So the new account, the reset password, and then the MFA and everything. So for the new account, we know that we need to allow user to create a new account. So we need to have a way to represent this information. Okay. Now, while we're working on this new account, we also have to keep in mind uh, everything else that kind of like relates to the, to the new user account, right? Because for example, if I'm going to be creating a new user account, then I need to represent the user somehow. But also I know that I need to keep track of 
the users, right? So I need to have a way to track this information, right? And also, I know that I'm going to give these users roles. So that means that at the time of the creation of the account, I need to assign uh, a role to the user, right? And I also need to keep track of who created the user. And this is going to be the system. Uh, and we're going to talk more about the system a little bit. Because if I'm creating a new account in the system, well, nobody's creating it for me. I am the one doing it. So that's the system. Okay. And for example, another one is this multi-factor authentication. So I know that I need to have a way to store the QR code on the user. Now there's nothing wrong with doing this and then come back and say, oh, we're going to add a new field in the users class, for example, to manage the MFA and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying, as you build this, as long as it's not going to impede you doing the first requirement, then if you can add, for example, the field to capture the roles, then we should do that because we know that in order to create a new account or to do it properly, we need to give a role to the new users. So we can just save them and not give them a role just because we we are not at the uh, we're not there yet right like uh right here okay so just because we're not in the access control doesn't mean we, we're gonna save users without their um their role i have to keep in mind everything else as we try to do this so we know that we're gonna need a user and we're gonna need to capture their basic information and the email is going to be unique they also gonna have a password and we're going to make sure that their account is not active whenever we create the new user. So let's see if we can tackle um, this first. So the first one by just trying to create an application, create the entity and then define exactly what this user is going to look like. Now, again, this is not as detailed as it should be, because, for example, this first point can be broken down into multiple points. So the user will have how many fields, you know, first name, last name, email, password, roles, what else the user is going to have? Well, they're going to need to have a, an image for their profile. So we're going to need that. And maybe they're going to have a verified password. Maybe we're going to put that. So there's like a lot more details that you're not seeing here that you're actually going to see in the code. But in the real world, you would decompose every single one of these points to the finest detail because you want to know exactly what you're doing and document everything. Okay, so we just don't have that kind of time to do this, but I just want to put you in the actual chair, if you like, to understand exactly how this works. So what do we need to do? We need to create a new user and then see if we can save this user in a database, but also keep track of who is doing what. So even before we create the user, we need to take care of this because we need to say, well, this new user is created. Who created it? It was the system. So we need to somehow have some foundation on the audit trail in order to save this user. Okay, so let's go ahead and start working on this. Maybe once we start working on it, it's going to make more sense. But I'm just trying to help you think on how you actually start doing this. Because I remember when I was in school, my professor just threw something just like that. It was even longer than that at me and say, hey, you have like a week and a half, I think it was, to give me a design that is a sound design, not just any design because I was doing my, my master's degree. And that was like in the beginning of the semester, that was like a lightweight assignment. It wasn't like the heavyweight assignments yet. So just know that this is going to teach you a lot of valuable skills. And I just want you to know that and just make sure that you're prepared to uh, learn all this stuff. And of course, feel free to take a break and all that stuff, but just know that this is like serious software development. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can go about fulfilling this first requirement right here. So let's do that next. So I have a brand new browser window open and I'm going to go to Spring Initializer. So we're going to start with the back end first. I'm going to click on that first link and I'm going to make it a little easier to see. It's better for me if it's in dark mode, but you know, it's better for you for it not to be in dark mode because of the video recording. But I'm going to use Maven and it's going to be Java as the language. We're going to use the latest stable version of Spring Boot at this time of the recording. It's 3.22. This is good. I'm going to fill in the information here and it's going to be packaging as a jar and I'm going to be using Java 21. Okay, so the latest version of Java is 21 and the packaging is a jar and I filled out all of this information. Now let's move on to dependencies. So we're going to need web because we're building an API 
and then we're gonna use JPA, we're gonna use Spring Security, and we're gonna use Lombok. We're gonna use Postgre, so Postgre driver. Okay, so we have Spring Data JPA, we have Spring Web, we have Spring Security, Lombok, and then the driver for Postgre. Java 21, JAR, and then later version of Spring Boot 3.22, well, 3.2.2, Maven, and language is Java. So now I'm gonna click on generate and then that's gonna download a zip file and then we're just gonna go ahead and open it in IntelliJ. So I have the application open in IntelliJ and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just rename this file to be just application. Rename and I'm just gonna remove that part. So it's just going to be application and then refactor. Uh, select all, okay, and open this up. Okay, so typical Spring Boot application, nothing to see here. And I want to make sure that I can just run this application and it will just run. Just a, a sanity check. So let's go to the POM file and we need to comment out some stuff. So let's scroll down and we're gonna comment out Spring Data JPA. And we're gonna do the same for Spring Security because it's gonna be looking for configuration. We don't have that yet. And we're gonna remove the PostgreSQL. It's gonna be looking for a configuration that we don't have yet and everything else can stay. I don't think every, anything else is gonna be a problem. And then I'm gonna click on the little refresh icon here for Maven, and that should resolve all of our dependencies. And once this is done, we should be able to just run it. So if I click on run, I don't know if it's gonna work, but let's just give it a try. And there we go. So it started really fast because we really don't have anything in this application. So you can see we started on port 8080, um, and we don't have any endpoints or anything, but we know that we're up and running. So what I'm going to do is to dive into exactly what we need to do for this application and how we're going to secure it. So before we do any more coding, well, we haven't done any coding, but before we do any coding, we need to understand exactly how we're going to tackle all of these requirements. So that's what we're going to be doing next. So just to quickly look at what we're going to be doing, we need to create the user, but we need to audit everything that we save and we update as far as entity goes. So before we do the user, we need to take that into account. So here is the approach that I'm going to take. So let's go back to IntelliJ and I'm just going to add some note here. So what I'm going to do is to create a first class, which I'm going to call uh, auditable or something like that. And it's going to be an abstract class. And this class is what everything that I'm saving in the database uh, is going to extend. So here I'm going to say all entities. Okay, so every entity in the application that I'm saving in the database, they're going to extend this class or they're going to inherit from this class. And this class is going to have all of the, you know, created at and updated at and created by and updated by and all of the entities are going to inherit from this. And also what I can do is I can add the condition for saving any entity in the application and I will have to do it only in the auditable class that I'm going to create and it's going to be inherited in all of the subclasses or all of the classes that inherit from this uh, class or this super class. So that way, whenever we're going to try to save an entity in the database, all of the logic inside of the auditable is going to run. And if we don't have who is updating the data or creating the data, then the operation is going to fail. So how can we implement this? So I'm going to open and create a new package. And we begin, by the way, and I'm going to call this entity. OK, so we're going to have entity and uh, we're going to have domain separately. And I'm going to show you why I'm doing that. So in here, I'm going to create a class and I'm going to call it uh, the table. OK, because it's going to audit all the other classes. And I'm going to press enter. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that it's an abstract. So I'm going to say public abstract class. So it's an abstract class, meaning we can't create any constructor for it. Oh, this is misspelled. So we factor rename uh, auditable. This is a D. OK, so this class is going to have some annotations. So first ones are going to be uh, getters and setters. Since we have Lombok, we should be able to import getters and setters. OK, and we want to map this as a super class. So let me see if I can collapse some of this stuff. 
So what we're going to do is to say add map. Uh, I think it's mapped superclass super class okay and then we need to add something called an entity listener so here we're gonna say add entity entity listener listeners and we're gonna pass in the auditing entity listener class and I just realized why this is not working because I commented out all of the dependencies so we need to import maybe not Postgre but we definitely need the uh, this one JPA so I'm gonna uncomment that and then I'm gonna refresh all right so we should get something in just a minute import and import the entity listener and import this as well okay so just make sure these are coming from the persistence so this is correct so we get getters and setters because we want to allow getters and setters. And then we want to map super class because we're going to be mapping this to the database to child classes. And then we want to give this this entity listener. And this is going to allow us to um, like specify a listener classes for all of the entities that we have mapped or all of the subclasses that we have mapped. And in this case, that's the auditing listener. Okay, because we need to do something every time the subclasses are going to be saved in the database. Uh, if you can think of it this way and now that I'm thinking about it I probably don't need to have the setters so I'm gonna comment it out temporarily because we don't want anyone to be able to set anything here this might change later but let's keep it this way and then I want to ignore the uh, let's do at JSON this is JSON ignore properties and then we can pass in the value it takes an array um, so we can do uh, created that because we know that we need to ignore these fields and then update it at. So we're going to say update it at. And we're going to keep them in here. And we're going to allow only the getters because that's what we say. So we're going to say allow getters, set that to true. So we can get information from this class, but we can set any information from this class. Um, but we do need to do it inside of the class itself though. Okay, so let me see how this is gonna work out. So here we have the auditable, which we're gonna be using. And um, we might not need this line, but let us let let me put everything together and then we'll see what we need to do. So I'm gonna scroll up a little bit and I'm just gonna add more spaces so that this can scroll up just like that. So I'm just gonna define all of the different fields that we need to keep track of. And we're gonna need to have an ID. So I'm gonna define this as a long. So this is gonna serve for all of these subclasses as well. So we don't need to define this ID in all of the subclasses. And then we're gonna need to have another string that's gonna be a reference uh, ID. So a reference ID is like a, like a number that you can use to identify a specific resource on the server or in the database. So for this one, um, we can do something uh, fairly simple. We can just generate them in the, on the fly. So we can say, uh, let's do alternative. Uh, yeah, this is the one that I'm looking for. And then we can say generate ID, which is going to be like a UUID. And then we can just convert it to a string. So every time we create a new entity in the application and we save it, they're going to have a reference ID and the reference IDs can come um, very handy. And then we want to have a created date. So we're going to say uh, created by. Um, so we're going to say private long and that's going to be created uh, created by. So what this is doing, uh, so you would think that this might be like a string or something, but remember, we need to pass in the ID of the user and we know the ID is going to be like a long. So whoever created an entity, they're going to have to give us the ID for that entity that's creating the other entity. So that's what we're passing in created by. And then um, we need another one for private. This is going to be another one that's going to be a long updated by. So that's the person updating it. So this one is who created it. This one is who updated it. And then after that, I can just duplicate these lines. So control D and then I'm going to do two more. But these two, there are going to be local date time. So local date time. And that's going to be created at. And I'm going to copy this, paste it here, updated at. OK, so the time like who created it at what time and who updated it at what time. 
Okay, so that's what this is doing. So this is really all we need for the super class so that all of the subclasses can inherit all of these properties. So whenever we create a new user, then we don't have to pass it an ID and all of these properties because it's going to become redundant. So we just create a super class so that we can keep track of this information. And then the subclasses or the child classes, they're just going to have just the fields that they need and nothing related to the who created it and who updated it or when that happened. So hopefully this is making sense. And if it's not, it's going to make sense a little bit later. But now we do need to pass in some annotation here because this is going to be an entity that JP is going to manage for us. So we need to pass in an ID for this. And because we have entity listener here, that's kind of like an entity, but this will never be persisted in the database. It's just going to be the children that will be persisted in the database. So that's what we're going to be working on next. We're going to be adding all of the annotations that we need to add and then the logic as far as whenever a new entity is being saved or updated in the database. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's add the annotations so that JPA can manage this uh, for us. So the first one is going to be the ID because we need to make this a primary key. And since I'm using Postgre, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put in a sequence. So I'm going to say at sequence, uh, supposed to be the sequence generator. And here I'm going to pass in a name. So the name is going to be primary underscore key underscore and sequence. S U key and I'm going to give it a sequence name. So I'm going to say sequence name and I'm going to pass in the same string. So I'm going to copy this and then paste it here and I'm going to pass it an allocation. So here I'm going to say allocation size. It's just going to be one. I want to do the generated value. So I'm going to go down and then I'm going to say generated value. And here we're going to pass it a strategy and that's going to be sequence. And the generator is the one that we just created. So generator, generator is going to be the same. And I want to pass in the at column annotation. I want to maybe give it a name of ID. So that's going to be the name in the in the database. And updatable set that to false because it's true by default because you don't want this to be updated. I think the ID would already take care of this and the reference is totally fine. We don't have to do anything for the reference, but for the created by, we need to add it not null. And I'm just going to copy this. Well, not no null. I want not null. So not null is supposed to come from the, the validation dependency. So let's quickly add that to the palm file. So I'm going to go down here. I'm just going to copy one of these and then I'm going to paste it. And the only thing we have to change is the web. We're going to change it to validation and everything else should stay the same. So Spring Framework and Spring Boot Starter Validation and then refresh this POM file. You can see it's here. Now, if we go back, we should be able to import it from this class validation. And then we're going to do the same on the updated by. So we're going to paste that in there. And for the created at, because I always want to have when something was created, maybe we don't always want the updated time, but we always want to know uh, when something was created. And I'm going to copy the column annotation and then put it on top of the created at and I want to change the name of this in the database so that's going to be created underscore at and I'm also going to pass it the nullable as false because I don't want this to be null and there's another annotation that I can add here which is the created date so we're going to select that and I'm just going to copy everything here well I'm not copying the null so I'm going to copy these two and then put it on top of the updated at and we're going to change this to updated at updated it's not nullable but it is it's updatable so we're going to delete that the date that the entity was created it's not updatable it's whenever it was created that's the date that's it but for the updated date we want it to be updatable so we're not passing in the updatable false by default it's going to be true and if you want to see what the default is you just go in this annotation and then you can see uh, what the default values are for all of these. So the updatable is true by default, so I don't have to pass it. Okay, so that's what we have to do for the annotations. Now, the next thing that I want to do is to implement a logic for uh, pre-persist and pre-update so that before we persist any entity, we check for all of these things that we're setting because we can't save anything in a database if we don't have who created it and who updated it and the date that they were created or updated. So that's what we're going to be working on next. 
So I'm gonna scroll down a little more and scroll up. So we want to do something called a pre-persist. Okay, so that's coming from JPA and we want to say public, that's not gonna return anything. And then I'm gonna name it before persist. So this method, it's gonna be called before any entities are saved in a database. So here we can implement our logic to get the values that we want to get and then set those values on the setters before we persist anything in the database. So before persist or pre persist is the annotation. And here I'm going to define the user ID because we need to know the user ID. So for now, since I don't have the logic yet, I'm just going to put one as a long because we know that we're setting an along for the user ID. And the reason that we're doing along is because we know that the IDs are set as long. So as you can see here, so the user ID is going to come in as a long because that's the user ID that we're defining here since the user class is going to inherit the ID from the auditable class. So that's how I know that this is going to be a long. And then I'm going to say if the user ID, so if the user ID is null, so if this is true, then we cannot persist anything in the database. So at this point, we're going to have to throw an exception. So we're going to say throw new API exception, and we're going to pass in a message. So the API exception doesn't exist yet. I'm going to create it in a minute and we can say cannot persist entity without user ID and request context for this thread. Okay, so we want to send well, or throw an exception in this case, if we cannot find the ID. So if the ID is null in the thread, and they're trying to persist an entity, so that can be a role, a user a document, then uh, we're going to send this message. So at this point, the execution of the method will stop and the application will just throw this exception. But if that's not the case, then we're going to set the created at and we're going to pass in now. And we're going to do set created by because now we know who created it and we'll pass in the user ID. So that's going to set the user ID for the created by. So whoever is sending the request in the current thread, that's who is um, trying to save this. And then we're going to say set uh, updated by, oops, I pressed the wrong button here, updated by. And that's going to be the same person because, you know, the date that it's created or who created it is also who updated it because we're just persisting it. And the same thing for the update. So set updated at, we're going to pass in now. And this is not JavaScript. This is Java. We need two equal sign. Okay. And we're going to do something similar. So I'm going to copy this whole thing, paste it. And we want to do before update. So before update, and you guessed it, there is a before or pre update in this case. So before we update any entities, we're going to do the same thing. So from the request or from the thread in the request, we're going to see if we can find the user ID. If we can't find the ID, we can't say we cannot update entity without user ID in the request context for this thread. Otherwise, we're going to call set updated at and set updated by. Then we can remove these two. Okay, so this is who updated it and this is who created it. And I'm gonna import these statically. So I'm gonna fix that like this. All right, so before we save any entity, this code is gonna run. I'm gonna remove this space, by the way, that I put at the bottom. So before updating the entity, we're gonna do the same thing. There's gonna be some more logic here so that we can determine the user ID. And when I say user ID, it means whoever is sending the request as the logged in user. Because when you send the request as a logged in user, you're going to send that request with your credentials and I'll be able to pull the user ID from those credentials and the thread. And that's how I'm going to determine what the user ID is. And then that's what I'm going to set for these values. So if we're just saving a new entity in the database, it's going to set whoever is creating it as the person creating it and updating it at the same time and capture the timestamp whenever this action is happening. The next thing that I want to work on is this exception. So this exception right here, because I don't want to see this red text right here. So we're going to go ahead and create this class. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So this is going to be pretty easy to do. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to create a new package. So package and I'm going to name it exception. And in here, we're going to create this class. So let's copy this name new class, paste it in here, enter. And it's really like the simplest thing ever. 
So we're gonna extend runtime exception and then we're gonna declare a public and that's gonna be the API exception. So that's the constructor. We're gonna give it the string, which is a message. And then it's just gonna pass the message to the super class. So we're gonna say super passing the message just like that. And while I'm here, I'm just gonna create another constructor. So I'm gonna do control D and that's gonna duplicate this uh, line. And I'm just gonna pass in a default. So I can just call the constructor and we're gonna pass in a default message. So we're gonna say un error occurred. So that if we don't have a message, then we can just call the regular regular constructor, don't pass anything to it, but then it's gonna give us a default message. So now we can go back here and uh, import this class and this name is up to you by the way so i'm naming mine api exception but if you want to name it something else that makes more sense for your application then uh feel free to do that but i'm just gonna name it api exception do a little bit of cleanup here uh, there's a key binding that you can use to uh, rearrange and clean the import i think it's Control alt o so you can try that on your keyboard okay so this class is pretty much complete the only thing we have to work on now is to figure out what this is going to look like because we need to find a way to always get the user ID and the incoming request. So we need to have a way to set this ID when the request comes in, and we need to have a way to retrieve this ID uh, when the request comes in as well, because we need to set it and then get it at this point or anywhere in the application, wherever we want to. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So what I'm gonna be doing in order to do an implementation of this is by creating something called a request context. And it's actually fairly simple to do this in Java, and I'm gonna show you how. The point is to access some information in every thread that gets created whenever a request comes in. And and I'm gonna be using something called a thread local. So I'm gonna bring in the documentation just so that you can take a quick look at it and see where it's located. So I have the page open. You can see it says class thread local. And if you read this description, it says uh, thread local instances are typically private static fields and classes that wish to associate state with a thread. So if you really have some basic, well, not basic understanding of Java, but if you understand what happens when there is a request that comes into an application or how you can build a website server from scratch. Um, this is something that I did when I was in, in school and you can find examples online as well. But if you want to create, let's say a web server with Java, one thing you're going to do is you want to create a new thread for every request that comes in because you want to process every request separately or independently from other requests coming in. So you have to create a thread and this thread is associated with a particular request. So when we create a thread local, it's going to give us a way to create variables and we can access those variables whenever we want or wherever we want in the application in their private field and in any class that you want to associate with the thread. So we're going to set one field because we only want an ID and then we're going to expose them using uh, getters. So let's go back to the code and see how we can implement this. So back in the code, I'm going to open the project and I'm going to expand this a little more. And then I'm going to, uh, well, I see that I put the exception inside of entity. So I'm going to move it out refactor okay so now entity is uh, its own package and then i have the exception package and then i'm going to create a new one and this is going to be domain so domains are like classes that we have in the application and everything in entity is stuff that there are still classes but things that were persisting in the database so it makes more sense to call them entity because they're being managed by jp and jp to call them entity you can see here but domain they're just going to be like regular classes that are not being persisted in the database by jpa so here i'm going to create another class and i'm going to name it request context press enter. So this is where we need to use the thread local. So I'm going to put a space here and I'm going to create a private field. Remember these fields are private and static. So private static final, and we're going to create the thread local of type long because we know that's what we want. So long, and I'm just going to name it user underscore ID. We're going to set it equal to a new thread local. Okay just like that. And then I'm going to define a private constructor. So request context and I'm going to do public. So let's do static void start. So it's going to allow us to start or uh, initialize everything. So here I'm going to access the user ID and then I'm going to set it to null. Okay because we need to have a way to reset it. And I'm gonna have another method. So I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna say public 
also static that's going to return the long and i'm going to name it get user id it's not going to take anything because we're grabbing everything from the request and this is going to return so return the user id so user id that get that's a method that exists that you can just call to get the value and then we need to have a way to set it i guess the setter should come first so we can say public again static and that's going to be void so it's not returning anything and we're going to call it set user id and then here we're going to say that's going to return well it's not returning anything uh well you need to take the user id so user id and then we're just going to set it so we're going to call user id that's it and then pass in the user id so uh what this is doing is well maybe i should put these on multiple lines so that it can be clear what we're doing since you guys are more um, familiar with seeing it this way so multiple lines and do it for this as well so we have this which is gonna allow us to set and get the user id so this is like a variable that we're defining inside of this class nothing fancy so you can think of this as the type of the variable and then we have a setter and a getter to get the variable and then we have a way to set it to null but i'm getting a warning here and it says to replace this to um with remove so i'm just gonna do that okay it says it can cause memory leaks so i don't want to have any memory leaks in the application so we're gonna just go with the suggestion which is the remove and when i put my mouse over it it says it removes the current thread uh, values from the thread local variable which is exactly what we want instead of setting it to null so that looks good so now since these are all static we can just call them uh call this class and then call these methods on it and then set the value and then get the value so this is is the request context again i just give it this name it's up to you can name it whatever you want okay so this is the class that we're going to use to uh, set the value get the value and then remove the value and the or clear it out whenever we need to do some cleanup so the next thing we're going to do is to make use of this inside of the auditable so that we can get this value so we're going to be calling the getter and then later on i'm going to show you where we're going to set this value whenever the request comes in because as you may imagine already it's going to be done in a filter so whenever request comes in we're gonna have some filters that are gonna intercept the request and that's where we want to uh, set this value but we need to do some logic because depending on the request we might not have a user ID in every request for example if I'm sending a request to log in obviously I'm not logged in so the request comes in without any credentials so we need to have some logic to determine when we want to set the system or we want to set uh, like a user or something but that's gonna come later so for now we're just gonna use this request context so that we can get this ID and then fix the error that we have in the auditable class so that's what we're gonna be working on next so now let's go to our class and well let's copy this name and then go over here scroll down so instead of this 1L we're gonna call the request context and import it that get user ID and that's all we have to do copy that paste it down here okay so that's all we have to do for capturing whoever is trying to persist or update any entity in our application and every other classes that we're going to be creating so the user class the document everything else they're going to inherit from this class okay that way all of these fields will also belong to these classes and this logic will also execute before any of them is being saved or being updated all right so now we're ready to create the user class which is going to inherit from the auditable class so that's what we're going to be working on next so i'm going to close all the tabs here just to clean things up a little and then i'm going to create another class so we're done for the domain for now in the entity uh, package we're going to create the users class so this is going to represent the user that we will be persisting in the database so here's the user and the first thing we want to do is to extend our class so extend auditable okay so now once we do this this class inherits everything that we just did so this id the reference the created by updated by and this logic okay so that's why we did this first because we need to extend this class and then we're going to keep doing that for every other entity that we create that's going to be managed by gpa so that we can access all of this logic that we define here okay so let's go back here so the user is going to be like a typical user so private uh string 
string, I'm going to give it a user ID. So the user ID is something that I'm going to define that I can use to fetch the user without it being the primary key. Sometimes I will use the primary key. Sometimes I will use the user ID, which is going to be a string because sometimes it can be convenient to just work with a string instead of a long as a user ID. Well, even though you can make the primary key a string as well, that should be fine as long as you define a way to make it unique every time. Um, but that's good. Anyway, so private string first name and we're going to have private string last name. We're going to have the email. So private string email. So all the typical stuff and we need private integer that's going to be the login attempts because we need to keep track how many times uh, they're trying to log in so that we can lock their account and you're going to see how i'm going to implement this and then we need private local date time and that's going to be their last login and we need their private we need to use this not only to show the last session, but to code some logic uh, that's going to help us with the login attempt. So all of this is going to come into play. We need another string for the phone and we need another private for the bio. And then we need another one for the image URL. And then we need some other stuff that we need for Spring Security. So we're going to do private boolean. That's going to be account non expired. Okay, so we need to be able to load this user from the database and then use some of these values to create a, a user detail that we can pass to Spring Security so that Spring Security can do our authentication for us. And we need another private boolean. That's going to be account non locked. Another one for uh, enabled and oops, enabled and another one for MFA. You can come up with a better name. I like to use MFA. It's real simple, but you can say like is MFA or some other name. And then we're going to need to keep track of a secret that they're going to have with the QR code. So I'm going to say QR code secret. So this secret is what's going to be used and some other stuff to determine if the code that the user entered, the verification code, if it's correct. So we need to save this value in the database and this value is going to be recreated every time the user set their uh, multi-factor authentication because that's what we're going to use to, among other things, to do the comparison to determine if it's a correct uh, QR code or not. And then we need to set the image URL, so private string, well, not the email URL, but the QR code image URI. This is a URI, not a URL. So this is going to be the image that's going to be generated. And now we're going to show you the library that I'm using to work with these two fields. And then we're going to need to define private. Uh, I'm going to keep it as a string for now, but we're going to create a class for it. And we're going to say roles. I just don't want to forget. So I'm going to put it here. I can actually put a to do here. Old class and map here with JPA. So these are all of the fields that I want to have on the user. If you want more for your application or your specific requirements, then feel free to put more on here. But this is what I'm going with. So this is our user. So user ID, first name, last name, email, login attempts, last login, the phone, the bio, the image URL, account unlocked, account non expired, and enabled. And if it's using MFA, like if the user is using multi factor authentication, a QR code secret, and the QR code image URL and then the user roles. Now, if this was like a real, like a real, real world application, this would probably be at least like, like 30 because there's so many things that you have to keep track of whenever you have like a real world application. But this is quite some that we have here. My point is feel free to add more if you want more. If you want to track more so don't hesitate to uh, add more fields here so the next thing that i'm going to do is to add the annotation for gpa to manage this class for me and that's what we're going to be working on next so let's start adding some annotation so first i want to do uh, getter and setter so that we can have getters and setters i also want to have a two string method and also a builder pattern so we're going to say builder and then i want a no args constructor so no args constructor and then i want a all args constructor 
and then I want to have the entity annotation for JPA. So entity coming from the persistence API. And I want to change the name of this table. So I'm going to do at table also coming from the persistence. Give it a name and the name is going to be users. So that's the name of the table that I want. And then I want to ignore everything that's the default. So JSON, uh, JSON include is what I'm looking for. So JSON include. So whenever we deserialize and serialize this, we only want to include things that are non-default. So I'm going to do non-default. So if any of these values is the default, so whenever we're going to deserialize this, we're not going to include these values. So there's no reason. Sometimes you might want that so you can check for null, but in my case, I just don't want to see them at all. So here I'm going to do a static import for non-default. I'm going to scroll up and you can see it here. Okay. So now we have all of these for managing the actual class there's some more that I want to add for example the user ID I do want to enforce for that to be unique so I'm gonna say column and then I'm gonna pass it unique to be true uh, updatable to be false well unique is already true you can see it's grayed out because well updatable is supposed to be false that's what I meant and then unique is supposed to be true and then nullable is supposed to be false. So that's what I want. So this cannot be null. It cannot be the same. So not two users can have the same user ID and it cannot be updated. And then I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go down to the email. Remember the emails have to be unique. So I'm going to say unique is true. Nullable should be false, but unique is true. So the email cannot be null. We cannot have a user without an email. That's like our basic way of communication. And then I'm going to scroll down some more. So every time we deserialize this, when, when I say deserialize, meaning we load it up in the database and then we're going to send it over uh, as a JSON to the client. So whenever you take JSON and a request, you send it to the backend. You can say that's serializing. And then whenever the inverse happens, so whenever we get the data from the database, then it has to be deserialized because the format it is when it's uh, it's being grabbed in the database and the application is in a different format. So that's what serialize and deserialize means. Like you transfer the same data, but in different medium, like in different ways. It's the same data, but it's represented in a different way in the application. So serialize and deserialize. I mean, this can be used widely, but that's the idea. So whenever we're going to send a response back to the user, we don't want to send the QR code secret like ever. So I'm going to pass in JSON ignore. So whenever we grab this from the database and then we have it in the Java form and then we're going to send, let's say we're going to send a response with this as an object, then this is going to be ignored. We never want to send this code. And lastly, I want to update the column definition of the image URI. The reason that I want to do this is because the image URI is going to be a very long string because it's going to be in the base 64 encoded format and it's going to be a picture. So all of the bytes are going to be represented as a string. So it's going to be a very long string. So if you leave this as the default, which is just a string, because that's what we have to work with from a Java perspective, then JP is going to map this to a var char, which is 255 characters, but we want more than 255. So I have to define a different um, column definition. So I'm going to say column definition and say this is text. I think I can just do uppercase like this. Okay, so that's text, not a variable a character or varchar. All right, so that's all we have to do for this class for now. The only thing we have left is to map these roles because we have everything else that we want. We just need to give the user uh, their roles and that's going to happen here where we're going to define a class that's going to be the class representing the roles. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So the role class is going to be fairly simple. And also this is supposed to be named. Uh, let's refactor this. This is the user entity. OK, so that's the user entity because we're going to have a simple user class that's going to map some of these object fields into another object. That's what we're going to use for our DTO. So this is going to be the entity. This is never going to go to the uh, to the front end, but the user class that we're going to use that's going to map these values and some other stuff. That's what we're going to be sending. So we want to name this or I want to name this user entity. OK, so now let's create the role. So in the entity package, we're going to create another class and we're going to name it role entity. Okay. Because it's going to be managed by JPA collapse. Let's copy everything here and place it here. 
okay and we want to name this roles i want the roles because i'm naming these classes roles entities i don't want to have this in a database so i'm overriding this by using the add table annotation and then pass in roles or the name of the table that i want in a database and this is going to be fairly simple so we're going to have a private string that's going to be the name of the role like role underscore user or role underscore admin and then it's going to need to have authorities because the roles they are uh, linked with authorities so i'm just going to pass it in as a string for now but i'm going to define this as an enum and this is complaining because it doesn't have an id and we're defining entity here so we have to extend our auditable class so auditable there we go and that should take care of that so this is all we have to do for now for the role entity now we can go ahead and uh, import that in here so we're gonna scroll down a little more and instead of string we're gonna pass in the actual role so we're gonna say role entity that's gonna be the user role just gonna name it role and then remove all of this and now it's complaining because we have to do some mapping on here so we're gonna come down a little more and the first thing we want to do is to map this to mini to one meaning mini user can only have one role okay because the roles they carry their permissions and that's just a way that i'm choosing to do this if you want to do it another way you want to give them multiple roles then you can do that but my roles and permissions are going to be defined in a way that depending on your role that gives you a lot of permission and i will be able to access those permissions as well if i want to so if i want a high level control i can just use the role if i want very fine grained control then i'll use the permissions or authorities associated with that role so uh, and typically what you have if i can uh, give an illustration here let me put some more space so for a role so if i say role uh, that's going to be an umbrella so the role can have like um, read i'll put lowercase read update delayed or something right so uh, that's the role. So an example of that would be, for example, a user role. So if someone is a user, then maybe they have um, just uh, read, for example. And if someone, well, I'm going to put this on a no line and put a colon instead because I'm giving an example. And if some, well, I'm going to put to read and update. Okay, so that's the user. They have these two roles. You can put curly braces. Uh, if that makes more sense but just know that this is an umbrella and it represents some it has some values inside of it so let's do it like this paste oops control z uh all right i'll redo it again update uh no read and then update okay so that's the user role and then we can have admin and the admin is gonna have read update and then we're gonna give them some delete okay so and then you can keep going keep going keep going so what i want to have is to not only have the roles so if i don't care what the specific permission or authority is but i just care about the role then i can just use the role or if i want to have a specific permission that i want to check for then for example if i want to check for the delay then i can say go to the user role access the permissions and if they have the delayed permission then allow them to do something now you can see this is also uh, kind of generic because we don't know on what we have these permissions. Do I have permission to delete a user or a document or is it to delete a role in the application? So what I like to do, and this is just me, I like to have the entity or the thing that they have the permission on. So here I would do something like user and then a column and then read. But if you want, you can just do a dash or anything. And I like to keep it this way because I can clearly um, separate all of the different roles and the entity that they gonna operate on because I have this um, character here. I usually use a column just like that so you would have user for example and then you can have maybe user again and then another one you can have could be maybe document read so when you define it this way i know this user role they have this permission they can read the user they can update user and they can read document and whatever else you want to put and the same goes for here for example for the admin we're going to give them user read user update user delete 
but let's say they're just administrators they don't take part in the business so they don't have any business <laughs> They don't have any business reading some sensitive document because they're just do administrator stuff like make sure their computers of the employees are working and stuff like that so they have all of these big permissions however only a manager can have the delete so for example you can have uh, a manager and here you can say they have uh, maybe all the document so you can do document read document update document delete a document create and maybe you can give them a user update something like that okay so you can see how this is going to come into play that's exactly the approach that i'm taking and these are strings by the way uh, string that are separated by commas and then the entities and the action that they can do is separated by column that's just something that i came up with when i was building an application i didn't learn that in school i didn't see it in a book i didn't see anyone do it this way uh, it, i just was looking for a design and i decided to do it this way so if you have something better feel free to do it but that's just how i've been doing it well i've had different variations of the same thing but it's always been something similar to this okay so now what we want to do is to just finish the mapping so if we have the many to one but i also want to uh, define the fetch type so here we're gonna say fetch and we're gonna say eager because whenever we load a user, I want to load their role. So that's why I define this as eager. Now you have to be careful with this eager though, uh, if this collection is very large. In my case, I'm not gonna have more than like 10 roles or maybe 15 or 20. So that's not gonna be a big thing for the database to load. But if this is gonna be a very large collection, then you might wanna think twice about setting up the, uh, the fetch for eager. But for the role, that's just fine. And then I want to define a join table. So I'm going to say join table. So this is going to be interesting. Well, <laughs> I put it below. Yeah, it's going to go here. So join table. And what I want to do is I want to give it a name. So the join table will have a name of user underscore roles. And then I'm going to define a join column. So join column. And we're going to set this equal to at join column. And again, open and close parenthesis. And here we're going to give it a name of user ID ID. So that's the first column. And then we're going to say reference column. That's going to be the ID. OK, so what am I doing? This join table will create another table in between to map the user entity with the role entity and the database. So this third table is going to have the name of user roles. OK, so that we can clearly identify what this table is. And then I'm going to say from this class, which is the join column, I want the name of the column to be user ID. So when you have the join column and then you have at join column, that's for the class it's being defined on. So this name user ID and the reference ID is going to be for this class. So I'm referencing this ID of this class, which is coming from the parent class. So really this ID right here, but it's inheriting this ID from here. OK, so this class has an ID field, this which is coming from here. OK, because we have to map these with the primary key. So you might be wondering why we're not using user ID because we're inside of this class. Well, this class extends the auditable. So everything that exists in the auditable also exists here. So even if you don't see it, <laughs> that's how it works. It's extending it. And whenever I create an object for this, you will see that you will have access to the getters and setters for these values. OK, well, hopefully this is like computer science slash object oriented programming 101. So <laughs> maybe I'm going overboard with this, but that's what's happening here. So when you define the first join column like this and then you say join column, you're referencing the class you're on, which is this class. So in this class, we're going to get the ID and then we can set that as a column that's going to be user ID. OK, and the second column. So that's where we have the inverse. Well, I need to close this first. Oops, the go here and then close that off. So for the second one, so the inverse join column. So that's when you're talking about this. So we're going to have something similar. So then we're going to do join column. Copy that. And then we're going to say this is going to be the role ID. Role ID. OK, so let me put some more space so I can scroll up. So many to one. Okay, we already know what this is. 
many users can have one role. How do we know which is what when it comes to many to one or one to many? Where the first part, so many, is for the class this is n. So the many to one is inside of the user entity. So what that means is many users in one role. So many users can be mapped to one role. Okay. I used to have a lot of problem with this and that's the trick that I use. So the first part, so if this was one to many, so one would be, would be the user, many would be the role. But in our case, it's many to one. So when you're reading this, what class is it defining? It's defined inside of the user class. Okay, so the first part is for the user. So the many is the user. So many user to one is for what it's defined on. So one role. Okay, so that's the many to one. And that's what we want to have. And then we have a join table. We're going to give it a name of user roles. And then we're going to do join columns. And then we're going to say at join column. The name is going to be the first when you do at join column you're referencing the class it's on when you do inverse join column you're referencing the field that is defined on and join column is just how you do the definition but you have to pay attention to this join column and inverse join column so the inverse is already referencing the field and the first one the first join column is referencing the class it's on so in this case this user class so i'm saying we're going to have a table that's going to join these two tables the name is going to be user role and the first field or one of the fields or one of the tuple in a database that's the um, I guess one of the official names uh, for all of my database developers out there so the tuple is going to be the first one of the tuples is going to be user ID and it's referencing this ID when you do join column that means it's picking these values from this class when you do inverse join column it's picking it from the field it's defined on and I have too many of these I think all right, I know this error was killing you guys. So I'm gonna format this, uh, Control Alt L, yep, and then Control Alt O, uh, Control Shift O, nope. Okay, I don't know what it is. I have a new computer, so I still have to figure out uh, some of these things. Then I'm gonna move this closing over here just to remove this space. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. Uh, I know this can look a little scary, uh, but if you have any um, like basic understanding of database and join tables and foreign keys and things like that, then that will make like total sense. Just know that the join column is referring to this class and the inverse join column is referring to this field which is why i'm naming this role id because that's it's picking it, it's going to pick it up from here and the reference column is id because the primary key and the role entity is also named id which is coming from the auditable class which is name id so whatever the field name is that's the string you have to define um, in here so it's going to be id for both Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to remove this space. And if you guys have any questions about this, just let me know. But that's what we're doing. So this is going to create a third table with these definitions. So the next thing that I want to do is to define the enum to take care of this uh, and then define the roles. So that's what I'm going to be doing next. So let's go over to our package. I'm going to create a new one. And this one is going to be enumeration. So that's what we're going to put all of our enum and this is misspelled and then I'm going to create a new class and then I'm going to name it authority and I'm going to select enum and then that's going to be the enum authority so let's just go inside of the user role and just copy this and then we're going to change it here from a string to authority and make sure this is imported so that's going to be the authority for the user uh, role and let's go back to the authority so here i'm just going to define some enum so user that's going to take some value so i'm going to keep it empty for now but we're going to pass in some values in there and then i'm going to define maybe admin again it's going to take some values and then i'm going to do super underscore admin you can name these whatever you like. I don't know what kind of uh, roles that you're going to have in your application, but uh, this is totally up to you. And then manager and the manager is going to have some some value as well. So these values, they're like strings. So we should be able to have a way to get these strings. So to do this, I'm going to define a field here. So I'm going to say private final it's a string because I'm defining those as string and I'm gonna name it value and then I need a constructor I can do right and then generate and we can say constructor and I'm gonna select the value click OK so we have a constructor that just takes the value 
and then we can have a, a, a getter so we're going to say public it's going to return a string get value and then it's going to return the value this that value so we will just have a way to get the values inside of the parentheses so these strings that we're going to add here because this is going to be like the actual permissions and i'm going to show you how we're going to map this whenever we load it up from the database so it's all going to make perfect sense so now let's define what these values are going to be so i'm going to go here another package for our constant so i'm going to say constant press enter and then i'm going to just have a constant class so we're going to say constant Oh, uh, I don't have to put that Java. So in here, that's where we're going to define um, all of the different uh, permissions for all of the authority or all of the values for these authorities here. So for these users. So let's go back in here. So I'm just going to define some values. They're just very string. So uh, I don't want to type them out. So the first one that I'm going to use is a role prefix, which is going to be role underscore. And I'm going to talk about this a little later. And then we're going to have an authority delimiter. So the delimiter for all of these um, permissions and or authorities so that's the comma so that's little comma that you see here that's separating every single one of them and then i'm going to have the user authorities that's going to be these values and then admin authorities that's going to be these values and so on and so forth so it's up to you what you want to define those are but that's what i'm going to be using so now i can just copy this authority and then change it for the user so i'll paste it here and make sure i can import that and go here import and i'll do the same for the admin super admin and the manager so we're gonna go and copy admin authority replace it in here and we'll do the same for the super admin authority put it in here and lastly we'll do the manager authority copy that and then place it here so i'll show you how we're gonna get these values and it's a, a new pattern well i don't know if it's very new but it's something that you can do in spring so that you can map these values from some data coming from your database so that's all i need to do for the authority and i'll show you how we're going to map these values when we're going to be working with stuff in a database because as of right now we don't have a way to remove these values from here and we're going to need to do that whenever we're mapping things and then sending responses back to the front end or to any HTTP client that calls the, this server because otherwise it's just uh, it's just not going to work. So next we're going to see if we can define this converter for this because we want to have a way to convert these values from a database to the Java class or the enum and vice versa. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and create another uh, package, but this time I'm going to create this package inside of the enumeration package because it has to do with the converter for the enums. So I'm going to right click here and then we're going to say package and then I'm going to name it converter because we need to convert these values from database columns and vice versa. And then I'm going to create the converter class. So here we're going to say converter and then I'm going to say role converter and then press enter. And we need to implement a class. Uh, it's the attribute converter coming here from Java Persistence. And we need to give it the two pieces of information. So the authority, which is the enum, and we're going to convert them to string. And because we implement this uh, attribute converter, we need to implement these two methods. So convert to database column. So it's going to take whatever value we give it from, which we're going to get from the enum, we're going to convert them to database column. And then we're going to do the same when we want to do the inverse. So convert to entity attribute. And then we're going to say, okay, now we need to give an implementation for these. So I'm going to say if the authority, uh, I'm going to name this authority. So an appropriate name. So then go back down. So if the authority is null, right, then in this case, I can just return null. So I'll cut this and go up here and then paste. Otherwise, we're going to return the values from the authority. So we're going to say authority that get value, which is going to give us the string. And that's what we want because we want to return the string. OK, so hopefully this is simple enough and let's scroll down. So we're going to we convert to database column, which we're going to save just as strings. Now we need to do the inverse because now we know that we're saving a string inside of the database. So this value really it's going to be these values that we're going to be saving so why is this giving me a problem okay id is just being weird but yeah these uh where were we so we were in the converter so in here so we know that when we convert to database column 
its strings that we're passing because get value if I hover over it uh, right here it's returning a string okay so we're saving string so we know that we're getting string from the database but we need to map them back to authority right so here we're gonna get you can say the code maybe and what we want to do is to say if code is null equal null we want to return null so we're gonna do the same thing again cut this out and then paste it here otherwise we're going to return a stream of let's import the stream so stream from java util stream of and then we're going to get the authority so we're going to say authority that values so if you look at this the values you see that it's returning an array so i'm going to select that and since we're streaming then we can filter it so i'm going to see that filter we want to filter where these are equal so these authorities that we're going to get uh, from the authority values so it's an array we're going to see where they're equal so we're going to say authorities that get value so the same method that we just called equal uh i want to do equal the code and we want to say find first and then if we can't find it we're going to say oh, else throw and then we're going to say illegal oops okay it's an illegal argument because we're not able to find anything that could match this and i'm going to remove the space from the bottom and there's one last thing we need to do is to add the at converter annotation so we're going to say at converter coming from persistence and we can give it a value of autoplay equals to true so that just means that to automatically run this converter whenever we're loading this class from the database or whenever we're going to convert it into an actual or authority in this case which is an enum and i'm going to add a space here just because these are like two methods i like to have space between my methods but not between my fields if i'm defining some fields in the class like if you see here you can see i have no space after the class but if it's a method then i like to have a space just a preference but you can do whatever you want so whenever we're going to convert the uh this to database we're just going to get the string value that's what we're going to save and since we save string values in the database we're just going to map them back into authority where we the values match so whatever we save in this case that's going to be the get value so it's going to be for this when you call get value it's going to give you the value inside so it's going to be like this string right here and then when we need to convert it back we just say hey whatever code you have or whatever permissions the string permissions so this these long strings right here you just map through all of the authorities values which is going to give you an array of all those values and just match them where they're they're in. okay and then return the first one you have otherwise you want exception which is the illegal not illegal access i want the illegal argument exception this one okay all right so that's the converter that we need and we don't have to do anything else because we have the converter annotation and implementing this converter and we have this authority then spring will just run this code whenever uh, we're interacting with the database and vice versa so that's all we have to do for the converter so we're making a lot of progress so far in the course and hopefully you guys are learning a lot already and i'm gonna close everything here and see what we have let me expand this a little more so we have our constant our domain with the request context so far entities we have the role the user and the auditable and then we have the enum for the role so that's the authority and then we have the role converter you can name this permission as well uh, or whatever else makes sense in your case but that's where we are so far okay and then we have the exception as well so that's all we have for now so you notice that if we go back to the user entity and I'm gonna open this up. There is one piece of information that we don't have here. And I don't know if you guys spotted it or not, but you can see that we don't have any password, okay? So if we don't have any way to save the user password, then we can't really save a user. Or even if we save a user, then they won't be able to log in because we're gonna ask them for a password. And the reason for this is because the password is going to be its own class. So I'm not defining it here because it's gonna be uh, like a standalone class and then we're gonna work out the logic. So the next thing that I want to do, because so far we still can't save a user if we think about all of our requirements. So hopefully you guys are looking at all of this. So we know that we're gonna have to have an expiration 
on uh, after 90 days on the credentials so we need to have a separate class so that we can put maybe like a date in the credentials or something like that so we'll need to pass in the user id and the credential is an entity so it needs to extend this class as well so um, we need to work on that because the user cannot exist without the password that's their token that they're going to use to log in at a base level okay we can ask them for like a verification code and some other stuff at a very low level they need to have a password so that they can uh, put in and log. So they need to have like a whole credential class that we're going to use to do that. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to open the project again and we're going to go inside of the entity package because this is something that we're going to persist. And in here, I'm going to create the credential entity. So we're going to say credential entity and then I'm going to press enter. So we have the credential entity here and let's leverage some of the stuff we have in here i'm gonna copy everything and then go here paste and i'm gonna change the name of the table to just be credentials so i'm gonna copy this credentials so i need getters and setters and to string builder no args constructor or args constructor entity and then table and then only include non-default values so and then here I'm going to extend the auditable again so auditable and let me make more room so I can scroll up okay so we need to have the actual password which we will represent as a string as you would imagine so that's the password so that's the password and then we need to have the user that this entire credential is associated with so here we're going to say private and that's going to be the user entity and we're going to give it the user entity name and the other thing that i need is a constructor that's just a constructor that i'm want to use and we're going to give it the user entity so we're going to say user entity user entity and then we're going to take the password okay and then here we're going to say this that user entity equals and then do the same for the password password okay so we can use this constructor to initiate uh, an instance of this class and now we need to add some annotation because we have a foreign class in here and this is an entity so we need to tell gp what to do with this so this is going to be a 101 because we cannot have one user have multiple passwords or multiple credentials so it's going to be a one to a one so this one right here and then we can say for this we want the target entity to be the user entity that class hopefully i didn't import this yep i don't want this catalina user so the target entity for this one-to-one -one mapping is the user entity class and then we want to say fetch eager and let's uh, statically import this so the target entity is the user entity class we're gonna fetch this eager meaning whenever we load this from the database it's also gonna load uh, or the user associated with the credentials because we need to do some comparison and stuff like that so whenever we load the credential we need the user and then i'm gonna define a join column so join column second one nullable is gonna be false and i want to give it a name maybe the name should come first so name is going to be user underscore id okay so this join column is going to have a name of id inside of this table that's going to be created for this class which is going to be the credential so the user id is going to be there along with the password instead of the entire user in any other form so we just want to have the user id because you know we're doing um, foreign key mapping. So the user ID is going to be the name of the column that's going to reference the user associated with this credential. You cannot be null. So nullable is false. Then I'm going to have on delete, which is coming from Hibernate. And then I want to see action. I want on delete action to cascade. So if you guys have any uh, knowledge of databases, whenever you have a foreign key, you set that if it's deleted, then you also delete the record associated with that foreign key. So that's uh, how you do this in uh, annotation wise. And then I want to pass, uh, let's say JSON, uh, let's do JSON identity info and then pass in a generator. This is going to be object generator, uh, object generators. So this one right here, that property generator, that class, and we want the property to be the ID. Okay, so the ID of this class, it's going to be the 
property generator for this field and the database and we want the uh, let's do json identity reference and we want this to be as an id so as always id set that to true so it's always going to make sure that this is an id and nothing else and then lastly we can pass in a json property and that's going to be user id so that's how we want to see it when it's uh, deserialized and i already explained serialization uh, to you guys okay so that's all we're going to have to do for this and now this credential is associated with a user so every time we're going to save a new credential we need to give it a user so hopefully this wasn't too bad to understand and if you have any notion of databases so i'm pretty sure this is like super easy for uh, a lot of people but again if you have questions just go inside and then see what the documentation say or you can just reach out to me on discord and ask me uh, any questions that you have about this but just know that we're just going to have a table in a database it's going to have a name of credential and it's going to have two fields or two columns one is going to be the password the other one is going to be the user id which is going to reference this user id on this column. and if the user id or the user is deleted in the database then this record for and the credentials is will also be deleted that's uh, what this is doing and everything else you already know we're gonna load the user whenever we load a credential uh, the target class is this user entity class so this one right here this is the name of the column in the database and it can be null and this is the property that we're using to identify what this id is going to be inside of the user class and we know that's just name id and we want it to be referenced always as an id so we set this to true and whenever we're serializing or deserializing this using Jackson. Uh, Jackson is like the default library. Like if I hover over this uh, somewhere here, so you can see the so Jackson that's used to do, among other things, a lot of the serialization. So we just say we want this to be referenced to as an ID, which is what we're defining here. Okay. I'm not saying these two are related though. We just want to say, hey, this is the key that we want to see. So that's all we have to do for the credential. I don't think we're missing anything else. So now we can represent this whole class as the credential for the user and we can check for so many different things. And we can add more fields if we wanted to, uh, like, you know, expiration date or uh, grace period or something like that. And we would update them accordingly in the application. So the next thing we're going to need <coughs> is going to be the confirmation because whenever someone creates a new account, we need to create some kind of a token or a key or something. And then we're going to save it in the database. We're going to send them an email with a key in the, in the link that we're going to send them in the password. So we need to have a way to manage that as well. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's go ahead and create the confirmation. So I'm going to open up, right click, and we're going to do a new class and that's going to be confirmation entity press enter so this is going to be very similar to the credential entity so i'm going to actually copy everything here and then paste it here so the confirmation entity is going to extend auditable because we're going to be saving it in the database and uh i don't think you know let me scroll up a little let's go and grab these as well so copy and then paste i'm going to change the name to confirmations i like table names in plural so if you don't like that you can name them whatever you like so it's going to be confirmation and i'm going to change this to a key so we just need a key you can name this a uh, token or something it's just going to be a uuid that we're going to generate and then send it to the user and then uh, create our logic with it. And everything else is the same because we need to reference the user. So all of this is gonna stay. Also gonna be a one-to-one -one because one user can only have one confirmation at a time. So we're gonna have it like this. And then I'm gonna rename this uh, constructor. In this case, we don't need to get the key because we're gonna generate it for them. So they're not gonna give us the key that they should use. So here we're gonna say the key in this case is gonna be the UUID coming from Java util that random that and we want to do the string. So whenever we create a new instance of this confirmation, we just need to give the user entity and it's gonna generate the key, save that, and the reference for this specific key is gonna be the user ID that's gonna be in our uh, database. So hopefully this makes sense. It's literally the same thing that we just did here except we're taking a password here but in this case we're taking we're, we're not taking the key because we're gonna generate it on the fly as a uuid okay so at this point we almost have everything we need 
to create a new user because we have a confirmation we have their credentials and then we have the actual user and the user has uh, the role where well, we need to populate some of this information and we're going to do that when we're going to test but we're almost ready to be able to put everything together so that we can create uh, a new user so what do we need to do next well we know that whenever someone creates a new account we need to send them an email and they need to confirm this email so that they can activate their account otherwise they won't be able to log in so in this case then we need to have an email service so that we can send the email to the user whenever we uh, create a new account for them and then send them the link so that they can click on it and then activate their account so that they can log in so let's go ahead and see if we can put the email service together so that we can just use it whenever we're going to create a new user. So let's go ahead and do that next. So I'm going to close everything here just so that we can clean things up a little and collapse the entity package. And then I'm going to create another package. This time I'm going to call it service. Press enter. So the first service we're going to be creating is the email service. So we're going to say email service. Press enter. This is going to be an interface because it's the definition, not the implementation. And I'm gonna collapse this. And here we're gonna have to have a function or a method that's gonna say send new account email. And what are we gonna need? Well, we're gonna need the name of the user. We're gonna need their email. So we're gonna say two. You can name it email. And then the token. You can name this key too if you wanted. And I'm gonna do control D to duplicate this and then rename this function or method. So send uh, password reset email. And it's going to take the same thing. So we have two methods that we can implement for this email service. One to send a new account email and another one to send a password reset email. And they take the same parameters. So let's see if we can give an implementation for this. So instead of the same service, I'm going to create another package for their implementation. So IMPL. And in here, we're going to create the email service implementation. So email service IMPL. And we need to implement email service and give an implementation for each method, which is just two methods. All right, so here we are. Now, what we need to do is to make sure that this is a bin because we're gonna need to inject it in other classes. So an appropriate annotation to do this is the service annotation and required args constructor. So we're gonna say required args constructor. And then I'm gonna use the Java mail sender. So we're gonna say private final java mail sender and then we're gonna say uh, maybe name it just sender okay so we don't have the java mail so we need to add that dependency in our pom file and this dependency is coming from spring framework mail uh, mail sender so let's open up the pom file you can press shift three times and then search for files or anything for that matter okay so now we inside of the pom file and i'm just gonna copy this dependency and instead of validation, we're going to say mail. So spring, uh, spring framework boot and then spring boot starter mail. That's going to give us this dependency. Remove these spaces. We're going to uncomment these, by the way, but it's just not time yet. So we keep them commented out. And let's click on this icon to reload and install the dependencies for this. Let's go back and now we should be able to import that cloud. So this is the sender that we're injecting here by passing in the required arcs constructor doing our dependency injection. And I need two more pieces of information. So I'm going to say private. That's going to be a string host. So I'm going to show you why I'm using this. And then we need private another string from email. So this is going to be the um, like when I'm generating the link, I need to know what my environment is because I'm not going to always use localhost or some static IP address. I need this to come from um, like a properties file or something like that so that I can change it on the fly. So for this, we need to read it as a value. So we're going to say at value, value coming from spring. And this is going to be the email host. So for this, I'm going to do dollar sign open and close curly braces. I'm going to define spring that mail that uh, verify that host. I'm going to copy this, put it on the front email. And I'm going to change it to spring mail and username. 
so that we can use this whenever we're gonna send the email. So maybe now it's not making a lot of sense because we haven't defined any uh, properties files or anything like that, but you're gonna see what I mean by that because we're gonna set those environment variables. Now I'm gonna scroll down a little more and for the send new account email, I'm just gonna have a try catch. So try, I'm not trying with resource, but catch any exception. So what we're going to do in the try um, we want to get a simple mail server. I mean, not mail server, simple mail message. That's going to be the message equal new simple mail message. And then we want to uh, set the subject. So we're going to say message that set subject. And the subject is going to come from, uh, let's say, uh, new underscore user underscore account underscore very fee. Okay, shun. I'm gonna turn this into an enum. Well, not an enum, uh, constant. So I'm gonna right click a refactor, uh, extra introduce uh, constant right here. So that's gonna be the name, new user account verification. And then that's when we're gonna set the value to new user account verification. So that's the title of the email or the subject of the email. And then we can have message that um, set from that's going to be the from email. Also, I'm keeping this external so we can pass it in a properties file in case we change our uh, mail configuration so that we don't have to come in and change the code. We can just update the configuration. And then we're going to say message that to or set to. That's going to be the to or the email. Um, thinking about this, I'm going to rename this. It makes more sense to name this email, but it would also make sense to set to and then pass in to. <laughs> but I guess email is better. Uh, let's go to the service and update that as well and update that in there. Okay, so we get the email set set to like we were sending the message to. That's this email address that we're going to get from this method. And then we need to set the message body that you do with set text. This takes a string. I'm going to create a method called get email message. And we're going to give it these uh, pieces of information. So the name, the host, and the token. We need to create this method, by the way. And then we're going to send it. So we're going to call the sender that send and pass in the message. And if we have any exception, we can probably log this exception. So at S L F for J for some logging um, API. And I'm going to say log that error exception that get message and nope, the localized message. And then we can just throw Usually you don't throw exception when you're trying to send an email because you usually don't want to disrupt your application like that whenever there is an uh, like a like an email didn't get sent. So you would probably wait for something not to come through or your customers to say, hey, I did this, I didn't get anything. And then you would say, hey, maybe you can do it again. And then maybe there was a problem with the mail server. And then the next time around it works. So you don't you usually don't want to throw an exception for that, but I'm going to do it. But I just wanted to tell you that you usually don't want to do this. Also, I'm throwing the new API extension, but I mean exception, but I don't want to do that because later when I'm doing exception handling, I'm going to pass over all of this exception coming from this type. And this is going to reveal information about the inner workings of the application. If I just pass in this message, unless I pass a custom message here, then it's okay. Uh, I guess I can do that unable to send email. If you pass in the actual message, that could be a problem because then you're going to reveal some sensitive information about your uh, API and you know what kind of technology you're using underneath. So you usually don't want to, well, given that, that I'm going to catch all of these exceptions and throw them to the front end, I don't want to show the error that happens when we try to send this email, unless it's something like this, like something innocent uh, that can't harm you, unable to send email and they don't know anything else. And we're logging it so we can go and take a look in our logs if we wanted to investigate it. And we're going to do almost the same thing down below. So I'm going to copy everything here, remove this space and paste, remove this space and remove this. But here we're going to say um, get reset password message. There are other ways you can do this. Like you can take another parameter here and use the same method and you use a if statement if 
you know, this is for a new account, then you call this. Otherwise, you call this method. You didn't have to separate them like this, but I'm just going to keep it this way, right? I've seen this before, like in applications that I've worked on, and sometimes they have multiple emails here. So I think it's okay. It's no big deal. But if you want to be more, um, if you want to be fancier, you can come up with a different way because you can see a lot of this is repeated uh, and it's really just doing the same thing. The only difference is this and the uh, title that we need to change. So here I'm going to say password underscore reset underscore request. And then we're going to do the same. Turn this into a constant. That's fine. And then we're going to change this to reset password request as the title of the email and these are public they're supposed to be private so private private all right so let's scroll down next thing we have to do is to make sure that these are async because we don't want to wait for the email to be sent to uh, send the response back to the user so we need to make these uh, async so i'm going to come down here and see um at async it's supposed to come from spring copy this and paste it here what this is going to do is just going to run this in a separate thread whenever we call it so we don't have to wait for this to finish so that the execution of the main thread can continue since this will be run in a separate thread so as far as this class goes it's pretty much done we just need to make sure that we can um, send these emails and change this to var by the way so that's what we have to do we have to make sure that we can define these uh, methods now and they're like utility uh, methods so we're going to define them very quickly so these two right here well everything else in this class should be okay and then whenever we define the properties in our properties file, then we're going to define these two values. So next, we're going to take care of these two methods. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's go ahead and create another package for our utility classes. So here we're going to say new package. I'm going to name it utils. Okay, I'm going to collapse this service. And the util, we're going to create a new class. We're going to name it email utils. And let's collapse. And also, let's just copy this. Uh, I'm going to copy the whole signature and then come down here. We're gonna do public static. This is gonna return a string, pass in the name, and then we need to say this is gonna be a string, another string, and another string here. And for this method, we're gonna say return, and this is gonna be a string. So we're gonna say hello, and then pass in the name. So we're gonna say plus name. So whoever it is, we're gonna say hello. And then we want to put to new line so we're going to say another string and then backslash n for a new line you can see how blue it is that means it's being interpreted in a different way which is a new line i'm going to put a comma here so it's going to be like hello so and so and then a comma and then two new line and then we're going to continue so we don't need this space here so we're going to say your um, new account has been created so your new account has been created. Please click on the link below to verify your account. And then I'm gonna put a dot and then I'm gonna put two new lines. So backslash N and then backslash N. So that's two new lines. I didn't even have to put that space here. I could just leave it like that. It would still work. It's just gonna be interpreted as two new lines. And then I want to uh, call another method that I'm gonna call get verification verification URL and then we're gonna give it the host and we're gonna give it the token and then after that we're gonna say uh, two new lines so back to string a new line another new line and we're gonna say the support uh, Tim so that's gonna put two new lines and then say the support team. And then we're gonna go ahead and create this method, create method. I'm gonna keep it public. I might need to use it outside of this util. So what we're going to do here is to just say return and then we're gonna say the host. So whatever the host they give us, and then we're gonna pass in slash. So whatever the host slash verify slash account. And then we're gonna say question mark token equal and then pass in the token. So here we're gonna say plus token. Okay, so you can do this in many different ways. And the first thing you notice is that I'm using just a simple mail message. So we cannot have a rich message with like pictures and stuff like that. It's just gonna be text. So that's gonna do it for this course. But if you want, I have a whole course on sending emails and I show how to send different emails, you know, emails with uh, attachment, embedded pictures and stuff like that. So I'm just keeping it simple in this case but if you want to know how to send more advanced email then you can check out this course anyway so let's import this so now we have this imported 
and we know what it's doing. It's taking the name, the host, and the token, and all it's doing is concatenate all of this so that it can give us a string. And we're gonna be creating this endpoint in our controller because whenever they uh, click, well, to begin with, we're gonna be creating the endpoint in our controller. But later, when we have the React application, we're gonna have to pass in the React application uh, base as the host because they have to go to the front end and then we can show them the loading animation and stuff like that and then verify the token. So when we're testing, we're gonna use like uh, the same server as the host because we're gonna be testing with Postman. And as we move on to the front end, then we're gonna have to change that host, which is why I'm passing it in as a value coming from a properties file so that I can update it easily. Or you can put it in a constant as well. So you just update it in one place, but I would prefer to put it in a properties file. And now we just have to define the other one. So I'm just gonna copy this one and then paste it. And I'm gonna change the name. So we know we're looking for this one. They take the same signature, three strings. So we can just change the name. Signature is the same. And let's just import this. I'm tired of looking at this error. Okay. And I'm just going to ignore this for now. It's saying that it cannot auto wire this bin, but I know this is a lie because it should be fine. The ID is just not picking this up yet. So let's go back here. And what we're going to do, we're going to create another one for this as well. And this is going to go to password. So we're going to change this to password. Again, you can see that a very small change is different for this one. So um, reset password, copy and paste it here. So if you want to create an if statement with a switch and all that fancy stuff, feel free to do that. But I'm just going to keep it like this for this course. So the host slash verify slash account for the first one. And then this is going to be host slash verify slash password and then the token and the URL. So that's going to be the URL part of the email for both of these. Let's click on this problem and it should be gone. So it's still showing here, but we know that we fixed those problems. So we should be okay. So we're pretty much done with the email service implementation and that will work as long as we have the other email configuration. And as of right now, we don't have anything in our configuration file. So if I expand the resource in this properties file, there's nothing there. So it's not going to work. So we're not ready yet to actually test this out, but we're making tremendous uh, progress on this. So the next thing that I want to do is to create a way to call these uh, methods so that I can send different uh, emails to the user. And to do this, I'm just going to use uh, like an event, like an event in Spring, so that whenever someone uh, is creating a new account, I can just fire the event and it will send the email. That's a very common use of uh, event in a Spring environment. And that's the approach that I'm going to take in this course. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's go ahead and see if we can take care of creating these events so that we can fire them whenever we want to send an email. So let's close everything and let's go back. The first thing I want to do is to go to our uh, enums and then I'm going to create a new enum class. So I'm going to say class and this is going to be like the event type so that I can identify the different events that are being fired. That's going to be an enum. And I want to have just two. So one is going to be registration. So whenever the user register, uh, register with us and one is reset password. That's it. So one for registration, one for reset password. And if we need more, we can come back here and put more. But for now, these two should be should be enough. Let's close that off and collapse this. Now I'm going to create another file and this is going to be user lowercase user event. Okay. And the user event is going to have uh, getter is going to have sitter and an all args constructor. Okay. Collapse this. So what are we going to need for this user event whenever we fire it? So we're going to have a private user um, entity. So user entity. That's going to be the user. And then we're going to pass in the private uh, event type. So event type, we're going to say this is the type. And then we're going to have another private map of anything. And we're going to say this is going to be the data. So whenever we fire an event, we can pass in some data if we want to optionally pass in some data. If we don't have any data, we don't have to pass anything. But whenever we fire a new user event, we have to give the user the type of the event and any data associated with that event so that we can properly handle um, the event that is fired. And then uh, since we have the event, we need to have a listener. So I see that the event is at the base uh, package. So I'm going to create another package, just call it event and then move this here inside of it actor. So now this class user event is inside of the event package. And inside of that same package, I'm going to create another package called listener. 
so the listener of this event and then in here we're going to create a new class and you probably guessed the name so user event listener press enter so let's work on this right now so we need this to be registered as a bin so we're going to say it's a component and we're going to say required uh, args constructor and after that we need the email service so we're going to say private final email service that's the email service okay i'm going to scroll up some more by putting more space at the bottom like that and then we're going to have a simple method which is going to be the event listener and then here we're going to say public void on user event so whenever the user event is fired we know that we're going to get a user event so that's the event and then now we just need to know which one it is and then call the appropriate method so we're going to have a switch which is going to take the event that type because it's an enum and then we can do different things depending on what happens so for the case of registration we're going to say email service that send a new account email because it's a registration and then we're going to say the event that get user which is going to give us the user entity get first name because we need the first name then we need the email so event that get user that get email and then lastly we need to send the data in this case we need to pass in the key so we're gonna say it's gonna be uh, the event that get data it's a map so we're gonna say get passing the key so we're gonna say key and that's gonna give us an object um, we're just gonna make sure that whenever we're passing in a registration event we pass in this map with this key that's gonna contain the token so then in this case we can just say this is gonna be a string just like that and for the other case we're gonna say case when it's reset password we're gonna do something similar but you know we're gonna call the this one and I'm just gonna copy everything in there so that I don't have to retype all that paste we're still gonna get a key all right so that's all we have to do and another thing is um, just for safety I guess you can say you can say default and do that that's it. so in case it's none of these then it's not gonna do anything because it's always good to have a default so this is going to be what we're gonna have for the user event listener so now we can fire any new user event like this guy right here by using the event publisher in spring and it will just fire this function and pass in the user. There used to be a different way that you you were able to do this by like implementing or extending some other event class, but you don't have to do that anymore. And I'm gonna show you how we're gonna call this method like indirectly. We're never gonna actually call this on user event. We're just gonna call it indirectly by just publishing this user event. So at this point, we almost have everything we need to create the user in terms of just um, the Java code. I think we have everything we need. Now we need to pass in the configuration for our database because whenever we run the application, we need to pass in this uh, information because we have these entities, right? And then we're gonna need to have some GP configuration so that Spring knows where to go look for our configuration and then create the data source for us. Otherwise, all of these classes are gonna fail and they won't be created. So we need to pass in the database configuration for that. So the next thing that we need to do is to work on the configuration for our data source, because otherwise, like I just said, we won't be able to test anything because we haven't created any database connectivity configuration or anything like that. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So like I mentioned in the beginning of the course, we're going to be using PostgreSQL as our database. So all of our data is going to be saved in this relational database management system. And I'm going to be using PG admin to give me a UI interface so that I can interact with the SQL server. So if you already have PostgreSQL installed on your computer, you should be good to go. We don't have to have like the latest version or anything. So if you have like maybe like a slightly older version that you already had installed on your computer, then you should be good to go. And you can use any UI interface that you like to interact with the Postgres server, or you can install PG admin. But in any case, you don't have to do any of that. If you want to use a different database, if you already have some setup for PostgreSQL with some other UI so that you can interface with the server then that should be just fine another thing that I wanted to talk about is how we want to have these things on our computer right so I would always encourage you guys to use Docker and get an instance of these servers so that you don't have to download stuff on your computer and that's also gonna give you experience working with Docker because it's a really important software that you probably should know so in my case I'm gonna be using Docker so that I can create a Postgre 
SQL Server and then also use Docker to get an instance of PG Admin. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to do um, both of these things without having to install anything on your computer. Now, that's not a bad thing. Like, it's fine if you want to install something on your computer. For decades, that's what all the developers were doing. You just install whatever software you want on your computer. But since we have another way that we can do this, then let's just do it that way because you don't have to install something if you don't want it. And also you get practice uh, with Docker. So I'm going to open my terminal and I'm going to maybe move this away and I'm going to make this full screen. Then I'm going to go back to my home directory and don't worry about what my terminal looks like because I have a whole setup with Tmux, as you can see that I'm using here and I'm using Alacrity. And also I'm using Vim and this is like highly customized. Like I spent a lot of time on this setup. So whatever terminal that you're using, uh, you can just use that. But don't worry about what you are seeing, like this system here and these things at the bottom here. Just don't worry about what you see here. Go ahead and rename this. So I'm going to name it terminal. And if you guys don't know, the Tmux is just like a multiplexer for terminal. So it allows me to manage the different uh, terminals that I have open. For example, if I need another terminal, I can just do that. Then I have another one right here. So that's what it is. You can just quickly Google it, but it's, it's not important for this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to create a, a compose file that's going to get me both Postgre and also an instance of PG admin so that I can run the Docker container. So what I'm going to do is to just do code. So whatever file name that I'm going to put, it's going to open Visual Studio code with that file name. And I want to call it just compose.yml. So before it used to be called, um, well, you can name it whatever you want, but it used to be Docker Compose because Docker Compose was separate from Docker. But now Docker Compose is part of Docker. I'm going to have this Compose file, so for a Docker Compose file, and I'm going to press Enter. And that's going to open Visual Studio Code with this file. And I'm using Visual Studio Code because it's going to give me a nicer syntax. So the first thing we have to do is to define a service or a list of services. And for each service, we're going to define the name. So in this case, it's going to be Postgre, uh, Postgres actually uh, database. So I'm going to say DB. So that's the name of the first service. And then the second service, I'm going to put another space here. It's going to be PG, PG admin. And then we're going to define what these two services need. So for the first one, which is the database, I'm going to say the container underscore name. So the name of the container, whenever I run this container, is going to be Postgres container. So that's going to be the name of the container. And then I want the image, like what image this container needs to uh, fetch so that we can have an instance of whatever we want to run as a container. In this case, it's going to be Postgres. And we're going to get back to the version later. But for now, I'm going to say latest. Now, you should never use latest whenever you're building an image, unless it's your own thing, like you're building your own image, then you always want to get the latest. But if it's something that you're not maintaining, like it's an image you're not maintaining, then it's a bad idea to use latest because you want your app to work with a specific version and you, you want to specify this version in there so that if they have a new version that came out, or multiple newer versions that came out and maybe they have breaking changes, then your app will never break because you're always going to run this specific version. So we're going to Google what the latest version is as of the recording of the video. And then we're going to plug that version instead of latest, but let's just keep going. So now that we have the image, we want to specify a uh, restart and I want to say always. So every time I turn off my computer, I turn it back on, it will just rerun these containers. So I don't have to run them again. And then we need to pass in environments or environment in this case. So these environments, they're like predefined for this specific image. And it's a way for them to give you access to set a user, a database and a password and some of the things that you will definitely need if you were to install this on your computer. So if I was installing this at some point during the installation, it will ask me to specify a, like a root user and a password for that root user. So that's what we have to define here. So in here, I'm going to say post uh, underscore user. That's going to allow me to define a user. So what I'm going to do is to use a different uh, syntax here. So what we want to do is to use a user from a different file. So if you wanted, you can just say something like, you know, uh, John or lowercase John, right? So you can just define John like this if you want it. But I'm going to use an external environment file and we're just going to plug in those values in here. And then I'm going to copy this and go down and paste it. This time we want to have a database. So we're going to say DB db like that. That's just the name of the environment variable that this image is expecting so that it can just set these values for you because whoever created this image, they knew that you're going to need these values. So we're going to pass in this key 
for a value in a properties file. So you're going to see that all coming together in a minute. And then you need a password. So you're going to say Postgres password. And then I'm going to do the same thing again. So I'm going to put dollar sign, open and close, copy that, paste it in here. And that's pretty much everything we need to pass in in terms of environment variable. So we're done with environment. So I'm going to went back to define another key value pair because you can see everything here is under environment. But now I'm done with environment. I'm, I'm I backspace once and then I'm going to pass in uh, more key value pairs. So here I wanted to expose a port. So I'm going to say expose and this takes an array and you can define an array with a dash and then I want the default port 5432 for PostgreSQL. And then I want to map this port. So I'm going to say ports. That's how you do port mapping. And then I'm going to say we want to map this port from the computer to the same port on the Docker container. So we're going to say 5432 and then a colon 5432. So the same. And then really important is I want to define some volume. So volume is also an array. So I'm going to say dash. So the volume, you can give it any name you want. So I'm going to say Postgres volume. I'm just going to define it like that. And then you put a colon and then you put the location inside of the container. In this case, that's going to be var lib and then Postgres QL forward slash data. So this information is on the official image. Like if you go onto Docker or Docker Hub to be specific, and then you search how to define a volume. So you have to point your volume from your local computer to this specific location. And that way, whenever you stop your container or you destroy the container, if you create another container and then you point it to the same volume, volume is just like how you save data because containers are very ephemeral. They don't leave for a long time and they can be destroyed at any given moment. So you want to save your data then Docker is going to do that for you as long as you provide it a volume. So we want to run some containers and we're going to use a Docker compose file. So I'm creating this compose.yaml file. The way you do this is by defining a bunch of services. So I have services here and then I have a first one, which is the PostgreSQL database. So Postgres DB. I have another one, which is the PG admin. We haven't done that yet. We're going to do that soon. So for the Postgres database, I want the container name to be Postgres container. I want the image to be Postgres. We're going to change the version in a minute because we want specific version. I want to restore start this container or start the container if I turn off my computer and then I turn it back on. Docker is going to automatically run this container. And then we're passing in some environment variable because we need to define a default user and a default database and a default password. And the way you do this is by passing Postgres user. And then we're going to read this value from properties. So that's what this syntax means, the dollar sign open and close. That means there is a file that you're going to pass that's going to have this value or this key with a value associated with it. So Docker is going to read the value and then plug it in here. So it's a little bit of a security feature so that you don't pass in plain text in here. And then we do the same for the database. So we're going to pass in a default database name and then also a default password. I'm going to move this up because it makes more sense if we put it up here makes more sense, right? User password and then the database. And then we're going to expose port 5432 um, from inside of the container. And then we will map this port on the same port on the computer. So on the computer, if I go to port 5432, it's going to point me to port 5432 on the database or the instance, which is the default port. And then we want to mount a volume so that if our container is destroyed and then we rerun another container with the same volume, then we will have our data. Our data will not be gone. And the way you do this is by specifying a folder or a location on the computer. So the colon is what separates your computer from inside of the container. And according to the documentation on the official image page on Docker Hub for PostgreSQL, you have to point it to var lib PostgreSQL data. So we're not really doing anything cryptic here. Everything is very clear to understand. And another thing we can do, so say like you have a script file, like an SQL file, and you would like to run it. So for example, let's say I had a schema uh, that SQL file, for example, and I wanted to run this file on this specific database. So the one that I'm defining here, whenever we run this container. So I could do something like this. So I could do in this specific directory, wherever I'm running this file, look for a schema that SQL file. And then we want to run this on Docker dash entry point dash init db dot d and then for slash schema that SQL. So we can uh, like give it the same name, but that's why you have to point anything that you want to run. Say I wanted to run another one, so I would do something like, let's say, control D, user. So let's say I had another script for user, and I wanted to run this script whenever we start this instance, then I would say, well, go to the current directory, look for a file named user.sql, and then 
you point it to this specific location and then you give it some name that is different from everything else that you already used and then you will run this script and then you will have the result of running this script inside of this database so let's say we wanted to create some tables and stuff like that on this specific database then that would happen here so that's all we have to do for this i'm going to remove one of them i think i have a schema file that i might want to use but in any case i'm just giving myself this option here in case i want to run something at startup then i can just name the file schema.sql put it in the same folder and then run the doc or run this file or run this compose file so that Docker can read this and then run the query automatically whenever this is starting inside of this database. So hopefully all of this is making sense. Next thing we're going to define is the PG admin. So it's going to be something similar. We're going to define all of these values, but this time for a PG admin. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's do the one for PG admin, which is going to be the UI that we're going to use to connect to this database. You don't have to do this if you just want to use the command line you can do that like if you have the client the postgre command line client you can just do that but you know having a ui is nice so what i'm going to do is just copy everything here we're going to change the values and then paste and then i'm going to scroll up too much so the container name is going to be pg admin container so i'm going to copy this and then change it here so pg admin container is going to be the container name the image is going to be the page slash oops, slash and then pg admin for this one i'm going to keep latest pg admin 4 by the way I'm going to keep the latest because whatever the latest is, that's what I want to have. In this case, it's not going to hurt anything because it's a UI that's going to connect me to an instance or a PostgreSQL server. So whatever the latest is, then I'm fine taking that. So container name is PG, oh, too many P's, PG admin container. And then the image is D page. So no L. So D page slash PG admin four. And then we want to grab the latest and then restart is also going to be always so every time we start our computer just start this container and also the port we're going to expose is 6000 and i'm going to map this port to 7000 so what am i doing i'm exposing port 6000 and then i'm mapping 6000 from inside the container to my computer 7000 so whenever i run this pg admin i have to go to my local host and then go to 7000 then it's going to take me to inside of this container or to the instance of PG admin running. And then for the volume, I'm only going to define one. And this is going to be PG admin. I'm going to copy this just to keep it very consistent. So I'm going to say PG admin volume and this go to var lib and then PG admin. So we can just change this PG admin. And then we need to change some of the environment variables. So we're going to say well, all of them needs to be changed. So I'm going to say PG admin and then you want to say underscore default underscore email so that's the email that you're going to use to log in so i'm going to pass this in here i'm just going to get rid of the default so it's going to be pg admin email and then i want the let's copy this paste it here we want the default password well i'm going to do Control z and then paste it like this minimize retyping so pg admin default password we're going to pass in the same. So copy the beginning and then change it just for the beginning. So PG admin password coming from our environment file. And the 6000 is where we define it. So to do this, you do PG admin underscore default underscore address. So you can either pass in a hard coded value here, or you can also take it from a property variable. In this case, I don't care. So I'm going to say it's 6000, which is the same one that I'm exposing and then eventually mapping from the computer to the container. And then we want to say the same thing. So PG admin and then listen underscore port. And then we're going to say 6000. OK, so that's all we have to do for PG admin. And if I scroll up a little more, you can see that this is very similar. And I'm going to show you where all of this information is coming from, by the way. So I'm going to collapse this. So we have a, an instance of PostgreSQL also an instance of PG admin. So container name, PG admin container. The image is the page slash PG admin four. And then we want to grab the latest. We started always, and then we pass in PG admin default email. So that's the email we're going to use to log in. PG admin default password, the password we're going to use to log in. And then we're exposing this port, which we're also mapping. And then we have a volume. So the last thing we have to do is to define these two volumes. So I'm going to put two more spaces and then I'm going to say volumes. And then we need to define these two keys. So we're going to say this one and also this. 
value right here. Okay, so we have to define the volumes like that. So let me scroll up a little more. So everything looks good. I don't think we made any mistakes or anything. Also, we didn't have to define any volume for this because this is a default one. But this one is something we're defining like this one and this one then we have to specify them at the bottom like this. Okay, so everything looks good. Now I do want to show you where you can find uh, this information. You probably already know, but I'll show you anyway. So I'm gonna bring back the browser and then I'm just gonna search for the Docker Hub. I'm gonna paste the URL, I'm gonna zoom in a little. And you can just search, for example, I can search for PG admin. And this is the one, so the page admin. So this is the one that we're gonna use. It's just gonna give us an instance of PG admin. Or if you want, you can use a different provider. Like you can just search for someone else. So if I just put PG admin, you can see I'm using one from the community, but if you wanna use this verified content, you can just click on that and then you just pass in the image name for this. So uh, it's no big deal. And if you scroll down, uh, let's see. So you should see some of this information. Let me zoom in a little more. So you see PG admin, default email, password, etc. So this, all of this is coming from here. And I'm gonna search for Postgre just to show you. So if I go here and say Postgre SQL, so I'll pick the first one. Well, this is the official image, so that's always better. And you can scroll down. You can see the different version. So the current version is 16.1. So we're gonna pass in this version, the latest one, 16.1. So if you scroll down some more, um, it should show you some of the same stuff that I was show so you can see it right here postgre password um, so feel free to go about it. well there it is here's all the environment variables that you can pass so the password uh, user the database the database argument etc so you can just come here and then research so the next thing that I'm gonna show you is how we're gonna define uh, like these environment variables so that's what we're gonna be working on next so what I'm gonna do is to do control N and that's just gonna create a new file and then I'm gonna do control S that's gonna ask me to save the file I'm gonna name it that env okay so you can see that it's named that env I'm gonna click save then I'm gonna click on use I don't care about this warning and then I want to define some of these uh, environment well, all of them so I'm gonna move this over to the side so that I can see them both at the same time so I'm just gonna copy and paste and give some values so for the user I'm gonna say it's just gonna be user oops control Z and then for the password I'm just gonna say the password is gonna be let me in so you don't wanna well I guess you can if you're not gonna expose the instance of PostgreSQL outside of your protected local network but just be mindful about your password and for the database I'm gonna call it DAC database like for the document maybe this is a bad name but you can change this to whatever you like and I'm gonna scroll down and we want to copy this one maybe put a space just to separate them and for this I'm gonna say junior at gmail.com this is not real this is a fake email so you can put any email just something that you can put in whenever you're logging in and for the password uh, I'm just gonna put let me in again for the password so this is gonna be the dot env file I'm gonna do control s to save it so we're passing in all of these values so that Docker can read this dot env file and then plug in those values in there for us. in this case is defeats the purpose because you know I'm showing you everything and then I'm, I'm passing them here but you get the idea if you want to hide them you can create this file like if you're gonna share a screen with some employees or something I hate this space so I'm gonna remove it but you should definitely separate them to make it easier to to read but yeah you might want to not show uh, what these values are for whatever reason but that's how you would do it by default Docker is gonna look for this environment file so you don't even have to pass any extra argument whenever you're gonna run this compose file Docker is smart enough to always look for this default.env file. And then in our case, it's gonna find it, so it's gonna plug all of these values inside of our Docker Compose file. Another cool thing that you can do, say that you wanted to always have a default for these environment variables. So for example, I could say junior, and then I put a colon and then a dash. So by default, it's gonna look for this environment variable, and if you can't find it, it will default to a junior and that's the syntax you pass the value so the raw value and you put a colon and a dash and then you pass the environment variable value so if we keep it like this and then i remove this value from the environment variable then the default is going to be junior so the, just so you know how to pass default value in case you know that you might not always have this um, this this environment uh, ready whenever you run this docker file but in our case we don't want this well, you could have it just as a fail safe, but I don't want to keep it in here. Okay, so we should be ready to run this Docker file and it should create a, an instance of PostgreSQL for us. Well, let's change the version before we forget. So 16.1. 
I'm gonna double check one more time just to be sure. Yeah, 16.1, that one right here. I can click on it. Yep, so this is the original Docker file. So 16.1, 16.1. Okay, so that's the one we're going to be using. Whenever you're watching this, if there's no real breaking changes, like if you have a way to certify that there's no breaking changes, so make sure that you upgrade to the latest version at the time you're, you're watching this and trying to code along. But other than that, we should be good to go. So this is our Docker file that's going to give us PostgreSQL and pgAdmin so that we can interact with the database and a nice user interface. So I'm going to also give you this file. So just look for this file with the resource so that you don't have to type it all out. But if you want, you can do it for practice. So the next thing that I'm going to do is we're going to jump over and then open a terminal and then we're going to run this Docker Compose file and then create the instances that we want. And then we're going to see if we can access it and start playing with the database. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm back in my terminal and we're going to start the Docker containers. The first thing that I want to say is I don't have Docker installed on this computer. I have another computer like a Linux computer that I have in my room that I use for like things like that, like installing Docker and do all kinds of like experiments. And I copy the two files over to that server so that I can run the containers there. So I'm going to SSH into this computer right now okay so i'm inside of this computer so i'm gonna go ahead and show you that i have this file in here so that env you can see this is the dot env file and then i can also show you the compose that yaml file and you can see this file is also here so now we just have to run the command so that we can start these two containers so to do this we're gonna say docker compose and then we're gonna pass in the file so the file is the compose that yaml file and then we're gonna say up and i want to say dash d so that I can run this in detached mode so that I can have my uh, cursor back or the prompt back. So I'm going to press enter and then we're just going to let this go. It will take a minute because it needs to go on in the internet and then fetch or pull these two images and then start the container. So we're just going to give it a second and then once it's complete, then I will come back. Okay, so the process has finished. And now if I go Docker PS and then I grab for, let's say, Postgre, press enter. Well, I'm grabbing, so I have to do grab. And now you can see we have the Docker Postgre running on 5432. And then we can do the same thing for the PG admin. So I'm going to say PG admin. And we have an instance of PG admin and we can access it on 7000 as you can see here. And the reason that I'm using grep is because I have other containers running. So I don't want to show you all the other containers that I have running. I'm just showing you that uh, these two we just spun up there actually work. So the other thing that I'm going to do is to do host name and then access the internal IP address. So we have to go to 192.168.1.216. And then we need to access port 7000. So I'm going to bring the browser over and we're going to do just that. So I'm going to say 192.168.1.216 and then 7000. And I'm going to make this full screen. So this is accessing PG admin. So not the database, but PG admin. So I'm going to press enter and you can see we have a beautiful uh, instance of PG admin. I'm going to zoom in a little more. So remember the password is, well, the username is junior at gmail.com. Um, the password was let me in press enter and or in so you can see I didn't have to install anything as long as I have Docker installed then I can spin up an instance of the PG admin uh, UI interface and now I need to connect to this database so the database that would define the Postgre database so I'm gonna go to servers remember this is just the UI we need to connect it to uh, an instance of PostgreSQL so I'm gonna right click and then register a new server so remember the um, IP address so let's copy that and paste it here so we're gonna give it a name so I'm gonna say local Postgres Postgre SQL Okay, so that's just a local instance of PostgreSQL. And then I'm going to go to connection and I'm just going to copy this IP address because I know it's the same one, paste it in here. And I don't need the HTTP because HTTP colon double uh, slash is the scheme. I think this is using TCP. So we have to remove that and just keep the uh, IP address and the username. I have no idea what we define, even though we just did it. So let me uh, that env. So the user for the database is user and then let me in. So let's go back. So this is user. Well, I'm just going to give Postgre here, but here is user. And then the password is let me in. Then we're going to make sure that we save it. And I'm going to click save and it's going to try to connect. And there we go. So we have our local PostgreSQL and it connected to the database. And now if I expand this, 
and we'll go to our database and we can see the uh, database that we defined so the DAC database so that's the default database that we specify in the DAC compose file and this is just a database that Postgre created itself so we don't have to worry about this one too much so now we have an entire instance of PG admin and PostgreSQL and we didn't even have to do much like we didn't have to install anything on our computer so now we'll be able to use the credentials that we defined for the database and then give these uh, give these values to Spring Boot in our application so that when we start the application, it can create all of the tables for us. So if we go into schemas and then go to tables, we shouldn't see anything here. So if I refresh, you can see I have no table. So after we run the application with the credentials for this database, then if we come back here and refresh, we should be able to see the tables created. So we need to go back to our application and then put the database configuration. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So before we go into the Spring application, there's just one small thing that I want to uh, point out. So inside of our Compose file, I'm going to collapse the two services. And for the volume, so make sure that you have your volume declared and put a colon at the very end. Okay, so just like that, I forgot to put these two columns. So just make sure that you have these two columns before you run the Docker Compose file so that you don't have any issues. So our services, the first one and the second one, and then we have the volume. Volumes. Remember, the volume is at the same level as the service. Okay, so the volume should be at the same level as the services. And then make sure you have a colon at the end of the name of the volume. But I'm going to give you this file. So just look in the source code and then grab this file. It should be at the at a folder named Docker. And then just look in there. You should see the, the two files. So I'm going to move this over now. We're going to go back to the Spring Boot application. And now we're going to be working on passing these database configurations or the database configuration information to this application so that whenever we run it uh, and JPA is picking up all of these entities, then it can find the database configuration and then create the tables for us. But before I do that, I want to put in the two files that I just created. So I'm going to say new and then I'm going to say directory. And then I'm going to name this Docker. And then inside of this directory, I want to put the two files for the Docker Compose and the ENV file so that you guys can have these files. So I'm going to drag the Docker Compose in there. And I'm going to say refactor. So now if I extend this, you should see the Docker Compose file. So it's all in there. And feel free to change those values or you can put hard-coded values in there. You don't have to use environment variables, but just know that you have access to uh, to this file. And then I'm going to put the .env file in there as well. So the .env file is not showing on my computer, so I'll just do it in the terminal. So I'm just going to say uh, copy, or actually I can just move it because I don't need it on my computer. So go to my home directory and there should be a .env file and then move it inside of the Docker directory. And then I'm going to exit out of here. So now you can see we have the that env file in there as well okay so you have these two files just feel free to use them and then modify them in any way that that, that you prefer that you like okay so the two services under services and in our value all right so that's it for docker and close these two so we will come back to docker a little later in the course but not right now we're gonna go back to it whenever we're doing the deployment okay so now let's go back to our source main and resources so the first thing i'm going to do is to rename this that properties file to a yaml file so refactor rename and i'm going to change this to a yaml file so yml yaml is also yaml if you want to be verbose but yml should work just fine and then i'm going to say refactor and also there is really i guess there is like a slight advantage of using a YAML file because you don't have to repeat yourself so much, but then your file kind of like drift to the right or the content of the file will keep drifting to the right if you keep adding more properties. So um, I've had students, you know, asking me, hey, why you use a YAML file and not a properties file? No reason. Uh, I do have to say I like the syntax of a, of a YAML file a little better than a, the syntax of a property. So inside of this file, we need to define some um, some properties. So the first one is going to be Spring, and I want to define some profiles. So we're going to say Spring Profile Active. It's important to define which profile is active whenever you have a Spring Boot application because you can have different configuration, um, and that is Java configuration and also uh, configurations coming from configuration files so you can specify uh, what is the active profile like that the other thing is you can also pass a default in my case I'm gonna say dev so I'm passing in an active profile which is gonna come from a property file and the default is dev so in case that I don't have an active profile defined as an environment variable then it's gonna use the dev the second uh, configuration that I want to do is for uh, Jackson 
So for this, I'm just gonna paste it and then walk you through it. So Jackson is what we use to do a lot of stuff. And one of the things that we do with Jackson is uh, serialization. And I'm just defining some default for Jackson here. So nothing fancy. And this needs to be moved over to under profile. So I'm gonna move over once and then paste it. So spring, Jackson, and then this configuration. They're self-explanatory. It's nothing really complicated. So for our civilization, fail on empty beans, we're gonna say false. Uh, close, closable, true. Flush after right value, true. So just some default value for serialization. And for deserialization, we don't want it to fill on unknown property. So just some simple Jackson configuration. And then after that, I'm going to define some data source property. So I'm going to go down and then tap over two times so that I can be under spring. So if I collapse these, it's going to be even easier to see. So under spring, we have profiles. We define the profile and then we have the Jackson properties that you can see here. And then after that, I'm going to define some of the database configuration. So I'm just going to paste it because, you know, I don't have to type this out. So for the data source, we're going to define the URL. So that's just PostgreSQL. And then we're going to pass in some environment variable for the host because we know we have an IP address and not local host. And it's really just a bad idea to put localhost anyway. So you always want to externalize these environment variables and then the port and then the database, like the default database, the username and the password to log into the database. And then after the database configuration, I'm going to pass in some JPA stuff. So I'm going to paste it again. I'm going to collapse this. So for JPA, open in view, I'm going to set that to false. And if you don't know what that is, sometimes you get a warning in the logs when you start the Spring Boot application. And that's because it's looking for uh, like some view interceptors. So you just turn this to false. The platform is Postgre, generate DDL true, show SQL true so that we can see the log. We're gonna do an update on the DDL auto. Uh, and again, I'm assuming you guys already know what all of this stuff means. <laughs> so I'm not explaining every single one of them. And our dialect is Postgre SQL dialect and format the SQL, we're gonna set that to true. So whenever it's gonna give us the log, it's gonna be a little bit uh, nicer look. So that is that. And then I'm gonna define, um, I think I'm gonna go inside of the resource and then I'm gonna create two new files. So here I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna create a directory. I'm gonna name it data, I'm gonna press enter. So instead of the data, um, we can define multiple different files, but the, the ones that we want to define is the data, that SQL. Remember we're using Spring Data JPA in this course, but I'm just gonna show you something else. So here, instead of the data, we're gonna create another file and we're gonna call it schema, that SQL. Now, if you're familiar with Spring Boot, you know that Spring is gonna look for a data, that SQL, and a schema, that SQL, and it's gonna run the schema first and then run the data, that SQL second. So if you want Spring to run some script, so these two scripts inside of the database that you're defining here. So if I extend this, so inside of this database uh, by default, whenever you run the application, then you can define the script inside of the schema. That's why you do like data definition and stuff like that. So create tables and uh, stuff like that. And then in the data that is SQL, that's why you do your uh, data insertion, like insert into this table and blah, 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 and stuff like that. By default, Spring is gonna use for these two files under resources. To be more organized, we put them inside of this data folder. So Spring won't be able to find them if we were to put any script inside of the. So there's another configuration that you can pass in here to tell Spring to look inside of this folder for these two files. So to do this, I'm gonna go again underneath under the spring. So you see I'm going under spring because this definition is not going to fall under profile or Jackson or data source or GPA. It goes under spring. So under spring, there is a SQL um, property that you can use. And then for this SQL property, I want to say init and we want to say mode. So the init mode is telling spring to either run these two script files, so the data.sql and the schema.sql, or to not run them. In this case, since we're using Spring Data JPA and I don't wanna run them, and I don't have any script in there anyway, like I don't have any SQL queries in there, so I'm gonna say never, because I never want to run these two files. And then I'm gonna say continue on error, I'm gonna set this to false. What this means is that if we have an error that occurs, in executing the script, should the application continue to start or should the application stop and throw an exception? I don't want that to happen, so I'm setting this to false. And then I want to set the schema location. So I'm gonna say schema location, and we want to point to this specific folder. So we have to say class path, which is gonna take us all the way to the resource. And then we're gonna say data dot, well not that, data forward slash schema 
well, it's coming up that is SQL. And we're going to do the same for the data. So we're going to say data that locations, and then we're going to say class path forward slash data forward slash data. So this is how you override the default location of these two files, which is just going to be under the resource. And we know we can have a lot of things under the resource. So to keep it a little bit more organized, we put these two files here. So I'm going to collapse this. And again, we're not doing anything with these two files yet. Not now, but I'm going to show you why I have them defined because there's something else that we're going to talk about, which is using Spring Data JPA and using uh, SQL. And we're going to make a case for using SQL in this course, even though we're using JPA. But I'll tell you that in the real world, uh, JPA is not used. I can tell you that like 100%. If you have a small application, maybe it's not doing much, then yes. As soon as the complexity increases just very slightly, then you can't use JPA anymore. It's just going to be so uh, so crazy. You have to go back to raw SQL. I'm not talking down on JPA, by the way. I love JPA. But I'm just, you know, teaching you a lot of stuff in this course. So I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, even though we're not doing anything with it. I just define it here and then we'll talk about it later. And then I'm going to collapse this. So again, under spring, I want to define some stuff for the servlet. So because we're going to be uploading files on this computer or on this server, we need to tell the servlet to allow a certain file size because by default, well, I don't know what the default value is, but it's it's one MB. Well, there you go. One MB. And we know that we're going to upload files that are even larger than that. So I put a big number there for um, the maximum file size and the request and just any file size. So this is this configuration. So I'm going to collapse this. We're going to review everything, by the way. And then after that, under Spring again, I'm going to pass in some email or mail properties. And this is going to be the host, uh, the port, the username and the password and some other default for the email configuration. And if you scroll down, you see where I'm defining this verify email host. So this is the host that we're going to be using whenever we need to verify the email. So that's the one that was defined inside of the service implementation for the email. So if we scroll up this one right here, so verify email host. So spring mail verify email host, which is spring mail and then verify and then host. So I think I need to change this to spring mail verify host. OK, so spring mail verify host. This is going to be this value right here. And I'm going to go ahead and collapse this as well. And I'm going to define some for the server. So I'm going to paste that. So we're going to say server port. And because I'm going to be using Docker whenever we're going to be doing deployment. So instead of just passing in server port here, I'm passing in the container port. And you're going to see how this is going to make sense uh, a little bit later. And then for the error, I'm pointing them to user slash error. So in one of our controllers, we're going to define a path for user slash error, and then we're going to return some error response. And I'm going to show you how to deal with this. This is a way for me to make sure that we never throw any exception that we're not catching. Because whenever you're building an API, you have to make sure that your responses are always consistent. So they always have the same format. And also you catch everything so you don't throw something that the client or the consumers were not expecting. So I think that's everything that I need to define. So I'm going to expand everything so that you guys can see. So we're defining some profile, some Jackson properties, and then we're defining the data source, some JPA stuff for logging some of our SQL queries and some stuff for our script, which we're not using because we don't have any script in these uh, two script files. And we have the mode set to never. So it's not even going to run these two files, some servlet stuff for the file size that we can send to the server and then some mail uh, configuration because we need the mail host, the port, the email ID and the password so that we can have the mail server configured in our application since we're going to send an email and then some other properties for the mail. So the character set, the timeout when the applicant is trying to make a connection or write connection and stuff like that. And we're also we are enabling uh, start TLS, which is transport layer security, because I'm going to be using the Google Mail server and it uses a secure server or TLS. So we have to enable that. And then this is a custom property that I'm defining because we need to pass in the host of the email. And you're going to see that in a minute. And then we're going to define some port for the server by default 8080. Otherwise, it's going to use the container port that we're going to define and then a the mapping for any errors that uh, we're not catch and turn white label uh, error to false. So again, if this course was a course for beginner, 
I would type all of this stuff out. But since I'm assuming that you guys have some experience, so this is just really a time saver for you. Um, I mean, I'm feeling like the video is too long for just this configuration because this configuration is literally everywhere uh, on the internet. So if you can just Google it, you mean, you're not going to find one file that has everything like this that you're expecting. But if you just do a quick Googling, then you'll be able to find um, all of this and more. Uh, and with even better explanation of what each one of them is doing. So I'm not wasting a lot of time typing all of this stuff out. That's why I'm giving it to you. Well, kind of just do it, you know, section by section because I want to make sure that you understand what we're doing. But yeah, what we will do is to define those values, right? Because we're defining these properties or these variables, but we don't know where they're coming from. So what we're going to be working on next is to define where these values are supposed to come from. And you're going to see the importance of making sure that we're defining these values, especially the ones for the database as environment variables. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and close everything here, clean things up a little, and then I'm going to go inside of the resource and inside of our resource folder. So the main folder here, I'm going to right click and do new and then do file. And I'm going to name this application dash dev that YAML. And then I'm going to paste these values. So this is everything that would define inside of this file. So all of these values with the dollar sign and the curly braces. So I'm defining the actual values here. So for the username is user password is let me in. This is the same IP address that we use to connect to the database and then the port and then our default database, which in this case is DAC database. And then the port I'm changing it to 8085. If I don't pass this port, then it's going to use, I think, 8080. Yeah, 8080. But I'm going to run it on 8085. And the profile that's going to be active is going to be dev. So it's going to pick up this file. So this application dash dev as the default. You can also override this in the command line. So if you want to override this, you can do that. And then I'm going to be using this email configuration. And this is all of the values that are defined for the email. So if we go back and we just look at the email, so host port ID and password. So host port ID and the password. I mean, it's blurred out, but these are the values. And then here I'm going to change this to local host. So I'm going to say local host. Okay. You're going to see why this is important because every time we need to change the host, that's going to be the default for the URL. Then we can just come here and then change it for right now, since I'm going to be testing the application and I only have the back and I don't have the front end, then I change it to localhost. Actually, that's supposed to be 8085 because that's going to be this value right here. And we don't need this.com. So localhost 8085. Later, we're going to say 3000 because we're going to have to point them to the react application. But for now, it's going to be 8085. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to copy everything, create another file for uh, production or as many um, environment as you want. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say application.prod.yaml and then paste and then change this to prod. All the values in here would change, uh, but we're going to get to that a little bit later, whenever we're going to be dealing with deploying the application. So this is the main applications file and I'm going to close these. So this is the main one. And then depending on the active profile, it's either going to read values from the dev or the prod. So if we set the active profile as the prod, then it will look for properties inside of this prod file. And that's just a naming convention from Spring Boot. So you just put the application dash and then the name of the profile that YAML or that properties, then it will just uh, pick the file up and then read the values from there. So now we have the configuration for all of our data source and also the email, which is really important because whenever someone is going to create a new account, we need to send them an email. We should be good to go to start the application and it should run <laughs> if we didn't make any mistake or anything like that. So we should be good to run it. And then we should be able to go back to PG admin and see if the tables have been created. So that's what we're going to be doing next. Inside of IntelliJ, we can go to the top and then click on edit configuration. You should have a window that looks something like this and you should see active profile. So for example, we know that the default is dev. We can pass in pride here. Actually, I don't know which one will take precedence, but let's see. So if I put pride here and click apply and then click OK, even though we have dev here as the default, we're defining the active profile. So right here, so active profile to be prod. So it should be prod instead of dev because we're defining this value right here. But I'm not sure which one will take precedence. I know if we open the terminal and we say uh, MVN spring dash boot 
run and then we pass in the active profile as the dev i know this one will take precedence but i don't know if you do it in the ide which one will be uh will be used so let's run it and it might break i'm not sure but let's find out okay it breaks and let's scroll up a little and it's give us unsatisfied dependency injection for the data source i think i have to go to the pump file and then uncomment this okay because we need the postgresql so we load and give it just a second okay i think we should be good now so if i go back and run this again okay it's looking good uh we get another problem error so users does not exist so let's scroll up a little more so the following profile is active and it's prod okay so the one that we set in the configuration takes precedence so the prod one was used so let me change this back to well i'm gonna remove it leave it blank and then click apply and click OK. Let's see which one will be uh, will be used now. It's supposed to be the dev. Okay, so you can see, we're gonna get back to this error in just a second. But if you scroll up again, you see the dev is being used right here. So we're good to go. So let's scroll down and let's take a look at this error. So we see that it's creating the user stable and then we get an error here, encountered uh, exception, accepting command, error executing DDL. Okay, and let's scroll down. It looks like it's not happy with the text that I'm defining here as the type but we'll get to that in a minute so let's scroll down let's just take a quick look so let's look at it's the same thing and the same thing again and it's doing some altering for the constraint that we're defining so the unique user id uh, email etc so all of this is fine okay so it looks like it did create most of the relations so we should be able to see something we're gonna fix this in a minute but let's scroll down so all right so it's saying relation users doesn't exist because it was not able to create the users uh, table because of this error. But other than that, it looks like it's totally running. So let's go back to the PG admin and I'm going to click on this table or right click and then refresh. And you see we have user roles and then we have roles, credentials and then confirmation. So our tables have been created. So let's go back to the application and let's fix this problem. So go back to the entity and we want to go to the user. So it's unhappy with this column definition. Put this to lowercase. I think that's the problem. This is supposed to be lowercase. So yeah, I think if I do the lowercase text, then that should fix the problem. So let's rerun. Uh, go to run and then rerun and see what happens. Okay, it looks like it works. Uh, yeah, it works just fine. And we can look at the URI. We can see the type is text. So we just had to make it lowercase. Now I'm going to select everything from users, empty, refresh, uh, properties, columns, scroll down, and there it is. So QR code image URI is a text. Okay, all right. So you can see all of the tables have been created along with all of the relations. And I think the sequence is here as well. So the primary key sequence is here in the sequence. So everything that would define in the application as far as the entities go have been created in the database. So we have our five tables here. And if you want to see the schema for this, you go to the database and then you right click and then you go to ER for database. And that should give you some kind of a diagram Diagram. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out a little more, uh, maybe too small, but you can see the different relations that we have with the different tables and everything was created for us by JPA. And you can export this as well by using this menu and stuff like that. But this is everything that we have. So you can see the user or users table has many different relationships with um, all the other tables. So if you wanted to see the diagram, that's where you would come to find it. So we know that we're good in terms of JPA and uh, all of our tables have been created. And we also have the, uh, let me scroll down. So if you go in here, we have this set to update. So it's not going to remove all the tables and then recreate them again. So now we can move on to creating a controller and then access the service and then send the information to save the user. So what we need to do is to create another service here for the user. So we're going to create a user service and inside of the user service we're going to have a method that's going to allow to create a new user and then we're going to go from there so that's what we're going to be working on next so i'm going to go ahead and close everything again so in order to be able to create any user we need to interact with the database and to interact with the database we can use something called a repository so we need to create repositories for the credential for all of these entities because otherwise we won't be able to save anything in the database for these entities so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create another repository or package and i'm going to call it repo or repository 
okay just the full the full name and then here i'm gonna say i'm gonna create a confirmation repository so confirmation repository it's gonna be an interface and at repository this is not required but i just like to see it here and then we need a user repository so user repository gonna be an interface and i'm gonna do the same and we also need the credential repository so credential repository also an interface okay so we have the confirmation repository credential repository and the user repository and we also need to save the role so we need the role repository also an interface because we're gonna extend gp repository so we have four repositories and we're gonna say extend gp repository and in this case we need the role entity and the type is long because it's coming from the parent class and i'm going to scroll up a little and for the role entity i want to define an optional of uh, role entity because we might or we might not find them and i'm going to say find by name ignore case and then pass in the name so we want to be able to pass in the name of the role and then fetch that role from the database so for this repository this is the only method that we're going to have in there so we will be able to fetch a role entity by just passing in the name to this function or to this method. So find by name ignore case, it's gonna ignore the casing and the name and then find it. So these interfaces is what's gonna allow the entity to be managed by JPA, which is the Java Persistence API, so that we can interact with the database for this specific entity that we define. Like if we go in here, you can see that we define this as an entity. So that's how you do this. You define a repository for it. And you can do queries in here, like on the methods and stuff like that. And I have examples in this course for this, like whenever we're going to be fetching the user and uh, whoever created the document or something like that and who updated it. So we're going to see some very pretty cool example of using the JP repository. But for the role, it's going to be that simple. So we're going to close this out. For the credential repository, though, we're going to need an optional that's going to return a credential entity and then we're going to name it get credential by id by user entity id so you want to be able to give a user entity id so user id and we want to be able to fetch the credential associated with that id because if you go inside of the credential remember we're mapping the user id as the entity so we want to be able to fetch a credential entity by passing in the user id because that should be um so if we go back here it should be a column inside of this table because we have the joint column so that's what this is get credential i'm going to say credential because there's no s so get credential by user entity id and then we pass in the ID. And the reason I didn't say get credential by ID, because that would mean that we're getting a credential by passing in the ID of the credential, which is coming from here. But in this case, we want to get the credential by passing in the entity ID. So that's why I named it get credentials, uh, okay, by uh, entity ID. So that's all for the credential. So the user is repository, uh, I just need to check. I don't think I did extend, yeah. So this one, we need to do extend JPA repository, credential entity, and then long. Okay, I forgot to do this. So close, and we're gonna do the same here. And this is gonna be the confirmation entity, also a long. And I want another optional, oops, control Z. I'm gonna say optional of the confirmation entity. And this is going to be find by key find by key so we're going to give it the key and it's going to give us the confirmation entity and add another one so optional of the same thing find by user entity and i can give it the whole user okay so two methods both of them are going to return the confirmation entity one take the key uh, and the other one takes the user entity. And then for the user repository, we're gonna say extend JPA repository of type user entity, and the uh, primary key type is long. And then in here, we also gonna have just two optional user entity. And the first one is gonna be find by email ignore case. So they give us an email, we're gonna find the user. And then the other one we need is also an optional of user entity. And we're going to call this find user 
by user id string user id you could name this find user entity i can do that actually so find user entity by user id so find user entity by user id or find user by user id i think it's better so find use this is too long so find user by user id okay so let me double check all of them so this looks good this also looks good okay role entity looks good very simple and in the user repository for the user entity also looks good with just two methods so we're good to interact with the database using these different entities so that we can save and fetch and update etc so now we can create the service and then we can call these repositories to create the functionalities that we want so that we can save the user so that's what we're going to be working on next so I'm going to close all of these, so close all tabs and collapse the repositories and go inside of the service, create a new class, and we're going to say user service. This can be like a user DAO, but I prefer naming them service. And it's going to be an interface. And what we want to do is to define the create user method and it's going to return void. And we're going to say create user. We're going to take the first name, another string for the last name one for the email and one for the password so that's the method that we're going to need to implement so that we can save a user we need the first name the last name the email and the password so now i'm going to create another class for an implementation for this so user service impl and we want to implement user service and give an implementation to these methods or well we only have one and i need the at service annotation to register this as a bin and i also want everything in here to be transactional and i will roll back whenever i have any exception so i'm going to say exception class so any exception that occurs roll everything back and then i'm going to do dependency injection so we're going to say required constructor and i need some logging so slf4j okay so that looks good and i'm going to collapse so now what we want to import is private final we want the user repository so user repository we also want the um, role repository so role repository and we want the credential repository and we also want the confirmation repository and i'm gonna scroll down a little more put more space at the bottom this is too low okay and i also need the bcrypt encoder so we're gonna say final bcrypt password encoder encoder so this is gonna give us an error because we commented out the code to pump file so we commented out the spring security dependency so i'm just gonna put it in in a comment we're just going to save the raw password for now but obviously this is not going to be the case in the course we're going to change it and then finally i need the application event publisher so this one right here publisher because we need to publish that the user has been created so that we can get the or send the email so we need all of these dependencies for now we're going to need some more but that's going to be later so now let's go ahead and work on this uh, method so i'm going to scroll up a little more so whenever we get this user i'm going to call the user repository that save because we want to save this new user and then i'm going to call create new user which is going to be like a helper function and i'm going to give it the first name last name email i can't pass in the password because we don't have a password on the user so the user repository is managing user entities and user entities they don't have a password so we're gonna create a new user well actually i can do that var and create a variable for this so i'm gonna say uh well i can do var then say user entity so this is gonna be the user entity right here after we save it and then we're gonna call the credential so credential entity we're gonna set that equal to a new credential entity so remember for the credential entity we need to give it the user and then we need to give it the password so here we're going to say password the raw password we're going to change that later and then after that we're going to call the credential repository that saves so that we can save this credential so we're going to say credential so we save it now we need to give them a confirmation so i'm going to say var that's going to be the confirmation entity set this equal to a new confirmation entity and this just take the user so we're going to give it the user and then we're going to save it so we're going to say confirmation repository that save and then we save the confirmation 
And then lastly, we need to tell the application as an event that the user will say. So we're going to say publish event and then we're going to pass in the new user event. So the one that we created and then in here we need to pass in the user entity. We need to say this is a registration type and we need to pass in the map and then we're going to pass in a key. So we're going to say the key is going to be the confirmation that get key. So we're going to say confirmation that get key. So whatever key that we created whenever we created the confirmation. So this confirmation right here. So if you go in there, this key, this random key, that's the one that we need. So we're going to send that with the event as well. So the code is complaining because it doesn't know what this create new user is. So we need to create this create new user, which is like a helper method. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to scroll down and we're going to say private. That's going to return a user entity and we're going to call create new user and it's going to take a string. Well, I'm just going to copy everything here so that I don't have to retype everything. So these values and what we want to do is to create a new role. So we're going to say role set that equal to get role by name or get role name. And then we're going to pass in the authority that user that get name or name, not get name, name. So that's supposed to give us the role name. And then we're going to say return create user NTT, which is another function that we're going to create. And then we're going to pass in the first name, the last name, the email and the role. Okay. Just like that. So now we need to create this create user entity and the get role name. So let's do them one by one. We will do get role name first. So let me copy this and then I'm going to go inside of the user service and then I'm going to define this. So this is going to return a role entity and it's get role name and then it's going to take a string, which is the name. Okay, so we have another method that's going to allow us to get the role entity by just passing in the role name. So back in the implementation, we're going to implement this method. Okay, so get role name will give us just this role and we're going to pass in the role as you can see here, which is the role entity to this method that's going to give us the user. So here, what I want to do is to say, let's get the role. So we're going to say role equal and then call the role repository that get or find actually by name, find by name, ignore case. And then we're going to pass in the name. So this is going to give us an optional of a role. So if I over over this, you'll see it's a optional of a role entity. So it's not the role yet. So what we want to do is to say return the role or we're going to throw an exception. So else throw and then we're going to say pass in a new API exception and then we're going to say role not found. Okay. So whenever we're going to create a user, we're going to see if we can find the user role. So by default, we're going to give users the user role. And what that means is that this role should already be in the database. Okay. So we need to do something called seed the database or database seeding, which is to just populate the database with some data because we know that we're going to be using this data. So if I try to run the application now, we will fail because it won't be able to find a role in a database by the name of user, which is going to be like uppercase user as a string like this, like this. Okay. That's what you get when you call the enum and then pass in the name. So it will fail, but we're going to seed the database. We're going to populate the database with the role. So now we just need to work on create user entity. So let's just copy this and then I'm going to go inside of the util and here. So we have email util. I'm going to create a user util, user utils, and we're going to define this method. Now I just need to get the signature because I didn't want to type all of this stuff. So I'm going to copy this name, paste it here. Also copy this uh, public, public and static, create user entity. One thing we need, that's a role, like this role right here, because we're passing it here. So we're going to say, in addition to the email, it will take the role entity and that's just the role. Okay. And all we're going to do is to just create a, an instance of a user entity. So create user entities. That's what it's doing. So we're going to say return user entity and we have a builder on that. So we're going to say builder and then we're going to pass in some stuff. So that user ID for this, we're just going to use a UUID. So UUID that random that the string. So that's the user ID of the user. And then we need to pass in the first name. So that's the first name that we're receiving from this method. Last name is the same. So last name, last name, 
email, email, and then last login, which sticks a date. So we're gonna say now, and then account, that account expired. So account non-expired, we're gonna say true, because their account is not expired. Account non-locked, we're gonna say true, their account is not locked. And then enable, we're gonna say false, because their account is not enabled. And then login attempt, we're gonna say zero because they haven't tried to log in at all. And then we're gonna say QR code secret, we're gonna pass in empty. And then we're gonna say phone, we're gonna pass in empty again, like empty string. Bio, we're gonna pass in empty. I'm gonna scroll down, put some more space and scroll up. And then we're gonna pass in the oops, image URL. And this is going to be this string. Okay, I guess I can show you what this string is. So if we go back here, open a new tab, it's just this, okay? So just some default image. And this can be whatever you like. You can put something funny, like an emoji or something, whatever you like, as long as it's a simple image. And then after that, we're gonna say role. We're gonna give it the role and then build, okay? So that's the user. So now we need to import now. So that should come from uh, local date time. And this empty, so we have one coming from Apache, which is string empty, uh, more action. So what this means is that out of all of the imports or all of the dependencies that we have in the class path, IntelliJ found this empty. I'm pretty sure it's like a simple string. So if we go in there, let me see. Yeah, it's an empty string, right? And that's what we want. So we can say this is like, empty string. But what I'm going to use, if I do control Z to remove that, what I'm going to do is to use the Apache common link three. So let's uh, open up the pom file and we're going to put another dependency. So I'm going to copy this one. I keep all of the spring framework at the top, maybe after the lumbok here before the test, I'll add another one. And this is going to be org that Apache that comments. And this is going to be commons length three. Okay. And then we can pass in the version. So for the version, I think 3.14. Well, let me do control space. Yeah. So 3.14.0 is the latest. Okay. And then I can refresh and go back. And now if I try to import empty, it should give me more options. So you can see uh, import static right here. So you can see this is coming from Apache commons length three. That's the one that I need. And there's a lot that you can do with this dependency, by the way, uh, like this one. These are like very, very popular library uh, or libraries with Spring or any Java application, the Apache Commons. Uh, they have libraries for like collections, string, etc. So we're just using the one for Lang3. So let's go back here and we just need to see that this is returning a uh, response entity or user entity, not a response entity, user entity. Okay, so this is the default user that we're going to be saving in a database. And here we can go back and import this. There we go. So now everything should be happy. So we can create a user now from a service perspective. So now we need to create a controller or a REST controller that's going to allow us to expose these functionalities over HTTP. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to delete the space that I put at the bottom and uh, maybe I can close everything. So close everything and let's create a new uh, resource. Let's right click uh, and then go to package. This is going to be a resource. Again, you can name this controller, uh, REST controller, whatever you like. I like to go with the resource because this is an API. It's a REST resource. So that's why I named it resource, but controller should be fine. Whatever name you want should be fine. It's uh, it's not a big deal. So here I'm gonna say user resource, enter, and let's collapse this. So we need to have a few things at the top. So the first one is going to be REST controller because it's the REST API. And then I want to have a default mapping, class level mapping. So I'm gonna say request mapping and then pass in a path. That's gonna be just user. Well, is the path an array? I think it's an array. So yeah, it's an array. So we can say, this is an array and then the first value is going to be forward slash user. So everything is going to go to forward slash user and then something else. And we need to get our service. So we're going to say private final user service and that's the user service and scroll up a little bit. Just going to put some space at the bottom again. So I can scroll up and we need to require uh, args constructor, require args constructor. 
that does the dependency injection for us. So now we're going to define a uh, post mapping. So post mapping, that's going to go to forward slash register or sign up, whatever you like. I'll go with register and it's going to be a public that's going to return a response entity of type response, which we have yet to define in the application. And then we're going to say save user. And this is going to take a request body, request body that's going to be at valid. Yep, Jaguar validation. And we want the user request. We don't have that either. And I also want to get a hold of the HTTP servlet, uh, servlet request. We're going to name this request. Okay. So I'm going to show you why I'm getting all of this information. So whenever I'm building an application, either if it's a microservice, by the way, microservice course is coming uh, right after this course. Uh, you guys are going to love this. But anyways, that's for another time. Uh, later this year. So the reason that I'm taking the request is because I want to always, and I mean always, return the same response with the same format throughout the entire application. I never want to send any kind of response, either a successful response or if it's an error, I always want to send the same format. And that's what this response is, because that's what we're passing inside of the body of the response that we're sending back as the HTTP response. So I'm going to copy this response and I'm going to go back here and inside of my domain. So inside of here, I can create a new Java class and then I'm going to paste that and then I'm going to create a record. Press enter. So this is just going to be a simple record. And then I'm going to say uh, JSON include non-default. Oops, non-default. Okay, so JSON include non-default. So if I have anything on there, that's just the default value, uh, just ignore it. And then I'm gonna clean this import a little. So we're gonna do something very simple on this record. So we're gonna say string, oops. So string time. So this is the time of the response. So this is gonna be a simple string. And then we're gonna have a code, which is gonna be an integer. And then we need the path. What is the path that caused the error to occur? And then we need the HTTP status coming from uh, Spring, and that's going to be the status. And then we need a message, which is going to be a string, and I'm going to collapse this for now. And then we need another string that's going to be the exception. If we have an exception, we're going to have a map of anything that's going to be the data. And then I'm going to move this closing curly braces to the top. Okay. So that I can have everything on one line. So this is a simple record, which is going to represent the response. And I need to put two question marks here. Okay. And import this map from Java util. All right. So this is going to be the format of the response. Every single time I'm going to send the response back either to the client or to the React application or Angular application, whatever client is calling us, every single time the response is going to have this format. It's going to have a time step or the time, the code, the path, the status and the message and any exception if there is any exception. So this is going to be the record. I'm going to just close out of this and then import it. Import class. This is coming from our domain, which is the record. So the next thing that I need to define is the user request. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to go here and then I'm going to create another package. I'm going to name it DTO request. All lowercase DTO request. And here I'm going to say new class, paste that in there. So user request, press enter. And I need getter and I need setter. You can make this a record, by the way, but I need to do some other stuff. So I'm not going to use a record this time. And then JSON ignore properties. And then I'm going to say unknown, ignore unknown true. Okay. So ignore anything that it doesn't know. Don't throw any exception when we're doing the mapping or the serialization. And then we need the private first or string first name. So all the values that we need to get. Well, I'm going to do control D to duplicate that. I think most everything I need here is going to be a string. So we're going to need the first name. We're going to need the last name, email, of course, and the password. So we're getting the password, even though we're not going to save it on the user. We're going to save it as the user credential. And then the bio. Uh, I don't know if I want, uh, I don't think I need the bio though. And then I want the phone. Well, I might use the same one for later for something else and then delete and remove that last space at the bottom. Okay. So this is all of the properties or fields 
that I'm going to define on this user request. So first name, last name, email, password. These four we're going to use whenever we're going to create the new user, but I'm going to use the same user request whenever we're updating the user information. So that's why I have the bio and the phone. And then we're going to say at not empty and then pass in the message. First name cannot be empty or no, because we cannot accept that the uh, first name is not valid. Same for the last name, same for the password. So we cannot have an empty password when we're saving a new user. Same for the last name, same for the first name, as well as the email. Email cannot be empty. Password cannot be empty or no. And they also have at email. And then we're gonna see the message invalid email address okay so the email has two it cannot be empty and then it cannot be uh like a, a a format of a string that's not recognized as an email using regular expression so first name cannot be empty last name cannot be empty email cannot be empty on all invalid email address and password cannot be empty on all and then we need to go back and import that and because we have this add valid annotation whenever the request comes in then Spring is going to check for all of these validation. And if anyone fails, then it's going to throw an exception. And later, when we're going to do exception handling, I'm going to show you how to catch this exception and then format it in the, in the way that you want to format it. And then, you know, concatenate all of these messages in case they send no first name and no last name. So I'm going to show you how to grab all of these messages and then create a nice response or error response and then send it back to the to the client but this should be good so far okay so it's giving me a problem here but i already fixed it but it's a little bit slow so it's not picking up that i already fixed this okay so now we can go ahead and say user service that create user and then we pass in the first name and then we pass in the last name pass in the email and the password Okay, so that's going to call the service, which eventually will call the repository, and then it's going to save this user. And then after that, we need to return the response. So we're going to say return a response entity that create. And then I'm going to call get URI, which is a simple method. We need to pass in a baddie. So the baddie is going to be get response. And then we need to give it the request. We're going to give it an empty map because we're not going to return anything. So I'm going to say empty map. And then we need to give it a message account created. Uh, that should be enough. Account created it. Uh, check your email to enable your account because by default we disable their account. And then after that, we're going to say created. Okay, so all of this is going to make sense. And you're going to see how clean this controller is going to remain for the rest of the course. So let's quickly get rid of this get URI. So get URI is going to be return URI that create, oops, create, and then pass it on an empty string. This is supposed to be lowercase. Okay, so the URI is usually the location of the resource that just got created. And it's going to be returned in, in a header. In the response and i'll show you that in a minute let's see like if i return some random stuff here and i'll show you this value in the header but we'll do that before we run the app so now we need to work on get response and that's what we're going to be working on next i'm going to go back to the util where we have the user util and the email util i'm going to create one of the most important util in the application which is the request utils Okay, so this class is where I'm going to do everything that I need to do to make sure that I'm always returning the same response every single time. So here I'm going to say public uh, static and this is going to be the of type response. So the uh, record that we created and I'm going to name it get response. So the same method that we're going to be calling inside of the, oh, let me close this. So the same method that we're going to be calling here, I'll just copy it and paste it here. Okay, so that's the method that we uh, need to define in here. And it's going to take the HTTP server request. request. It's going to take the map of anything. So that's the data and we need to question marks. And then we need to get the message and then the HTTP status. Okay, and then we're gonna return what we need to return. So we're gonna return a new response 
remember the record if we go back let me show you what this record looks like so this record right which takes a time a code a path etc so we're gonna go here and say uh, let me finish this off so we're gonna say now that well we need to import that from local date time so uh we need local date time import static i'm just gonna type that local date time that now there we go import and then since this is a string we need to do to string so we convert it to a string and then we need to get the status that value so this is going to give us the http code of the http status and then we can do request that get uri so that we can get the uri of the request and then we're going to pass in the actual http status so you remember we have the status here so what we can do we can do http status that value of and then we pass in the status that value okay and you're gonna see what that looks like and then we pass in the message and the exception and then for the exception it's gonna be empty because we don't have any exception so let's import this from uh, the comments library well I'll do the import later whoops control Z empty so for our data we're just gonna say data whoops data okay and let's import this now import comments length three and we need to import this map and it's giving us this one problem we need to import this here import and import this map okay we have no data so we pass in an empty map if we wanted we could have just sent this uh, newly created user but we're returning void here when if we wanted we could just return the newly created user but i'm not returning anything and then I need to import this HTTP status. Okay, so now you see how clean and lean this controller is. And we're going to be using this method and, and some others to always return this uh, response type. So this guy right here, this record. And if we have any data, it's going to leave inside of this map. So we can chain as uh, many different keys with values that we, what we would like. Okay, so now we should be good to go. Again, it's not picking up that this error has been fixed, but we're just going to ignore it. So this all looks good. Um, I don't think we have to do anything anymore. The only thing we have left to do before we can go ahead and run this and test it is that we need to be able to create some roles in a database so that whenever we, uh, let's go into the implementation for this. So remember we call create new user and then we try to fetch this role, which is the role user. And we know that we haven't saved anything in a database. So you can go to the database, like literally go to the database like this. Uh, let's go to the query so you can just insert the roles like you can go to this role here and then do the insert or you can do it with the code and we're going to do it with the code so that we can see what that would look like if we were to do it using java code since we're already in the code we don't have to write any sql queries so that's what we're going to be doing next so let's go ahead and create some roles so that we can find something whenever we go look for them, particularly whenever we go look for the role user. So let's go to the main application class. So this class right here and let's go down. I'm going to expand this and then we're going to go down and I'm going to create a bin. You've probably seen this before, but it's going to be of type comment line runner and then we're going to give it an appropriate name and then we're going to plug in the role repository because we need to uh, use it to save some stuff in a database. Okay. And then here we're going to say return args like that. And then we're going to pass in some code in here. So what we want to do is to do a few things. So remember, every time we're saving anything in the database, we need to know who is doing it. So for this, we're going to have to access the request context, and then we're going to set the user ID. In this case, this is the system. So I'm going to pass in zero. So we're making the decision to say that every time the ID of the user or the updater, the person or the entity that updated us something is zero, then we know that's the user. And then we're going to save our uh, user role, set that equal to a new role entity. And then we're going to set the name for that. So we're going to say, oops, I uh, need the semicolon. So user role that set name. And this name is going to come from the authority that user that name. So that's going to give us the user as a string in uppercase. And then we're going to say user role that set authorities then we're going to set the user authority so we're going to say authority that user so that's one that's the user role and then we're going to have another one so admin role equal a new uh, role entity and we're going to say admin role 
and set name authority that admin that name and then we're gonna say admin role that set authorities and that's gonna be the admin authority okay and then we're gonna save so role repository that save i think there's like a save that save oops not find that save and then we're gonna pass in the admin role and we're gonna do the same but this time for the user role which we forgot to do user role so we're gonna save these two roles in the application and then after that we're gonna access the request context and then we're gonna call start well we probably should rename this because it reset uh, the value so maybe not start maybe something like uh, well I guess start would make sense because you reset it to zero or you just remove whatever you had okay so I guess we can say start all right so that should take care of running this all of this code inside of the command line runner whenever the application start or right after the application start okay so we're almost there there's just two other things that we have to do so if you go inside of the uh, let's go to the entity uh, let's go to any other one of them so you see that we have the auditable which is the abstract class that these are extending and if we go in here we see that we're using the entity listener so for all of this to work inside of your main application or anywhere where you can create this uh, this beam you can put well you have to put at oops at enable jpa auditing so you need to put this annotation there and because we're also using so this is gonna allow for this code to work this one right here, okay entity listener auditing entity listener for this code to all of this logic to run in the way that it's supposed to be so before we save any entities that extend this class so you need to do that and then the last thing we have to do remember in our email service we have the async annotation so whenever we have the async annotation we have to enable async so go back to the main application again and then underneath we're gonna say enable oops enable uh, async this one right here okay so enable async and then enable GP auditing we don't need to give them any arguments or anything like that so another thing we can do before we run this if we want to for example insert the system into the database we would have to go in here and inside of the data we can pass in an insert uh, statement in here so I'm gonna paste what I prepared inside of here so that's gonna insert into the users so you know ID user ID first name last name email phone bio reference ID image URL created by an updated bot and I pass in the values which is zero so the same value that we're passing in here as the person or as the entity that is uh, in the request context so that whenever we save this role is gonna put zero for the updated by and zero for the created by so then this query will run and then it will insert this value so you see that i'm setting system system just some dummy data this is not a user but the system itself so stuff like that okay and then the updated by is zero the created by is zero so the same value that i'm passing in inside of the value for the id i pass the same one for the created by and updated by and this is totally valid you can do that at least in postgresql the same value you're passing in here you use it as a as a key here in our case it's not a foreign key it's just an id and the reason it's not a foreign key is because we didn't define that inside of the like if we go here uh, inside here we didn't define that as a foreign key we just say that it's going to be a law and we're going to talk more about that in a minute or later in the course i'm going to explain something to you so we should be ready now <laughs> that's the last thing oh never mind <laughs> this is the last thing this sql init we need to make it always so that you can run the script okay so if we didn't make it a mistake well, if I didn't make any mistakes, we should be able to run this and it should create this role or these two roles in the database. And we should be able to send a request and save a new user in the database. And it should also send the email because remember we publishing this and we should get the email with the confirmation and everything. Uh, so let's, uh, let's double check one more time. Uh, I want this to work on the first try. So let's go to the email uh, da, 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 da. so let's see here get k okay, verification email uh, get password okay everything looks good so we're gonna take it for a spin so that's what we're gonna be doing next so i'm gonna go ahead and close everything <laughs> just have a clean slate and yeah let's uh let's run it 
I haven't done this, so if it breaks, uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna have to look into the into the uh, into the logs to see what's happening because I haven't run it like behind the camera. So let's go ahead and run it, see what happens. Okay, and we got an exception. So the script must not be null or empty. So I think it's because the yeah it didn't start at all. So because we have the data empty, so this one uh, let's see if we go to data this one this script. So it's complaining. So we're gonna say something simple just so that we can. Uh, see it in action. So I'm going to say begin. I think you can do that in PostgreSQL. And I'm going to say create table if not exist. And then I'm going to say test. And then we're going to, oops, <laughs> this is parenthesis. And I'm going to say ID serial primary key. And then uh, name. This has nothing to do with the course. I'm just putting something in here. Uh, oops name is uh, character uh, varying of 255 and not all okay just some dummy data like that just so that it's happy and then we're gonna say end okay let's uh, run it again again this has nothing to do with any of the work we just did it's complaining because it says the script is empty so I'm assuming it's because this script is empty so I just put some dummy data in there to create a dummy table and then I'm gonna run it again see what happens and we got another exception so it's telling me that so everything ran uh, by the way but we get this error so created at cannot be null for the user because we set the created at to be not null but let's take a look at the database just to see so if i select everything from users it's gonna be empty because we didn't create anything the application didn't start uh, but what about roles do we have anything in roles nope nothing in roles so nothing got created because the application didn't start and it says that we don't have anything for created at inside of the user so i think this is in uh this is this created by updated by so we can put hmm, okay i think i'm gonna hold on to this then we can come back to this uh uh script because we don't really need it i can just run this inside of the of pg admin it just wants us to put the date and I don't have a date sample and I don't feel like typing a whole date so we're just gonna uh, chill on that for now so let's go here and change this to never okay and let's run it again so now it's just Java and there we go it looks like we're good so here's all of the insert for the role all of the queries so it looks like we're good so if I go back here and should be empty for users okay but for roles we should have something and I got nothing. So I see the queries, the insert you can see here. Do I need to refresh? Refresh and run this query. Okay. So I got nothing. So I'm gonna put the queries here. I think I needed to refresh. Continue and oh there we go. <laughs> okay, this was kind of stale. I guess I'm gonna close them. So yeah, I think we have something, we just couldn't see it because the I had to refresh this. So for roles, if we search again, we have the two roles. And the created by is zero, updated by is zero, and we didn't set these values on the role, but they got picked up from the context. So if we scroll over, you can see admin and user and the date. So this is the date that I didn't wanna type out. So I think I'm gonna have to do it now. So I'm gonna copy this date then go back and then i'm gonna go to data add two more so created underscore at updated underscore at and then i'm gonna pass in these two values i'm gonna scroll over and i probably should break this to multiple lines so in here and i'm sorry for all of these errors we're gonna pass in these two strings a uh, simple string paste this and also again paste it i'm gonna click on configure and Put a Postgre, there it is. Uh, this name is fine. The host 192.168.1.216 user, let me in. Test connection, connection success, apply and click OK. I just want the errors to be gone. So I'm gonna close this and they look like they're mostly gone, but they're still here. So what's this? Unable to resolve column name user ID. Oh, come on. All right, so that looks good. Um, I can actually run this query from uh, inside here. So let's go ahead and rerun the application. But this time we need to go here and comment this out. Otherwise it's gonna run again and that's gonna give us a problem. So comment this whole thing out because we're not doing this twice. We're only doing it once. And go here and change this to always because I want this uh, data to be inserted into the database. So let's go to run and then rerun. Okay, account non-expired 
population. Okay, so we set all of this to be non null. So that's why we have to pass in all of these values. Let's see, uh, let's go back. Let's go to the users and describe this. So ID, we pass in this non null. So apparently we set the these two to be non null and the enable and the email and the MFA and the user ID. So you have the user ID, MFA, and account non expired. So let's quickly fix this just so that we can have this record inside of the database. So again, I'm going to break this on multiple lines and I'm going to paste account non expired, account non lock, and enabled enabled so what else we have mfa and so we have the user id we have mfa i'm looking at all the ones that are not uh, that cannot be null enabled we have the email already we have these uh these two so account, account non expired account non lock and we have the updated at created at and created by primary key okay so i think we can do this let's go back so we have one two three four those are all uh, booleans so we're gonna say True account non expired, true account non lock, uh, enable false and MFA false. Let's rerun. There we go. So now, if we go back and we select everything for users, there's the system. So ID is zero and updated by itself, created by itself, and it's not enabled, it's false. And the uh, da, 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 da. and this is the user ID. Here's the phone. Well, you probably want to put the, maybe the support of your company, the support phone number here. Okay, so now we have a reference to the user ID of zero which would be the one to create these roles because it's created by zero, updated by zero. So the last thing I do want to say is these are not foreign keys. We will be able to fetch this using SQL because the values are the same, but they're not foreign keys. So if we go inside of the properties and we go to constraint and we go to foreign keys, you see that we don't have any foreign key in the users. Well, not the users. So let's go to role and constraint foreign key. See, we have no foreign key, only have a primary key. So to do the foreign key, uh, I'll give you an example. So before I give you the example, I'm going to turn this to false or never because we don't want want to run any of the script anymore. We don't want to run this anymore. Well, actually, I can. I want, I'm going to delete everything that I have here, like uh, here. I'm not going to delete this so that you don't have this error, but just know that uh, it's going to complain if we have nothing there. So I'm going to close this and also close. Remember to comment this out. We can't do this more than one and close this and close this as well. Close all of this. So if you go inside of the entity, right? So these are supposed to be foreign keys like the created by which is the ID and the updated by, which is another ID. So if we were to make these foreign keys, we would have to pass in the entire user class in here, not just the long, which is the uh, just a simple value. So even though you want this to just be a simple number, for it to be a foreign key, you have to pass in the entire class. So as an example, I will show you what that would look like. So for example, you would have maybe a private uh, user entity in this case, because you have to pass in the whole class. And let's say we were setting the owner, right? We know that the created by is going to be the owner, but let's say we were doing it this way. So we would say private user entity, that's the owner. And then in here, we have to pass in some annotations. So we would do something like uh, one, two, many, right? And then, so that means that one entity that's doing this can be mapped to, uh, well, not one to one, but one to many like that. And then you pass in something like a join column. I mean, I'm not saying that this is how this is supposed to be done, but I'm saying that if you were to do this, like the created by and updated by, that's the route you would have to take with uh, JPA. So for example, you would say, I'm going to add a new column on this and the name is going to be obviously user ID or owner ID or something. Well, yeah, owner ID, right? And then you're going to say uh, reference, oops, reference uh, column name is going to be the ID that's inside of the user entity. But we know that really we're just talking about this ID because this class inherit the ID from the auditable. And then lastly, you would have to say something like foreign key. And then you say at foreign key, and then you pass in the name of the foreign key. So for example, you could say something like FK underscore user uh, underscore owner for the foreign key name. And then you could pass in a foreign key definition if you wanted to, but that's not required. And you can also pass in a value, which is going to be like a constraint that uh, you can pass in constraint, for example. 
So that would be how you would have to do uh, this as a foreign key if you wanted to do it this way. So the point that I'm making here, if I were to go this route, I would have to do a different implementation. I wouldn't be able to just have this auditable like this. I would have to split it, maybe create some other class and stuff like that. Like I haven't really thought about the whole thing, but I know that I would have to change my, uh, my approach because I would have to pass the same class that's being inherited inside of the same class. Okay. So this is one thing with JPA. However, if I had to do this with just SQL, <laughs> It's so easy. It's like a one line of code instead of dealing with this thing. Okay. So again, it's best to do it this way, but I'm going to show you that we're going to have it be a foreign key without having to do this. And every time that someone is going to save a new entity in the application, if they pass an ID in the request context, that's not a foreign key, then it's going to throw an exception. And what I mean by that is if we go back to the application and I'm going to uncomment that for a quick second. So if I pass in any number here, it will just work because it's just expecting a number. And because the value is not a foreign key, then it's just going to say, Hey, I just need to put in a long here. As long as I have a long, I'm okay. So that's not the, the best implementation because every reference to the user should be a foreign key. Like it should exist. I shouldn't be able to pass in any, any long value for the created by or the updated by and the database should just accept. And if I were to do this in JPA, I would have to do something like this. Okay. And redesign this entire uh, implementation, like come up with a different implementation. I'm not saying it's hard. Well, I haven't tried it. However, I'm going to give you this entire uh, framework or design, not framework, huh, framework. So if I go to the database and right click and go to ERD for database right here, uh, you can export this design as SQL. Well, it's taking a long time to load. Maybe I have to refresh the whole thing. Yeah, I need to refresh. So um, let's open this up one more time. Query tool. So this is where we're going to write our queries and then go to the database and then do this. Okay. So you can export this as SQL and I'm going to show you how we're going to do this. I think if you go here uh, with drop table, yeah, somewhere here you can save this uh, and get all of the SQL that was generated to create uh, this uh, design or this uh, relationship and tables and stuff like that. But if you look closely, the, let me see if I can zoom in, for example, like if you look at the roles, you can see that the created by is just on a big end and the updated by is just a big end. It doesn't have any key next to it, meaning it's not a foreign key and that's not good. Okay. So that's what I just explained in the Java, as opposed to if you go to the user role, then you can tell that these are two foreign keys because of the way that we're doing the mappings. So if I try to insert a role in the user role that doesn't exist or a user that doesn't exist, just some random user ID, then it's not going to take it because it's going to say, Hey, this is not a foreign key. So I wanted to bring your attention to that. And the other thing that I'm going to do is for this diagram. So this one that we're looking at right now, like this whole thing with all of our tables, I'm going to give you guys the SQL that I wrote to create this. And this is the one that I would actually run and then create these tables instead of what JPA generated for me, because dealing with JPA and to put uh, like to come up with a different design for this when I only need to be able to pass in an ID. It was just so annoying to me and I didn't want to do it. I feel like it was extra work for no reason. So I just went with SQL. So let's go back in here and we're going to go to the schema. And I know you guys hate SQL, so I'm not going <laughs> to uh, type in all the SQL. Uh, I know some of you would, would love to uh, have me explain all of the SQL, but I'm going to show you that um, this is what I created. Ooh, I don't like this formatting. So you see, we have the begin and I'm going to create the user stable. So everything in the user stable is everything that we already have. So nothing here is new. So everything we have in the in the Pojo and then I added the constraint. So email is going to be unique, user ID unique, but check this out. The created by and the updated by their foreign keys and they're referencing the user ID on the user stable. And that includes the system because the system remember is also a user. And if I go down to confirmation, well, the confirmation we did, the foreign key is not a problem. But if we scroll down to document, which we don't have in the application yet, but we know that every time someone creates a document or updated document, we need to know who did it. But look, just these two lines is going to take care of the foreign. So if I run this script and create all of those tables, I will have my foreign keys without having to do something like this in my code. Okay. So this is a lot simpler. And that's why I always try to tell uh, students that it's cool to know JPA. It's, it's fine. You can learn JPA. And again, JPA is good. 
I've used it for years. I still use it depending on the project. But as of late, I just I haven't <laughs> I just haven't used it like at all <laughs> at all. And I'm decent at, at SQL. So I just I'm, it's fun for me to write all of my queries. So I don't really use uh, object relational mapping like that. But look how simple it is. I can go to the walls. OK, this table. And then I say, hey, here, these are two foreign keys because you know that this role is going to have an updated by and created by. And here are my two foreign keys. And I also have the default value for the timestamp. So even if I don't pass the timestamp, it's going to take the default value for the current time. But look how simple this is. OK. And I was able to define some indexes to enhance the performance of the application. So again, I'm going to give you guys this. Uh, this is all your code uh, because you're taking a course. So I'm giving you all of this code, but I'm just telling you it's fine learning SQL, uh, learning JPA, but you might want to do things <laughs> with SQL uh, because it's it's simpler. OK, so again, I don't like this format and I'm just going to give you guys all of this code. I'm going to format it so it's not going to look like that. But I wanted to show you that how easy it is to do in SQL as opposed to doing some mappings like this. OK, so I'm going to get rid of that and remove all of the imports for that. So this and this this these two okay but this will work if you just run this in your database you still can use uh jp entities right you still can use all of this stuff you know your role your user you still can use them as entity and you have all of the benefits of not dealing with sql and role mappers and stuff like that you just use jpa but all of your data was created and your schema was defined in a very nice way but me personally I don't work with JPA like at all. I feel like it's just <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't want to say anything bad about JPA because I I've, I use it for so long. I've used it for so many years, but it's just like eh, I'll go with my SQL because hey, I can write my queries and it it feels a lot easier to do it this way. All right. So the next thing that we have to do is to just test this and using Postman. So we're gonna test the this method so that we can create a new user. So that's what we're gonna be doing next. So I reformatted the schema file and you can see now it looks really nice. So you guys have access to all of this, including the document, which we haven't gotten to yet because we haven't created the JPA entity for this. But again, you already have it here and everything else, along with some indexes to enhance our performance whenever we're searching for uh, users and stuff like that. so. This is all yours and you can go through it. You can run it. You can learn. Uh, it's uh, up to you if you want to use it or use uh, GPA. So I'm going to close everything here. And because I have all of this script, I'm going to make sure that I turn this off. Oops. So go here. So make sure you turn this to never because we already have our tables and stuff like that. So make sure this doesn't run this to script. So turn that off and I'm just going to go ahead and rerun the application and then I'm going to open Postman so that we can test. So let's see what happens. OK, so we're up and running. going to clear this, going to open Postman and going to create a new request. We need to go to HTTP locals 8085. OK, and then we need to go to user slash register, go to the body. We're sending JSON, so we're gonna say raw JSON, and then we're gonna insert the JSON. So we need the first name, and that's going to be the first name. So junior, gonna copy that. Last name, email, and password. So I'm gonna say let me in. So this is gonna be a real email, so I'm gonna use get raise at gmail.com because I need to get the message or the email with the link. And then I need to say this is the last name. OK, now I need to change those values. Last name, email, password. OK, so first name, last name, email and password. I'm going to see if I can make this a little bigger. Oh, too big. OK, like that. And so first name, last name, email, and password. And we're sending a post request to 8085 user register. So let's send this. Okay, so we got an error 500 for user register. Let's take a look. Ooh, right. So we try to save someone, but we don't have anything in the context. Okay, so you see that we don't have any, any user ID in the context. So what I'm gonna do, since we're not sending on like a real request as a logged in user, and we don't have any filter to intercept it to set the user ID to zero for the system. I'm going to do it manually. So I think if I go here and uncomment this like that. So whenever the application start, it's going to set this to zero and we're never going to set it to null. I think this should work. But let's see. I'm not sure if it doesn't work, then we can just comment out the code and I'll tell you why it doesn't work. But let's see. So let's send it again. Yeah, 
it's not gonna work i i thought so yeah the reason it's not gonna work is the contact is gonna create a new thread for every new request so even though when i started i set this to zero when the requests come in it's gonna set the it's gonna create a new thread and this new thread is not gonna have this in it so one way to solve this is to go inside of the auditable so the auditable class and just pass in a value manually so like that okay as the system like that so that you can set this value to zero which is gonna be the system so let's rerun this oops okay we are up and running and send okay there we go so we got 201 for the code the time is right now the status is created and the message is account created check your email to enable it. so let me open my email so i open my email and as you can see I have the new user account verification and if i open it up i have the message your new account has been created please click on the link below you guys probably can't see this okay so there it is click on the link below to activate your account the support team okay so if we click on this link nothing's gonna happen because we don't have any endpoint that's listening to this get request so i'm not even gonna click on it so let's close this and let's go back to our database so let's go to the query and let's rewrite this query so select star from users and then run that so now we should have one user there we go well two of them one of them is the system so this one right here and the second one is the the new user we just created so you see that we can't create a new user unless we send an appropriate request and we have a user id in the request context and if you ran the sql that i just gave you you can only pass an existing user so for example if i were to say created by is five or well maybe not five but three well it's going to give us an error because there's only one user which is the system and their id is zero so there's no one with id three as a foreign key so it's going to give us an error okay so everything is good email is here it's disabled it's got the default um, profile image and everything is in there okay and their user id so looks like we're good we're meeting the requirements because we can see that we can add a new user if we don't pass and are created by and updated by etc so there's two values so the next thing that we need to work on is to be able to click on the link and then confirm your account after we do that i'm gonna have to create the filter that's gonna filter all of the requests to determine if the request is coming in from a logged in user or if it's a request that doesn't require a logged in user in this case we will pass in zero which is going to represent the system so first we need to be able to uh, activate our account so we will have to create another endpoint in here okay so that we can confirm the new account we're going to enable it and then after that we're going to have to work on a filter so that we can uh well not here so that we don't have to do this okay so we need to be able to set this user id in the context uh, automatically by using a spring filter and this is going to take us into spring security and all of that other stuff so after we're done creating the endpoint to verify the new account then we're going to go into spring security and start building the login functionality so that's what we're going to be working on next so let's go back to the user resource and i'm going to copy this paste it down so this is going to be a get mapping so i'm going to change this to a get mapping and make sure i import it and this is going to go to user verify forward slash account and we need to get the request param so i'm gonna say request param and we don't need the valley this time because we're just gonna get a token so we're gonna say token string token and we're still gonna take the servlet request. You can inject the request inside of your controller, just like that, and it will be passed. And then we're gonna call from the service, verify account key, and then we passed in the token. We can call it verify account token or key. And then we're gonna return empty. This is gonna return void. And then we're gonna say a different message, account verified. I put it that at the end of everything and then we're gonna put okay so 200 not a 201 this time and we're gonna change this to okay and remove the uri like that so now let's create this method create this method it's gonna take a token or a key or whatever and then we need to go into the service so that we can implement this and click okay so this is gonna be fairly simple so first thing we need is the confirmation entity which is gonna come from get user confirmation and then we're gonna pass in the token okay and let's go ahead and create this method create method so the confirmation all it's gonna do is return 
the confirmation repository that find by user entity. Well, not find by user entity. We want the other one. So find by key and then give it a token. I should probably be consistent. So let's name this key, 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 verify account key, go in there, name this key, go in there, name this key. Okay. Verify account key. So we're taking a key, get user confirmation. We give it the key and then we need the user entity, which is going to be get user entity by email. We give it the confirmation get the uh, confirmation entity so it doesn't know what this is so let's put the type so that it knows instead of using var now it knows because it couldn't infer get email okay that's gonna give us the user associated with this in uh confirmation and then we're gonna say set uh same problem fine user entity set enable to true then we're gonna save it oops So we set their enable to true and then we save the value and then we call the confirmation repository and delete the confirmation. Okay, that's it. Now we just need to create this method, get user entity by email. And what we're going to do, if I can scroll up, is to just say user by email equal user repository that find by email. Ignore case, we give it the email. This is going to give us an optional. And then we're just going to say return user by email or else throw. Oops. Or else we're going to throw an exception that we, we didn't find the user. Like that. User not found. Now we can change this to a var and a var. And this is returning an object. This is supposed to be confirmation entity. So for this, we're going to say or else or else null. Oops. No. Okay. So if we can't find it, we're going to return no. All right. So verify account key. It's going to take the key. We're going to get the confirmation for that key, get the user from that confirmation, set the enable to true. And then we're going to save the user because we changed something on the user and then delete the confirmation. If we go back to create new user entity. So we know that we set account non expired to true account non lag to true. Uh, we should set MFA to false as well. Okay. And the only thing that we set to uh, false in terms of the account is the enable. So we have to turn this to true. Everything else should be true because they just created a new account. So if we go back to the implementation, only thing we have to set to true is this enable. Okay. And then delete the confirmation so that they can click on the link again. So in the user resource now, if we go to user verify account and then pass in this token, I'm going to rename it to key which means we have to go to the user util, well, not the user util, but to the email util. And we're going to name this to uh, get email message. Yeah. Key, just to be consistent. Okay. Key and key, key. And then we're going to name this key. Key is going to be after the account. So that means in the resource, we need to change it to key. Okay. So we're looking for the key. So now we should be good to go. So if we rerun and open Postman again, and we're going to duplicate this request. This time it's going to be a get. Well, I can just use the link in the email. So I'll go back to the email and I'm just going to copy this link because we need to change the token to a key. And I'm going to close that. Go back to Postman, paste, and this is the key. Okay. So if we send this request now, we should have the user uh, be verified. So send, ah, not found. Oh, did we rerun? So we need to go to user verify account for a get request. Well, we need to change the name of the method. We're going to change this to verify account, verify account like that and rerun. So we have to go to user verify account. So oh, we miss user slash user. That's why it gives us not found. And also you notice that this error is not formatted the way that it's supposed to be because remember we are sending something like this code time pass that is message but this looks different because it's coming from the server but i'm going to show you that how we're going to customize all of these errors so every time we get an error it's going to look exactly like this okay except it's going to have an exception so let's check one more time so we're up and running 
go back to postman and forward slash user verify account and then the key is this send there we go account verified so if i do it again it should tell me that it couldn't find this key or something so send it again so well it's an internal server error because we have uh i'll show you we have this okay so instead i think it's better if we do this so find or confirmation key not found this is more descriptive and a better way to handle this so we run this is already deleted in the database by the way and if we go back and send it well we're not handling this api exception but at least now we should see confirmation key not found so later when we start handling all of the exception especially the one that we created which is this new api exception then we'll be able to send this message back to the to the client we're we done with this feature well not yet we still have to for example handle these exceptions and stuff like that but from a core perspective we pretty much have a way to create a new user and confirm their account okay because they're disabled at first, as you can see here, they'll never be able to log in. And we don't have any login functionality. We're gonna have to take care of that. So let's go back to see where we are. So, so far we have this. So for the new account, we created the users to be able to create a new account using their basic information. So we have that. Applications should disable all newly created account until verified. We have that. Applications should send an email with a link to verify the new user. We have that. Only after verifying a new account should the user be able to log in. Okay, we don't have the login functionality yet, but we have pretty much done the new user account. So what I want to work on next is this. So I want to work on the login. So I'm going to move the login below new account because it makes more sense to do login before we can do reset password. And the login is going to be interesting because that's where we're going to introduce Spring Security and work with all of these credentials and all these other things that we've been setting on the user. So I'm going to go ahead and move the login right after the new account and then we're going to start working on it. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So before we go back to the code again, let's take a quick look at some of the ways that you can secure an API application. Now, this is not the full list, but this is some of the most common ways that you can secure a web application or an API. So the first one that you probably already know is form-based authentication. And we're going to keep this in the Spring Security context because there can be many different ways to talk about all of these different concepts. So for form-based authentication, that's when you use the form login with Spring Security. And I think by default, it's going to give you a very bootstrap looking form that you can uh, be able to put in a username and a password and then you can log in. So that's one way you can do it. And it's pretty secure to do it this. Way. However, this is not going to work for us because we have an API application and this application is going to be returning JSON and it's to be used by some other application like React application or an Angular or a Vue application. So we're not going to have any form that we're going to ask the user to log into in the back end because the interaction between the user and the application is going to be done using React.js. So that's the front end application and it's the React.js application that's going to be making HTTP requests to this API application. So form based authentication is not going to work in our case. The second two options, so basic authentication and digest authentication, these two have non vulnerabilities. So even though we could use them, they're a little bit inconvenient. So they're not very like convenient to use, but they have non vulnerabilities. You can use basic authentication or digest authentication to test, uh, like if you're developing your application, but it's not something that you want to take to production. And I'm talking about them together, a basic and digest authentications, because they're very similar in their implementation. The next way that we can secure uh, API applications is by using OAuth 2. OAuth 2 is the standard. For most of all of the applications that you use on a daily basis, they're most likely using OAuth 2 in the back end to make sure that you're accessing their application securely. Now we can use OAuth 2 in our application because we can turn the API as a resource and then we can create a separate application that's going to be the authorization server. But this is something that I'm going to do in the next course which is going to be the ticket management system, which is going to be a little bit more complex with a microservice architecture. So unless I really have a microservice architecture, I don't really uh, want to use OAuth 2 because I don't want to deal with multiple different applications. I just use Spring Security and then I have just one single API application. But if I'm going to have a microservice architecture, then 
I'm definitely going to go with OAuth 2 because you won't be able to do a token implementation, a custom token implementation. Or you can, but it's going to be very repetitive because you're going to have to take the filters and put them in all of the microservices. It's just kind of like very inconvenient to do it this way, among other things. Because in addition to that, you have to manage your keys and you have to make sure that all of the different services in your microservice architecture, they have access to these keys. So it's it becomes very um, hard to manage. And the last one, which is the custom token and implementation that's the one that i'm going to be teaching you in this course and the reason that i'm choosing to do this for at least one last time until we have a very big update in spring security is because i want to show you that all the things that we're going to do in the custom implementation is almost everything that is done in the oauth 2 implementation but just on a bigger scale because if you understand what's happening in the custom token implementation with spring security then it's like you understand oauth 2 at 75 percent so in this course i'm going to be using the custom token implementation for Spring Security so that we can secure the API application. I'm going to take a very detailed approach because I want to show you how to customize as much as possible with Spring Security just to give you a very in-depth implementation of Spring Security because Spring Security is very, uh, very powerful and it's used in a lot of enterprise applications. So if you really have a very solid understanding of how the custom token implementation works, then you will have a very solid foundation for uh, whenever you start working with OAuth 2. They're not really the same, but it will give you a pretty good foundation. So what we're going to do is to do the custom token implementation. It's also very popular with uh, API applications. So if you have a simple API application, instead of setting up an entire OAuth 2, then you can just do a custom token implementation. So that's what we're going to be doing. And what you should expect is that I'm going to take a very in-depth approach because I'm really going to do a lot of customization with Spring Security. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So if you want to see the documentation of Spring Security, this is the website where you should go. And this is the official website of Spring Security that's coming from Spring. And if you see here, it says Spring Security is a framework that provides authentication, authorization, and protection against common attacks. And you can read more on this. I'm not going to read this to you, but you can go ahead and read it yourself and get familiar with this technology because that's what we're going to be using to secure our application. And it's a good idea to take a look at the official documentation. But I'm going to quickly go through all of these uh, different sections. So for prerequisites, it's requiring Java 8 or higher. So we're on 21, so we're good on that. And they have a community. You can see what's new in this version. So the 6.2.1, you can check that out. I'm going to scroll down to Spring Security. And in here, you can see that you can even access the source code. So this is going to take you to the GitHub, I think. So if I open this up. So yeah, so you can see the, the GitHub repository. Like if you want to see the source source code yourself, you can come here and then take a look at the code yourself. This is not something most people would do. <laughs> they just kind of like trust what's been given to them. But if you want to see the source code, then you can do that. Where I want to go is to scroll down to servlet application because that's the type of application that we have. We don't have a reactive application. We have a servlet application. And then in there you can click on getting started. And here you can see more about, you know, a simple project and see exactly how to integrate Spring Security in your app application and then I'm going to go to architecture. So what I want to show you is a quick overview. I'm going to show you that in more detail at a very high level. I want you to understand something, which is this filter concept that you have in Spring Security and they call it a filter chain. So you can think of your application as the application in the box. So the box with the data lines or the dashes, that's your application, right? So that's the API that we're building and you can think of your controllers. So all of your endpoints that are being exposed over HTTP, you can think of them being behind the servlet. So all of your controllers are sitting behind this servlet. So whenever there is a client, so when they say client here, that means whenever there's a request that comes in from any client, the request has to go through all of these filters. It is these filters that actually do all the security check. And if everything passes, then the request makes it to the servlet and the servlet has logic in it, among other things, and it's going to send the request to the appropriate controller method. So you really have to understand that there is like a filter chain that the request goes through before it makes it to the servlet and the servlet is then going to 
delegate this request to the appropriate controller to the appropriate method so that's the first thing that you need to understand and this is also a high level so if i scroll down you will see the the same diagram but in more detail the general idea is the same we have the client and then we have a bunch of filters we have a security filter chain and then some other filters that were already present with the spring framework and then ultimately if everything is successful then your request makes it to the servlet and then behind the servlet is where all of your controllers are and then the request is received by the appropriate controller what that means also is that if there's any errors like if you're expecting some username and some password and you didn't get it then the filter is going to throw an exception and the request will never make it to the servlet and then you can send say hey uh, you're not authorized to access this resource or something like that so you really need to understand this concept of a filter chain where when you send your request before your request can make it to the controller it has to go through this filter chain to make sure that the request is authorized and it's authenticated and all that and then the request can make it to the servlet and then the servlet is going to send it to the controller so that's the first thing that you have to understand with spring security so this concept of a filter chain is very important which is sitting in between of the client so all of the requests coming into the application and the servlet which is before all of your controllers so all of your controllers are behind this servlet and this filter chain is what is checking for authorization authentication etc whatever you want to check for and the request that's going to be done in these filters and only if every check passes then the request will make it to the servlet so that's not really too hard to understand hopefully you guys understand that so the second thing that i want to do is to show you how it really works right because right now you have to understand the concept of a authentication manager and authentication provider these are the other concepts that you have to understand but at a very high level just keep this image in mind you have this filter chain and all of your requests will go through it so what i I want to show you is how exactly this the security works right what happens when you have a security configuration and you send a request to log in let's say you provided correct credentials then what happens behind the scene right what exactly is happening where is the request going so i'm going to show you a little bit of that so that you can understand exactly what happened and whenever we're going to be writing the code then you will understand what these things mean and that's just going to help you so that you're not super confused so that's what we're going to be doing next so spring security is big if you go to the github so the page that i just showed you with the source code and you go through it you will see that it's a lot of code so there is a lot to learn but if you understand what i'm going to explain to you in this one slide then you will have a very solid understanding of the flow of spring security now spring security just like spring boot comes with a lot of default configuration so what that means is that if i go to the application right now and i uncomment the security dependency and rerun the application you will notice that the application is secure even though we didn't put any kind of configuration that's because by default spring is already configuring the application as long as I have the security dependency and the class path and this is really important to understand because it's upon this existing configuration that you're gonna put your custom configuration so that you can work with spring security so you remember that we had a bunch of filters and whenever a request comes in it goes through all of these filters and then if everything checks out then that one request makes it to the servlet and then the servlet will send your request to the appropriate controller. Start thinking that we are at the filter, especially the Spring Security filter. So by default, Spring Security uses a filter name username password authentication field so whenever you send a request and you have the dependency for spring security in your class path and spring security configured all of the default configuration for you then it's going to use this username password authentication filter by default now what does that mean that means if i go to the application right now and i uncomment the security dependency and i rerun the application and let's say i rerun it in debug mode and then I put a brick point inside of this class somewhere. Then I know that this class is going to be called because it's the default filter for the Spring Security configuration. So that's the first thing you have to understand. By default, Spring is going to use this filter to try to authenticate any request coming in as long as you have Spring Security enabled in your application, meaning you have the dependency in your POM file or your Gradle file or whatever. So that's the first thing. Now, every time Spring Security needs to authenticate the user, meaning let's say you send a request and then you send a username and a password, you need to authenticate the user. So you need to compare 
the username and the password with an existing username and a password. Spring Security is going to use something called an authentication manager. And by default, it's going to use an implementation of this authentication manager called provider manager. So what that means, again, if I run the application, I enable Spring Security and I go into this class provider manager and I put a breakpoint somewhere that I think the code will hit. And then I send a request to the application. I should have a hit in my breakpoint inside of the provider manager because it's the default implementation. Now, the other thing you have to understand is the provider manager is not what's doing the actual authentication. And when I say the actual authentication, I mean comparing the username, assuming that we're sending a username and a password because, you know, we can send a token, we can send anything as our authentication. But in this specific case, we're taking an example of sending a username and a password or an email and a password. So the provider manager, which is the implementation of the authentication provider or on implementation of the authentication provider, because we can have as many authentication uh, provider implementations as we want. That's not what's actually doing the actual authentication. This is really just a manager. So it's doing some management stuff, checking for some other things here and there, but that's not what's doing the actual authentication. The authentication happened in something called an authentication provider. The authentication provider, that's what's going to take the request and then check or compare the username and the password to something that exists in the application, either in memory or by loading it from a database or whatnot. So the provider manager, which is the implementation of the authentication manager, is going to forward the credentials to the authentication provider. And the default authentication provider is the DAU authentication provider. So everything I put at the top in white that's the default implementation that gets used if you just enable Spring Security in your application and you didn't give your own configuration. And what this authentication provider needs to actually do the actual authentication is something called a user details service. The user details service is what's going to contain all of your users in the application. And that's it. You see how simple it is? Just four points, <laughs> even though it's complex. But if you understand this four point, you're going to have a pretty good understanding of what's going on with Spring Security. So the user details service, like the name implies, it has all of the users. So let's say you have user join with password one, two, three, user Peter with password one, two, three. Then these two users, they're going to exist in this user details service. And the default implementation of the user details service is something called in memory user details manager. So if you enable Spring Security in your configuration right now, you will see that when you run the application, Spring is going to give you this default password. That's because it's storing that password, like it's creating the password on the fly and then storing it in the in memory user details manager. And then the user is going to be like the string user. So if you go to access your application, it's going to give you this default login page. And if you use user and then you use the password, then you're going to be able to log in because by default, Spring is using this username password authentication filter that takes a username and a password and the password will be given to you and the log when you run the application. So this is the core of what you need to understand when it comes to Spring Security. Remember, we talked about all the filters. So your requests, they're not going to go directly to the controllers. They're going to go through a bunch of filters. And the default filter that is used in Spring Security to start looking into, you know, is this request supposed to come through? Is it authenticated and all that? That's the username password authentication filter. And what this filter is going to do is going to send the request to an authentication manager. Authentication manager is just managing the authentication. It's doing some other stuff. Like you can go and look at the class. You'll see what it's doing. But eventually you will see that it's not comparing any username or any password, meaning it's not doing the actual authentication comparing the password, comparing the username. What it's going to do, it's going to use something called an authentication provider. And you can have multiple authentication providers, by the way. And the default one is the DAU authentication provider. And that provider, by default, it's going to use this in-memory user details manager. Unless you give it your own user details, then it's going to use your own user details. So what I'm going to do to really make you understand this, we're going to one by one customize 
each one of these main concepts in Spring Security. And you will see how it's going to make sense. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to just enable Spring Security in the application, and then we're going to run it so that you can see all of this in action. And then we're going to come back very briefly to the slide, and then we're going to customize the in-memory user details manager. So we're going to give our own user detail service with our own users. And then we're going to try. And then after that, we're going to give our own authentication provider. And then we're going to go from this. So we're going to walk our way from the bottom to the top, because that's the best way for you to understand what's going on in Spring Security. So with all that being said, and you being ready, <laughs> so let's go ahead and dive in. So what I'm going to do is enable the dependency in the POM file and then just run the application and see what happens. And then we're gonna go one by one, step by step, until you understand exactly what's going on in Spring Security. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So I'm back in the application and I'm gonna go to the POM file and I'm just gonna uncomment the dependency for Spring Security. So I'm gonna uncomment that. And then I'm gonna just click this M for Maven to just reload and make sure these dependencies uh, are installed. Okay, and then I'm gonna run the application. So I'm gonna click on the green button just to run it. So now you will see that this password was generated. So it says using generated security password, this password. The user is user, which you can actually see if you go to the default user detail service, which is the in-memory user details manager. So if you go into that class, you will see where it sets the user. And actually, let me just show you. So if I search for this class in memory user details manager, and you can see it's coming here. Okay, so it's coming, you see it's coming from the class path, so from Maven. So if you go here, and you can see where it has this users, which is a map where the user is being created. So this map will contain the default user, and then the password is going to be generated on the fly. So if we go back Back now to Postman, and let's say that we want to send this request again. Remember, before we were just getting an error because this token was not found. But now, if we try to send the same request, you notice we get a 401 unauthorized. However, if we then go to authorization, and by default, I think it's using basic uh, authentication. So we're using basic authentication, and then we say the user is going to be user, and then the password we need to get. Uh, if I can go back and uh, you see the error. So let's go up, scroll all the way up and we see if we can copy this password, copy it and then paste it here. You will see that we will not get the fall one anymore. We will get the error that this token was not found. So if I send it again, you see now we have the error again because by default, Spring Security is using basic authentication. I think it's also using form authentication. So maybe we can check that out. So if I copy this, and I go to the browser and I send that and there you go. So you can see that it's giving me form authentication. So by default, it's not only using basic authentication, it's also using form authentication. Okay, so let's go back to the code. So you can see we're going to get the same error again. So if I scroll up, uh, it will say that it could not find the confirmation. Okay, so we were able to access it. We didn't get any more full ones because we sent the default user, which is user, and the password, which is the password that was generated. So why is all of this happening? Like, I didn't do any configuration, I just put a dependency. Well, that's because, as you know, with Spring Boot, Spring Boot does a lot of auto configuration for you. So that's what's happening. All of the things that I just showed you on the slide, that's what's happening here. And if you wanna see more, um, we can search for the username, password, authentication token so this class uh, let me scroll up well not this one username password authentication token so i'm gonna look for this class so this class right here so maybe if i put a breakpoint well i have to restart this in debug mode so i'm gonna click you know debug and i'm gonna put uh one breakpoint here and another breakpoint here and uh let's see let's see let's see uh get credentials i'm just gonna put one here and another one here, uh, set authentication as well. I just don't want to miss anything, okay? So remember, this is the default configuration that gets called, the username password authentication token. So now if we grab this, well, we don't even have to grab it. We can just send another request. So I'm going to send another request, and you see we hit this class, the username password authentication token, and you see the credential user as the principal, and the credential is the one that we we have in, in Postman. So you see that by default, it's using this username password authentication token. So I'm gonna click on this double circles in red, and then I'm gonna disable 
all of the breakpoint and click done and then i'm going to click on display to run this through uh if you go back to postman it should fail yeah 401 because this password is no longer valid but you see that this gets hit so what else should we look into so we can look at the provider manager so the provider manager is the authentication manager that gets used so let's look for the provider manager back to the application i'm just gonna just mute all of these breakpoints actually i can just delete them i can click on all of them and then click this um, minus sign click ok so we were gonna look at the provider manager so we can say provider manager so this class so if we just put a breakpoint somewhere here it should also hit so let's see maybe here and provider manager here uh, also here um, to, 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 to authenticate maybe here so let's see what else we have okay I think that should do it so let's uh, restart and debug mode then we're gonna send a request this is the last one that I'm doing I believe that you believe me so let's go ahead and send this request Maybe we didn't put the breakpoint in the proper place. Um, let's put one here. Oh, they're disabled. I have to unclick this and then click here. Uh, done. There we go. Like that. Okay, so let's try that one more time. So send the request and there you go. So you see, we also hit this provider manager because it's the default implementation for the authentication manager. Okay, so if we go inside of the authentication manager, it has one method, authenticate. Eventually, this method, what it's going to do is call the authentication provider to delegate the authentication to the authentication provider. Authentication managers, they don't do authentication. They do some other stuff. So if we go here and you see the authentication manager is here. So if I copy this parent and then I search for it inside of this class, so I'm going to press enter and I'm going to press enter again. I'm going to keep pressing enter and scroll down. Well, I'm going to say parent that authenticate. So there you go. So you see, we only have one. You see in my ID, I have one match in this class for the parent which is the authentication manager authenticate so what this authenticate is going to do this authenticate is going to call the authentication provider so the authentication provider is what's going to do the actual authentication like comparing the username and the password so i'm going to run this through okay so now let's take a look at the last piece which is the DAO, well, that's not the last piece because the last piece is this, but I want to look at the DAO authentication provider because that's where the actual authentication is taking place. So let's go back to the code and then I'm gonna press shift three times and then I'm gonna search for DAO, DAO authentication provider. Okay, that one. So this is what's actually doing the authentication for when we don't have our own configuration because that's the default. And if I scroll down and scroll down some more, you can see where it's retrieving the user using the user details because we need the user details service. That's where the actual user are. And you can see the user is loaded here. And if I scroll down some more and some more, uh, I can't see what I'm looking for. Maybe I passed it. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. So you can see here, it's getting the credentials. So on line 41, remember this is the default. So the username password authentication token, that's the default token from the, uh, let me see if I can go back to the slide. So this username password authentication filter, it's going to create an object with the username and the password of the user. And that's going to be stored inside of the username password authentication token. You can see they have almost the same name. The only difference is this is token. And the one that I just showed in the slide is filter. So just know that when the filter intercepts the request, it creates this object and that's what's going to contain the username and the password. So you can see it's grabbing the password here. I mean, it's doing some checks here to make sure that things are not null. But what we're interested in is this password here. OK, so it gets the credential from this object, get the password. This is where it checks to make sure that the password is correct. So you see it's using the password encoder and see that if the user coming from the user details, so the user details, remember, coming from the user details service, and it is checking to make sure that the password match. And it uses the encoder because the password is encoded. And all it's doing is it's saying if the password don't match, just throw an exception. So if the password do match, then the request is going to continue. No exception will be thrown and then it will make it to the server or to the next filter. But in this case, we're assuming that, uh, you know, everything else will pass. But it's only checking to make sure that the password are the same. So if we put a breakpoint here and we send the request again, it's just going to send it. You can see we hit. Well, that's not the one I'm going to please pray, play. There we go. So now we're here. So if you look, if we step through this now, this was not null. So it skipped to 
this line. So if we look inside of this authentication, you will see that this is the user and this is the password. Okay, so that should throw an exception because we know that the password was incorrect. So if I step over and then now we're in the if statement, if I click step over again, it will go here and through the exception. Well, this is true. So it's going to go inside and then it's going to log this and then throws the exception. Okay, so we know that if there is an exception that gets thrown, then our application is maybe like half broken. So, uh, so if I run this, it throws the exception. We go back to Postman 401. Okay, there is like other th things that are being done to make sure that the appropriate um, status code is sent back and stuff like that. So we don't have to worry about all of this downstream um, services and calls and things like that. But now you understand where it's taking place. Okay, and here in the DAO authentication provider, that's the only place where you're going to see checks for password. The manager is not going to do it. The filters are not going to do it. They're doing other things. They're not doing the actual authentication. So authentication happens in authentication provider. Okay, so hopefully you have a pretty good understanding of what's going on. So let's go back one more time to the slides. So you have filters. The default one is username password authentication filters. And you just saw that this class is going to create a, a username password authentication token and then send it to the um, authentication manager. The authentication manager is doing a bunch of other things, but we know that that's not what's doing the actual authentication. Authentication happens in the authentication provider. By default, that's the DAO authentication provider. And that's grabbing the information from something called a user detail service, which contains the user information. And by default, that's the in-memory user details manager. So what can we do at this point? So at this point, I'm going to take you step by step to the implementation. So first, we're going to implement our own users. So instead of using Spring's users and then this long password, we're going to put our own users with their password. So what that means is that we're going to have to work and override the user details service. So override the in-memory user details manager and provide this manager with our own users. So let's go ahead and work on that next. So I'm going to go ahead and close everything again, close the debugger, and we want to go inside of the application and I'm going to create another package. I'm going to call it security. Okay, so everything security related is going to go here and then I'm going to create a new class. I'm going to call it filter chain configuration. Okay, so this is the beginning of our Spring Security configuration, and I need to add the add configuration. So coming from Spring Context, and I want to enable web security. So this one right here, and then I want to add enable method security, and we're going to talk about this uh, in a moment. And also, I want requires constructor. I don't know if I'm going to use all of this stuff that I'm uh, adding in here at the uh, class level, but I know eventually I will need to use all of them. So I'm just going to put them there. Then I'm going to put some space. Now, remember, we need to tell Spring, hey, these are our users. All these other users that you are creating, we want to override them. We want to give our own users. So the way that you do this is to create a bin. So we're going to say bin and then we're going to say public. Remember, the class that we want to override is a user detail. So we're going to say user details, oops, user detail service. Okay, so this class. And then we're going to name it, you know, our own user detail service. And what we're going to do, we're going to say, we're going to create some users. So the user detail service, it takes some users. So we're going to say user, uh, user one equal. And then we're going to say users coming from Spring Security that with details uh, actually we can do something else because if we do with details it's going to ask us for an encoder because you always have to encode your password and if the password is not encoded uh, spring is not going to be happy with that so we can do that with default encoder okay so you can see that it's deprecated because they don't want you to use it but we're going to use it just to test and then we're going to see username and then i'm going to pass in uh well lowercase junior so that's my username and then I want to pass in my password. So I'm going to say that password and I'm going to say, let me in and then I'm going to give myself a role. So I'm going to say roles it takes an array, but I'll pass role underscore user. Well, just user in this case. And we'll talk about the meaning or the difference between role underscore user and then just role is user. And then we're going to call build. Oops, build. Okay. So this is our user. We can create another one. So I'm going to, going to copy this. I'm going to rename this to junior as the name of the user and then paste this again. And I don't know, 
uh, Anna, well, lowercase Anna, I just couldn't think of anything better. And then we're going to change this to Anna. Okay, so we have two users. They both have the same role and the same password. We can just say return. We're going to override the in memory. So we're going to say return a new in memory user details manager. And then we're going to pass in a list of, and then we're going to pass in junior and then uh, pass in Anna. Okay, because it takes a collection. So now we have overwritten the users in Spring Security because you know that the default DAO, so if you go back to the slides real quick, so the so the DA authentication provider, which is the default authentication provider. So remember, authentication providers is what actually does the actual authentication, like verifying the password and the username. So we know that this default DA authentication provider, it uses this in memory user details, which is giving the user details service, which is where the user details are. So if we go back, you can see that this is the user detail service, like this thing right here. Like if I hover over this user, you can see that it's the user details. Okay, so you can see it here. That's the user details. And then we're giving these two user details to the in-memory user details manager. Okay, and then I'm going to remove the space at the bottom. So now if we run the application, we should be able to access it using all the defaults. The only thing we're overriding is the users so let's go ahead and run it and rerun okay so you can see that it started just fine and it's giving us a warning saying that we shouldn't use the default password encoder but that's because we're just testing we're gonna fix that a little bit later so now if i go back to postman or the browser and then i send this request again 401 but if i pass in junior and then i pass in let me in i should be able to send the request so i send it and you see we get the same error this time it works. So if you want to see this in action in the browser, you can just copy this URL or any URL that goes to the any route in the application. Let me bring this over here and expand it. So if I go to this URL, it's going to reroute me here. And if I go to Anna, I uh, hope that's how I spelled it. <laughs> Let me in. Press enter. Back credential. Yay. So what did I say? Uh, I said any. It's Anna. Okay, fine. I'll use any because I don't want to restart. So any, and then let me in. sign in. See, we were able to log in, but you know, we got a 500 because um, there was an error that occurred. He couldn't find this key. Okay, so far so good. Any questions, let me know. Step-by-step step, we're going. Remember, we only did this part. All of these defaults are still being used. Okay, so default username, password authentication token filter is being used. The default provider manager is being used as the authentication manager. And the default DAO authentication provider is still being used as the authentication provider. The only thing we've overridden is the in-memory user detail. So we pass in two users. So now let's go ahead and see if we can override the authentication provider, in this case, the DAU authentication provider. So let's go ahead and do that next. So back in the application, I'm going to collapse this. We've only done one thing, passing in our own users. Okay. So now let's see if we can override the provider. So the way that we can do this is to define another bin and we're going to say public and we're going to define something called the authentication manager. So we're going to say authentication manager. And we're just going to name it authentication manager. And inside of the authentication manager, we're going to pass in the user detail service. So user detail service. We could also pass in a password encoder, but we don't have a bean for a password encoder because we're using this default password encoder, which is not recommended. Now, what we're going to do, we need to override the DAO authentication provider. So the DAO authentication provider, they work together with the authentication manager because you have to tell the manager, hey, this is the authentication provider that we need to use. So that's why you see that this bean is of type authentication manager. So what we're going to do, we're going to say DAO authentication provider. So that's the provider and we're just going to name it authentication provider and then create a new one, new DAO authentication provider. Okay. Now, what can we do with this DAO? Let's see. So we're going to say DAO and then press that just so we can see what we can set. So what we can do with the DAO, which is the default provider, but we overriding it, we can set the encoder, but we're not using any encoder. We can also set a user detail password service, which we don't have. And we can also set a user detail service. So even though by default we were using this bean, the user detail service bean, we can also specify it explicitly to the authentication manager. So we can select that and we're going to say use the user detail service. Now you're wondering, well, we're not calling this method anywhere. Where is this user detail service coming from? Well, 
because we have a bean that we define, that's the bean that's going to be passed into this because we have one defined. If we didn't have this defined, it will use the default, which is the one with the user, and then the password will be generated like in the console. But because we have our own bean of the same type, user detail service, then it's going to say, oh, okay, they have defined it, so let's just use this one. So it's going to use this one, okay? And if we wanted to, we could pass in anything else. So a password encoder, a user details password service, which is another service that you can use, but only for the password of the users, and also user details, which we just use to pass. Okay, so we don't have to do anything else, but you can see there's only like three setters on this DE authentication provider. And then now, what we have to return, so return the default provider. Remember, it's a new provider manager, so this one right here, and then we're passing in the authentication provider. So you can see how they work together. So DAO authentication provider, and then that's it. So we've overridden the DAO authentication provider by overriding the values that we can set on it, and then we're turning a new provider manager because this class is very convenient because it has a constructor that takes a provider, okay, as the provider to be used for that manager. So we know that's the default. So we're passing and we say, hey, I know you are the default. We could also say this. That would work just fine as well. Um, there's no problem with this because this overrides the parent class. So hopefully this is making sense, right? You can see that in this one bean, we make all these things work together. We know that this is going to be passed automatically because we have the bean. And we know that this is the default provider. We're overriding it, overriding the user detail service. So we're passing in our user detail service. And then we know that this provider is a subclass or it extends this class. So we say, hey, since this class is an interface, if we go in here, you can see it's an interface. We can create a constructor for it, but we know this interface, if we go to the implementation, we know one of them is the provider manager. So we say, hey, we can use the provider manager. So this class right here, and we can just call the constructor and give it our authentication provider. And that's what we just did here. We call the constructor, give it the provider. Okay. So this way we've overwritten the default DAO authentication provider. So now if we rerun again, nothing will change because it's almost kind of like what was already happening. Okay, so you can see we started again. If I go back to Postman, send the request again. Well, I'm not going to pass in any auth, so I'm going to say no auth, send 401. But if I use basic authentication and send, we get the error, which means we pass all of the security filters. The application just throws this exception. And if we pass in any, same thing should happen. Okay, because those are our users. However, if we pass in someone that doesn't exist, send 401. Okay, so far so good. One more time, let's go back to the slides. So we overridden this, and we've also overridden these two. Okay, in one bean, we've overridden these two. We tell the authentication manager, and the provider manager is the default for it. We say, hey, this is our DAO, because the provider manager needs to know what the authentication provider is. And then we've overridden, or we created a new instance of the DAO authentication provider. And then we return that with our own user detail service. So far, so good. <laughs> so hopefully this is clear. Like I really try to make this as clear as possible. So hopefully you guys are getting it. Now, what do you see? Well, we haven't done anything with the filters. Maybe we should look at the filters, right? Because right now, all of the endpoints in the applications, they're all locked. By default, Spring Security is going to say, hey, all endpoints should be authenticated. Spring Security by default is going to secure every single endpoint in the application. So we need to put in a configuration to say, hey, if the path is login or register or reset password, don't make it go through the filter and try to see if there is a username and a password. Just let it go through, just send it to the controller because these routes or this path, they're supposed to be open. We don't want the user to be authenticated in order to access the, you know, login or register or reset password. So that's the configuration that we have to put. So that's what we're going to be doing next. Now for the filters, you know that there's like tons and tons of filters, but the one that Spring Security uses by default is this username password authentication filter. Now this filter that is intercepting the request whenever we send the credential. And by default, Spring is going to secure every single endpoint except for the login and I think the logout and maybe a couple of others, but all endpoints in the application by default, they're all secure. So if we try to access them, it's going to say, hey, that's a 401, which means unauthorized. Another configuration that we can add in Spring Security is to tell Spring Security, hey, I want you to not secure these specific endpoints. And if a request comes in and it comes for these specific endpoints, just let the request go through and then send the response back to the client or to whoever other application or the browser that calls the endpoint. 
So we can add a filter that's just going to do this for us so that we can open up some other endpoints that we don't want to secure or we don't want Spring Security to secure. So let's go ahead and see how we can do this. So back in the application, I'm going to go down and then I'm going to define another bin and I'm going to say public and this is going to be the security filter chain. So that's the bin that we need to define and it takes the HTTP security. So we're going to say HTTP security. I'm going to name it HTTP and it throws an exception. So we're going to say throws exception. What we have to do, we can return HTTP and then pass in more configuration. So one thing we can do is to say that authorize. And then here we're going to have a request and this takes an error function. So what we can say, we can say, hey, for every request that matches a specific pattern, so we're gonna say request matches, and let's say, for example, if someone goes to user forward slash test, for example, so we're just gonna do a simple test. So we're saying if someone comes to this specific path, then we want to say permit all. And then after that, we're gonna say, well, we can do that any request authenticate, okay? So technically what we're saying is, we say, hey, any request that comes into the application, as long as it's not user slash test, you need to authenticate it. Then I'm going to say that build. So this is a very, very simple configuration that we have for the security filter chain. You will see later that this method can take so many different configurations. This is really nothing that we're doing so far. So all we're doing is saying, hey, the security filter chain, which is one of the filters, we're saying, hey, if the request comes for user slash test, permit all, meaning don't secure it. Don't try to see if there is any user or anything like that. Just send it over to the servlet so that the servlet can send it over to the controller. And then we say, after that, anything else, make sure they're authenticated. So that's what this line is doing. And then we call build so that we can build this HTTP security and then return it. So now if we rerun the application and we try to access slash user slash test, which we don't have in the application yet, we don't have any controller methods or rest controller methods that is listening to this endpoint, but we should no longer get a 401. So let's go ahead and just rerun the application and just give it a second to start. Okay, so we're up and running. Now I'm gonna go ahead and open Postman and I'm just gonna duplicate this tab, so duplicate. And then we want to go to user slash test. Is that what we had? Let's take a look. Yeah, so user slash test, which doesn't exist. So if we go back to user slash test, we can send any type of method, but I'm just gonna keep it as a get. And I go to authorization and I make sure that I don't have any authorization. So I'm gonna say no all and then send the request. You notice now we get a different error, which is a 403, which is forbidden. So before we were getting a 401, which is unauthorized, meaning we don't have access because we're not authenticated, but now we get a forbidden, which means we don't have permission. So you can already see there's a difference, but we were supposed to get a 404, which is not found, right? 404 not found because we don't have this route defined in the application. Surprisingly, if the route is not defined in the application, in this case, Spring just throws a 403 instead of a 404. So what we can do, we can go back to the application and we can go back to the controller. So in here, we can just create a simple endpoint. So I'm gonna copy this one, paste it down, and we're gonna say that's gonna go to tests test and we're going to say test and we're not going to take any parameters. It wouldn't do anything if we left in here and we're not going to return any response. Well, any response body, but we have to return something. And in here, I'm just going to call build, not body, but we need to call build so that we can just build a simple response with nothing in the bad. So now if I go back and refresh and give this a second, so this is going to go to slash user slash test, which means it should give me this 200. It shouldn't give me the 403, which is what Spring is going to throw back if it doesn't see that the route exists in any of your controllers. So now if we go back and we send the request again, and you see we get a 200 because we told Spring to not secure this endpoint. So even though I'm sending the request with no authorization, you can see I have nothing here. But if I were to go to test again, like I change the path and I send this, now you can see I got another 403. So this is how this works. Now, what do we need to do? Well, if we go back to the slides, remember that the username password authentication filter is the filter that is intercepting the request. You might be asking yourself, well, I would like to have more control, right? Because we have some users defined, we have some configurations going on, but we're still not receiving any username and password we're not calling the authentication manager, like we're not doing any of this. How can we possibly get more control to do this? Well, 
that's what I'm going to show you now. Let's say we wanted to create a controller so that we can send our login users to this particular controller. So we want to take control of receiving the request to log a user into the application, right? Because you don't want Spring to do everything for you. So how can we do this? Well, that's what we're going to be working on next. So back in the application, we're going to change this test. So we're going to say maybe login. So that's going to be a post request. So I'm going to copy this and then paste it here. So we're going to say now, if we want to log in, we have to go to user slash login, and then we're going to take maybe this. Okay. We're just going to use the username and the password or the email and the password in this case. So this email and the password, and then I'm also going to remove the add valid annotation because we're not actually doing the login implementation yet. I'm just getting you guys, uh, your feet wet into Spank security. So now remember we to make sure that we can access the login by default spring has the slash login open. And I think also the slash log out like log out. I think these two are open uh, that I know of. There might be like a couple more, but I know for sure these two are um, open in the configuration so that you can log in and log out. But now we're going to open user login and we're going to say permit all anything else, try to authenticate it. And then we're going to say, Hey, for the login, this is the method. And then we're going to try to log the user in. So what we're going to do, remember from the slides after the filter, it's the authentication manager, right? So from the slides, remember that after I had the filter on the left, then it was the authentication manager. So the authentication manager that we have here, which is the bin, we can use it in here. So since we have a uh, requires arcs constructor, so we can just pass it in here, private like that. So now we have the authentication manager. So with the authentication manager, we can go down here and say, Hey, now go to this authentication manager and then call the authentic. And the reason that I'm showing you this, and I'm going to wipe this all out and then uh, we're going to start building the login, but I really want you to understand what we're going to try to do. But once I do this and I explain all these things to you, you can understand how easy it is. So if you look at this authenticate, it's really the only method. Uh, we have some other stuff, but coming from the Lang, uh, Java Lang, but you see that we have this authenticate. Now, even though it's named authenticate, that's not what's doing the authentication. It's the provider that's doing the authentication. And the provider also has an authenticate method, which is the real authenticate method. So you see that this is taking an authentication object. Okay. So you see this, this class in here or this interface, it's very important. So let's select that. And then we're going to go in this authenticate. So remember this is an interface and it takes this authentication, which means the object that um, it needs to do the authentication. So let's go in there. So if you go in there, you'll see that you have a way to get the principle, get the authorities and get the authenticated and set authentication. This one is usually not used because they don't want you to set the authentication manually, but it's in there. So this is the authentication that Spring Security is using throughout the entire application. But now if you go back to the uh, user uh, resource, you might wondering, well, we're just doing the authentication at this point. Why do we need to have an authentication object to pass into the authenticate while we're still trying to do the authentication because we don't have an authentication yet. Now, if you remember from the slides, we have the username password authentication token as the default filter that is intercepting the request. So I went back to the slides just to show you, and I'm going to be using my mouse. So remember, this is the default filter. Okay. And this filter is using the username password authentication token to manage the authentication. So if I show you in the code, then you will understand it better. But I just wanted you to remember that we have this filter, right? So let's go inside of this filter. So let's do shift three times and we want to search for user name password authentication token. So now we're inside of this class and then I'm going to scroll down and you can see that it says this class. So the username password authentication token is an implementation of the authentication. And you can see that it's extending this class, which in turn will extend the authentication. So if we go inside of this class, you can see that it's extending the authentication, but this is the default one that gets used when you don't have any filters defined. You will see that this has two constructors. And if we scroll down, you see, we have now two methods unauthenticated and authenticated. And if I scroll down to put it in the middle of the screen, you'll notice that one has the principal and the credential, and you can see that there are two objects. Okay. So that means this can be a string 
or an object or anything that falls under an object, which is pretty much everything. So that means that you can pass in anything for the principal and you can pass in a whole object for the credentials. It doesn't have to be like an email or a password. It can be anything that is an object, which is pretty much everything in Java. You can pass in a list here if you want, because that falls under the category of an object. So I'm just showing you how open um, this is. But the difference between the two is the authenticated has an additional parameter. So what that means is that whenever you need to start the authentication, you're going to have an object that's going to be of type authentication, but it's only going to have the principal and the credential. And after the authentication has been successful, you're still going to have the same object, but it's going to contains authority. Okay. So that's the main difference between the two. And you can see that it's calling the same constructor to do the same thing. But the only difference is now we have authorities. This is very important because in our custom configuration, we're going to follow the same pattern. Okay. Now, why am I calling this authentication when it's clearly username password authentication? Well, like I just told you, it extends this class. Uh, well, there's a hop in the middle, which is this guy, but this guy also extends authentication. Okay. So what we can do is as for convenience, we can use this class, which is a, an implementation, not an interface, and then call its constructor to pass in an unauthenticated object, which is going to be of type authentication, because we know that this class extends this abstract authentication token, which in turn implements the authentication. So, I mean, I don't have to explain everything about ob uh, object oriented programming for you guys. Hopefully you guys have the basics, but technically speaking, we can use this class as an example. There are other classes that are like similar to this that we can use. So we can use this class call either this constructor, or we can just, just use this helper methods, the static methods to pass in an authentication object that contains only the username or the principal and the password or the credential. So we can either use this constructor. Well, not this one. We're going to use this one because we know that at this point in our code, our user is not authenticated. So because we don't have any authorities to, to create the, this one. Okay. So we're going to have to use unauthentic. So let me copy this class and then go back. Remember, this is taking unauthentication. Okay. So you can see it here. So we're going to say, well, I know that I can create this user by calling this class and make sure it's imported and call unauthenticated because if I call authenticated, I don't have any authorities to pass. So I'm going to say unauthenticated, which takes the principal in our case, that's going to be the username or the email. And it takes the credentials in our case, it's going to be a string, which is the password. So we're going to say unauthenticated. And then here we're going to say, well, user get email. That's going to be what we're going to use for our authentication. And then we say user get password. Okay. So that's going to do the authentication for us. And if this is successful, then we'll be able to access the page that we were trying to access. So hopefully this is making sense so far. And if you have any questions, just stop the video. Don't go any further and then just reach out to me in the discord. Then I'll be able to help you. But so far, everything should be clear. And again, if it's not clear, just ask me a question. So now let's rerun and restart. So remember we opened this user slash login to be uh, open. So it's permit all. So that spring is not going to try to authenticate it. And then when we access this as a post request, it's expecting a user request. In this case, we're just going to pass in an email and a password and we remove the add valid annotation. So even though we have all of these non empty for the first name and last name, we don't have to send the first name and last. Okay. So now we can try to see if we can log in by just calling the authentication manager, which we've already defined with all of our stuff. So our user details and all of our users and all that stuff. So we should be able to log in with the same users. Okay. Because once we create this bean and hopefully you guys understand the concept of beans, which means this class is available to be used throughout the entire application. That's what this bean is. So since we have this bean of authentication manager, we can just inject it in this class without doing anything. And I need to make this final so that it can be injected by the required constructor an uh, annotation. Okay. So now we have the authentication manager, which we know will be this one because we, oops, because we defined the bean for it. So that's the one we're going to use and we're going to just call the authenticate. So we're doing it manually bypassing the username password authentication filter, because we know that's the default filter. We're just going straight to the controller 
and then we call the authenticate and we know that's going to just trigger the entire authentication process well you can see here again we're not checking for any user password or any user email so we have some control but not the entire control okay so let's rerun uh, i think i already reran it but let's try it again and then let's go back to postman and we're gonna go to maybe um i'm gonna duplicate this tab and we want to go to user uh login and this is a post request and the body i'm gonna keep everything but we need to change the uh, email to be junior because we have a user in the application that's junior and let me in so if we send this request we should get a 200 so send this and now you see that we have another problem and we have a forward three. Now, the reason we got a forward three is because by default, Spring enabled cross-site request forgery. And because this is enabled by default, Spring was looking for a CSRF token and it didn't find it. And I'm gonna show you that in the browser uh, one time. So if I go to the browser and let's say I try to access this, so let's copy this. And then I'm going to paste it and send it. And you see that it says access denied. So that's the same forward three. If I zoom in a little that we were seeing. But if I go and inspect and let's open this up. I'm going to zoom in here a little more. And I'm going to try to go to slash login. So I'll show you where this is. Oops, too far. So I want to go to slash login. Okay, so it's still giving me the forward three, but uh, let me see if I can show you this in another way. Um, so let's go back to um, see. So I'm going to just comment this out. So I'm going to copy this because I want to show you this because I really want you to understand this. So now we have all endpoints will be secured okay so we're saying hey everything authenticate and then i'm gonna rerun because i want to show you what the, where the problem is coming from and then i'm gonna go back to the browser and then refresh uh let me see refresh and let me see if i miss anything so authorize request we want everything to be authenticated and in here we have a login that should matter so we can keep this here and i'm scroll up okay everything looks fine so let me rerun it one more time and let's refresh Okay, so we still have the same problem. Let me just uh, undo this and remove this. And I'm going to put this whole thing in a comment and then I'm going to rerun it because I want it to go back to the to the default so that I can show you this because it's going to be very important. So hopefully you guys are taking notes. So if I go back to anything, so I'm just going to go to localhost 8085. Okay, that's what I wanted. So now it's giving me the form and uh, I need to zoom in a little. So if we look at this form and open it up, you will see, and let me expand this a little. So you see the form and I'm going to expand all of the HTML stuff and look, we have this input and its name is underscore CSRF and the type is hidden. So we're not going to see it in the form, but Spring is using this to create a session for us. And you can see the value here is a value that was generated by Spring. So this value that I'm highlighting here. Okay. So CSRF, which is good for us because we don't want, you know, someone to um, attack us using cross site request forgery. That's what this CSRF is. But now, if we log in, so let's log in with Junior and then let me in. And I want you to see something here. So I'm going to go to the network and clear it. And I'm going to log in. So we log in, but it gives us a 404 because this base path doesn't have any controller to it. But if we look at the login and we scroll down, you see in the response header. So the response that sends, uh, Spring sends back to us, you see that it has a cookie. So this header set cookie and it has a JSON session ID and you can see it's HTTP only, which means we can only send this cookie through an HTTP request. We cannot access it then with JavaScript or anything like that. That's what this HTTP only means. So it's because CSRF is enabled. That's why we're getting this forward three. So if I go back to the code and I re-enable this and we're going to keep it exactly the way it is. But in addition, we're going to disable CSRF. So I'm going to say that CSRF and then we're going to uh, let's let's do the let's just take what it gives us. So HTTP security that disable and then I'm just going to use a Lambda expression. OK, so now we disable CSRF because we say, hey, don't worry about looking for this when we have a request coming in, like forget about it. Don't look for this CSRF key. None of that. So now now, if we rerun, we should be able to access our endpoint, which is the post to log in. And it's not going to give us a row three because it's going to say, OK, I don't have to worry about cross site request forgery anymore because they disabled it. So now if we go back to the uh, postman and we send this again, you see now we get a two hundred. Why did we get a two hundred? We didn't return anything. Obviously, you see we have nothing here, but we got a two hundred 
because we send the correct email and the correct password. But for example, if I put some gibberish in here and I send the request again, you can see it says forbidden. Okay. We were not able to access. So even though you don't see that we're sending in response, we actually logging in successfully because we get in the 200. What that means is that the code made it pass. Uh, if I go back to the resource, the code made it pass to here. Okay. So now I'm going to show you something. So I'm going to remove the semicolon and I'm going to press that var so that I can create a variable out of this. So this is the authentication. Okay. So that's the variable. And then I'm going to put a breakpoint right before it. So right here, I'm going to put a breakpoint and then I'm going to rerun it in the bug mode. So I'm going to say stop and rerun and I'm going to give it a second. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why I think I already had this endpoint, so it's enable. I'm going to disable it. Well, I'm going to see if I can remove all of these uh, other endpoints. So I'm going to leave the one that's in the user resource and then I'm going to remove everything else. Actually, I'm going to remove everything just like that. So I'm only leaving the one in the user resource and then I'm going to press the play button so that I can run this through. And then I'm going to close this provider manager. So we had a, a something in here. So now if I go back and send the request, now the code is going to stop here. So you see at this point, um, well, I'm going to do something else, but I want to show you that what this authentication is. So if I step over once, it's going to do, see how it's taking some time. So now it's done. It did the authentication and it's successful because we made it to this line. It didn't throw an exception. And if we look at this authenticated, which is the username password authentication token, you see now we have authenticated is true. Credentials is null because they're hiding the credentials and the principal is the actual user. So if I expand this, you can see the junior and some other stuff that it sets by default. But most importantly, you see the authorities and the role is role user. We set it as user in the configuration, but now you see that it's role user. So that means we're able to log in successfully. So I'm going to run this through and then return the response. But if I want, I can return this in the body. So here I'm going to say that, well, I can just rename this to body, return a map of, and then I'm going to pass in the key, which is going to be, oops, the user. And then we're going to pass in this authentication. We're going to paste it and then we're going to import the map and we need to say, um, okay, because now we need to return. And then I'm going to pass in a question mark here so that it doesn't complain. Uh, oh, I don't need this because I'm using okay here. Okay. So now if we rerun, you will see now we will get the entire authenticated user because after this line, the user gets authenticated. So now if we go back and send the request again, and we run this through, if we go back, you see, this is our authenticated user. Uh, can we make this nicer as a JSON. I'm not sure what's not. Uh, let's see. Pretty raw. Pretty. There we go. Okay. I don't know why it didn't do it by default, but now you can see spring did the entire authentication for us. So we have the user, which is the key in the map and he has authorities, which is an array and one of them is world user and then authenticated is true. The principal username is junior with these authorities and then some other stuff with spring security account expired, account non lock, etc. And the name of the authentication is also junior. So now you understand we're taking control, but so far you haven't seen where we're saying, Hey, check to see if this username and password is correct. Where do you see that? You don't also, you know that the, uh, let me see if I can just do this real quick, because I want you to see the difference between these two objects, even though they are the same. So I'm going to select everything and I'm going to say refactor and introduce variable unauthenticated. Okay. So that's fine. We can name it unauthenticated. So unauthenticated, which is just going to be username password authentication, which is, which is just an authentication, but we're using this class because it's convenient to create an authentication because the authentication itself is an interface. So if you go here, you'll see that it's a simple interface, but we know that it has a ton of implementation and we're just using one of them, which is the last one, username password authentication token, because we need to be able to create an instance of it. Okay. So hopefully that, that is clear. So now if we close this and go back, well, we have so many things open, close this as well. Well, I don't want to close this. I'll leave it open, but you see now, if I put the brick point here, you will see that these two objects, the unauthenticated and the authenticated, they're going to be very similar. The only difference is going to be that the first one will not have any authorities and everything else is going to be kind of the same, not quite, but uh, you'll see it. So now if we rerun again in debug mode and I have the breakpoint right here on line 57, and if we go back, we send the request again, it's going to stop here and then I'm going to step over once. So now we have this authenticated, then we can take a look at it. So if I expand this, you can see now we have the principal, 
Okay, that's the username. In this case, that's the email, but it's just junior. We have the credentials, that's just a string. And look, authorities is zero. I have no authority, okay? It's a collection, but I can expand it because there's nothing in it. And I can clearly see that it's of size zero because I'm not authenticated yet. And check out authenticated, which is also set to false because I'm not authenticated. So the point I'm making here is both the unauthenticated and authenticated user use the same object. The only difference is it doesn't have any authority and authenticated is false when it's not authenticated. And these became true and authorities exist when it is authentic. So now, even though it's the same object, if I step over once, you see it's taking some time because it's doing the authentication. Now authentication is done. So now if I look at the authenticated and expand it, you see the authenticated is now true. The principle is no longer a string. It's a whole spring user details user. Okay. Also really important what I'm showing you here, this user here, user details user, and then credentials null because they don't want to be passing the credentials around. So they make sure that the credentials are null and then authorities, which we set as users. So this guy has role user and you can see it in here. Okay. Role user. So hopefully this is clear. And again, make sure you're taking notes of what is what because once we really start doing our own authentication all of this is going to come into play and you're going to understand what we're doing so what is left at this point at this point we have taken control of the authentication manager which is doing some management stuff but eventually it's going to call a provider which in this case we're providing our own provider and the only thing we're telling the provider is we're giving the provider our users okay which is coming from the user detail service, which is what Spring is gonna use to get users. But we still haven't done anything to say, hey, get the user and compare this password with the user's password. We haven't done that. You haven't seen it, right? You understand that we're taking control, okay? So we see, hey, now we have our own endpoint and that's inside of our own controller and we're taking control. We are calling the authentication manager, which we know should exist and it should be ours, which means the one with the find here. So this means, so everything should be there. But so far, even though we understand all of this, we still don't see where we're saying, hey, take this email, compare it with the user's email that I have in my user digital service, so in here, or take this password and compare it to the password that I set for these users, which is let me in in both cases. Where is this happening? <laughs> so that's the question you're asking. So that's the last piece, right? I mean, there's more to Spring Security. There's like different ways that you can implement this and many different things that you can do with it. Uh, but we're just taking kind of a simpler approach so that you can fully understand what's going on. Uh, and that's just going to help you with everything else with Spring Security. So the last piece with this is the authentication provider because we know ultimately the authentication manager is going to pass this object which is the unauthenticated authentication it's going to pass it to the authentication provider and we know that this guy right here you can see authentication provider is in the name so we know that this is happening here okay we're just giving it the user but we're not explicitly saying hey compare this username with this username and compare this password with this password so this is the piece that we need to take control of so that we can control the entire flow so that we don't depend on Spring Security to do things that we don't see what it's doing. Well, you can trust them because uh, this framework is very robust. We can give them the credit that they're doing something right. <laughs> um, but say you want to take control because if you don't understand this part, then um, you, you're missing something because you need to say, well, exactly how can I take control of doing my own checks? And I'll show you where it was doing the check in the DA authentication provider. So if we go in there again, and if we scroll down, uh, go down, 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 and you can see where it's checking right here. Okay. So we know that it's calling the password encoder and then get the user detail, get the password. And we know that all of this is going to be passed in here and it's going to check. It's just checking to see if it's not matching. And then if it's not, then it's going to go in this if statement and then throw this exception to say bad credentials, as you can see here. And this is a class coming from Spring. So, you know, that's what they're doing. But how do we take this from spring how do we take this functionality from spring now check this out you see it's taking the username password authentication token as the authentication which is what we're passing in our controller okay to the authentication manager so so far so good but also look it needs the user details so what that means is 
whenever we're going to take control over this process of checking the username and the password, we need to pass to Spring Security a user detail because we know that this is where it's getting the password. Okay, so you see that it's checking the presented password, which is coming from the authentication. We know that this is our request. So this username password authentication is the unauthenticated. So the user coming in with the username and the password. But this is what Spring is using in its database or its memory. In our case, it's not the database, it's the memory because we define the users here. So we know that whenever we're going to take control of this authentication provider, we need to give Spring Security a user details and an unauthenticated authentication, which is this part right here. Okay. Remember, we talk about this class is just a, a convenient way to get an authentication. So we know that we're going to need to give two pieces of information. So we know what this is because we have it right here. That's right here. So we can always do that. But how do we get an instance of user detail? Well, let's go inside user details and see what's inside of here. Now we see user details, a simple interface, right? And it has a password as a username and some other Boolean values. Okay, that's simple enough. So how can we get an instance of this and then pass it over to Spring Security? How can we take this and build our own custom provider? Because we know we can, because if you look here, this is a custom provider. Well, it's still from Spring, but we know that it's a provider. So there is a class name authentication provider. So let's copy this and do shift three times and search for this class right here. So authentication provider. Well, what is it doing? Well, it's going to take the same object authenticate authentication and it's going to try to do the authentication. Okay. Same object makes sense because that's what we're passing. Okay. You know, we're passing in the same authentication. We know at this point it should also not be the authenticated, which means authenticated is false and there's no authorities, but we need to give that same object to the provider because the provider needs to check for the username and the password. And it also has this other method called supports. What this is doing is because Spring Security can take many different authentication providers. So there is like a loop that goes through all of the available providers and see which one that is supported by the authentication that you pass in. But we're going to talk about this when we do the implementation. So now we know we're still going to have to give an authentication. Okay. So let's see what are some of the classes that implement this authentication provider. We know the DAO is one. What else do we have? Let's click. So if we click here and we scroll down, we can see there's like a bunch of implementation of this. And the one that we know that's being used by default is this one right here, DAO authentication provider. And if we go in here, we can see that it's extending this abstract user details authentication provider. So we can go in there as well and we can take a look. So we see that this class is implementing the authentication provider and some other stuff, but it's not important for this. And if we scroll down, we scroll down, there's should be a place where it's taking the user details so we can see the additional checks is being created here. So that's the one that's being used to do the authentication for this class because it's overriding it. Okay. It says it's deprecated. Okay. So right here. And if we keep scrolling down, we will see the authenticate that's it's overriding that's coming from the parent class. So this is coming from this authentication because that's where this method is coming. This authenticate is coming and we see it's doing a bunch of things. It's uh, getting the username and it's using this cache to find a user detail. So you can see the user details is here. So technically we know that there's a cache and I'll show you the, the map uh, at some point in some uh, past lectures where it's creating some of the users and the password and save them on the, so we know that the user is coming from a user cache and you can see it right here. And this user cache just has get user from cache, push and cache and some other stuff. So that's not really important, but we know that these users are coming from a cache. So if you scroll down, uh, we go that to authenticate. And you see it's getting the user from the cache and this user is returning a user detail. So that's the user. And we see that it's checking to see if it's null and it's doing some other stuff. And okay, it's doing some more checks and it's doing a bunch of things that, so if you want, you can go and explore all of these um, methods that it's calling to see what it's doing. But ultimately that's, what's going to actually do the comparison and then determine that the user is authenticated and the password and the username are correct. So what we need to do is to override or create an implementation of this interface and give our own authentication. Okay. And then when we have our own authentication, we can do our own check because we know we can access the authentication get principle so that we can get our username and we can access get credentials so that we can access our password. And then we can check with 
the password that we have. So this is the last, well, not the last piece, but for what I'm trying to explain to you, this is going to be the last piece. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to do some cleanup and I'm going to close some of these things. You guys can go back and get the lectures and if you need to refresh your memory on what we just talked about, because I know it was a lot. I'm going to close so I can have some cleanup and then I'm going to create another class. So I'm going to go into the security package and then I'm going to create another class and I'm going to say my own authentication provider. Okay. Again, this is just proof of concept. We're not implementing our our logic yet. I'm just making you understand. And this is going to be the last piece. And then after that, we're going to go on to um, do the implementation that we want to. So I'm going to have my own implement uh, authentication provider. And I want to implement the authentication provider. So here I'm going to say authentication provider. Okay, so I know I have to override the authenticate and the so. So here we are. So the first thing I'm going to do, since I want this to be a bin, I'm going to say this is a component. And I'm also going to say required Arcs constructor and I might not use it. I don't know, but let's put it in here. Okay, so I'm gonna put some more space and then scroll up a little more. Okay, just like that. So what I can say is I'm gonna say whenever I get an authentication, I know it's gonna have a username and a password. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that's what I'm giving to the manager. So whatever you give to the manager right here, that's what you get in the provider. So ultimately, whenever you pass your authentication, which is the unauthenticated authentication, it gets passed all the way to the provider. So we will receive this object, this one in here. Okay, so far so good. So what can we do? Well, we need to cast this. So we're gonna say user equal, and then we're gonna cast the authentication to a username and password authentication token. So, so this class, because we know that's what it is, because that's what we're creating in our controller, and that's what we're passing here. So we're gonna say, okay, I know that's what this is gonna be. Oops, uh, oops, uh, let's do this one more time. So var user equal, we're gonna, oops, control Z, control V, oops. Uh, let me do that one more time. So let's copy this class, go back and then say, we're gonna cast it and then we're gonna say authentication. Okay, so now we have the user, which is the authentication. But wait, where is our users? Well, our users are here, user detail service. And we know we can access the user detail service because we have a bean defined as a user detail service. So, okay, we know we're passing in here and we pass it to the DAO. So we know that's the one that's gonna be used to do the authentication because we're passing it to this DAO so far. We're overriding this, but I'm just explaining that's why it was happening. But how do we get access to this? Well, what's inside of this? Let's go. Oh, there's a method called load user by username and it returns exactly the same object that we were seeing, which is user details. And this one just has the user information. So password, username is expired, et cetera, et cetera. So just a, a normal interface, nothing crazy going on. It extends serializable, but that's because they need it to be uh, serializable. So nothing else is going on here. So we can go back and say, well, we can just use this guy that we're gonna copy it. Well, if you click here, you'll see that we have the in memory user details manager as an implementation. So that's what we have here in memory user details manager. And if we click here again, we have some more. So the JWC uh, DAO, uh, well, not, not this one is an implementation, but this one right here is one that you can use if you're using uh, JDBC, so user details manager, uh, user JDBC user details manager, and a few more. But we know that we have a bean of this type, which is an implementation of this class. So what that means is we can inject this class anywhere we want as a bean because we know whatever implements this class, which in this case is the in-memory user details manager, we have a bean of that type and that bean has all of our users, this bean right here. So we can say, okay, then I can inject it in my authentication provider. Okay, so I'm gonna say private, final, user detail service, user detail service. My users should be in there because we have a bean of this type, AKA we have a bean that implements this guy and we're passing our users to that bin. Okay, so that means our users should be in here. So if we call load user by username, that should give us our users. So let's copy this. So now we have the user coming in from the requests and the user we saved in our database coming from the user detail service. Let's compare. So now we can go here and say, if the user that get credentials, okay? But this is an object, so we're gonna cast it. So we're gonna say it's a string because we know that the credential is the uh, user. And then I'm going to put another parenthesis just so that I can uh, convert it fully to a string and then use the equal 
So let's say uh, equal, and then we're gonna say user detail service. Well, we can do this on multiple lines, just so I'm not confusing you. But here we're gonna say uh, var user from DB equal user detail service that load user by username. What's the username? Well, the username is the one from the authentication. So user that get get name should work, but we should get principal because that's the username. And then we're gonna just cast it to an object. I mean to a string, okay? Because we know that the principal. If we go to our controller, see over over this, the first object, the principal, we're passing in our email, and the second one, the credentials, we're passing in the password. So we know these two values are gonna be strings, so we can cast them safely. So first, we cast the entire authentication to username password authentication token. That's our user coming from the request with the username and password. We need to authenticate them, and we know that our users in the database, aka in the memory, because we don't have a database yet. Everything is here. No database yet. We know that these users are in the user detail service. So we say, hey, load my user by this username. Okay. The principal is the username. In this case, that's going to be junior. So that's going to be the user from the database. And now we're just checking to see if the credentials coming from this user from the request is the same as the user from the database. Okay. So here we're going to see user from DB that get password. So this is our if statement. And if this is true, uh, we should also probably compare the username. So in this case, I'm not going to compare the username because it's going to look, the if statement is going to look a little messy. So I'm going to just remove it. Uh, I think I can just remove this too. Uh, we can compare the credentials with the password. There are two objects, so I guess that's okay. Hopefully that works. Otherwise I'll go back to string. So we know that if this is true, then what do we need to return? Again, we need to return an authentication, but this time, this authentication should have authenticated set to true, and it should also have authorities. Okay, so let's do that. So we're gonna say return, and we know that we can use the username password authentication token whenever we need an instance of this authentication, since we don't have our own yet, but we're gonna create our own. So username password authentication, this time, instead of calling unauthenticated, we're gonna call authenticated, and then now, what does authenticated take? Well, let's go in there. Well, it takes the principal, so that's the user, which is an object. It takes the credentials. We never want to pass the credential. And it takes authorities, which is a collection of anything that extends granted authority. Okay, so far so good. So we're going to say, well, for the principal, I can pass in a string because it's an object, or since I have the whole user here, this guy, from the database, I can say this is the guy. This is the principal. It's the user from the database. If we want, we can decorate this object with more stuff. We can do another call to the database and fetch some user that should be as the authenticated user. You can do anything you want because it's an object, so you can pass in pretty much anything you want. So we're gonna say this is it. And then for the password or the credentials in this case, like if I over over this, first one is the principal. So we pass in our user, the one that we fetch from the database. Second one is the credentials. We never want to pass the credentials. So I'm going to say open and close bracket. And then we're going to say password protect. Because there's no reason for us to have the password uh, going around in the, in the application memory. And then lastly, if I pass it null here, uh, you'll see that I need a comma here it will work, right? We can return that. In other case, so in this case that this doesn't work, we can just throw an exception. So throw, and I think the one we can throw here is uh, bad credential exception. And then we can say something like uh, unable uh, or incorrect email or password or something like that. Uh, we're gonna say unable to log in. And this is supposed to be a new, like that. Okay, like that, okay? So if this is true, we're only looking at the credential then we're gonna return this, tell Spring, hey, our user is good to go. They're authenticated. Otherwise, it will skip this if statement and it will throw this exception, unable to log in. The only thing we have left to do is the authorities. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So now for the authorities, remember, we can go back here and look, you see, it takes anything that extends. So you see, this says question mark, which is a collection. So question mark means anything that extends this grand authority. Okay, so we can do a loop here or for each, we loop over all of the roles of the user because we know we have access to the roles because we have this user here. Like if I go here and just show you what's on this user from the database. 
So you see that we have this get authorities, which is a list of granted authorities. So we can just say user from DB or from memory that get authorities. That's it. And Spring is going to do everything that it needs to do for us. What about this? Now, what this means is the support, this method, it means that what kind of authentication does this class support? That's what this means. Because remember, you can have more than one authentication provider. So this class will return true or false depending on what provider is being used. So in this case, I can just say true, meaning it's going to support any kind of provider, which is not very good. But I can say, hey, I know. Oops, I keep doing this. So I know it's going to be of this type. That's what I'm going to pass into the manager because this method is going to be called by the manager. Because remember, I told you the manager was doing a lot of different things. One of the things that the manager is doing, the authentication manager, is to check to see which provider it should send the request to. So the manager will call supports and then pass in the authentication. So in this case, this guy, and then he will say, does this equal to this authentication? And if it's true, then it's gonna say, okay, I support this type of authentication. Then it's gonna pass the authentication. Well, I'm saying authentication a lot, but it's gonna pass this, this guy to that particular authentication provider. So here we can just say true. Once the manager goes here to say, oh, it's true. Okay, I'm just gonna give it here because he knows that this supports this type of authentication. But if we wanna be more precise, we can say it's gonna be of this type. So we're going to say this, that class, we can say that uh, is assignable and then pass in the authentication. Okay. So whatever authentication that gets passed here, if it equals this username password authentication, then that's the one that we're going to use. And that's going to be true because we know that in the manager, we're creating an instance of this class. So whenever the manager is going to call the supports and pass this object, which is going to be of this type of this class, it's going to match. That's going to return true. So it's going to say, okay, I can call this or I can use this authentication manager to do the authentication for this particular request. So far, so good. Okay. So now we have this bean. We need to tell Spring Security about this bean. So we need to tell Spring Security, hey, I have my own authentication provider now. So if we go back, what does that mean? So it means that instead of passing this DAO to the manager, because the manager needs to know of all of our providers, we can have more than one. So now we're saying the DAO one is the one that was being used. And we know that is just doing the same thing that we're doing here. It's implementing this authentication provider, but now we have our own. So we need to tell the manager, this guy, which is the one that is being used to do the authentication. Remember it's right here. So we need to tell it in our configuration, say, Hey, this is the new authentication provider that we're going to use. We're not going to be using this one. So what do we need to do? We need to tell it to use this one. This one takes what user detail service. So we know that whenever we're going to create a new instance of this authentication manager, the only thing we have to give it is this user detail service. So so we can copy this class and go back. We're going to say that's the class we're going to use now. It's imported automatically. Then I'm going to pass it here, my own. Okay. So that's going to be that. So now we don't need this line right here because we know we don't have a setter for the, well, you could, you could just, you know, put a setter and then define this as a field, but we're not going to do it this way. We're just going to pass it to the constructor and we have it here. So we can copy that and see here, here's the user detail service, delete that, and then return this. There we go. And this is too long. I'm just going to set it to a var. Okay. So we say, Hey, this is our authentication provider. Now we don't need the DAO. We have our own thing. And here you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever logic you want. You can call the database. You can do anything you like in here because this is yours. You're taking control and you're just telling the manager because you know the manager needs to take all of the authentication providers because it's doing a bunch of things. So you don't have to tell the manager this is your authentication provider and the manager is the one that you're using here. Okay. It's always going to be that always going to be the manager, the one you're going to call every time to do your authentication. So now we should be good to go because we have our users as the user details, which we're giving here as a bean because this is a bean and we're passing it over to the authentication provider and it's right here. So now we can just run the application and I'm going to close uh, some of this stuff just to clean up. And I know this was a lot. And again, just go back to the videos and watch them. And I know I talk fast sometimes. So, <laughs> so just go back to the videos and watch them again. This is not an easy topic. I can tell you that. So let's run this. And if we did everything correct, we should be good to go. So we see that we're up and running. So now if we uh, probably need some logs, but let's just see if it works. Let's go back to Postman, extend this a little. So this should work just fine because I'm sending the correct password. So let's send this and I got a forward three. So one other thing I want to mention is Spring is sending forward threes whenever there's like any exception in the application. I promise you it's some kind of exception that occurred and Spring just threw a forward three. So if we go back. And I don't see anything interesting. Nothing is going on. Uh, let's see.
So I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. I don't know what's going on. So let's rerun. Probably something small. It's always something small. Okay, so let's send the request. Okay, so we got here and let's run, run. So you can look here, you see that you get your user. Okay, so you see this works just fine. All of these values are true and then we have our authority. So we get the user from the database because we just inject the user service and we also have the user from the request. So user principal is junior and then the credential is let me in. So you can see the difference between these two. Okay, so it's happening here probably. Yeah, I thought so. Probably because we're not using the um, the string. So if I go over, yeah, so it's failing here because it's not able to do the comparison. So let's fix that. I knew that was going to happen. So let's go and I'm just going to do something else just so that I make it clear what's happening. So we're going to say var password equal and we're going to say cast it to a string and then we're going to say user from db that get password not user from db this user get credential right here because we know that when we call the user from db get password that's definitely a string the only problem is this first one so now we can grab this password and then we can say if this password we can check for the username as well but i'm just giving you a simple example so the password uh, we don't need parentheses so if the password that we got from the request equal the password from the database or from this, then it should be successful. Then we will return this. Spring will do the rest. We don't have to do anything else. As long as you return this authenticated user, Spring will take it from there. That's all you have to do. So let's rerun. Give it a second. Okay, started. And let's go back and send it again. Okay, so we're here. Let's see if everything works. Didn't match. So this is, oh, because of the encoder. So I can copy this. Yeah, we have an encoder. So if we see what this is, so you, well, I did that too fast. So let's close. So click on this. It looks like a calculator like a grid thing you click it and then you paste your value here and then you click evaluate so you see this is a whole like it's encrypted because it's using the default encryption so it's this password here so what we can do multiple different ways we can solve this so we can say uh, i'll show you another way that you can do this so you can see that we're using this default password encoder so i think we're going to just have to omit this because i don't want to have to save the password as uh, encoded i can go online and then find a tool to just encode the password with bcrypt and then put the password in here but i don't want to have to do this but one thing we can do is do open and close and then do no up like that so you're saying hey we're not using any password encoder uh, and i put it in the wrong place so we have to put it in front of the password like this we're not going to do this in the application but we need to finish the proof of concept so that you understand the different moving uh, pieces of spring security before we dive in to do our custom configuration because if you understand what i'm explaining right now you like 80 percent there nothing is going to stop you when i give you this example it's going to be like okay it all makes sense now and then you'll be a master in spring security so we're going to say no op or saying that we're not using any password encoder and then we need to remove this because we don't want to use any default encoder or anything like that so i think we can do uh, user that with username so we're gonna get rid of that we're gonna do it a different way that's just another way that you can do it but I'm gonna put this in a comment so we're gonna say with username and uh, remove this and then we're gonna say junior I'm gonna put it on a no line so that's easier to see and then I'm gonna put this comment well I think I'm gonna undo this undo because I want you guys to have it this way another thing I can do because I want to show you another way that you can do this actually so let's uh, run this through and close and then I'm gonna show you another way so you can do another way like that bean uh, I'm gonna scroll up need more space at the bottom so we can say something like public the same thing just a different way and then in memory user details manager you can see it's the same same class and then here what we can say is we're gonna say return and then we can say new in memory oops well we can just copy this okay so we're gonna return this and then in there we're gonna pass in all of our users so we have user that with username and then we can pass in junior and then we're gonna say that password well I guess we can copy all of this and then put it here I'm gonna put it on one line just so that we can see them better. It's literally the same thing, just a different syntax. Okay, and then instead of a semicolon, we're gonna put a, a comma and then control D to duplicate it. And then I'm gonna have, and uh, I'm gonna spell their name correctly this time. Okay, and then I'm gonna remove this and there we go so now we have a different it's the same bean just a different syntax so i'm gonna put this in comments like that so that you guys have this code in case you want to when you're following the lecture so you have both of them okay so that's just another way to do this and then we can pass in no ops you could use the same it's not like i couldn't do it with this i just wanted you to have both of them and we could do something like this 
you see it works just fine okay so that's that so now we can just rerun because now we're saying we're not using any password encoder so we can pass in our raw password it should work just fine never gonna do that in production but we're testing so it's okay all right so we started and i'm gonna make sure i well i'm gonna stop it and then run it in normal mode not in debug mode because i don't want to debug it and then i'm gonna open postman i think we're up and running and then send got a four three again probably have another problem okay so we got this bean okay and i think we have a problem in here so let's debug it again spring security is just gonna throw a four three if we have an exception i want to see this in action i want to see it work so let's see okay so we're here bum, bum, bum. Huh. again so let me in and if i copy this and check this again okay so okay uh, what am i doing so let's run this through stop the application now we don't need the because we don't have any password encoder at all so we don't need this okay we should be okay now run give it a second to come up and send there we go. Okay. Able to log in successfully just using our own authentication, everything we did, customized almost everything. So you see now we can log in just fine. And if we pass in a bad password, send, it's not going to work. It's going to throw this exception. So if we do step over, step over, step over, there we go. And then run this through. Four or three. Okay. So instead of giving us the actual exception, it's just giving us a forward three. So I'm going to remove the debug point and then rerun this in normal mode. So hopefully you guys understand all of the different pieces that we went through with Spring Security. Now, again, there's a lot more that you can do with Spring Security, and this is just one approach. There's many different ways that you can configure Spring Security, and you can do many different things with it. But I'm just giving you a very high level overview so that you can understand how it works in the background. Make sure you look at the slide. The slide is very high level, like very high level, but it's the full picture. So make sure you look at the slide and make sure you remember, okay, we have filters and then authentication manager and then authentication provider and then user detail service. That's it. <laughs> Those are the three pieces. Now we know the authentication manager is going to use an authentication provider. And we know that we don't have to do that because Spring already has a default. But if we want to take control over it, we can do it that way and provide our own bin. So make sure you go to that slide and just look at it and go to the documentation that I showed in the beginning of this section and make sure you look at everything that we were doing. And you can look at the documentation there and see. But there's so much that I didn't cover, obviously, because Spring Security is big. But at least now you have a pretty good idea of what's happening and how you can take control of what you're doing. So hopefully you have a good foundation in Spring and Spring Beans because you really have to understand Spring Beans and how Beans work and what that means and how to inject Beans and do dependency injections and stuff like that. So I'm assuming most of you guys already have this basic uh, fundamentals of the, this framework. And that's why you're here, because you want to learn more. If if you understand everything that I just explained, you have a very solid foundation in Spring Security, and that's what I'm going to tell you. This configuration, you've seen it a lot, and you know there's a lot more that can go into this, but I'm going to show you how you can customize it and keep it so clean so that you can have your provider and uh, you know everything else in a separate file, and you only have to import just one single thing here without doing all the crazy, like sometimes you will see this configuration get so long, but there's a way that you can use something called a config figure so I don't have to do this big implementation in this security filter chain. So again, this is just the basics that I just gave you. We're going to take a, a different approach because I'm not going to be using a controller like that to do my authentication. I'm actually going to use a filter because you know that Spring was using a filter. So if we search for a username, password authentication token, well, password authentication filter, password authentication filter. So we know that Spring was using this filter to intercept our request and then try to do the authentication as you can see here. And you see where it's creating its own username password authentication token and it's passing it over to the manager. Okay, so exactly what we just did, we know that's what this filter is doing. And it works hand in hand with the username password authentication token because you see its name username password authentication filter and this is named username password authentication token. So they work together hand in hand. What that means is that if Spring you used a filter to do this, we should also use a filter to do it and not do it in the controller. Because when the request gets to the controller, that means they're authenticated unless it's an open endpoint like the login like this. But we know that best practice, or at least from a spring security perspective, it's best to use a filter to do the authentication. So I'm going to use a filter for the authentication and not do it in the controller. Even though this is a very good and solid overview, there's a lot more <laughs> to learn with spring security. And we haven't done the login yet. I just give you like an overview of the 
login, but we haven't done it. So what we're going to be doing in the next lectures is we're going to be working on the login feature. I just gave you an overview of Spring Security. So now you, you, you should be good, right? You're ready. Then I'm going to give you the actual implementation. We're going to go back to the course and then do the uh, implementation of our filters and do everything that we need to do for the login feature. So I hope you're ready. And again, make sure you watch these lectures if you want to watch them again, if you want to understand what's happening and all that. So make sure you go back and then uh, watch them again. Oops, I think I delete something here. I'm going to do control Z. But yeah, make sure you go back and then watch all of the lectures just to make sure that you fully understand what we're trying to do. So we're back to the functional requirements again. And this time I moved the login in the second position because we're going to be working on that right now. And I'm going to scroll up a little bit just so we can go over these four points that we have to uh, we have to code. So we need to allow the users to enter their email and password to log in. OK, so this is pretty self-explanatory. And then we have to make sure that if they have MFA set up, we should ask them for the QR code, even if they enter their correct email and password. So even after they put in their correct credentials, we're still going to ask them for the QR code if they have MFA set up, as you can see here. So again, pretty self-explanatory. And then we need to mitigate brute force attack. And the way we're going to do this is by allowing only six fail login attempts. And then after that, we're going to lock the account for 15 minutes. So we're going to let them try six times to get the wrong password. Remember, in this particular case for number three here, if they're getting the email and the password incorrect, then nothing's going to happen. The only time this is going to kick in is if they get the email correct and then they're getting the password wrong. OK, if both the email and the password are wrong, then we're just going to tell them, hey, incorrect email and password, please try again. But if the email is correct and the password is incorrect, then we can assume that someone somehow got a hold of the user's credential, but they don't know the password. So they're just trying to like break into the system by using a brute force attack. So we're going to say, hey, you can only do that six times within a window of 15 minutes. So we will need to account for that in our code. And then after 90 days, their password is going to expire and they won't be able to log in. So even if they have a correct password and they've been using it, but if it's been over 90 days, then the password is going to expire automatically and they won't be able to log in until they update their password. Okay, And this is going to help us with password rotation because, again, we're assuming that the security of the application is really important. So we're kind of like making up scenarios so that we can code these things in, in our application. I do want to say that these four points, they can be in a lot more detail. And also there would be requirements for the back end and requirements for the front end. So you can see here, it doesn't say that, hey, you need to make sure that they can submit a form if the form is not valid or anything like that, because this is kind of like mostly on the back end. But just know that you would have requirements for the back end and requirements for the front end. So I'm just making sure that you guys understand, even though we have a pretty good document that we're going off of to just build our application in the real world, this document will be a lot bigger with a lot more details. And you just would have to go line by line and make sure you cover every single requirement. So just making sure that you understand it. So we're going to be doing the login feature and this is going to allow us to put in the security configuration. So we're going to be diving into the nitty gritty of Spring Security and all the configurations that we're going to be putting in. The last thing that I want to do before we begin is I want to go back to our database. So I clean our database. I remove all of the tables. So you can see here if I click and refresh, we have no tables. So I'm going to right click and then I'm going to go to query tool because I need to run our uh, schema so that we can recreate those tables because we do want to have the foreign key as the created by and updated by. And I mentioned how it would be kind of a little bit more complicated to do it with JP. So we're going to be using the script so that we can put this in. So let's go back to the application and we want to go to our main uh, resources data and then we want to do the schema.sql. So I did um, update this a little. I think this is the last time that I'm going to update it just to make sure that everything is in place. So you will have access to this script so you don't have to worry about what's going on on here. It's definitely what JP was going to do for us. We just kind of did it ourselves and we make sure that we have the foreign key reference and the tables. Okay, so it's literally the same thing that JPA is going to do. Well, I did make some modification, but nothing that's going to be like significantly different in terms of uh, the tables that you're going to have. It's going to be pretty much the same. So we're kind of like having the best of both worlds. We have the JPA in the application, and we also wrote our own schemas and define our own tables that JPA will also be able to use. So the best of both worlds. So I'm going to go ahead and copy everything, and then we're going to go back to 
the uh, application or not the application we're going to go back to the query and then i'm going to go ahead and paste this in remember it's really important that you do this and the reason is because if you don't do this then for your updated by and created by in all of your tables it's not going to be defined as a foreign key if you just run the application and jp create all those tables for you then you will not have these foreign keys you can add them if you want like you can afterwards you can just say alter table and then you add the foreign key but again i'm giving you all of the code okay so here is everything that you have to do which is just grab the script and then run it in your database so i'm gonna go ahead and select everything and then i'm gonna click on this play button and you can see query return successfully in 89 seconds so now if i right click and then refresh you can see all of our tables are here and if we want to verify that we actually have the foreign keys so for example we know that inside of almost all of these tables we're going to have a foreign key reference so for example if i open up the confirmation and then i go to constraint and then i go to foreign key you can see that I defined these two foreign keys. So the updated by and the created by, they're foreign keys. Okay, so this is really important because otherwise you can pass in any number for the updated by and created by for these tables and it's just going to accept it. The database is just going to accept it because they're not foreign keys. So later when you actually need to pull the report, because you're going to join the tables. So the tables that you're looking at and you're going to join that with the user's table, then it's not going to work. You're not going to find a reference on the user's table if the uh, actual ID doesn't exist. OK, so it's really important that you do this so that we can have the proper uh, foreign key reference, as you can see that I'm defining here on all these tables. Other than that, I did some tweaks and I kind of like put some default values and stuff like that and make sure some of these values have uh, different length. Like for this timestamp, it's six, so we don't have to use the entire 255. Like little things here and there just to make sure that it's fully optimized, but it should work exactly the same way as if you were to run it with JPA with the exception of the foreign keys. So really important that you do this so that your data can have its proper integrity. So now we have all of our tables and everything. And the last thing that I'm gonna run is the system. So let's go back and then we're gonna go to the data and we're gonna just grab everything in here and we're gonna go back, we're gonna go down. Well, I actually, I don't need this anymore. So I'm gonna paste this over it and then I'm gonna select everything and then I'm gonna run it. You can see it ran successfully. Now, if I do select, oops, star from the users table that should give me the system okay so you can see the system is back so this is good so now we're gonna start working on the login so that's what we're gonna be working on next so let's go back to the application and i'm gonna close these two tabs uh let's open up everything make sure you have a copy of the code because we're gonna kind of like get rid of everything that we've done so far just like starting kind of from scratch because we want to make sure that we have a proper um, authentication uh, flow going on so let's just go back to the domain well we want to go to the resource so i need to make sure that you understand what we're going to be doing so the first thing we're going to do for the login is you see how we're using this username password authentication token we're using this class because we need to create an authentication so if i over over the authenticate you can see that it takes an authentication, right? So if I go in there, you can see it's an authentication that it's taken. But if you go inside of the authentication, you notice it's an interface, which means we don't have a constructor that we can use because you cannot create a constructor for an interface, which is why we're using this class because it's a convenient class that we can use because, I mean, well, let's go in there. You can see that it extends this abstract authentication token. And if you go inside of abstract authentication token, you can see that it's implementing authentication. So because we cannot use the authentication as an interface, we can have a constructor for it. We're actually using this class, which is the username password authentication token, which is totally fine. You can use it. But in our situation, we're going to create our own class so that whenever we're doing our authentication, we can initialize our own class here instead of using this authentication token. Again, you can use the authentication token if you want. It's totally fine. But I'm going to show you that you can customize it and make this an even better flow if you actually use your own class. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. So we're going to go into the application and inside of the domain, I'm going to create a new class and I'm going to name it API authentication. So I'm just giving it this name API authentication. But in your case, it's going to be like whatever your app is in an authentication or whatever else you want to name. So, for example, you can say, you know, my cool bank application authentication or something like that. So 
be creative with the name. I'm just doing something kind of like generic for everybody because, you know, everyone is going to take this course and then they're going to change things to whatever they're building. So some of you will be building customer relation management systems or a banking application or some school application to manage students and courses. So you decide what you want to name this class. But this is going to represent our authentication. It's going to be the equivalent of this username password authentication token because this is not ours. This is coming from the Spring framework, which is totally fine to use, but we're going to use ours. So let's go back in here and I'm going to close these two tabs because we don't need them. So this is our class, which is going to represent the authentication. It's going to represent the authentication when we're initializing the authentication. So when we're inside of the controller here, as you can see here, we're kind of like starting the authentication. And it's also going to be the same class that we're going to use if we go to the uh, authentication provider whenever we have a full authentication. You can see here, whenever our authentication is successful, we're actually returning another authentication. So the same object, but this time it's it's got different things in it. So it's it's got authorities and whatever else you want to put. So we will be following the same pattern. You can see here, one is unauthenticated when they're starting the authentication process. And then once the authentication is successful, then they call a different one, which is authenticated. So we're going to kind of like follow the same pattern. So let's go back to our authentication class. And since this class is our class, we can put whatever we want inside of it. So first thing I'm going to put is the user. So I'm going to say user, user. We will be creating this user, but we don't have it yet. And then we're going to have private string email. So you see that uh, if we go back inside of the, uh, well, we already have it here. So if we go in here, you see that they're passing in a principal and credential and they're both objects. But in our situation, we know that we're only going to be dealing with a string, which is going to be an email in another string, which is going to be a password. So we can just define them as string. So you can see the uh, benefits of using your own class. So we know we're going to get an email and a password, and I'm going to define another, uh, another field that's going to be a Boolean. That's going to be the authenticated. So we're going to say authenticated. We're going to define it here and it's going to be false by default because that's the default value for any Boolean in Java. So the next thing we want to do is to define this user. So let's go back to the, I'm going to close these now. I'm going to, I'm not going to go back to this username and password authentication token again. I just wanted to make sure that you understand um, what we're doing. So let's go back here and I'm going to define another package. I'm going to call it DTO and inside of this DTO package, I'm going to create this new user class. So here I'm going to say user, press enter. For now, we can just, um, I guess we can copy some of the stuff we have in the user entity. So let's go to entity and then copy some of these uh, values. So um, I'm going to copy everything and then I'm going to do some cleanup. So copy everything, go back here and then paste. And uh, let's uh, remove some of this space at the bottom. So I'm going to define the data annotation. So that's going to take care of getters and setters and two string methods and stuff like that. And we don't need these. So I'm going to remove these uh, validation. So all of these annotations, we don't need them. Uh, remove everything for the role. So let's make sure we work on this. So the first thing is the ID because they need the ID. So we're going to say private long ID and then string user ID string first name, string last name, string email. Uh, we have the phone. So I'll move all, all the strings at the at the same spot at the top. So we have the phone and then the bio. And let's grab the image URL. Let's get the QR code image URI. Scroll up a little more. I'm gonna grab the QR code secrets and then I'm gonna put it right here, but we don't need to return this secret. So I'm gonna change that to last uh, login. Well, I have the last login, but this time I want it to be a string. Okay, I'm not going to be dealing with local date time in this user DTO. So we're going to we're going to remove this. So we're going to have a string for the last login. And then I'm going to do control D twice. And here we want to say created at and the second one is going to be updated at. So when I'm working with the database and the user entity, I'm working with the local date time. But at this point in the DTO, I want to work with string. I don't want to work with local date time anymore. So that's why I'm defining the created that and the updated that and the login as string. And then I'm going to do control D two times again. And this time I want the role. So the role is going to be like role user, admin, etc. And then the other one is going to be the authorities. So the authorities, I'm going to represent them as a string and they're going to be separated by a comma. And after that, I need two more long. So I'm going to duplicate this and I want this to be the created 
by and the second one is going to be the updated so updated by so we know we created it we updated it and their id their user id which is a string and first thing last thing email phone bio image url qr code image uri last login created at updated at their role and their authorities i don't think i need the login attempts so we're going to delete that this is something that we need in the code logic with the database but we don't need it at this point in the dto and then we have account unexpired account unlock and we also need another one which is the credential expired so i'm gonna cut this one at the bottom paste it here I'm gonna change the type to a boolean and then we're gonna say credential or credentials non expired okay because we need to keep track of that so that we can show it in the front so this is going to be our user and all we have to do at this point is to just import this guy in here as our dto okay so this is the user that we're gonna be working with in the application when we're not dealing with the database or saving the user in the database because we're going to have some kind of a mapper that's going to take the user from the database and then maps it to this class and vice versa. Okay, so we're done with this class. I'm going to close it and close the user entity. So now in this class, we need to extend the authentication and then make sure that we can put the same pattern that we saw with the username password authentication token. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So inside of this class, I'm going to do the same thing that you saw again in the username password authentication token. I'm going to extend the abstract authentication token if you want you can just extend the authentication token but this class has uh, some other stuff in it that makes it a little bit more convenient to work with so you don't have to go all the way down to the bare authentication class or interface in this case you can just use this abstract authentication token and if you saw um, when I showed you so if you go here you can see it's the same class abstract authentication token so we're gonna use the same one. so close this and go back here so now we need to uh, implement some methods. So we need to do get credentials, get principal. So these two we have to implement. They're coming from the authentication because they're required. But that third one is not required. So we're not going to select this one. So I'm going to click on OK. So we need to give implementation for these methods. Now we're going to need to create some constructor. So that's what this area is. So it says create constructor for the super. So I'm going to click on that. And it gives us this code for the API authentication that takes grant authorities. And I'm going to get rid of these comments and just delete them. So what we want to do is to create one constructor. I want this constructor to take the authorities and also the user. So we're gonna say user and authorities. Okay, we're gonna keep the type like this, but if you want, you can have your own authority class, like the type for the authority, and then you can pass it in here if you want to override the grand authority. You would have to expand this class or another similar class, but in this case, we're not doing it because this will work just fine for us but we do want to get the user whenever we uh, call this construct. Then we do have to pass super authorities because this class demands that. So that's why it was giving us this error. So it's important that you keep this line in here and then we can do everything else that we want. So we can pass in this user as the user that we see in the constructor and then do the same for the password. So we're gonna say password equals password. Well, we're not taking the password. So we're gonna do the same thing that we did. So we're gonna say password underscore protected like that and then we're going to say this that email and then we're going to set it to the email underscore protect and this is going to make sense in a minute whoops and then we're going to say oops this that authenticated we're going to set it equal to true okay and this is going to make sense in just a second just bear with so for the password protected we can kind of like create a constant for both of them and for this one i will just copy this value right here and then paste it in here for the value so password protected is that and then i'm going to do Control d to duplicate this line and then grab the email protected paste it and then we're going to say email protected because at this point when we call this constructor we have a fully authenticated user so we don't need to show the email we don't need to show the password at this point so that's why we're protecting them but we're setting the authenticated to true and then we're setting the user here and then we're passing in the authorities to the parent class which is this class so this is the first constructor the second constructor the control d again the second one is going to take something completely different and i'm going to put it at the top so for the top one we're going to pass in a string email and another string password and we also need to call the super again because we're creating a constructor so for this case uh, string has some utility class that we can use so we're going to say authority so authority utils coming from spring security 
and then we're gonna say no authorities okay so that will just do the trick for us and we don't have any users to set because we're not getting the user and the constructor so we're gonna remove this line but this time we have the email and we have the password so we're gonna change these to this email and then these to this password I guess the email should come first like that and then authenticated it's gonna be false hopefully you guys can already see where this is going so this is the constructor we're gonna call whenever we're gonna start the authentication. So like this, and we know we're taking an email and a password. So that's why I define email and password. And then this is the one that we're gonna call whenever we have a fully authenticated user. So in the provider, that's the one we're gonna call here, okay? So we could leave it like this at this point. This is totally fine. But another thing you can do is to follow the same pattern that Spring is following with their username and password authentication token. So they have this unauthenticated and also they have the authenticated. So we're gonna do the same thing. You can also use the constructors. So if you go inside of this class, you will see that you can actually call the constructor to do this because it's public. But in my case, I don't want them to call the constructors. I want them to call the helper methods. So these methods, the unauthenticated and authenticated. So what I'm gonna do is to go back to my um, authentication class and then copy these two constructors again or select them and then press ctrl d that's gonna duplicate everything and then i'm gonna go up so these are the two constructors that we just defined and i'm gonna make them private so this is private also this is private so no one is gonna be able to actually create these constructors or call these constructors directly and i'm gonna scroll down and then for the first one that's gonna be our unauthenticated so the same thing that they're doing here so we can copy this name paste it here so for the unauthenticated it's going to be public static because it's a static uh, method and for this we're going to call the constructor so this constructor up here so we're going to copy this name and delete all of this while we're here and then we're going to say return a new api authentication and then we're going to pass in the email and the password like that and then we're going to say public static now we're going to do the unauthenticated so this one right here so copy that close i'm just copying the name but Hopefully you guys see what I'm doing. So for the second one, it's gonna be the unauthenticated. Well, this is the authenticated. I just did the authenticated. So unauthenticated only takes the user email and the user password. And then the authenticated, it's gonna take the user and the authorities. And if you wanna pass anything else in this constructor, you can. And for this, we're gonna call the other constructor. So I'm gonna copy all of this and then paste. And this takes the user and the authorities like that. And then after that, we just wanna make sure that we're returning something here okay so hopefully that makes sense so now we have two public static methods one for unauthenticated that's going to take the email and the password which is what we're going to be using here when we're starting the authentication and then we have another one for authenticated that we're going to use whenever the authentication is successful which we're going to call in our provider okay this is not going to be our provider we're going to change this code okay but i'm just keeping them here for reference that we're gonna call the authenticated so that we can create the actual fully authenticated user. So this is gonna be the class. So now we can uh, give some more implementation for these. So for the get credentials, again, no, we don't need people to get the credentials. So we're gonna say password protected. And for the principal as an object, I can return whatever I want. But for this case, I want to return this user. So I can copy this and then I'm gonna say for my principal, return this user. If you want, you can return whatever you want here, but whatever user that we have here that they pass into this constructor whenever they have a fully authenticated user, when I call my principal, then it's gonna give me that. So you can see the benefits of customizing and creating your own authentication. So you can put whatever you want. You don't have to depend on what Spring is giving you. Or if you want, you can say throw an exception because you don't want people to call these methods at all you can make it to an exception and i'm going to define some method here so i'm going to say public um string get password i don't know if i'm going to use them because uh, i'm not sure but i feel like i might so this is going to return this that get password or this password i'm not allowing them to get the password with get credentials but i'm creating my own method to get the password again i'm not sure if i'm going to use it but i might so i'm going to define it here and then i'm going to do the same for the email so get email. I don't think I'm going to use them, but just in case we can come back and clean it up. Okay. So then get email. And this is giving me some errors because he wants me uh, to use Lombok, but I'm not going to do that. And I think there's one more that we have to work with. So let's do generate and uh, let's do uh, implement methods. So cancel. I think I have to do uh, override methods. So we need to make sure we get the uh, da, 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 set authentication 
or set authenticated this one right here that takes a boolean so we want to make sure that they can't call this because you don't want anyone to be able to set the authentication with, with a setter like this so we have to make sure that we uh, got rid of that so we're gonna say throw a new api exception and then we're gonna say you cannot set authentication you can put whatever message you want in here or through whatever exception that you want. But we're not allowing them to do that for the set authentic. We want them to go through our process in order to create an authentication that is authenticated. So where this value is true. And the last one we need, if we right click and go to generate and then we do override methods, we want the is authenticated. In our case, we don't want to do anything with the super class. We just want to return this guy right here. And then we know that the only time this is going to be true is whenever they have a fully authenticated user. So this authenticated, that's why we're going to return. Okay. So it's important that you override these two and I'm going to move them to the bottom, maybe like right below here. Okay. All right. So I think that should be everything that we need to do for our own authentication. So now we have our own class that we can use for our authentication and we can pass uh, whatever we want. In our case, we're just passing in the email and the password whenever we have an unauthenticated authentication or API authentication. And whenever the user is fully authenticated, we're going to call the constructor and pass in the user and also the authorities. Spring needs the authorities, so that's why we're passing into the super here. So that's why we need to take them in. And then we made the constructors private so that they can be used. So we're forcing everyone to use the unauthenticated and then the authenticated helper method. So that's pretty much everything that you need to do for this class. So now we have our own class, so we don't have to rely on this username and password authentication token. So this is the first thing. So I'm going to go ahead and close this class and close here as well. So the second thing that we have to do is to create a filter because remember, uh, if I search for the username password authentication filter, oops, wrong one filter. So this is the class that intercepts the request coming in and then it tries to do the authentication. So you see that spring is using a filter to do this. So it's only right that we also use a filter just to keep with the same uh, pattern or design that they had in mind. I don't know all the details around why they're doing it this way and not in a controller. And I don't know if doing it in a controller would make sense. Um, my point is, I don't know why, but since they're doing it this way, then we're also going to be doing it this way. So instead of having uh, an endpoint in our controller. So the way that we have it right now, so in the user resource, you see that we have this login endpoint. We're not going to do it this way, like at all. We're going to have it in a filter and then we're going to authenticate all the requests coming in using that filter. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So what I'm going to do is to just delete this because remember, make sure you have this code because I gave it to you in the last lecture of the last section. So make sure you get the code because again, we're going to delete all of this stuff. This was just for a demonstration. This is not how we're going to be doing things. And I'm also going to clean up the import. So clean all the imports, clean this map. Okay. Um, so now we're going to be working on the filter because we don't want to do the authentication inside of a controller. We want to do it in a filter the same way that spring is doing it. So inside of our security package, I'm going to collapse some of these to make sure things are clean and close this as well. So in the security package, I'm going to go ahead and right click and create a new class. I'm going to name it authentication filter authentication. So authentication filter, press enter, and we're going to work on this class now. I'm going to put some space here and I need some logs. So I'm going to say SLF4J so that I can log some stuff. And then we want to extend. Um, I want to say that there are many different classes that you can extend. You can extend the username password authentication filter. Uh, there's like a bunch of other filters that you can extend. But the one that I like to work with is the abstract. Uh, that's going to be the abstract uh, authentication uh, processing filter. So this one right here, that's the one that I like to work. So the abstract authentication processing filter is a good one to use if you uh, just want to do the uh, authentication filter. And then we're going to implement some methods. So the most important one is this one, the attempt authentication. So this is the method that gets called whenever you're going to initiate the authentication process. So we need to override that. So we're going to be working on that and I'm going to collapse the import. It's complaining because we don't have a constructor. So let's do that because we need to pass something to the super class. And I'm just going to extend this a little. Uh, let's scroll over. So you can see that we can really just work with any of these. I think you just have to do one of them. So I'm just going to pick either one of them and then I'm going to refactor it. So let's scroll down and scroll up a little more. Well, I need to put some space at the bottom. 
so that I can scroll up. Okay, so this is our authentication filter class. It's extending the abstract authentication processing filter. And for our constructor, which I'm also going to make public because it makes it protected, I don't need to pass in the URL, but I do need to pass in the authentication manager. So I'm going to delete that and leave the authentication manager. I also need to pass in the user service. So I'm going to say user service. So that's our user service, so user service. And then a class that I don't have yet, which is the JWT service, which is gonna be really important. So this is gonna be the JWT service. And what I want to do is to call the super class. And because we're not passing in any URL, we need to tell it what URL to listen to. What we need to do is to say, create a new uh, ant matchers. So we're gonna say ant path request matchers. So this one right here. And then we're gonna say listen to slash user slash login. That's where we're gonna put the login for whenever someone is authenticating themselves. So they have to go to user slash login and then it will hit this filter. Okay, so that's what this is. And this class, the parent class, which is why we're passing this to the super, it needs to know what to listen. And we can also pass in the type of method to listen to. So here I'm gonna say a post that then pass in the name. Uh, can we import this? So we need the post method. Yep, we can. And this is com coming from Spring Framework. So this one right here, HTTP method post. And also this goes inside of this like that. So we say, hey, listen to the user slash login to trigger this method or to uh, trigger the authentication process. And then we, we say, hey, listen to a post request. I think the default is already post, but we're being very explicit. We say, hey, if it's a post request, like if we go here, you'll see that this is just the post request. Uh, so we say, hey, for any post request that comes for user slash login, then that's the one you should listen to to trigger the authentication. And then we need to set some of these values. So the uh, user service and the uh, JWT service. So we're gonna say here, we need the private final that, and we're gonna cut off the service and private final paste that in that okay so we're saying hey you need two things you need the JWT service and you also need the user service because we need to fetch the user from here whenever we get their username from the request we need to update their login attempt and then do some other things so we need the user service and the JWT service so now we can pass in these values in the constructor as well for our dependency injection so we're gonna say user service equal user service and then we're gonna see this that JWT service equal JWT service you can see we don't have the JWT service yet and we also don't have all of the methods that we need in the user service so that we can work with this so we will need to define some methods in the user service so that we can update the login attempt and we're also gonna need the JWT service so that we can pass in a token to the response and speaking of the response I remember we have to uh, implement another method. So I'm going to do right click and then generate. And then uh, I think I can do override and we need to do the successful authentication. So let's scroll down and looking forward. So we have unsuccessful authentication, this one right here. This gets called if the authentication is unsuccessful, but we're going to be handling the error in a different way. So we don't have to override this one, but we do need the successful authentication. This gets called whenever the authentication is successful. So that's why we're gonna need the JWT service because we're gonna need to give them a token at this point in the response as you can see. So our filter is coming together but we do have a lot, a lot of work to do still. But you can see where it's going. We're listening on user login and then it's gonna call the attempt authentication. If the authentication is successful, then it's gonna call successful authentication. So we can do whatever we want, either if it's successful or unsuccessful because remember, you can also listen to the uh, unsuccessful right here, unsuccessful authentication. There's a caveat to this. The caveat is you cannot throw any exception or do any try catch in the attempt authentication. If you do that, then it's not gonna trigger the, uh, it's not gonna trigger this method, the unsuccessful authentication, because you're catching the exception. So you need to let the exception go through so that it can be caught by this unsuccessful authentication. So it's just a caveat to that. So if you uh, have a try catch block in your authentication here, and then you try to call the unsuccessful authentication, then it's not gonna work. Now we're gonna be working working on the user service because we need to add a method in there that we're going to need so that we can update the login attempt of the user. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to define an enum. So I'm going to go to our enumeration and then I'm going to right click and then I'm going to create another class and then I'm going to call it login type. So this is going to give us the type of login that's happening. So in our case, we're just going to have two of them. So we're going to have login uh, underscore attempt. So when they're attempting to log in and this is attempt and then login 
underscore success so when they successfully log so that's it we don't need uh, anything else here. and also notice that i'm not creating a converter for the other enums here because we're not saving these to the database this is all for the application and the application logic none of this is going inside of the database so that's why i don't need a converter for it i only need a converter for the role converter because we have all these authorities and we need to save them in a database i just wanted to point this out so with the login type we have the login attempt and login success and that's all we have to do here so i'm going to close this and then we need to go to the service so let's go to the service open up the user service uh, interface and i'm gonna pass in another method here and it's gonna return void and we're gonna call it update login attempt and it's gonna take the email and also the login type login type login type we need to update the login attempt so that we know how many times the user has logged in because we need to keep track so that we can lock their account so update the login attempt will update the login attempt of the user in the database so that we know okay they've logged in three times within 15 minutes and four times and five times and then after the sixth then we're gonna go ahead and just lock their account so now we can go to the implementation and we're gonna implement this method so implement the update login attempt so it's down below here. So this is going to be pretty interesting. So really pay attention. So the first thing I need to do, because I'm going to be calling this method in the filter. So whenever I grab the email of the user, like right here, I'm going to be calling this method. So I'm just going to put it in here just so that it can make more sense. So here I'm going to hard code some value. So we're going to say junior at gmail.com. And then we're going to pass in the login attempt. So we're going to say login. Oops login login attempt because they're attempting to log in and then i'm gonna do a static import for this in so at this point when the authentication is called when we start doing the authentication we're gonna pass in the email of the user and the login attempt as the login type because i need to know which type it is so that i can determine what to do and this is just going to update the login attempt or login attempt number or whatever you want to call it but you get the idea so now what we want to do in the implementation is first we need to get the user so we're going to say uh, user entity equal get user entity by email and then we're going to give it the email so this is going to give us the user and if it doesn't exist like the user doesn't exist by this email then it's going to say user not found you can see it right here okay so that's the first thing we get a hold of the user after that we need to set the user in the context so we're going to say request context coming from our domain that set user id then we're going to pass in the user entity that get id just in case that anything is saved in a database or anything like that then we know who did it so that's going to be this user now we need to switch on the type so we're going to say switch on the login type login type because we need to know what to do depending on login attempt or login success so in here we're going to do a number of things so let's scroll up a little more so i want to say when it's an attempt what do i want to do well if it's an attempt we're going to do one thing and then if it's a success we're going to do something else so i'm going to put the two different uh, scenarios here so if it's a login attempt we need to check to see if the user has already been in the cache if the user is in the cache and i'm talking about a cache that we don't have yet that we're going to create then we need to set their login attempt to zero and then say that their account is not locked otherwise we need to increase their login attempt and if their login attempt is bigger than five which means like it's either six or greater then we're going to lock their account and if it's login success so for the second scenario they're going to reset their account because you know we're going to set their login attempt to zero and then remove them from the cache and then set their last login to the current instance because that means they logged in successfully so we have a number of things to do so now what we need is the cache because if we don't have the cache then we don't know if the user is supposed to be in the cache or not or if they're already in the cache or what login attempts that they have so we need to work on the cache so that's what we're going to be working on next so there are many different ways that you can define a cache in java you can even use a map like in java like if you're really good with the map api you can create your own map and then create a cache with that but again there's already like very good implementation out there from big companies that we can make use of and that's what i'm going to be using so i'm going to go back to the browser and then i'm going to search for let's search for google guava maven and we're gonna click on the uh, open in a new tab actually actually let me go back because i need to keep this here so we want the core library so the first one right here so we're gonna click on that and the latest version is the 3300 so we're gonna click that and then copy this and then go back to our app and open the pump file and i'm gonna go down and put it 
underneath this one and then remove this comment and the space at the bottom. So we have the com.google.guava and the latest version is 3300. And then I'm going to click on this M to make sure that I can pull this in. And it doesn't look like it's able to find this version. So, oh, there we go. And then I'm going to go back and open a new package. I'm going to call it cache. So everything cache related is going to go inside of this package. And we're going to create a cache store. So right click and then do cache store. So what this is going to do, it's going to define what the cache is supposed to be. You're going to press enter. And what we want to do is to say, I'm going to need some logs. So SLF4J, what we're going to do, we're going to make this a generic because we might be able to use this in other places in the application. So we're going to say this is going to take a key and a value. That's usually what you need whenever you need to cache anything. You need a key and then you need a value. So we're going to say this class, the cache store, is a generic class and it takes a key and a value for the two types. And then after that, I'm going to define the actual cache. So let's uh, let's see if we can scroll down here so that I can scroll up a little more like that. So we're going to say um, we're going to define the cache. So we're going to say private final and that's going to be the cache. So this is supposed to come from the library that we just installed. So you can see it coming up here from the Google Guava or Google Com cache. And then we're going to pass in the type because it also needs the type as it is also a generic. So we're going to say this is going to be our cache. Okay. The cache is going to have a key and a value. And then we need to define a constructor. So we're going to say public. That's going to be the cache store. So cache store. So a constructor for this class. And for this constructor, we need to take an expiry duration. So expiry duration, and we need to take the type. So for this, I'm going to say time unit, uh, and then we're going to say time unit. So the time unit is going to determine for whatever unit, how many times that we want to have that as the duration. So for example, we can say this is going to be minute, and then we're going to say five. So that means five minutes. So we're just making sure that this is extendable as much as possible. So in here, then we can uh, say for this cache that we just defined in the class, we're going to call the cache builder. So coming from our package, and then we're going to say that new builder, and then we're going to say that expiry or expire after write. So after we write something, how long after it should expire. And then we're going to pass in this information. So we're going to say, oops, control Z, the duration and the time unit. Oops, wrong place. So this should go, well, we need a closing here. So we're going to paste this in here. And then we're going to say that concurrency level, because you need to give it a concurrency level. For this, we're just going to use the uh, available processors. So we're going to say runtime that get runtime that available processors and then we just need to build this there's more options that you can pass but i'll leave that up to you so whenever we create a constructor for whatever type that we pass for this type of cache then it's gonna do this for us it's gonna say okay this is when the cache is supposed to expire and this is the unit of time that they're using and then this is how many of that unit that they're using okay so that's just a little constructor that we need so that we can create an instance and we can create different instances of this and i'm going to show you how and then after that, we need to have a public that's going to be the get. So we're going to say V because that represents the value that we're getting. And then we're going to say get. That's the name of the method. And we want this to be not null. So the constraint key, which is the K for the type. And then we're going to pass it in here like that. So if we need to get something, we're going to say log info. And then I'm going to say retrieving from cache for or from cache uppercase with key and then pass in the key. So we're going to say key that to string just so that we can represent it as a string. And then after that, we need to return the cache. So the cache that would define that get if present and then we're going to pass in the key. So I'm going to explain this one more time. So hopefully you guys have some um, experience with Java because, you know, this course is uh, assuming that you you have a pretty solid foundation of Java. But in any case, the cache store, it takes the key and the value for the type of cache that you need to create. So if you need to pass in a string and a user, then that's going to be a string and a user. And then you need to pass this into the actual cache. So whatever value that you're going to pass in here, it's going to be passed into the cache that we're going to create this cache for. Well, I'm using cache a lot, but hopefully that's making sense. And whenever we need to get a value from the cache, then it's going to be this type or whatever type that you define because we're getting the value and then we need the key well the key is going to be of this type so if you pass in a string here then this is going to be a string if that was a user for the value then this is going to be a value and that's just how generic works so to get 
it's going to return the value, whatever the value was or whatever the value is that you passed in. And then we're going to get it if it's present. OK, I think this is going to return all if it doesn't exist. But you can go in there and you can uh, download the source or sources and it will tell you what's going to happen. And you can see clearly it says return the value associated with the key and the cache null if it doesn't exist. OK, so we can return null if it, ex if it doesn't exist and the value if it exists. The second method we need is one to put something in the cache. So the put it's returning void because we don't need to uh, return anything. You can, but as per the standard of a cache, then you have the get, the put, and the put usually returns void. And then we're going to say we need to have a value to put. So we're going to say not null and we need the key and the value. So again, not null because we cannot, we cannot accept null for this. And that's going to be the value. And then in here, we're going to just call the cache again. Well, we need the log. So I'm going to copy this. Oops, copy, paste. So we need to say storing, oops, record and cache for key and then pass in the key. So we're going to say key to string and we're not going to return anything because this is returning void. And then we're going to call cache put, which already exists. And then we give it the key and the value. OK, so you can see how this is coming together very nicely. And then really important, we need the eviction because we need to be able to remove a value in the cache by using the key. And this is the evict. OK, you can name this remove. But if you go to the standardization of the cache and how it's supposed to be implemented, then they use these keywords put and evict. So we have to keep with the, I guess, best practice, <laughs> you can call it. So for evicting a value, we need the key. So we're going to say key. If we get the key, then we're going to say log that info. And then we're going to say removing from cache with key and then pass in the key that to string because the key can be like anything. So hopefully they have it to string on that key or somehow we can turn it into a string. And then we're going to call the cache and validate and then give it the key. So every time I call cache put, cache invalidate and cache uh, get if present, well, invalidate is another way that they're calling it, but you can call it evict as well. But this is coming from Google. You can see if I over it, this is the Google implementation. So all we're doing is creating a wrapper around the Google cache that already exists that this already comes with. And the benefits of doing this is because you can customize it. So the same idea with the um, authentication that we define, the same idea. You customize it and you make it yours and then you can pass in whatever you want. Like if I wanted to, I could pass something else here and do some other logic in here. I mean, maybe not a lot of logic in here because this is a simple uh, cache, but you get the idea. Because it's yours, you're customizing it, then you can put whatever you want. So this is the cache store. So now we need to have a, a, like an implementation of this because this is just a definition. So we need to do an implementation of it. And that's what we're going to be working on next. So now that we have the cache store, which is the definition, we can define beans for specific implementation because we can pretty much use this cache store for any key value pair that we want to create a cache for. And to do this, I'm going to create another class in the same cache package. I'm just going to call it cache config. So we can use this cache configuration class to do any kind of configuration that we want for any class or any type of key value pair. So here we're going to say at the configuration because we want this to be registered as a bin. And I'm going to define a simple bin. So I'm going to say bin and then I'm going to say public. That's going to be a cache store. So we're going to say cache store. Now I need to say what type of cache that I'm defining. So the key and the value for the cache. So here I'm going to say it's a string because I need to store the email and I think I'm going to use the integer because I need to count how many times that the user has tried to log in. And then I'm going to just give it a name. So user cache and we're going to say that's going to be the cache. And here I just have to say return a new cache store and then pass in what I want. So here I'm going to pass in uh, 15 minutes because we know it's 15 minutes. So we're going to say 900 seconds. So that's 15 minutes. And here we're going to say time unit. So from concurrency and then we're going to pass in second right here like that. So, okay. So that's going to be the bean. And if we want to give the bean a name, we can do that. So if I put the opening and closing, you can see it takes value and name. So we can say something like uh, name and then we're going to say, um, user login cache and then we can create another bin even if it's another bin of string and integer but because you give the bin a name then you can have as many of the same type as you and if you want something completely different like for example you can say 
this is going to be long and then string. Only thing you have to do is to say uh, another cache. Just the name of the method has to be different. And then you can just say um, registration cache or something like that. So you can have as many as you want and you can pass in whatever expiration that you want. In our case, we need 15 minutes. So I'm passing in 900 seconds, but you can pass in different configuration for as many caches as you want. The only thing is whenever you need to get the cache, then you have to pass in the proper uh, bin name so that you can get the proper cache and then you can use this cache. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys understand where I was going with this. You don't have to do it this way, but if you want to be a senior dev, then you need to know these things. Even if you don't do it, but at least you know, and you kind of like master this framework. So now we have a cache where we can pass in a string for the key and an integer for the value, and it's going to expire after 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. What that means is that every entry in the cache is going to not be eternal. So they're not going to be living in the cache forever. They say eternal whenever you're working with cache. So if you have a cache where you keep the values in the cache forever, then they say the cache is eternal. But in our case, it's not going to be eternal. All the values or entries on the cache, they're going to expire after 15 minutes of the time that we put them in the cache because that's what the requirements uh, want. So now we have a cache. So since we have the cache, we can close this. And if you want to create another cache for something else, you can come here and do it. In our case, we're only going to have this cache but you're taking this course and you're going to have the source code. If you're building some different application and you need another cache for something completely different, then you can just come here and then define your cache and then use it anywhere you want in your application. Okay. So let's close these two. So now we have the cache. We can come back here and then put our logic. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll up because we need to get a hold of the cache and we need to do private final and we need to define this as a cache store. Okay. And we know that we need the one that has a type of a string and integer. And then we're going to say user cache, just give it the same name. So now we have the bean in and we're going to scroll down. Since we only have one, since we didn't define a name for the bean, then it's only going to use that one that we have. And we know that it's of type string for the key and integer for the value. So now we can scroll down and we're going to say, first thing we're going to do, we're going to check to see if the user is already in the cache. So we're going to say if, and then we're going to pass in the user cache that, and then we're going to say get, we're going to pass in the user entity that email or get email. And then we're going to say, if this is null, meaning they're not in the cache, then we know what we need to do. Well, we need two equal signs. So if they're not in the cache, that means the user is not in the cache yet. So we're going to say, well, then that's their first time trying to log in, set login attempts we're going to set this to zero because they just starting. They're not in the cache yet. And then we're going to say their account is not locked. So set account unlocked. We're going to say true. So this is the first logic. If the user is not in the cache, so we're going to do that. This is just some like cleanup or setup because they're not in the cache. So if they're not in the cache, then the login attempt should be reset to zero. And also their account is not locked. So even if it was locked because they're not in the cache, then we have to set it to true because they're not anymore. And then after that, we're going to say, well, since the user now is trying to log in, we're going to set the login attempts to whatever their login attempts was. So user entity that get login attempts, and then we're going to add one to it because we know that they're trying to log in now. So initially, if they're not in the cache, we're going to say, well, they're not in the cache, then it's zero. But if this is not true, meaning we're going to skip this if statement, then we're going to add one to their login. And then we're going to put them in a cache. So we're going to say user cache that put, and then we're going to say the same thing, user entity that get email, and then we're going to pass in their login attempt like that. So we're putting them in the cache, whatever the new login attempt is after we increased it by one. And then we're going to say, in this case, if their user cache, so user cache that get, and then we do the same thing again. So user entity that get email. So if they're in the cache and it's greater than five, in this case, we know that their account should be locked. Oops. Well, I'll just copy this line and then paste it here. False. We're locking the account. Remember this is account non locked, not account locked. That's why it's true here. And then it's false here. And the reason I'm doing this counterintuitive way of naming thing is because that's how it's done with uh, spring security. So if you go to, let's say user details like this class right here, oops, user details, uh, this one, you see spring is doing the same thing. Account non expired account, non locked credentials, non expired. So we're following the same, uh, the same pattern. We're naming things the same way. It just makes it easier to work with the framework overall. But if you disagree with the spring team, then 
change it. And then that's it. So one more time, I'm going to go through this first part of the logic. So when we call this method, we're going to give it the email of the user and the login attempt type. In this case, we're calling it here. So it's going to be the login attempt. We know they're trying to log in. So if they're trying to log in, we're going to find the user. Well, in any case, we're always going to find the user. So we're going to fetch for the user. If the user doesn't exist, it will just throw an exception. That's it. We're done. User not found. Otherwise, if the user exists, we're going to say set this user ID in the request context. And you're going to see why I'm doing this because we're going to have to save the user after we do all of this, save the user in a database. And if we're saving anything in a database, then we need this to be set. And the reason that I'm not doing this here, it's because I don't know if this user exists in my system. So I can't set the request context to whatever user. ID. I don't even have a user ID at this point. Okay. But I'm just saying it would make no sense to do it here. So once we know that we have a user like right here, we set that user ID in the context. It's going to be the user and the request that's going to save whatever it's going to be saving in the database. And we're switching on the type of the login. So if they're attempting to log in, the first thing we do is we go into the cache. We see if they exist in the cache right here. All of this. If they're not in the cache, meaning they haven't tried to log in, we reset their login attempt to zero. And then we see their account is not locked because they're not in the cache. They're fresh. And then after that, we get them again and then we set their login attempt to one in case they're not in the cache. But if they were already in the cache, then that would just increase it by one. Either way, we're adding one to it. So if you were zero, which means he went into this if statement, then it's going to be one because they're calling this method. That means they're trying to log in. So that's one attempt. So that's why passing in one here makes sense either if he goes into this if statement or not. Hopefully you're following. And then after we increased the login attempts, then we're going to put them in the cache. So we call the put, give their email, and then whatever the login attempt here, whatever the total is after we increased it by one. And then after that, we say if it's bigger than five, which means it's six or above, then their account should be locked. And then after everything, we need to just save that user. So after the switch, so right here, we're going to say user repository, that's save, user entity. Okay. Either way, we have to save the user because we update the user information. So we save the user. We're going to do the login success in a minute because it's shorter, but this is the logic that's going to determine if we're going to lock the account or not within the 15 minutes. Now you see that we're not checking for if it's been 15 minutes. Well, we know from our cache values only stay in the cache for 15 minutes. So whenever we do the last update, it's going to start counting from zero to 15 minutes. So if they're not in the cache on this line, 82, that means it's been more than 15 minutes since they try to log in. So they're not in the cache because we know that the cache only keep values for 15 minutes. Okay. So even if you don't see the 15 minutes here, you only see that we're checking for the login attempts. It's taken into account since values in the cache only stay in the cache for 15 minutes. So hopefully that makes sense. So now whenever they come to log in, we're going to call this method and then pass in their information. If there is that doesn't even exist, it's going to throw an exception right here. So it's not even going to do anything from this point forward. It's going to go here and then say, oops, user doesn't exist. That's it. We're done. And then we sent the response back. Say user doesn't exist. So this is only going to work if they send a correct email. It doesn't matter if the password is wrong. As long as they click on login and their email is correct, we need to consider it as one login attempt. So we're going to run all of this code. So hopefully this is making sense. The other thing we have to do is to work on the login success, meaning whenever it's successful, then we're going to go to this path in the logic and we're just going to clean some things up. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So if the login attempt is a login success or not login attempt, if the type of the login is a login success, meaning they logged in successfully, then we need to do a few things. The first thing is we need to get the user entity and then set their account non lock to true. So account non lock, we're going to set that to true because they logged in successfully. We need to reset their information. Then we're going to call the user entity again and then set login attempt to zero. We reset everything and then user entity again. And then we need to set last login to now because they just logged in successfully. So their last logged in is now. And then lastly, we're going to remove them from the cache because they logged in successfully. So we're going to say evict and then user entity that get email. That's it. Okay. So if the login is successful, we say, well, at this point we reset their account. We set their attempt login to zero because this is going to be saved in the database. And then we also going to say the last login is now because they just logged in successfully. Then I'm going to do a static import for this and then we remove them from the cache. So one other thing that I need to point out is, even though we're setting this to zero and over here, we're incrementing it by one. If the user is in the cache, we reset this value. So it doesn't matter that this was like 20 
or 10 or something like that. It doesn't matter what this number is that was saved last in the database. If they're not in the cache, we need to reset it, okay? So even if they try to log in like four times and then on the fourth time they successfully logged in, well, this code is gonna run. But I'm just saying in case that didn't happen and the user had like, maybe they try to log in like three times and then they, I don't know, got a phone call and they went away and 15 minutes have passed and then they come back. Now in the database, they're gonna have like four for their login attempt, but it's been over 15 minutes, which means they're not in the cache anymore. So that's why we need to reset it to zero, okay? So hopefully that makes sense and set this back to zero. So that's what we're gonna do for this. And this is the simple logic. It's not very complicated, just a couple if statements, but you really have to think about this and how you do this implementation because there are many different ways that you can implement that one thing. I know I've done it many different ways um, before and then I just came up with this new idea, but I've done it with different types of cache. I've done it using the different tables and stuff like that. So it really depends on whatever approach you take and how it makes sense for you and your application. So now we have this method ready. So we can, well, we're already using it here. We need to get the login credentials from this request because this is the request that comes in whenever this is fired. So we need to grab the username and the password from this request and then pass that into the authentication manager so that we can trigger the authentication process. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So what I'm gonna do is to, uh, let's see if we have the TTO request. So we have the user request like this class right here. So I'm gonna define another one. So I'm gonna copy everything in here and then I'm gonna right click and then create a new one for the login request. So I'm gonna say login request, press enter, and then I'm gonna paste everything here. For the login, we know that we're only gonna need the email and the password, so I'm gonna delete this and delete everything else like that. We only need the email and the password. And then I'm gonna grab the same getters and setters in JSON property, ignore, paste them here. Okay, so just pretty much the same thing and collapse. So now we have the login request that we can use and then we can try to map the values from the request to these values, to the email and the password. Remove that space at the bottom. Okay, so now we can close this and this and we're gonna do something here. So I'm gonna cut this off and I'm gonna do a try cat. So we're gonna say try, open and close and then catch any exception and open and close. Then I'm gonna paste this here. I need to return all, so I'm gonna keep it down there, but I'm gonna remove this one. And then I'm gonna go here and then paste like that. So whenever we're gonna attempt the authentication, which is where the authentication is gonna start, we need to grab the user information. So we're gonna say the user is going to be the new object mapper. So we're gonna say object mapper coming from Jackson and then we're gonna say that configure pass in auto close auto close source and I'm gonna remove this just so that it can import it by itself and it's coming from the JSON parser and we're gonna say true so this is just a simple configuration for the mapper and then we're gonna say read value so read value and then we're gonna pass in the request that get input stream and then we're gonna say try to read it as a login request that class the class that we just defined so jackson is gonna try to get inside of the input stream and then map or convert the username and the password to a java object which is this object right here with the getters and setters. So that's gonna give us our user. And this is the user that we're gonna pass in his email for. So we're gonna say get email. So that's gonna be the email because we don't wanna have a hard coded email in here. So user get email and then login attempt is for the update login attempt. And then after that, we need to create an authentication. So we're gonna say authentication. That's going to be the unauthenticated. So unauthenticated, or we can call the API authentication that unauthenticated because that takes the username, uh, well, the email and the password. And we're gonna say user that get email, user that get password, okay? And I'm gonna statically import this. And then we can give this to the authentication manager. Now, where is the authentication manager? Well, we know that we are passing in the authentication manager here. So whatever manager bean or authentication manager bean that we define in our application, we saw in the last section, we're gonna pass it to this constructor whenever we call this constructor. And you also notice that we're passing this authentication manager to the super class. So we're passing it to this class. So if you go inside of this class and you search for get authentication manager, you can see it right here. So whatever manager that we pass to this class, it has a getter that's gonna allow us to get this manager. So that's the one that we're gonna call. 
and we know we can call it because we're extending this class so we can just use everything that exists inside of this class because we're extending it as you can see here so to get the manager we're gonna say in this case we're gonna say return get authentication manager you see it coming up here so that's gonna give us the manager that authenticate remember every time you're gonna do the authentication it's always going to be the authentication manager slash authentic but unless you do like a different like super different type of implementation and then here we're going to give it the authentication that's it so if everything goes well in the authentication then that's going to return well in the authentication process like checking in the email and the password then that's going to return the authentication object which we will get in here okay so you can kind of like name this oops uh, control Z so you can name this in this method authentication so we will get the authentication here okay the same one that we will create in the authentication provider like the rich authentication object with all the users and authorities it's gonna be passed in here and this is gonna be very convenient for us because we need to give them a token at this point in the successful authentication so if there's an exception we're gonna say log that error and then we're gonna say exception that get message and then after that, I'm going to create another method that I'm going to name handle error response. This doesn't exist yet, but I'm going to create it. And we need the request, we need the response, and we need the exception. And then I'm going to put this in comment. And then we will return null. If we do have an extension, we will return this null. This means it's unsuccessful if it's null, because there's like tons of places where this is checking for this authentication not to be null. So this is going to say, oops, authentication failed because we're returning null. So now we need to work on the handle error response. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this name and everything else. And I want to go to the util. So the request util expand that and go to request util and in here we're going to define this method so i'm going to go down here put two spaces in and paste it and just to save some time i'm just going to copy the signature of this method so that i don't have to type all of this stuff out so paste this here and i'm also going to grab the exception so this exception class put it in front of this okay so we have our method signature so this method is going to be doing a number of things and also we need to make it static public static and it's not returning anything so void so what we're going to do is we need to just write the response inside of the response body of the re uh, serve that response so this response right here because we need to return something that looks exactly like this response the one that we define because remember we always going to return the same format of response or error if we have an error so to do this i'm going to say uh well let me go back up and do this one more time so if the error or the exception in this case is an instance of the access denied exception. So access denied exception. This is coming from Spring Security, not an IO file. So make sure you select Spring Security one. If this is the case, then we're gonna do one thing. So we're gonna say the response API response. I'm gonna put some space so I can scroll up. Okay, API response is going to equal to get uh, error response. We're going to create all of these methods and then we need to give it the request. We need to give it the response. We need to give it the exception and then we need to say forbidden. Oops, forbidden. Then I'm going to see if I can import that. Yep, this is the one from Spring Framework. So if the exception is an instance of access denied, then I'm going to create another response for this with forbidden. And then I'm going to write that response to the HTTP serve that response, like write it inside of the body of that response because we need to return it. So I'm gonna, mm, let's create another helper method here. So I'm gonna go up and then I'm gonna say private, oops, private static final and let's create a B consumer. So coming from Java, Java function, and then we're going to say it's going to take an HTTP servlet response and it's going to return our response. So the response that we define and we're going to call it write response and it's going to take the servlet request or response in this case. So servlet like that. So it should be servlet response. So this value here and the second value is the response. And then we're going to say um we need to close this with a semicolon uh, i wanted to have a try catch so we're gonna say try and then a catch for any exception exception and here we're gonna say throw a new api exception and then we're gonna say 
exception that get message i might have to come back and reconsider this but let's leave it like this for now and then here we need the output stream which we can get from the http server response that get output stream and then we just need to call the new object mapper and we need to say that right value we give it the output stream and then we give it the response so whatever response that we're going to pass in here and we can delete this and then lastly we need to flush this out like that so now we can call the right response if i scroll down we're going to say right response and accept and then we're going to give it the response and also the api response i'm going to change this to a var okay so now we need to work on the get error response and you're going to see how these are going to come into play in a minute because i know right now things might not be making a lot of sense but it's going to make sense in a minute so this is going to return the response so from our uh, domain and what we're going to do we're going to say response set content type so content type we're going to pass in application underscore json underscore value and after that we're going to pass in the response oops set status so here we need to say status or http status that value oops control z value like that so we set these values on the http server response and i'm gonna name this status to keep it shorter and then pass status here then import this and it's coming from http so spring framework http you can pass in your string here if you want. It's really like JSON slash value, like this value right here. But if it's already defined and there's no point, just use whatever already exists in your class path. And then after that, we need to return, we need to return the actual response. So we're gonna say new response. So from our domain, we're gonna say now that to string, and then we're gonna say status that value. We're gonna pass in the request that get URI, and we need the HTTP status that value of and then we can pass in the status that value so that's going to give us the actual http status because that's what this takes like this response and then i'm going to say uh let's do error uh error reason which is another method that we're going to create uh well i'm going to pass in null for now so we're going to say null and then we're going to say get root cause message and then pass in the exception to this exception and then lastly we're going to pass in the empty map so empty map that we have defined up there so empty map import that from java collection and get root cause message is coming from apache link 3 so you can see it here which we imported in the beginning so if you give it this it's going to give you the message of the root cause of the exception and then here we need to pass in the message but we're going to work on this message in a minute so you can see everything that we did and i need to close this with a semicolon so you see everything that we did just so that we can have a very nice way to return the same response every single time so all of this is really important in api because you need to keep it consistent with the same format throughout the entire application so let's scroll up and quickly fix this message because it's null for now so i'm going to scroll up and uh, below this i'm going to define another private oops private st static and that's going to be final it's going to be a b function or by function and it's going to take uh the exception it's going to take an http status and it's going to return a string so hopefully you guys are familiar with the these new things that you can do with uh java so i'm going to call it error response and we're going to pass in these values so we're going to see exception status so these are the two values the first two and then the last one is what it's returning. So this takes an exception, it takes an HTTP status, and it returns a string. And I'm gonna remove the extra parenthesis. And then here we're gonna say, and I'm gonna do if the HTTP status, and then I'm gonna check to see if it's uh, same code as, and then we're gonna pass in forbidden. So if it's forbidden, then what message do I wanna have? Then I'm gonna have a message in here. And I'm gonna say return, you do oops not have enough permission so that's the message that i'm going to return if it's a forbidden for the http status if the same code as the status is a forbidden then that's going to be what i'm going to return if the http status is the same code as unauthorized then i'm going to return a different message so i'm going to say oops return 
you are not logged in like that otherwise or if the exception is an instance of disable exception coming from spring security or if the exception is an instance of the lock exception coming from spring security or if the exception is an instance of the bad oops bad credential exception or if the exception is an instance of the credential expired so again spring security or if the exception is an instance of api exception so api exception then in this case oops control z we can return the message because we know what the message is going to be so in this case we're going to say return exception that get message so it's safe to do this here and then we're going to say if well i'm going to go on a no line if the exception or http status in this case is the same code as or is uh, i think i can do 500 so if it's a 500 i'm going to return an internal server error occurred so a generic message well i guess i can put this on multiple line because i'm gonna do an else after that as the last one else i'm going to say return an error occurred please try again and semicolon so there's one important thing that i want to say about this method the order is very important okay so i'm not doing this in any random order and also i should probably put this on multiple line but if you guys know me a little you know that i don't like having things on many different lines so that's why i have it all on one line but feel free to move it to multiple different lines and i have api authentication this is supposed to be api except and again in your case it's going to be a different a different name like my app exception or my app authentication or whatever name you want to give it okay so if it's any of these so disable locked exception back credentials and credential expired and api exception to our own exception we know it's safe to return the message so we return the message if it's a forbidden we say you do not have enough permission the message for forbidden is not it's not a message that's going to reveal too much, but I still want to customize it. So I pass in my own message and then unauthorized. And then if it's a 500, otherwise we will return this. Okay. And feel free to extend this more if you would like, but that's good for me. So now I can scroll down and instead of null, I'm going to say uh, air reason that apply, give it the exception and the status. There we go. So that's going to give us the message and delete all of the space that I put so I could scroll up. Okay. So this is going to give us the error response, which we need. And then we're going to pass it to write response, which will give us uh, well, control Z, which will write the response inside of the, like, if you look here, it's going to write it inside of the body. Like the object is going to be written inside of the response or the servlet response. So it's taking our API response, the Java object, or in this case, I think we define it as a record, but it's still an object. And then we write it inside of the body of the HTTP servlet response. So everything here looks good for now. And I think we should be good. These are private. And this is uh, the one that we need to import. So we can go back to the filter on comment this and then import it. See all this work we just did just so we could do this, just so we could import just this single method. So if we have an exception in here, it's going to give us a very beautiful response or error response and it's going to return null. So the next thing that we need to work on is the successful authentication. And for the successful authentication, we're actually going to need the JWT service. So this JWT service is going to be very interesting and I really want you guys to pay attention because it's going to be very important for the application. That's what's going to give the users their tokens and check to see if the tokens are expired or are valid, etc. So before we can work on the successful authentication, which is going to be code that we're going to write here we actually need to define the JWT service which we don't even have in the application yet so i'm gonna do some cleanup while i'm here delete all of these that i'm not using so we're going to be working on the service and make sure that we have all of the methods that we need so that we can continue with the successful authentication so that's what we're going to be working on next so i'm going to go ahead and copy the JWT service name and close uh, everything else that I'm not using. And then we're going to go to the service 
package. So let's scroll down and this is the service package. And then I'm going to right click, create a new class and then paste this. And I want this to be an interface. So I'm going to select the interface. So we're going to define some methods that we're going to need here. And we're going to see if we can take like a modern Java approach. So we're going to be using or try to use all of the modern features in Java. So we're going to define one to create the token. So we're going to say create token. And this is going to take the user and it's going to take a function. So we're going to say function from Java util. This function is going to take a token and it's going to return a string. And I'm going to name it token function. That should do it. Token function. And we're also going to have an optional of string, which is going to be extract token because we need to be able to extract the token. This is going to take the HTTP servlet request. We're going to name it request and it's also going to take the token type. I might make this an enum. I'm not sure yet, but let's leave it like that for now. And then we need another one to add the cookie. So this is really important. I know in the past I've shown how to put the token and the header. But in this course, we're going to take a very secure approach, which is to make sure that we add the token as a secure HTTP only cookie, which is the best way that you can do this. So I'm going to say add cookie. And this is going to take the HTTP servlet response. And we're going to name it response. It's also going to take the user. And then we need the token type. And then we're going to say type. And we also gonna have another one that's gonna return a generic and we're gonna call it call. Well, it's not gonna return a generic, it's gonna return values from a specific class. And then we're gonna call it get token data. And it's gonna take a string, which is the token, and it's gonna take a function, and that's gonna have the token data. So we're gonna say token data and t, which is the value that's gonna return. And then we're gonna call it token function or token data function, I'm gonna remove this T. Token function should be fine, even though we have it in two different methods. Remove that space on the bottom. So I'm gonna, uh, let's see if we can import this user cause it's causing some problem. So this is the user coming from the DTO. So this user right here, the one that we defined earlier. So this is the user, this token, we can quickly define it. So it's giving us some import here, but I know that I don't have this token yet. So it's can see that it's trying to find tokens from everywhere but this is not the token that we need. So the token class is fairly simple. Let's see if we can quickly uh, define it. So inside of our domain, we're gonna create another class. We're gonna name it token, press enter, and we need some annotation. First one is going to be the builder because we need a builder pattern, and then we need the getters and setters like that. And we're just gonna have two token in there. So private string access. So that's the access token and then private string refresh refresh token because the user is going to have two tokens an access token and a refresh token so that's it we don't need to do anything else here and let's close this and see if we can import it so for the token import and we will pick the one from our domain there we go and collab now the token type oops i have an extra uh, comma here uh, we can also define the token data, not the token type. We'll get to the token type in a minute. So we're going to go back again inside of the domain, new class, paste, token data, press enter. So this is going to be like very important and I do want you guys to pay attention. So let's copy these annotations that we just put inside of here, close and paste. So we need the builder, getters and setters. So what we need for this class is the user. Oops user uh let's see if i can import it as i'm typing user yep so that's the user and we also need to get some claim so we're gonna say private claims which we have to import this is gonna be the claims and then we need to define private boolean this is gonna be valid if the token is valid and then lastly we need private a list of granted authority. So granted authority, and that's going to be the authorities uh, associated with that token. Okay. And again, this might not be making a lot of sense right now, uh, but it's going to make sense um, whenever we're going to start working with this. So let's import the list. Okay. So this is going to be the token data. Make sure I don't have any imports that I'm not using. And this claim is going to come from the third party library that we're going to use to generate the token, these claims. That's what you're going to, and you're going to see how all of this is going to come into play 
whenever we're going to start working with. So let's go back to the uh, service and then import the token data. Okay, so now we have the token data. Let me collapse this. And then we need to define the token type, which if you already guessed it, is going to be an enum. So here we're going to say token type which is going to be an enum. Uh, let's see if I can leverage some stuff here. Uh, maybe not. Okay, I'll just type it out. Okay, so for the token type, we know we're going to have two types. So access, and we're going to give it a value of access-token. And then we need the refresh token. So we're going to say refresh. We're going to give it a value of refresh token. And then we need getters and setters. So the way that I like to do this, I like to create a private, well, the way that you can do this, private final string, but I like to call it value because that's the value of the enum. Like this is the enum or the name of the enum and whatever you define inside of the parenthesis, that's the value of, of the enum. So that's why I like to call this value. And then after that, I'm going to define a constructor. I guess I can just right click and do generate constructor. Okay. So the constructor is going to take a string and it's going to return the, it's going to pass this string to this string that we're defining here. And I'm going to put this on one line. Okay. And then lastly, we need to have a way to get this. So we're going to say public and it's going to return a string and that's a get value. And then it's going to return uh, the same value. So we can just copy all of this stuff here, paste it here, remove that space at the bottom. Okay. And we need to return. Okay. Oops. Uh, this value like that. So that's the token type enum. It has an access token with a value of access token, which is a string and then refresh token, which has a value of refresh token. And you can see IntelliJ is telling you that this is the value of the enum. So now if we go back, we can import this token type. There we go. So let's see why we're getting an error here. Okay. So we're getting an error for this claim. So I'm going to comment this out for now. And then I'm going to go to the authentication filter and then import this. There's no implementation for it, but at least we can stop having this error that we're having. here. So this is going to be the service or JWT service that we're going to use to manage everything token related. That is if it's a access token or a refresh token. So now we need to give an implementation for all of these methods. And that's when we're going to need to introduce the third party library that we're going to use so that we can create the tokens for the users. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's go back to the browser and I'm going to just search for JJWT and press enter. And it should be this first one here, Java JWT, and I'm going to click on it. So this is by far the most popular third party library for Java for creating JSON web token. And if you want, you can go ahead and read on it, but I'm not going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to scroll all the way down until I can see where I can get, oops, where I can get the dependency. And then we're going to plug it into our application, but I would encourage everyone to go ahead and read up on it. Like at least you can read that first readme in the GitHub page. So I'm going to copy this because I've already done that. I spend a lot of time just reading just to see what's going on. It's very easy to use. It's very powerful. It's very secure. So I would definitely encourage you guys to go ahead and check it out and just read more about what this library is. So I copy everything and then I'm going back to the app and then I'm going to open the palm file. And I'm going to scroll down before the test dependency. I'm going to paste everything and I'm going to remove the comments and I'm going to click on the little M to refresh Maven so that Maven can go and fetch these dependencies and it happened really very quickly. Also going to remove this comment. Okay. So now we have the uh, JJWT in our class path as uh, our dependency. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close the pom file. And the first thing that I'm going to do is to see if I can um, import this claim. So we're going to go here and then see if we can import it. Import. There we go. And you can see that it's coming from the class that we just, or the library that we just imported in our application. Okay. So the other thing we have to do is to give an implementation for the user or JWT service. So I'm going to copy the name and then go down, close some of these things. So inside of the implementation, we're going to do new Java class, IMPL, press enter. And in the security package, so in here, I'm going to create another class that I'm going to call JWT configuration or config. I'm going to name it configuration in this case. So the JWT configuration is just going to fetch some information for us. So I'm going to add in the getter and the setter. And we need to get the, uh, let's do add value. So that's supposed to come from Java, not Lombok. 
and we need dollar sign well we need quotation dollar sign open and close i'm going to be looking for jwt that expiration and this is going to be private long expiration and then i'm going to need another at value annotation quotes dollar sign open and close curly braces this is going to be jwt that secret and this is going to be a string like that and you'll see why i'm doing it this way and since we have this defined just so that we don't forget let's go to the resources and go to our application and somewhere at the bottom here like maybe after this i'm gonna say jwt expiration and i'm gonna pass in dollar sign open and close jwt underscore expiration and we also need the secret dollar sign open and close jwt secret okay and we're gonna need to define these two values so let's copy them oh well i'm gonna copy both of them go to the dev paste and i'm gonna do something different here so we know that we cannot define the secret here so for the secret i'm also gonna take it in so i'm gonna put another dollar sign so instead of putting a value here i'm gonna pass it in as a value so we're gonna say dollar sign and then we're gonna pass in a secret so we're gonna say secret just like that so we're not only passing it in in here as a secret that's coming from a different file but even in that different file in this case in the dev we're also passing it in as a value because we cannot have this secret just laying around and then for the expiration i'm gonna do this so 432 zero with six zeros and this is millisecond so if i take this value and i go back to the browser and then i search this and i see milli seconds to for example days you can see just five days okay just five days that we're allowing the expiration so back to the app so that's going to be the jwt expiration that's five days Again, this value is going to be whatever you want it to be, depending on your application. I'm sure you guys already know that. So we're going to copy this and do the same in the prod. Come down here, paste. And then I'm going to close the prod. And I'm going to show you how we're going to pass this secret. So when we're going to run the application in this IDE, I'm going to show you how we're going to pass it. And then when we're going to run the application, let's say in a Docker container or in some other ways, then I'm going to show you how we're going to pass this secret. So this secret is never going to be anywhere in the application ever, which is the way that it's supposed to be done. Okay, so let's go ahead and close that and also close this. So now we know we're getting these values, JWT expiration and also the secret. So these values are going to be plugged into this bin whenever it's created. So let's close that. And now we need to work on this implementation. So we're going to say implement jwt service and before we implement we need to first extend jwt config so the configuration and we need to implement our method so implement methods we're going to implement everything okay so we have some work to do in here so even though we have like one two three four so we have four methods that we're going to be using externally however we're going to be writing a decent amount of code here because we need to make sure that we're doing this in a very in a very good way or in a very secure way or in a very senior developer way if you if you want so i'm going to annotate this with the at service annotation and then we need the required ox constructor and also i need some logging so i'm gonna say at slf4j oops slf4j okay so we will need only one dependency for this this is going to be private final that's going to be the user service that's the only dependency that we're going to need for this class so we have the user service in there and i'm going to collapse some of these imports so what we're going to be doing next is working on this class so that we can make sure we have an implementation for each one of these methods. So that's what we're gonna be working on next. So I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down and I'm gonna define some helper methods that I need so that they can help me implement these actual methods that we're gonna be calling from outside of this class. So I'm gonna be creating some private methods and let's go ahead and get started. So the first one that I'm gonna need is going to return, uh, well, it's gonna be private final and it's gonna give me the key. And also, we're going to be taking advantage of the new features of Java. So we're going to be using, uh, I guess you can say, fancy Java. So here I'm going to say a supplier, and that's going to give me a secret key coming from uh, Java Crypto. And then I'm going to call it key. 
and this is not going to take any parameters so i'm going to put empty parenthesis and this is going to give me the key so this is going to say keys and that's coming from our library and then i want to do uh hmac sha key four and in here i want to say decoders coming from our libraries again that base 64 and then decode and then we want to call get secret so what this is doing is it's going to fetch the secret for us and this get secret is defined inside of the generality configuration so if we go in there you see we have getters and setters and then we have secret and an expiration so that means we have getters and setters for get secret and set secret and set expiration and get expiration and because we're extending this class then we can access get secret which is going to give us the secret from our properties file as you can see it's being defined here and since this is going to be a bean because it has the as service annotation then it's going to also create the bean for this class which is going to trigger this add value annotation from spring and then it's going to try to read these values and then set the value from the properties file inside of this value right here using the setter and then we're just using the getter to get that value here so that's going to give us the key or it's going to supply us the key and the next one that i need which is also going to be private final that's going to be a function so java util function and I want to be able to give it the token. So it's going to take a string and it's going to return me claims. So claims are like everything that we set on the token. So we give it a token and it's going to give us claims. So we're going to say claim function. Uh, it's taking the token. So we're going to say token. And what we want to do is to call JWTS or JWTS. So from our library. And then we want to say that parser and let me put this on a new line so that it can be easier to read so it's going to say parser and we want to say that verify with and then we're going to pass it the key again so we're going to say key we need to call get so that's going to give us the secret key and then after that we want to call that build oops that build and then we're going to say that parse sign claims and then we're going to pass in the token so the sign claim so technically the token and then we want to call get payload. So that's gonna give us the claims associated with the token that we're passing in here. Okay, so we're gonna use all of these methods in a minute. So we just need to define them for now. And then I need another one, which is also gonna be private final, and it's going to be another function. I'm gonna give it the token, and then it's gonna give me the user. So the user ID or the subject in this case. So I'm gonna say subject. So that's gonna give me the subject, and it's taking the token. So we're gonna say token. That's how you pass the parameter. So we know that it takes a string and returns a string. So the first parameter is a string. So I just named it token. And you can see here, the ID recognized that this is a string token because that's what we define the type is going to be. And what this is gonna do, uh, we can call another method. We're gonna say get claims value and then we will give it the token and then we can pass in anything that we want from the claim but in this case we just want the subject we're going to pass the subject as a string so i'm going to say claims and then do get sub okay so that's going to tell the claim to only extract the subject out of it and we're going to create this method in a minute and i also need another one to get the authorities so i'm going to say well this one is going to be public because i'm going to use it on the outside so we're going to say public it's a function it's gonna take the token and it's gonna return a list of granted authority so granted granted authority coming from spring security and then i'm gonna name it authorities and this is gonna take the token so we're gonna say token hopefully now you kind of get used to the syntax and there is a helper uh i think it's a method that we can use so we can say comma separated string to authority i think it's called authority uh list like that and then uh let's pass it the string so let me see if i can import this so first let's import the list so that's supposed to come from java util and i'm gonna scroll up a little more okay and this is supposed to come from a helper from spring security so this right here authority util coming from spring security so what this does it returns a list of authorities by giving it a string where every authority is separated by a comma and we know that in our application that's exactly what we implemented because all of our authorities they're separated by a comma so if we go to the constant uh let's go here uh well we want to go to the constant and we go here so you see that they're separated by a comma. So these are all of our authorities or permissions, and they're all separated by a comma. So you can see here, separated by a comma, right here. 
Okay, so this is gonna work exactly well because we know that this is what this is for. But another thing that I want to do with this, I'm gonna put it on a no line. I want to not only put all of the authorities inside of here, but I also want to add the role because later I'll show you how we can either check for a specific role in our controller or we can check for a specific permission. So to do this, I not only need to put the role of the user, but I also need to put in the permission. So to do this, I'm gonna do a new string joiner. So coming from Java Util, and then I'm gonna pass in the authority. I think we define the authority delimiter underscore delimiter or maybe we didn't, let's see, yep, we did. So that's coming from our constant and I'm gonna click on it just so that you guys can see. So it's this comma right here, the delimiter of the authority, which is just this comma, okay? So we're gonna see this is the delimiter and then we're gonna add whatever we want to add. So here we're gonna say that add lowercase and then we can pass in any string that we want. And that's when we're gonna call our claims function dot apply or apply and then we're gonna give it the token. And from there, we want to say that get, and we want to get the authorities. So here I'm gonna say authorities, which apparently we don't have defined yet, and I want to grab that as a string. So I'm gonna say string that class. So I'm assuming this is not making a lot more sense, but it will make sense in a minute. So just bear with me. So the first thing that we want to pass in to get all of the authorities is going to be the token. And then we pass in the key authorities, which is what we're looking for. So let's go to the constant and I don't have this defined in the constant. So I'm going to go ahead and just define it. So I'm going to do control D and then I'm just going to copy authorities and then paste it here. And this is just going to be authorities. It's okay to still name this permissions. So feel free to do that. If you prefer permission, now we can import this. So all I'm saying is, Hey, I want to have this string joiner, which is going to join a long string and the delimiter is going to be the comma, as you can see here. And I said, the first thing that I'm adding is a bunch of authorities, which I'm grabbing from the token because I know the authorities exist in the token. And then after that, I want to also add the role. So I'm going to say that add, I can add another sequence of character. And this time I want the role prefix. And then I'm going to say plus call the claim function again. So we're going to say claim function that apply because that's how we get anything from the token. And then in this case, I want to get the role. So I want to say that get, and then I'm going to pass in the role. So I'm going to say role, and then also that's going to be a string as a string. And I want to say, I want to convert all of this as a string. So here I'm going to say that to string like that, and then close this. I don't know if, if I define the role, but let's see import. Okay. So I didn't, so I'm just going to copy this again, go back here do control D and then paste this. And this is just going to be the word role like that. Okay. So I think that should do it. And I think I have an extra here. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this and that should fix the problem. And then I need another one to extract the token. So I'm going to go above here because I want to keep all of the public ones at the bottom and then all the private ones at the top. So here I'm gonna say private again, final, and this is going to be the extract token and it's gonna return a by function or a b function. Uh, the difference between the function and the b function is the function takes a value and returns a value, but the b function, as you can tell by the name, it takes two values or two parameters and return a return value. So in this case, we can see it's going to take an HTTP server request. It's going to take a string and it's going to return an optional of a string, which is going to be the token because we know that we might or we might not have a token. So that's why I give it an optional and I'm going to say extract token and we have to pass in these two values that we say it's going to take. So the request, well, it's giving me a suggestion here, but I'm going to name this cookie name. So we need the cookie name so that we can go and search for it. And I have too many of these parentheses. So we're going to extract the token. As you can see here, we're naming it extract token and we're taking the HTTP server request. So the request and a string, which is the name of the cookie that we want to look for. And it's going to return an optional of string because we know we might not have the token by looking it inside of the request by that name. So hopefully this is making sense. So this method is going to be a little bit interesting. So what I want to say is I want to say I want an optional of, and then here I want to stream 
because we know we're gonna get a bunch of cookies on the request and we want to stream on the requests that get cookies or cookies right here because you see it's on an array so we can stream over it so let's see if we can import the stream that's the one so from java util arrays and then here inside of this what we're going to say we're going to check to see if this is null so we're going to say equal equal null and put a question mark so if this is the case then we need to create a new cookie so that we can return it as an empty value. So what I'm gonna say is, I'm gonna say new cookie. You can see it's coming from the servlet and it's just gonna be an array and we're gonna pass it the cookie. So we're gonna say new cookie and then we're gonna say empty value. So empty underscore value or empty, yeah, I'll just keep empty value and then empty underscore value. So if we don't have a cookie, we're just gonna create one. And then if we do have one, then we're gonna see if we can grab it from the request. So in this case, we're gonna say request that get cookies. And then I'm gonna go on a no line and I'm gonna say that filter from stream. And we're looking for this specific cookie name. So I'm gonna say uh, object. So from Java util that equals, and then I wanna look for the cookie name. So cookie name and then compare it with the cookie and the iteration that get name. So we're just comparing the two names. And then I want to say that map, and we want to map where the cookie that get value. So we want to get the value of the cookie. And then I wanna say that find any, so any one of them. And then to finish this off, I'm gonna say that or else we want to return on empty like that, so an empty optional, and then close this off. So I'm gonna walk you through this again because this is like a very condensed way of writing this method. So let's see if we can import this, import static from optional. Okay, so it's gonna return an empty, and we have too many of these right here. And I think instead of empty value, I'm just gonna be using the empty from the comments link. So this one right here. So if we go in there, uh, oops, went to the wrong place. So in here, so this empty is really just empty string, but I don't want it to be empty string. I want it to be an empty value. So let me undo that. And then I'm gonna copy this name and then go to the constant, do control D on this one and then paste this here. So empty value is gonna be like, uh, maybe like empty because I need to have something in there. I can't have an empty string. And then I think we have an error here. So we just wanna do request like that. All right, so let me walk you through this one more time. So we're gonna return an optional because you can see that this is returning an optional of string. And what we're saying is we're gonna return an optional of something, right? Right here. So if I put my mouse over here, you can see that this ends over here which means we're gonna do all that and see if we can return an option of something. Otherwise, we're gonna return an empty option. So hopefully this is clear. So we return an option of whatever the result of this is, or we're gonna return an empty option. So that's the first. The second part is we want to see if we have any cookies. Because when we call get cookies, if get cookies returns null, then we're gonna throw a null pointer exception. We don't want a null pointer exception to be thrown whenever we call get cookies, because that's what will happen. Like if you go in there, it will tell you that if they can't find any cookie, they will throw this exception. So because of that, we're saying, hey, if this get cookies returns null, so if it's null, then create a new array. Because remember, get cookies is an array. You can see it's an array. So if it's null, there is nothing in it. Let's create a fake one so that we have something to work with. Okay, so we're going to say create this fake cookie array, and then we're going to pass in empty, empty. Because we need to do this filtering here, so we need something to continue to do that. It will break anyway if this returns null because it will throw a null pointer exception, but we don't want that to happen. So we're saying if this is null, well, let's create a new cookie array on the fly. So we create this one. Otherwise call get the cookies because we know we have something there. So at this point on everything that I'm highlighting here, we have some array to work with. Either if we get all the cookies, which is gonna return an array of cookie, or we can just use our own in case this was null so that we don't throw an exception or a null pointer exception in this case. We're gonna return this dummy cookie as an array because we know that we need an array to pass into the stream, okay? So that's what this whole thing is. And then since now we have an array either by using this fake one or by using this get cookies, depending on if this was null or not, then we can filter over it. 
and what we're filtering is we want to say we're going to filter on all the cookies so you can see because we're filtering it passes in every single cookie you can see that's a cookie we can say we want to filter where the cookie names are equal so whatever cookie name that we're going to pass here to this method it's going to compare to see if the names are the same that's the one that we're going to filter so if the name are the same then we're going to filter it out so we're going to grab it um, we're filtering it out and then we're going to say give us the value of that cookie by mapping it and then we're going to say find any so anyone that you find just return it so that's what this function is doing so hopefully it wasn't too bad but that's how we're going to extract the token from the request and we know that we're going to be saving the token and the cookies so we need to access the cookies so when i created this method the first time it wasn't like that i was just streaming or looping over the cookies and then one time i was testing then i realized that the application was throwing a neural pointer exception because i didn't have any cookies so i came up with this solution just so that we can have a, a feel safe scenario here so even though we call get cookies and it returns null then we're going to create this fake cookie and it's probably going to return an empty value because it's not going to be able to find a cookie by the name empty unless you set a cookie in your application and then you give it the name of empty. so that's going to extract the token okay inside of the cookie or the cookie is going to look for the particular cookie and then give us the token which is going to be the value of the cookie. okay and then we need another one this one is also going to be a private final and this is going to be another by function. So we're going to say by function. It's also going to take the HTTP server request. It's going to take the cookie name. And this time it's going to return an optional of cookie because that's what we're looking for because we need to extract the cookie. So here we're going to say extract cookie and we need to pass in these parameters. So we're going to say request and cookie name because we're going to pass this in. And then we want to say in this case, we're going to say also return an optional of something. We're going to stream again on the request get cookies and we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say if this is null question mark, then give us this fake cookie array. So new cookie, which is going to be on the array. And then the values are going to be a new cookie of empty, empty. So we're going to say, oops, new cookie, empty value empty value otherwise we know we have cookies so we're going to see requests that get cookies okay so that we can stream on it and then after that we're going to say filter we're going to do the same thing so where the cookie objects that equal cookie name so the name that we're passing into the method equals the cookie name get name so we're going to get that and we want to say find any and or else we're going to say empty again. So empty. And I have too many of these. I don't have to do it this way. I can just do this. Find any like that. And then close this. And we need to close this right here. Okay. So there we go. I'm going to scroll up a little more. So pretty much almost the same thing. But in this case, we're not getting the value of the cookie. We're just trying to get the cookie itself. Okay. So that's why it's saying it's returning an option of cookie. And you're going to see where all of this is going to come into play. I'm going to scroll down a little more and we're going to be working on the builder. So we're going to say private final. This is going to be a supplier of the JWT builder. So we're going to say JWT builder and this is going to be the builder like that. This is not going to take any parameter. And what we're going to do is going to be like fairly simple. In this case, we're going to say JWT uh, S that builder. So we're going to call the builder. And then we want to pass in the header. You don't have to pass in these headers, but I like to pass in the headers. So we're going to say header that, and then we're going to say add. You can see it takes a, either a map or a string and a, as a key and an object as a value. So here I'm going to say the type is going to be the JWT underscore type. And this is going to go, well, you can pass it in like this, but if you want, you can pass in a simple map of, you can pass it like this as well. So I'm going to pass it like this. Oops, control Z. I have a Mac, so I keep forgetting what keys I have to use to do control Z. So we pass in the headers and then we're going to see that end because we need to pass in more uh, stuff to this. And we're going to see the audience that add. So we're going to say add. So that takes a collection or a simple string. In this case, we're going to pass in a simple string. So I'm going to say get arrays underscore LLC. So in this case, you can just pass in your name of your uh, application. And then after the audience, I'm also going to say end again. So we're going to say end. And then we want to pass in an ID. So that's going to be a random ID. So I'm going to say UUID that random that to string. Just a random string for the ID of the token. So the idea of the token is actually really important. You can actually build 
different types of logic around it because you can save the ID of the token somewhere, either in memory or in the file. And then when request comes in, you can, you know, do other things and check for this specific token and stuff like that. Like depending on the username, like you can do anything you want with that ID because it's an identifier for the token. In this case, we're just using this ID, but we're not doing anything with it. And I'm going to say uh, issue or issue at, and I'm going to say from, so from the date of Java, and I'm going to pass it now, which is the instant that I'm going to say, uh, we can just press the dot so that you can see what you have here. But another thing that I want is not before, because I don't want this token to be used not before the current time that it was created. So not before now. So nobody can use the token before the time that it was created. And then we're going to say sign with, and then here we're going to pass in our key again. So we're going to say key that get because we define the supplier. And then we're going to pass in the algorithm. Well, you can just leave it like this. It will work as well. You're just passing in the sign with this key. But I want to pass in a specific algorithm. So JWTS, that signature or SIG, that this one, HS 512. Now, if you want to see what the algorithm is supposed to be for your key, you can actually call the key. So on your key, you can call get algorithm. You can see it's coming up here. So this algorithm is going to tell you exactly what algorithm you should use for your key. So that's how I know that this is the one that I need to use. So I'm going to see if I can import this type. So let's see here. So I'm going to import it from the library that we brought in. So I'm going to do the same here. So you can see that they're giving us this squiggly underline and it says it's deprecated. But if we go in there, you'll see that they're just simple string for the type, which is DWT. So it doesn't bother me that it's giving me this warning because I'm not really doing anything with these and they're just simple constant. So I'm just using them anyway. But if you want, you can define these values yourself in your own class, which is going to be the TYP for the type and then JWT. I'm also going to create a constant for this. So I'm going to say right click refactor introduce constant, I'm just going to give it the same name and I will move it over to the constant class. So I'm going to close this. I just paste it anywhere here. Oops. That. So this problem, you can just ignore it. The ID is a little bit slow, but we don't have any problem for this empty. So now if we go back, we need to import this. So well, it's already imported. That's good. So this is going to be our builder. And then I'm going to go down. I'm going to define another private final. This one is going to be another by function. Oops. By function. This is going to take the user. So our user. It's going to take the token type, so the token type enum, and it's going to return a string, which is going to be the token. So we're going to call this uh, build token or token builder or something, and we're going to pass in these values. So we're going to see that's going to be the user and also the type of the token. And then here we're going to determine what type of token that they pass in and what we need to return. So I'm going to scroll up a little more, put this at the very top. So what I'm going to do is call object again. So we're going to say object that equal. And then we're going to try to see what the type is. So we're going to say the type and access. Oops. So we know that we define access token in refresh token. So we're going to say, is this access token? Then we're going to build an access token. So we're going to call the builder that we just defined that get. So we're going to get the builder and then we're going to say that set uh, or subject in this case. Then we're going to pass in the user that get user ID. So a string as the subject. Again, for the subject, you can pass in anything you like. In my case, I want to pass in the user ID, which is a string. And then I want to pass in some claim. I want to pass in the authorities and I want to say user that get authorities. So it's just a simple string. That's going to be the authorities. And I want to pass in another claim. So you can keep passing in as many claims as you want. At this point, I want the role and I want to say user that get role. So for claims, we're not only passing in the authorities, we're also passing in the role. I'm going to scroll up some more. And another thing I want to pass is the expiration because we're building the token. So we're going to say expiration, we're going to say from and then pass in now. And then we're going to pass in plus second. And then we're going to say get expiration coming from our class that we're extending. So that's all that. And then we're going to say that compact. So that's going to give us the token. So if it's an access token, that's what we're going to do. If it's not an access token, that's when we put the colon, then we're going to say, well, in this case, it's a refresh token. So we're going to get the builder again because that's how we create any token. And then from the builder, we're going to say the subject is going to be the same. So user that get user ID. And in this case, since it's a refresh token, we only need to give it the subject, the expiration. So the expiration is going to be the same thing. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy it from here and then paste. And then after that, 
we're gonna say compact. So if it's an access token, I'm gonna import this real quick. Then we're gonna do this. So we're gonna get the builder, pass in the user ID for the subject, and then pass in authorities for the claim and role for the claim. So we will pass in the authorities and the role as part of the claims and then set the expiration date. Otherwise, we know that we have to create a refresh token. So in this case, we just pass again the subject and then the expiration. Also, you can have a different expiration date for the refresh token because we know that if we're in this part of the code, then we're dealing with a refresh token. And then I'm going to do some static import for these just to make it look a little better like that. OK, so it's going to build a token for us. I need another one to add a cookie to the response. So this is going to be another private final and we can make this a B function or consumer in this case because we're not returning anything. So you can see here the buy or B consumer, it takes two values. But in my case, I want one that takes three values. So I'm going to click on it. And then I'm going to go in there and you can see it's a functional interface. And if you scroll down, you can see that it takes two values. Okay. T and U. And then we have the accept and then we have the end in, which is just a chain of the same function. You can see right here, just call the accept and then pass in these values. But in my case, I want something that takes three values. So let me see if I can go to the definition. So if you go here, so a consumer is not going to return anything. So anytime that you would have a method that returns void, then you can use a consumer. So if it's a consumer, it takes one value and it returns nothing. If it's a B or by consumer, then it takes two values and it returns nothing. But in my case, I want something that takes three values and return nothing because a consumer is not supposed to return anything. It consumes it. And the same logic applies for function. So a function will take a value and return a value. But in this case, we have a by function. That means it takes two values and it return a third value, which is the R. And you can see the regular regular function here takes a value, returns a value. But the by function takes two values and you return a value. And you can see the pattern is the same. But in my case, I need a consumer. So if we click on consumer here, you can see this consumer takes one value and it consumes it. it doesn't return anything. You do your logic, you do what you need to do, and then that's it. And that's also true for the B consumer, but the only difference is it takes two values. But I need something that takes three value. Since I said that we were going to be using the latest features of Java and functional interface is one of them. Well, it came out in 1.8. It's been a minute. Uh, it's still a, a new thing. If you've been working with Java for a long time, then you know that this is a new thing came out in um, 1.8. So what we can do, we can create our own functional interface and then we just use it. So that's what I'm going to do because I need another consumer that can take three values. And really, I don't have to do that because I can just reuse a regular regular method here or a regular function in here. But I want to take the opportunity to show you that you shouldn't be scared of these things because if you really understand the concepts and what they're supposed to be doing, then you shouldn't have any problem. And speaking of that, if we scroll up and look at the supplier, so you can see the supplier here, it's the same idea. So if I go inside of the supplier and then I click on this select open file and you can see it's, the, it's part of the same package, the function package, and you can see the supplier. The supplier is just going to supply you a value. So you tell it the type that it needs to return and then you call get on it after you defined it. So whenever you need to get that value as a supplier, so it's going to supply you something, meaning it's going to give you something, then you just call the get. And that's what we've been doing with the key. So every time we need to use the key, you can see we call the get and that's going to give us the key. And we told it when we call the get, the type is going to be of type secret key. And that's what this takes. You can see here, secret key. So we're going to create our own function and it's going to be pretty cool. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to open up here and scroll all the way to the top. I need to collapse this external library. It's huge. So I'm going to scroll up and then I'm going to create a new package. I'm going to call it function. And then in here, we're going to say we need a function or a class, which is going to be try consumer because they're using by consumer and by function. So since we need something that takes three values, then we're going to name it try consumer. I'm assuming that's the naming convention. Don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just following what I see. And if you go back here and we look at this consumer, you can see it's very simple. So we can just say that this is going to be a functional interface. So we're going to copy that and then go here. We're going to say that's a functional interface make sure this is imported and then we're gonna say it's gonna take one function which is gonna be accept that's also a naming convention you have to name it accept so we can just actually copy everything here copy then paste so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pass in my type here we can see it's gonna take one 
two, three value. Okay, I put T U V for no reason, but you put whatever you want. And then we're gonna say the first one is gonna be the T for the consumer. Second one is gonna be the U, so U. And then the third one is gonna be the V for V. Okay, and we don't need all this comment. I'm gonna delete it. And I don't think we're gonna use the and then, but if you wanna do an implementation for it, you can already see where we're going with it. So you would pass your values here. So these three values, if I can copy them. So instead of one, you pass in three, and then you pass in the same name here, like that. And then you can probably keep this not and all for the after. And then in the return, you're gonna pass in your three values. Oops, control Z. But in the return, you would pass in your three values. So here you can see they're passing in one. So here we need three, since we're working with three. So you're gonna see for this three, we're gonna do the same T, U, V, and then call after, except the same values. TUV like that. And you would change this right here, like that. And you could probably pass in the same values here. So the same TUV, you can just pass them here. But in our case, we're not gonna use this. I'm just gonna use the accept, remove this space, like that. And then we need to change this to an interface, interface, like that, interface, okay? Because it's a functional interface. And also functional interface can only have one method. And I'm gonna delete these imports. Let's clean them up. Okay, so this is our track consumer and it's a functional interface. So now we can use it and pass it three values because that's what we need to work with. So we're gonna go copy this name, go here. Instead of a B consumer, we need a track consumer coming from our class. And you can see different implementation. You can see I put mine, which is the first one coming from secure doc, but you can see we have two more. <laughs> So let's see what the implementation that they had. So I'm gonna select the second one and then go in there. You can see it's really nothing. They're doing the same exact thing that we're doing. Just they use different um, letters here, but it's really the same thing. So um, if I do control Z and then I do R and then I look at the one from Apache Commons. So I'm gonna select this one then go in there. You can see this is exactly what I just told you to do but now they're just saying anything that extends this t anything that extends this v anything that extends this uh, u which is a way to make it more flexible in case you define a different type so you can see it here literally what i just told you but you don't have to pass in anything that extends this value you can pass in this value directly like you can say t u v which is the after and it's really just a chaining of the same thing so you can call this twice or as many times as you want by just chaining it like this. So hopefully you guys understand how this will work, but that's not what we want. So I'm going to do control Z so I can remove the import and then I'm going to delete the R and then type it again so that I can get it from my own package. And hopefully this is super clear now. And to do the, uh, to add the cookie, that's the method to add the cookie. We're going to say HTTP server requests. We need the request. Well, actually we need the response. So we're going to add the cookie and the response, not the request. We need the user and then we need the token type. So we're going to say token type and then we're going to say add cookie. So this is the method that's going to add the cookie in the response so that we can send it to the client as a secure cookie or an HTTP only. I'm going to explain the difference between a secure cookie and an HTTP only cookie. So here we're going to say response. You can see the ID is being smart. So it's going to say, well, you're going to take a response, which is going to be of type HTTP response. You're going to take a user, which is going to be a type user. And then you're going to take the token type, which is going to be of type token type. I'm going to select it. But in this case, I'm going to change the name to just type instead of token type. And then in here, we're going to need the curly braces. We're going to, we're going to have more than one line. So if you look here, this is really one line of code. So we don't need the curly braces and also true. Here. So every time you don't see the curly braces after the arrow, that means it's a one line of code, okay, which is really nice. But now we're going to need multiple lines. So we're going to put the opening and closing parentheses or curly braces in this case. And we have too many of the parentheses. There we go. Okay. So this is going to be also very straightforward. So what we're going to do is to just switch on the type. So we're going to say type because we need to know when it's an access token that we're supposed to work with or if it's a refresh token that we're supposed to work. So on the type, we're gonna switch. So open and close again. And then I'm gonna say for the case, it's an access token. I'm gonna put open and close again because I need multiple lines. So open and close curly braces. So if it's an access token, I'm gonna create the access token. So I'm gonna say access token, and then I'm gonna call create token. So the method that you see here, so this one right here, create token. And then we're gonna have to give it the user which we know we already got. And then we're gonna give it the token function. In this case, we're gonna say the token and we want to get access. So that's gonna give us the access token. Once we have the access token, we're gonna create a cookie because we need to pass it in as a cookie. So we're gonna say cookie is going to be a new cookie. 
And for this cookie, we're going to pass in the name. So we're going to say the type. So we need to get access or refresh token, but we're creating an access token. So we're going to say get value. So that's going to give us a string. So if you go here, it's going to give us this string access token, which is how you're supposed to define cookies or cookie names. So you're going to have to have it in lowercase and then you separate different words by a dash. So when we call get value on the enum, either access or refresh, it's going to give us this, which is what we're supposed to pass in for a cookie because we can not pass in uppercase letter like access like this for a cookie. I guess you can, but that's not how it's supposed to happen. OK, so now we have the name of the cookie. We just need to pass in the value, which is the access token. So we have the access token cookie. So now that we have the cookie, just a simple cookie with a key and a value, the key is the name. So access token, the value is the token. So the JWT token. And then on that cookie, we want to say cookie that set HTTP only because we want it to be HTTP only. So we're going to say true. What that means is that this cookie is going to be in the browser, but you won't be able to access it using JavaScript or any other hacking mechanism. And it's also going to be sent back with the request automatically without you having to pass it in in the request, depending on the path. But we're going to set the path and the attribute of the same site to be none so that it can always be sent back with the request. So we're going to say HTTP only is true. We're also going to set it to be secure. So we're going to say cookie that sets secure secure so set secure this is going to be true so you can probably get the domain from the i guess you can get it from the response or maybe the request so let's go in here let's see what do we have here at cookie blah 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 set headers get headers okay so maybe you will need to get the request in here so that you can pass in four values in here uh, but we're not going to do that but my point is you can probably pass in the request in here as well in this method so that you can determine if you're using HTTPS or HTTP before you can set this set secure. Because if you're not using HTTPS, that's what this means. It means only on HTTPS that this cookie should be set and it should be sent back with the request. Because we're going to be on HTTP for like most of the course until the application is deployed on a secure server, that is, then this is not going to work. So I'm setting it here, but I'm going to put it in comment because we're not on HTTPS. And then I'm going to say cookie that set max age. So this is really important. I'm going to set two multiplied by 60. And I'm going to tell you guys what that is. And then we're going to say cookie that set path. You have to be very careful with the cookie because the cookie is very sensitive, especially if it's an HTTP only cookie. If you don't set those values correctly, then it's not going to work the way that you're expecting it to work. For the path, I'm going to put dash. So that means the root path or really the, just the entire path. And what that means is that from whatever request that this cookie uh, comes back for. So if you send a request with like localhost 3000 slash user slash, I don't know, profile slash uh, profile details or something, it doesn't matter because it's the, it's the root. So it's going to work for any part of the specific URL because it's the root. But if you wanted this cookie to be sent only for, let's say, for slash user profile details, then you would specify that in the path. And the browser is smart enough to know that, hey, I'm only going to send this cookie if the path is, you know, user slash details or something like that. But we're setting it to the root, meaning always send it with the domain that it came from. And then after that, we need to set this attribute of the same site. So we're going to say cookie that set attribute and we're going to pass in same site and we're going to say none. So none dot name. And let's import that import. And this is supposed to come from same site cookie. So I'm going to scroll down and it's right here. So you can see same site cookie none. So I'm going to select that. And the last thing we need to do is to edit to the response. So we're going to say response that add cookie and then we pass it the cookie. So that means the cookie is going to be in the response whenever we send the response back to the user, because that's what this method is doing. It's adding the cookie well, creating the cookie and then adding the cookie to the response as a cookie in the response. And then I'm going to copy this case again. Then I'm going to scroll down and then and go down once I'm going to go ahead and paste this and I'm going to change access to refresh It'll be coming up here refresh so if it's a refresh token I'm going to call the get refresh so we're going to create a different token this time it's not going to be access token well I'm just going to rename it so it's going to be refresh token so that's going to be the refresh token we're going to call create token but this time we give it the refresh as the token type and then we create the cookie we give it the refresh token value. So refresh token is going to be that the name of the cookie and then we pass in the cookie or the value of the cookie. In this case, that's going to be the JSON web token. And then the same thing again, set HTTP only true. 
we're not on the HTTPS yet. So I'm going to set this true, but also put it in comment because I'm using HTTP. And then I'm going to do two times 60 by 60. Okay. So I'm going to explain what this time is because this time that we're setting here is the same time that we're going to set for the token so that they can expire, I guess, in about the same time because by the time this code runs and then this code runs, millisecond will have elapsed. So it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's going to be super close and everything else is going to stay. So this is the method that we need to call whenever we need to add the cookie to the response. And we just have to give it the response, the user and the type of cookie that it should generate. So that's all we have to do for this. So I'm going to scroll down again. I think we're almost done. So I need to create the method that we define up here. So this one right here, I'm going to copy it and then I'm going to go down and right before the public one, I'm going to say private. This is going to return a generic of T and I'm going to paste it here and it's going to take a string. That's going to be the token. So the token as a string. And we know that this is a function of claims and whatever the type is, which is this T right here. So we're going to say this is a function of type claims and it's returning some value which we know will be part of the claim so i'm gonna close this like this so what that means is that whatever we're gonna return is gonna be something that exists on this claim so if i go in here it's either gonna be this or this or this or this or something else and it's gonna make sense once we start using them and i need to give this a name i think claim should be just fine i'm not gonna name it claims function now we're gonna say what we want to do is to just return the claims function and then we're gonna say and then so you can see how we can use the end in. We pass in this function and then on this function is where we're gonna apply the token. So we're gonna say apply and then pass in the token. Maybe this is not making a lot of sense. When we start using it, well, we're already using it up there. You can see that what I'm saying is I need to get the subject from the token. Now you could do this in a different way, but the reason that I'm doing it this way is because if you look at this claim function, we can call all of these on it. So get ID, get issuer, get audience, get expire, et cetera, et cetera. So we can just be clever about about it and then just say hey we're gonna pass in the claim function that's gonna return t for whatever the value is for all of the types that we have inside of this class so for example if i needed the expiration so if i delete this and see expiration if i get this expiration and i go in here so the expiration is a date so i could say in this case i'm looking for a date so i would make sure that well right now i'm looking for the subject but i would change this to a date so then i would say get date so i can use the same get claims value i just pass it the same token but i tell it hey in this case from the token after you parse it and etc i want to get the expiration or i want to get the subject or i want to get the audience so that's why i define it this way and it's really convenient that you can do all these things in java so that you can make your code really clean so i'm going to do Control z and hopefully that makes sense so in this case i want to get the subject from the token so i'm going to call it give it the token and then say from the claims give me the subject so that's what we're doing here and what this is doing is we're going to say from this claim function we're going to give it the token and it's going to give us the claim and then if we go down here again, uh, where are we using this? So then we're going to say, well, with this apply again, which is another function, it's all saying, hey, from these claims now, apply the token. So hopefully this is making sense. And if you have any questions, of course, let me know. But that's a way that you can use the end then because it allows you to chain all of these. So that's the last one that I'm going to use as a helper. So now what we're going to do is we're going to give implementation to these four methods that we did all of this work for so that we can finish finish up this JWT service implementation. So let's scroll down and let's go here. So what we're going to do for the create token is going to be fairly simple. I'm going to say, give me a token. So I'm going to say token and then set it equal to the token. So the token class that we created and then call the builder. And then we need to pass in the access token. In this case, we're going to pass in build token and then we're going to say apply and we need to give it the user, which we already have from this method. And then we're going to give it the type, which is access, uh, access. So that's going to give us the access token. Token. And then we need to give it the refresh token. So we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say refresh, oops, refresh. And then we need to call the builder again. So build token that apply user. And then in this case, we need refresh token. And then we're going to call build. So that's going to give us the token. And we know that we can either create an access token or a refresh token. So in this case, we're going to say token function. 
so the token function that we have in this method we're gonna apply it so we're gonna say apply and then give it the token so that's all we have to do for this and also i'm noticing that this is named token so this is the token class so if we go in there you can see that this is the actual token class which has an access token and a refresh token so if you can come up with a better name for this class then you can do that but i'm just gonna name it token and it has an access token so we call the builder and then for the access token we pass again the access token so give it the user and an access token and then to set the refresh token we do the same thing again for the refresh token so that's going to give us a token of this type with an access token and a refresh token so that whenever we pass in this function and apply it when we call this method if the function was get access token then it's going to just give us the access token if it's refresh token then it's going to give us the refresh token so hopefully that's making more sense and then for the extract token we already defined this method so we're going to say extract token we're going to give it the request and we're going to give it the cookie name which we're getting from well this is a cookie name not a token type so cookie name and that's what we need to give here cookie name because we're extracting it we need the name so extract token and we need to say that apply like that and then i'm gonna scroll up a little more so add cookie is gonna be fairly simple so we're gonna call add cookie and then we're gonna say accept it takes the response the user in the type that's it and then the last one we have to work on is the get token data so the same thing that we were doing with the function is the same thing that we're doing here that's why we're making it return a generic so the generic is going to be everything that exists on the token data so remember when i said that we were using function i said for example here it takes a string and it returns a list of authorities so the same thing happens even if you have it as a parameter so it takes a token data and it's going to return anything that exists on this token data or anything else that you want uh, that it can return from doing some work with this token data or some code logic with this token data. So this may not make a lot of sense now if you're not familiar with uh, with the function or Java util function package, but it's fairly simple to, uh, to use and to understand. And if we go in the token data, so this T that we're defining here, that it can return here, it's gonna be either a user, a claim, or a Boolean, or a list of granted authorities, okay? Or anything else that you can derive from this token depending on what you pass here or on the logic. So for this, I'm going to have to create the entire token data and then pass it into the token function. So I'm gonna say token function that apply. You can see it takes the token data. So now I have to create the token data. So I'm gonna say token data, because I have a builder for the token data, I'm going to say builder. And then we need to pass in the value for the valid, which is going to be a Boolean. I'm going to pass in true for now. We need to pass in the value for authorities. And we know we can get this from the authorities that apply. And that takes the token. So if we call the authorities and we give it the token, it's going to give us the authorities. And then we need to pass in the claims. And that's going to be the claim function that apply. Give it the token. That's going to give us the claims. And then the lastly, we need the user. And we know that we can call the user service that get user by user ID. Where is the user ID? Well, the user ID is in the subject. So the subject is the user ID, which we pass into the token. So we're going to call the subject that apply, give it the token so that it can give us the user ID. And then to build this token data, we're going to call that build. And that's going to build the token data for us. Well, we don't need this. So we give the function a token data object in this case. And then we can call either get valid or is valid or get authorities or get the claim or get the user. So that's what this means. So when we call this get token data, we're going to say, I'm going to give you the token and I want to pass in the token data that, or if you want to do object reference, you're going to pass in two columns and then say valid. The same thing that, uh, let's see if I can find an example. Yeah, right here. Okay. Because if I go and create token, you can see that it takes a function of the token and it returns a string. So in this case, we know that we're going to give it the user and in the token get access meaning we want to get the access token out of the token data. So if I hover over this, or well, not the token data in this case, but of the token, we want to get the access token. And that's going to be a string. So the same thing is going to happen here. So whenever we call this method, we're going to say, here's the token, but I want the valid, or I want the authorities, or I want the claims or the user or whatever. So hopefully this is making sense. And the last thing that I want to work on is this value here, because I didn't want to confuse you, so I'm doing it last. So what we're going to do is we're going to call the object from Java util and then we're going to call the equal because we need to compare two different strings. In this case, that's going to be the user ID. So we're going to say is the user service that get user by user ID and we need to get the subject that 
apply that uh, well not that we need to give it the token so that's going to give us the user id so this part right here is going to give us the user id which we're giving to the user service to get that user so from the user that we're going to get from calling the user service by giving it this user id we need to get the user id because that's what we need to compare so we need to call get user id so now we have the user id from the database and then we're going to compare it with the ones from the claim so we're going to say claims that apply and then we're going to give it the token and then we need to call get subject because that's what we need the subject in this case is the user id and if you're wondering where that's coming from it's coming from here so the subject is the user id the string okay that's what we're passing in in the token so we're saying go in the database and then fetch this user by that user id and then compare it with the one in the token so that's gonna give us a boolean true or false because we're comparing it and that's what we're passing in for the value we're going to be doing other checks on the token whenever the request comes in and then we have all of our filters so that's going to be like a different type of check that we're going to be doing on the token but for this valid inside of the token data that's the logic that i'm going to implement so i'm going to go ahead and remove all of the space that i have at the bottom i uh, put this space in so i could scroll up but that's everything that we're going to need for this class and i don't think i'm going to need anything else but if we're going to need any other methods and i can just come back here and put it but i'm like thinking right now to see if i'm missing anything and i can't think of anything that i'm missing but we can always come back and then put more methods that we that we think that we will need so just as i was thinking about anything that i'm missing i just realized that we're just going to need another one to log the user out because this is a cookie then we need to send a response to the user or to the client in this case so that we can remove the cookie so here i'm going to define another method and it's going to return void and i'm going to call it remove cookie because we need to remove the cookie from the from the response so i'm going to make it take the http server request which we're going to name request it's going to take the HTTP server response, which we're going to name response. And then it's going to take the cookie name, which is going to be a string. And I'm going to name it cookie name. So we need to have a way to remove the cookie from the response or from the browser. And because it's an HTTP only cookie or it's a cookie in general, the way that we can do this is just setting the max age to zero and then send that same cookie back to the user. So after the last lecture, I just remember that we're going to need to remove the cookie. So let's go back to the implementation and then give an implementation to this method. And it's going to be fairly simple. I'm going to again put some more space that I'm going to delete again, but I need to be able to scroll up so you can see better. So here we're going to say we need to remove the cookie. So let's see if we can find an optional of a cookie first. So we're going to say optional cookie because we don't know if it's going to exist. You always have to be careful whenever you're working with cookie. We're going to say apply and then we're going to give it the request and then the cookie name. So we give it the request, we give it the cookie name. We're going to say get us a cookie. But we know that this extract cookie function, it can also return an optional of empty in case that the cookie doesn't exist or there's no cookie or it's null when we call get cookies on the request because we know that it can return an optional of empty. So here we're going to say if the cookie exists, so optional of cookie that is present. So if we actually have one, then remove it. So we're going to say get the cookie, so cookie, like the actual cookie. So call the actual cookie that get, that's going to give us the cookie. And then we're going to say cookie set max age to zero. So we're going to expire the cookie and then we're going to attach it to the response at cookie and then at the cookie. So this is how you're going to log the user out or remove the cookie from the browser. Because if the cookie is removed from the browser, let's say they logged out for some reason. And then for some reason, they still have the page open or something like that. So if they click again on anything, that's gonna send a request to the backend, then the cookie will not come because the max age of the cookie is zero. So the cookie will not be attached with the request. And because we won't have a cookie in the request, when we have our filter, then the filter will not find the cookie. It will just gonna say, hey, you're not logged in. Might not be making a lot of sense right now, but this is all gonna come into play and you're gonna see how it's all gonna come together very nicely. So I'm gonna remove the space at the bottom again again and i think at this point we have done everything that we needed to do for this particular implementation so really simple stuff here we're not doing any crazy logic or anything like that but this is a very very important class that we had to uh, define as an implementation for the jwt service because we're going to need to generate the token and work with the request and the cookies and stuff like that so it was really important that we spend the time and then create this class or an implementation of this service so now we're all ready to go to continue with the login feature so the login functionality in the entire application because we needed to have this 
implementation of the JWT service because at the end of the successful login, we need to give the user a token. And if we don't have the service, then we cannot generate the token for them. So we're going to go back and continue with the login feature. And that's what we're going to be working on next. So before we continue with the login functionality, I wanted to take a quick look at the documentation of HTTP cookies because cookies are very sensitive, especially if you have an HTTP only cookie that you're setting up in the backend server and you want that cookie to be saved in the client browser. You want the browser to automatically send the cookie with the request that's coming in from that client. So it's really important that you pay attention to the different properties that you're setting on the cookie, because if you don't set the proper values for every single one of these properties, then it's not going to be saved automatically in the browser. And that's what we want to do. So I wanted to show you where you can find the documentation on the Mozilla developer website. So you can go there and then, or you can just Google HTTP cookies. You should see this link uh, somewhere at the top. So you can see it says an HTTP cookie or a web cookie or a browser cookie is a small piece of data that a server sends to a user's web browser. So you got to understand that this is the client. The web browser is the client. The browser may store the cookie and send it back to the same server with later requests. So that's really important because that's how we're going to set up our entire authentication using the filter. So when we set this cookie on the response, and the response made it back to the client's browser, then the browser is going to analyze the cookie, like look at all the different values on the cookie, and then it's going to determine if it's supposed to save the cookie and then send the cookie with all subsequent requests or later requests, as you can see. So we can go here and read up more on cookies. You can see what it's used for. So in our case, we're going to use it for login as a, as some kind of a session management, even though we don't really have a session with a JSON web token as our authentication. But since we're using a cookie, then it's kind of a session management, but not really. But since since we're going to be using the cookie, so we would fall under this category of login. But one more thing that I really want to go over, if I scroll down a little more, I want to go to the same site. So if I scroll down some more, uh, so here's the domain. So they're giving you descriptions and the values that you can assign to each one of these. Let's scroll down some more. So I want the same site attribute. So they call it attribute. So the same site attribute, I'm just going to go over it real quick because it's really important for something that we call cross site request forgery. So it says the same site, which is the attribute that you can set on the cookie, which we did in the in the back end, uh, lets servers specify whether or when cookies are sent with the cross site request. And a little bit later down the line, it says this provide protection against cross site request forgery, and it can take three possible values. So strict, lax, and then none. In our case, we pass none in our configuration in the back end. And with the strict, it tells the browser to send the cookie with requests from the cookies origin site. So that's what the strict mode is going to do or the value of strict for the same site attribute is going to do. And for the lax is similar to the strict, except the browser also sends the cookie when the user navigates to the cookies origin site. But the one we set, which is the none, specifies that cookies are sent on both originating and cross site requests. So this line right here is really important because we know that we're going to be working with two different Different domains. So we're going to have the backend that's going to run on a specific domain. So let's take the example of our local setup so that this can make more sense. So the backend is going to be running on localhost 8080, but the React application is going to be running on localhost 3000. So that's why it's important that we set the none for the value of the same site because we want the browser to send the request between sites or cross site. So it's really important that we set this none value on the cookie. So you can come back here and then read more about cookies if you're not super familiar with cookies cookies uh, or web cookie or HTTP cookies. And it's really something kind of simple. So you're probably going to spend like about two hours, uh, like if you really concentrate just to master cookies and what, what they're all about and what they're used for and some examples. But it's not something that's very complicated or that's like a lot to learn. There's not a lot to learn, but you do have to understand the basic concepts of using cookies and all these different attributes and what they mean and how you're supposed to use them depending on your use case. So I wanted to show you that um, so that you know where to go find that documentation about HTTP cookies. So now we're going to go back and then we're going to continue with the login feature. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and just close everything and we're going to go back to the filter. So let's scroll down a little more and we want to go back to the authentication filter that we were working on and we want to scroll down. Then we want to work here. So whenever this filter gets called, 
it's going to call this method. And then once the authentication is successful, then it's going to call this method. So assuming that the authentication was successful, we know that we can do whatever we need to do with the authentication or with the filter chain or with the request or with the response, because we have access to all these pieces of information inside of this successful authentication. So let me scroll up some more. So the first thing that we're going to do, we're going to get the user. So we're going to say authentication that get principal and then we're going to get the user this way. I need to put an equal sign here. And if I over over this, you can see that it says that this is an object, which is what the get principal return. But we know that this authentication that get principal is going to be our user. And how do we know that? How do we know that this authentication is going to be our user? So if you remember, even though we're going to be reformatting this, whenever we have the authentication, so the full authentication, which we're going to do the work here we don't have it yet but whenever we have a successful authentication and then we're gonna set the authentication here we're gonna pass in our user so this user of type like for example we're gonna say this is gonna be cast to our user so the from the user dto so that's the user that we're gonna pass for the authentication so this principle right here so this first object i mean this might be confusing because we're going to redo this entire logic because we're not going to be using this username password authentication maybe if i show you the if we go to our domain and go to api authentication so we're going to be passing in this user so remember i told you whenever we have a successful authentication we're going to be calling the authenticate you can see that it takes the user and that's what we're going to pass to the api authentication which is this constructor right here so this is going to represent our principle so this, this first argument that we pass like this. Okay. So that's going to be the principle. So that's why we know that we can cast this get principle to the principle. If we scroll down here, I can show you that the get principle on our authentication is returning this user right here. Okay. So if we scroll up, you can see that this user is of type user DTO. And that's what we're returning whenever we call get principle. And the way that it's going to set is what I just showed you when we call the authenticate we're going to pass it in here which is going to happen like this okay we're going to set it because whenever we have a successful authentication this is the constructor that gets called and we know we will give it the user and then set the user on the class so that when we call get principal then it's going to give us our user so that's how we know that it's safe to cast this as a user because we set it we know that's exactly what it's going to be. so after i get a hold of the user i'm going to call the user service and then i'm going to update the login because at this point they're logged in successfully so i need to pass that in so that our update login attempt logic can update the user information so here we're going to say user that get email and then we're going to say login success okay so we know that they have successfully logged into the application so we're going to update their information and if you want a reminder to see what the login update login attempt is doing you can see when we have a login attempt we're going to do this entire logic when we have a success then we're going to set the account non lock to true we need to set the login attempt to zero and then we need to set the last login to the current time and then we need to remove them from the in memory cache and then save the user so we need to do that at this point because we know that they have successfully logged in remember this gets called only when you have successfully logged in so we're going to update their login attempt. well we're updating many different things here but we need to call the same method but pass in the login success so that was the login attempt now it's the login success so let's continue i'm going to scroll down now we need to determine what kind of response that we need to send back to the user because if the user is using mfa then we need to send them a different response. If they're not using MFA, then we need to give them a token and then log them into the system. So I'm going to define an HTTP response, response, and then I'm going to set it equal to user that is MFA. So this is where I'm going to check if the user is using MFA. So if the user is using MFA, I'm going to say send QR code. Oops, QR code. So that's why we're going to send the QR code. And for this, I need the request and the user. Otherwise, so we're going to put a colon. We're going to say send response. So that's why we're going to determine if the user is using the is using MFA or not. And then we're going to determine what kind of response we're going to send to them because we can't send the same response if they're using MFA or if they're not using MFA. So we're checking to see if they're using MFA. We say, OK, we know we get the user which is going to be the user that we're going to load from the database that we're going to pass into the API authentication, as you can see here, which will be our user in the authentication, which we're getting from calling the get principal. And then we're casting it to a user because get principal return an object, as you can see here. 
So we have our user here and then we update their login attempt because now they have successfully logged in. So we need to update their login attempt. And I just went over that. And then the next thing we need to send them a response, which is going to be this response right here. But this response is going to come from either send QR code or send response. So if they're using MFA, which is going to be checking here, then we're going to send the QR code because they're using MFA. If they're not using MFA, then we're going to just send them a normal response, which is going to give them their token and then log them into the system properly. So I'm going to hover over this method and I'm going to say create method. So that's going to be this method right here. And then I'm going to create this other one, create method, and then I'm going to create this one right here. So now what we have to do once we get this response, we're just going to pass it inside of this HTTP response. Okay. Okay, because we need to send that back. We need to say response. So this HTTP serve that response, not the HTTP response that we created. So this is going to be the HTTP response that we're going to create, but we need to pass it inside of the body of this HTTP serve that response as the response to the user. So to do this, we're going to say response that set content type, and then we're going to call application underscore json underscore value because we want this to be json it might not be json so that's why we we have to do this and this is coming from the http so we're going to set the content type of the request to be json and then we're going to set the status so we're going to say response that set status and then we're going to say okay so the http okay that value and we need to import this import static so it's to come from http org spring framework http and then we're going to create a an output stream so i'm going to say i'm just going to call it out and then i'm going to say response that get output stream so that's going to give us the stream then i'm going to create a mapper i'm going to set it equal to a new object mapper and then i'm going to call the mapper i'm going to say write value and then i'm going to pass in the output stream and then pass in our http response so we're writing our http response which is going to be this java object inside of the body of the response because we're grabbing the output stream from the response and then we're writing these values inside of it. and then we need to call this out that flush and that's all we have to do so this is going to write the body so the http response inside of the http servlet response so it's going to look like a normal controller return this value so that's how you do it whenever you're working with the http servlet response you need to get a mapper and then write the values inside of the output stream of the response so now we have to do the most important work which is to work on these two methods and that's what we're going to be working on next so I'm going to go ahead and scroll up and I'm going to go down here. This is going to be fairly simple. So we're going to call this service that add cookie and then we're going to give it the response and then we're going to give it the user and then we're going to give it the token type. So we're going to say token type and we need to create the access token. So that's going to be the access token. And then we need to attach the refresh token. So we're going to say JWT that add cookie. We're going to give it the same thing, response user, and then the token type that refresh. So we're creating these two tokens and then attach them to the response as two cookies. And then after that, we need to return the get response. So get response, which is going to come from our uh, util. And we're going to give it the request. And then we're going to give it a map of user and then we're going to pass in the user and then we're going to give it a message which is going to be login success and then we're going to pass in okay and i'm going to go ahead and import this so it should come from our request util as you can see here so i'm going to select that and then we need to change this to the response because that's what it's returning so the response coming from our domain i'm going to copy this and then change it here as well because remember every single time we're going to return that same response okay this one the time code path status message exception etc so let's go back and close that out i'm going to scroll up a little more and for this one it's going to be fairly simple so we're going to say return get response we're going to give it the request and then give it a map of the user again so we're going to say user and then pass in the user then we need to give it a message so we're going to say please enter qr code and then we're going to pass in OK because the request was successful. So we pass in a 200 OK. Then I'm going to statically import this like that. And then I'm going to remove all of the space at the bottom. So this is going to be our filter for the authentication. So you can see that even though we're kind of doing like a lot of work, I guess you can say. But in the end, it's something that is very simple. If you understand exactly what you're doing, you can see that it's not really complicated at all. We try to log the user in. And if the user logged in successfully, we either send them a message so that they can enter their QR code or we just send them a regular response to saying that they logged in successfully and then we will just 
just navigate the user to the to the home page of the application so the front end is what's going to handle all of these different scenarios so this is everything i think that we're going to be doing for this i'm going to also statically import these so the access token and the refresh token make it look a little nicer then i'm going to scroll up and make sure that i don't have any imports that i'm not using I'm going to delete this one and then I'm also going to delete the map and then collapse. So the other thing that I want to say is you might think that we should be ready to test this, but we're not because we don't have an authentication provider. We need to go back here and then rework on this class so that we can have a proper authentication provider. And we also need to work on our configuration. So the filter chain configuration, we need to finish this configuration as well. So even though we have the authentication filter, we actually can't use it yet. And I'm gonna make this a constant. So I'm gonna say refactor, enter this constant, and then I'm gonna name it login underscore path, and then press enter. And then I'm gonna move this to our constant. So I'm gonna cut it out, go back to our constant, and then just paste it anywhere here. And we need to import it from here, import. So we need to finish up the entire configuration and also work on the authentication provider in order to be able to test this login functionality. So we need to continue working on the security configuration, make sure everything is in place, and then we're going to be able to test this. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So let's go ahead and work on the authentication provider. The first thing that I'm going to do is to just rename it. So I'm going to do refactor rename, and I want to call it API authentication, API authentication authentication provider, press enter. And again, I'm just using API for everything that I'm customizing. In your case, you probably will have a very descriptive name that makes sense to your application. And it's still going to be a bean. And we also need the constructor, but we will not be using the user detail service. We're going to be using our service. So I'm going to get rid of that. And then we're going to call in the user service. And that's going to be the user service. And also we need the bcrypt encoder. So we're going to say private final bcrypt encoder. So right here, here, and then we're going to name it encoder. And this is giving me an error because we don't have this bin defined, but we're going to define it a little bit later. And then I'm pretty much going to clean everything here. So hopefully you guys got a copy of the code before we started making the real changes for the uh, login feature. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to get the API authentication. So we're going to say API authentication, and then we're going to set this equal to, uh, well, I need a way to get that. So I'm going to scroll down and then I'm going to create a private final. Uh, I'm going to take a function here and it's going to take the authentication. So authentication from uh, Spring Boot and it's going to return the API authentication. Make sure this is imported and we're going to call it authentication function. Remember, it's taking the authentication as the first parameter or the only parameter and it's returning the API authentication. The reason we need to do this is because we need to cast this authentication because we know that we're going to have an API authentication and not an authentication. So it's safe to cast this object to an API authentication. So that's what we're defining this function. So it takes the authentication and all it's going to do is just do a casting. So it's going to say API authentication and then we're going to pass in the authentication. So we just cast it. So now I can go up here and then call the authentication function that apply and then I give it the authentication. So that's going to just do the casting for me. You didn't have to do it that way. I'm just making use as much as possible of the fancy Java, I'm going to call it, just so that you can become more familiar with it. But you could just cast it up here. That should be just fine. So once we have a hold of the authentication, so that's going to be the unauthenticated authentication. That's going to contain the username and the password. And then we're going to see if we can get a hold of the user. So we're going to define the user, set that equal to the user. Oops, set that equal to the user service that get user by email. So get user by email and then we're going to pass in the API authentication and then we have get email on that. So that's going to give us the user, the user we're supposed to authenticate that we're going to fetch from our database. And I'm going to see if I can create this method. So get user by email. We're going to be working on it a little bit later, but let's put it here and it's going to return the user. So the user coming from the DTO and then I'm going to remove this space and I'm just going to go here and then just stub it out just so that we don't have this error here. So it's down here and we're going to be working on it in a minute. So let's go back and and now we have a user. So that's going to be of type user DTO, which is the user that we're going to pass in as the logged in user. And then we're going to say if the user is not null, so user is not null. So if the user is not null, then we're going to do something here. And then we're going to say else we're going to throw a new API exception and we're going to say unable 
to log in or authenticate. I don't think it's going to be possible that this is going to be null because if this user is null, it's going to throw an exception when it calls this. But just to be on the safe side, we're still going to do it anyway. And I need to get a hold of the user credential. So we're going to say credential, set that equal to the user service that get user credential by ID. And then we're going to pass in the user that get ID. So we're going to give this method the user ID and it's going to give us the credential. So I'm going to click on this again, create method. So this is going to return the credential entity because that's what we're working with. And we're going to do the same thing again, come up here and then we're going to just put the stub of the method so that we don't have an error in here. Click OK. OK, so it's down here. So we have to work on these two methods. Now let's go back. And so that's going to give us the credential because we need the credential so that we can check for the user password. So we know that if the user is null or if we can't find a user, get user by email, we'll throw an exception like user not found. So that's going to take care of the user. But now we need to check the credential of the user. So using the user ID, we're going to see if we can fetch the credential of the user. That's going to give us the user credential. So once we get the credential, we're going to check to see if the credentials have expired. Like if it's been 90 days since they last updated the credential. So to do this, we're going to say if the user credential that get updated at and then we're going to say minus days and then we're going to say 90 because we know that it's 90 days that the requirement said and then we're going to check to see if it's after now so if it's after now then we know that it's been 90 days so then we're going to say well in this case then we can't do the authentication so we're going to throw another exception I'm going to copy this go here paste it in i'm going to keep it as a one liner and then i'm going to change the message credentials are expired please reset your password so if the credentials are expired like it's been 90 days since they last updated it so we get the updated that and we remove 90 days from it and we check to see if it's after now then we know that it's been over 90 days since they last updated it then we're gonna throw this exception otherwise what we're going to do is we're gonna try to see if we can check the user password so to do this I'm gonna get a user principal so principal that's going to equal the new user principal which we don't have yet but we're going to create it principal and you can see that these suggestions they're coming from packages that we didn't define so we're not going to use them and then we're going to give it the user and then the user credential and we're going to be working on this soon enough and i'm going to copy this name we're going to go to our domain we're just going to define everything so that we don't have any errors and then we're going to come back and then implement so inside of the domain i'm going to create a new class i'm going to call it user principal really important is we need to implement the user details and if we go in here remember this is the only interface that we can pass in to the authentication so we need to have some kind of a representation of this user details so similar to the user detail service we're just kind of like creating our own wrapper around it so here we're going to say implement methods and then i'm going to click ok and we're going to come back and work on this but we're going to leave it like this for now and then come back here and then see if we can import this import so that's coming from our domain and it's giving us an error because we don't have any constructor for this so let's quickly fix this while we're here so i'm going to say at required arcs constructor and then remember we need to give it a user so we're going to say private final a user so coming from our domain that's going to be the user and then we need to give it another private final credential entity we're going to give it the same name credential entity so this is going to be our constructor we're going to put a space here then come back you can see now we don't have this error anymore so now that we have the user principal then we need to check for if the account is expired so if i scroll down here so we need to check to see if the account is enabled if the credentials are non-expired if the account is locked etc so we're going to have to check for these right here so if any of this is true then we have to throw an exception saying that the account is currently disabled or the account is currently locked or something like that so to do this again i'm gonna i'm gonna actually move this below at the bottom here and then i'm gonna create another uh, method here so i'm gonna say private final and this is gonna be a consumer because it's not gonna return anything and it's gonna take the user principal so the one that we just created and we're gonna say valid account because this is going to check to see if the account is valid and it's going to take the user principal. And what do we want to do? We just want to check to see if the user uh, account is not locked or if it's enabled, if the credentials are expired or if the account is not expired. And then if any of them is true, then we're going to throw an exception because we cannot, you know, successfully authenticate a user if their account is disabled or locked or credentials expired. So I'm going to scroll up a little more. And in here, we're just going to have a bunch of if statements. So we're going to say if the 
user principal that is account non lock and then we're going to say if that's the case then we're going to throw an exception so here we're going to say throw a new lock exception because the account is locked so we're going to say lock exception coming from spring framework and then we're going to say your account is currently locked like that semicolon and then close the curly brace and remove that one and then i'm going to do control d like three times and we need to check for the is enabled and then we're going to say your account is currently disabled and then we need to check for is credential expired then we're going to say your password has expired and then we're going to delete and then we're going to say please update your password again these can be whatever message you want but in my case that's just the message that i'm going to put and then for the last one we need to check to see if the account is not expired so we're going to say is account not expired and then we're going to say it's going to be similar to this so i'm going to copy everything here then i'm going to paste it in here we're going to say your account has expired uh and then you can say whatever you want like please let's say like contact administrator okay and again, make sure you change these messages so that they can make sense in your application. And then now we have to change the exception that we're throwing. You can see here, we're only throwing the lack exception. So that's not supposed to be like this. So the first one is the lack exception, but this one is going to be the disable exception. So we're going to say disable exception coming from Spring Security. Next one is going to be the credential credential expired exception and for the last one i'm also going to use the disable so we're going to say disable or you can pass in the api exception should work just fine but just so that we keep everything in par with each other then we're just using the actual exception so lack exception disable exception and the credential expired exception so that's all we have to do here so we're just checking to make sure that the user is uh, actually their account is valid so now we're going to go up so once we get the user principal, then we can pass that to the valid account. So we're going to say valid account that, and then we're going to say accept, and then we're going to give it the user principal. So that's just going to take care to do that for us. So if all of this passes, then we're going to check to see if the password is correct. So here we're going to call the encoder that matches because we're going to compare the raw password with the encoded password, as you can see here. So we're going to pass in the raw password, which is coming from the API authentication that get password. So the password that the user gives us at login, like the one they tapped in as they are logging in. And then we're going to compare it to the user credentials that get password, which is encoded that we saved in the database. So if these two are the same, then we're going to see that's a successful authentication. So we're going to say return uh, API uh, authentication that authenticated. And then we're going to give it the user and then the principal. So we're going to say principal that get authorities okay if you wanted to you could just get the authorities from the user and then do a loop or something like that but we have this user principle that's very convenient so we're just going to use it so if this is not true then we're going to do an else statement so here we're going to say if the password don't match then we're going to throw an exception here and this is going to be the bad credential exception and then we're going to change the message and we're going to make it say something like email slash and or password incorrect please try again something like that and actually we don't need this else so i'm gonna delete it okay so then it looks more like this and i'm gonna scroll to the left so you can see better so if the user is not null then we're gonna go inside of this if statement we're gonna do all of these checks if all of these checks pass then we're gonna try to match the password and if the password match then they're authenticated successfully and that's why we pass in the user as the principal and then we're passing in all of our authorities which we're catching in the successful login we're gonna get this user as the principal and i'm gonna do a static import for this to connect this all together so if you go in here remember we're passing in this user here which gets passed to this constructor which gets set to this user so that whenever we call uh, get principal we return that user which is the user that we're receiving in the authentication filter so here this user right here. that's why we're able to cast it okay so that's the connection that i was trying to make earlier when we were working on on this part 
So hopefully this is making sense and it's coming together for you, but that's what we're doing. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and then remove all the space that I put at the bottom so I could scroll up. And if you want to put these on multiple lines, feel free to do that. I'm just not going to do it. I like them to be a little bit like this. And then I'm going to put a space right here and then scroll all the way to the top. So now we have a number of things that we have to work on, like all these things that we just kind of like quickly defined. So we need to work on those and make sure that we give an implementation for them. And I'm going to aesthetically import this one as well. All right. So let me scroll up and clean the imports a little. So remove this and also remove the local date time. So we need to work on these uh, methods that we just defined in this class as well. So the get user credential by ID and also the get user by email and the user principal. And we also have to define a bean for the BigQuery Brim coder because you can see that it's giving us an error because it couldn't find a bean for it. So that's what we're going to be working on next. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this 90 into a constant. So I'm going to right click it and then refactor. Oops, right click refactor into this constant. And then I'm going to say 90 days like that. And then I'm going to move it to our constant. So I'm going to cut it off here, go to our constant class and then just paste it anywhere here and then import it here. And if you want to define this as a property in your properties file, you can use the add value annotation so that you can read it here and then you can pass it in here. But I don't care to do that. I'm just going to pass it in as a hard coded value from our constant. But it's definitely something that you might want to do because, you know, this might change and you might not want to uh, change the application itself, but you just update the properties file. So 90 days. And it's also better for readability. So I can clearly see that this is 90 days and it's not a number or anything. And I can over over it and it can tell me that it's just a number nine. So let's go to the user service implementation and then we're going to give an implementation to these methods. So you can see they're all returning nulls. So we need to fix that. So I'm going to change this to be the user ID because that's what that is. I'm going to scroll up a little more. We're going to call the credential entity. So we're going to say credential repository, not the credential entity, the credential repository. And then we're going to call get credential by user entity ID. And then we're going to pass in the user ID. So that's going to return an optional. So I'm going to say var and then create a credential by user ID. And I'm just going to change that to a simple variable like that. And I'm going to rename it credential by ID. This name is too long. So we have the credential, which is an optional. And then we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say return this credential or else we're going to throw an exception and here we're going to say a new API exception so a new API exception and then we're going to say unable to find user credentials or credential so this one is pretty straightforward we're going to try to find the credential by passing in the user id and if we can't find it we will throw this exception if we find it we'll just return it and for this one we're going to say get user by email so this one right here and notice that this is returning the user entity but we want the user so we're going to call that and then give it the email so that's going to give us the user entity so i'm going to define a variable for that and i'm just going to name it user entity like that and then we need to map it to a, a, an actual user so i'm going to create another method from user entity and then i'm going to give it the user entity and then i'm going to give it the user entity that get role so that's going to give us the role entity that you can see here. And I'm going to call get credential by ID and then give it the user entity that get ID. So this method is going to take the user entity. It's going to also take the role entity and it's also going to take the credential entity. And it's going to return this user. So we need to do a mapping so that we can populate all of these values. So that's what we're going to be working on this. So let's go back here. I'm going to copy this method or I'm going to just hover over it and then create method. And then I'm going to cut it off here. And then I want to go to our user util. So let's scroll down util user util and we want to just go down here. I'm going to collapse this so that we can have more space. And then I'm going to say define this guy, which is going to be public. Okay. So in here, I'm going to scroll up and I'm going to define a user. I'm going to say user equals a new user like that. I'm going to put more space so I can scroll up some more like that so that you can, can see the top. So we create a simple user by calling the constructor and then I'm going to call bin util. So it's to come from Spring Framework bins. And then I'm going to call copy properties. It's going to pass in the user entity and then pass in the user. So all the properties that it can see have the same name. It's going to call their getters and setters and then swap them or not. Well, maybe not swap them, but it's going to copy them over to this simple user. OK, so it's going to copy from the user entity and then put them in here. Everything that has the same name, all the fields that have the same name. And then after that, we're going to have to set the last login. We're going to call the user entity that get last login. 
and then we're going to pass it as a string. So that's going to be that. And then we need to set the credential. So we're going to say user that set credential not expired. So for this, we need to do a number of things. So I'm going to call is credential non expired, which is going to be a method that I'm going to create. And then we're going to give it the credential entity. Oops, like that uh, user credential. So I'm going to copy that not credential entity user credential. Well, uh, I'm just going to call it credential entity like that. Make it make more sense. And then we're going to pass it here. OK, like that. Oops. And let's just put the stub of this method like that. And we need to pass in the created at. So we're going to say user that set created. Oops, that set created at, which is a string. So user entity that get created at that to string. We're going to do the same with the updated at. So user that set updated at user entity get updated at to string. Then we're going to set the role user that set role, which is a string. So we're going to say role entity. So role that get name. And then we need to pass in the authorities. So we're going to say role or user that set authorities which takes a string. So we're going to call the role get authorities like that. And then we're going to say get value, which is going to give us a string. And I think that's everything. And then we're going to return the user like that. And then I'm going to scroll down. I'm actually going to make this public because I need to use it outside of this class. So we're going to say public and we want it to be static and it's going to return a Boolean is credential non expired credentials maybe so credentials like that. And this is going to be pretty simple. So it's going to return credential entity that get updated at. So we're going to get the updated at and then we're going to do the same thing. And then we're going to say plus days and then we're going to pass in our 90 days. So 90 underscore days. So if it's been 90 days, that is after right now. So that's going to be our Boolean. And then we need to import this like that. So this is going to check to make sure that the last time the credentials have been updated, it hasn't, it hasn't been 90 days since then. And then I'm going to go back and import this statically. More options. I'm going to try to delete the Y and put it again. Nope. So I'm going to type in user utils that. Well, I guess this is not accessible. So public user from user entity. So it should be. And, and I think we just have to static like that. Okay. So that should do it. Then we can statically import import. There we go. So by the time this method returns this user, which we're using in the authentication, we will have everything set on this particular user because we're doing all of this logic with the credential and we'll have access to everything else that we set on the user. And also everything that you see that I'm setting here is things that I know will not be copied when we call the copy properties on the bin util. And one last thing I want to mention is people are going to tell me, oh, there's a library that you can use to do this like you didn't have to do this like this well i wanted to do it this way i didn't want to introduce another library just to do this part but there's like tons of library that you can use to do the mapping from one object to another i'm just not using it so feel free to use any library that you prefer to just do the mapping for you but i'm not going to use any library so let's go back to the user service implementation and scroll up a little bit now we have to work on the get user by id or get user by user id and we're going to do the same thing so here we're going to say we're going to have a user user NTT, which is going to equal to the user repository that get you or find user by ID or find by ID. And then we're going to give it the user ID and then we're going to say that or else throw. And I'm just going to copy this, copy all that, paste it in here, semicolon. And then we're going to change the message to be something else. User not found because we didn't find the user. Otherwise, we're going to return the same thing. So I'm going to copy this paste it here. So we're going to return from user entity, pass in the user entity, the role from that user entity, and then get the credential of the user and then give it to the from user entity as well. So that's what we have to do for these three methods. So we have them all in here. Next thing we have to work on is the user principle. As you can see here, we just kind of like stubbed it out, but we have to put an implementation for all of these. And it's going to be pretty simple because all of the information that we need to determine the password username in all of these Booleans, they already exist inside of this user. So whenever we pass this user to the user principle, the user will have all of these values defined as its value and its field because all of this work happened when we call get user by email. So if we go there and then we go to the implementation. So when we do this and then we call from here so you can see everything is set here. So by the time that we have to use this user inside of this class, then everything is already set up and we just have to call the getters and then pass them to these. So that's what we're going to be working on next.
So let's quickly work on this uh, class. So for the authorities, we're going to use the same helper method again, or the same utility that we use. So the uh, authority utils, and then we're going to call the comma separated string to authority list. And then we're going to call the user that get authorities. So that's going to just give us the authorities. And then I'm going to scroll down. And for the password, we're just going to call the credential entity that get password. So that's pretty simple for the username. We know in our case, we're using the email. So we're going to call the get email. So whatever you're using as the end quotes username, that's what you would return here. And then I'm going to scroll down and we're just going to say that's going to be the user that is account non expired. We're going to do the same for is account non lock and then credential expired. You know where this is coming from. So we're going to say user is credential non expired because we know at this point we have already done this logic to determine if the credential is expired or not. And we set it on this user. Remember, this user is the user that we're passing in to the principle, which happens here. Okay. This user right here that we call from get user by email. And lastly, we're going to do user that is enabled. Okay. Very simple. Remove that last line. And that's everything that we need. I don't know if I'm going to need to access any of these, like at some point in the application, but just in case I'm going to put a getter on the user so that I can have a getter for the user in case I want to get the user from this user principle. I don't think I will, but we can do cleanup later. So that's what we have to do for the user principle. And the last thing that I want to fix is this encoder. So you can see this is giving us an error because we don't have a bean for this. So let's go back to the security package like in here. And I'm going to create another class. I'm going to call it security config. Press enter. So that's going to be like a configuration class. So we're going to annotate it with add configuration so that it can be a bean and this is misspelled. So I'm going to refactor rename and then we're going to say security, security config. And we just need to define the bcrypt encoder bean. So I'm going to copy this name, go back to the security config. And then in here, I'm going to say I need a bean and it's going to be public of this type. And then we're going to call it password encoder. It's not going to take any parameters and we're just going to return an instance of it. So we're going to say turn a new bakery password encoder. One thing we can do, we can give it a strength. I like to do it 12 for the strength and I'm just going to turn this into a constant as well. So refactor into this constant and then we're just going to name it strength. Press enter and I'm going to remove that space. Okay. So that's all we have to do for this and collapse these imports. And I'm going to make this private because I'm not using it outside of this class. You can also move this to the constant. Actually, let's just do that. So I'm going to put it back to a public and then we're going to go to our constant and just paste it anywhere here and then import it, import static and then remove this space. So this is a little bit cleaner. So this is our password encoder. Now, if we go back to the API authentication provider, then you can see that this error is gone. So we have another error here. As you can see, it says one related problem. And if I click on that, it's taking me to the filter chain configuration for this API authentication and we're passing it in a user detail service because we're going to change all of this. So that's why it's giving us this error. But the API authentication provider itself is completed. Okay, so we're done with this. We're not going to be writing any more code in here, but we're not using it yet though. Or we're not using it properly yet because you can see this is giving us an error, which means that we still can test the application even though we have the authentication provider. There's a few more pieces that we have to create and then put them all together before we can test this log in so that we can see all of this in action. And now I just remembered that we need to change this support. So we need to change this username password authentication token to our class, which we know that is the API authentication. So I'm going to copy that and then paste it here. Okay. That's the authentication that we're supporting the API authentication, which is this one that we created. Okay. So uh, I was working on this and I totally forgot to update that. Make sure you update this to the authentication or the API authentication. Otherwise this would not be used as an authentication because it wouldn't support the username password authentication token. So your entire flow, even after we put everything together would not work because the authentication manager would not call this authentication provider because it doesn't support the API authentication, which is the authentication that we're going to be passing in and the login. So make sure you update this and I'm going to scroll up and remove the import that I'm not using. Delete that. 
Okay, so I think right now we should be good to go. I don't see anything that I'm missing, but again, if it breaks whenever we run it, then we'll come back here and then fix uh, whatever problem that we see. So I think that's everything that we have to do for now. One last piece that we have to work on, which is really important, is something called the authorization filter. So this is the filter that's going to intercept every request so that it can determine which route that the user is trying to access and if the user has access to this route, meaning if the user is authenticated or if they're not authenticated. So this is going to be like a really important filter that we're going to need to add in the application. That's going to be the authorization filter. And again, you're going to see how it's all going to come together. So this provider, the user principal, everything that we've been doing so far, you're going to see how it's going to all come together and we're going to have such a nice flow. So it's all going to come together. So we need to work on the authorization filter and that's what we're going to be working on next. So I know we are supposed to be working on the filter, but before we do that, there's one thing that I want to talk about, which is testing. So so far, you see that I've been writing a lot of code and I haven't been testing any of the code that I'm putting in. This course is not about testing because testing is like a separate topic. And I'm going to have courses about testing, just testing the application. So we're going to have like a simple microservice and then we're going to be writing, you know, unit tests, integration tests and stuff like that. But I've had a lot of people asking me, how do we test all of this code? Because if you're trying to get a job, you can't just write the code and then deploy it because you have to write tests, especially unit tests. And to a minimum, you have to write unit tests for your code or your logic or whatever the case might be. So before we go into the filter and then continue with the login feature so that we can finish it up, I want to show you how we can test uh, maybe like something in the service or something like that because it's really easy, but you have to understand the concept. And again, I'm not going to go over like all the basics of testing because testing is a big topic, but I'll show you an example and maybe you can take it further. Also, another thing that I'm noticing, you see line, uh, let's say line 45 here. So we are already doing this check when we call get user by email. So we could just use the same logic that we have when we call this method and then just use whatever the result is on this user. And I'm just looking at this and I'm like, oh, this is a, a good refactoring that we can do here. So I can do control D and then I'm going to put this in comments and you can just select everything in this if statement and then call the user that is credential expired. So we can just use this right here. So if this is true, then we're going to throw this exception because we're already doing it. If you look here, when we call from user entity, we're already doing the same thing here. Okay, so we don't have to do it in the authentication again. So a small refactoring that just uh, stood out to me and I was like, okay, I'll just fix it right now. But in any case, I'm gonna kind of like close everything here and then let's go back to, let's grab something from the service. So let's go to the service. So here is the service. Let's go to the implementation. No, not this one. So user service implementation. So let's say, let me scroll up a little bit. Let me see what I have because I don't want to take something that's going to make me spend a lot of time, but I do want to show you how to test. So let's scroll down. Maybe we can do, uh, let, let's do this one. Okay. I mean, this is not super complicated. It just have different if statements that we have to make sure we all test, but we can test this get user by uh, user ID where we pass in the string as a user. ID. And this is going to be like unit tests, which is like the basic type of test that you have to write with your code. So we're not going to be writing any integration tests or end to end tests. And these are like the three main types of tests that you have to write. But if this was going to be like a, an application at some company or something like that, then you have to write unit tests and an integration test and then end to end test, at least these three to a minimum. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and we're going to go to the test package. So this package that we never actually touch. So let me collapse this main. So inside of this package, so the test folder, we're going to create another folder. So in here, what you would do, you would come here and then you would say uh, integration like that. So that would be your integration test. And then you're going to do another one for repository and testing repositories is a little bit different uh, because the way that I think you can see is the standard as of right now is to use like a container to represent your database because you want to mimic the database as much as possible. So it, it requires a little bit of a setup, but we're not going to do any repository tests right now. And we would also do like resource. So all of the folders or all the packages that we have inside of the main, we would try to like recreate them inside of the test folder so that we can have kind of the same structure and then we would write all of our code. But the one that we're actually going to be working on is the service. So we're going to say service and then press enter. And then in the service folder or package, I'm going to create another class. And I'm going to say service, well, user service test. So you would name it like that and then press enter. So the first thing that you would do is to use this annotation. So you're going to say extend with, so coming from JUnit. And then we want to say Makito extension that class. Okay. 
So we have to do that. And then what do we have in the implementation? So we know that, um, let's scroll up. So we're gonna need all of these dependencies and we need to mark them because we don't wanna actually create instances of these dependencies. We can just mark them out. But we have to scroll down to see which ones are being used. So let's say we're gonna test this method and we see in this method only the user repository is being used to fetch the user, but also we are using the credential repository because when we call the get credentials by ID, then we call the credential repository. As you can see, this method is here and you can see the credential repository. So at least we know that we're gonna need these two dependencies inside of our test. So the way that you do this, and again, I'm not going into um, all of the details to explain exactly uh, why we're doing this, but let us let me just go ahead and show you. So we can kind of understand what this is doing. So we're extending this class and then we need to mark the repository service. So we're gonna use this annotation called mark, okay, from Makito. And then we're gonna say private, that's gonna be the user repository. And then we're gonna name it user repository because we know that we're gonna need this, but we don't want the actual user repository. So we're creating a mock of it, like a fake user repository. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the credential repository. So I'm gonna say credential repository, and then I'm gonna give it the same name. So now that we have these two dependencies that we know we're gonna need to test that one particular method, then we're gonna get an instance of the user service implementation. To do this, we're gonna say at inject mock. Okay, and I'm gonna explain what these are, are doing in a minute. So here we're gonna say user service implementation. So you want the implementation, and then we're gonna call user service IMPL. We're gonna give it the same name. So what this is doing is with these max annotation, we're creating a mark for these two. So we're creating fake instances of these two services or dependencies, and then we're gonna inject them inside of the user service implementation. So when you use the mark and then you mark stuff like that, and then you use inject mark, Markita is gonna do all the work for you, create the fake instances of this two services, and then inject them inside of this actual instance that you're gonna use to actually make your call or to call the method that you wanna test, okay? So that's what this is doing. Another way to do this is to use a uh, at before annotations, which is gonna run before every single test. And then you can do setup like this. So we would just do all of the setup and then pass all of these dependencies to this class right. But you can do that with the same annotations. And again, this is not a testing course because there is a lot more to say about all of this, but I do want to show you how we would test a simple method. So now we're gonna write our test. So we're gonna say at test. So that's gonna come from JUnit. Then I'm gonna scroll up a little more and we can also give this a display name. So I'm gonna say display name name. So this one right here from Jupyter. And then we're going to say test find user by ID. So here you can just give a descriptive name, something that's going to allow you to recognize the test uh, very easily. And then after that, we're going to say public and then void and then get user by ID tests. There's different naming convention for these, but I'm just going to go with just adding tests at the end of the name of the method. So if we go back here, you see this is get user by uh, user ID. Well, I'm just gonna change it then. So get user by user ID test. Okay, so the same name, just test at the very end. And then we're gonna work on the body of the test. So in testing, there is like some basic things that you have to understand, which is why I said that I'm gonna have a separate course for testing, but there is a range. Well, I'm gonna put it in a comment. So we're gonna say a range, which is where you arrange what you wanna test. You can also give it another name, which is given, like given that this condition is present or something like that. I'm gonna put a dash just to make it easier to understand. So you can undo arrange, like you're gonna arrange stuff that you need to run your test. And then we have act. So this is when you actually make the call to, um, to the actual method that you wanna call. And this is gonna be when. And then lastly, we're gonna have the then, which is gonna be what's gonna happen or what you should expect well, this is supposed to be assert. That's when you check for whatever you're supposed to uh, check for or whatever you're expecting. So we're gonna have given when then or arrange act and then assert. So these are the three things that you usually have to do. Sometimes you don't have to do all of them. Like sometimes you don't have to arrange. Like if we were using the setup with the at before annotation, which would run before every test, then we could do the arrange there. So we have to do these three things. So let's go back to the method and we know what the method is doing is just calling the repository and then passing the user ID, which returns an optional. 
and then we're gonna see if we can find the user or not and then if we find the user we're gonna map it to this form or to this user which is the user that we define so instead of returning the user entity we're gonna return this user and we're also passing in the credential so we know that it's a simple thing that we have to do so i'm gonna go back here and then for the arrange or given i'm gonna define a user so i'm gonna say user entity set it equal to a new user entity so we're not gonna give it anything yet and we're gonna set some stuff on it. So user entity that set first name, for example. And then I'm gonna say junior. And we can do user entity that set maybe ID. And we're gonna say one. Okay, just some number, just so that we have something to work with. And then I'm gonna do a credential. So I'm gonna say var credential entity. Set that equal to a new credential entity. And then we're going to set some stuff in it. So I'm going to say credential entity that set password, for example. And then I'm going to say password. We just imagine that this is the, the credential of the user that we fetch from the database. We're just arranging or setting things up so that we can test. And on the credential, we will need the user entity. So set user entity. Oops. And we're going to pass in the user entity. So what I usually do, I would set the things that I know that I will need. And then once the test fails, it will tell me what is uh, missing. And then I would add them in there as well. So I think we also gonna need a role entity. So I'm gonna define, I'm gonna put a space. So I'm gonna say role entity, set this equal to a new role entity. And then we can pass in user for the name of the role. And then we can pass in the role user. So we're gonna say authority that user. Okay, so this is the role. And then we can set that role on the user. So we're gonna say user entity that set role and we can pass in the role. I think that if we don't have the role, it's gonna give us an error, but we don't know yet. So this is still in the range because we need to set things up before we can actually make the call. So now what I want to say, since I'm using Mac for these services, so whenever I call these services and at any point in the test, I want to tell it what to return because these are not real instances of these dependencies or these repositories. These are fake ones. So because I'm using fake ones, I need to tell the test what's supposed to happen whenever there is a method that is called on these fake instances because they're not real. This is kind of like a very plain English way of explaining this because I want you to understand it. So what we're going to say, we're going to say when and then we pass in the user repository that find by user ID, which is going to take the string. So we can pass in any string here. I'm going to pass in one. So we're going to say whenever this is called with the value one, then return. So we're going to say then return. Remember, this is returning an optional. So we're going to say optional of the user. So we're going to say of and then pass in the user entity like that. Because we know that this method is going to be called like if we go back here. So we know whenever we're testing this, it's going to call find user by user ID. And this is being called on the repository. So what that means is that this is going to be called. But we don't have a real instance of the user repository. We have a fake of it, which is this mark right here. It's a mark. So we need to tell the framework what's supposed to happen whenever this is called because it won't know what to return. It'll give us an error because it's not a real user repository. It's a fake one. So we're saying whenever the repository is being called and this method is called with this value, then return this optional that we just defined, like this fake one or this example that we're setting here. Return it instead. And then we can try to import this end. It's supposed to come from Makito. So we're going to say whenever this is call, return this fake user that we're defining here. And we know that get credential is also going to be call. So we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say when we call the credential repository that get credential by user uh, entity ID. And then here we're going to pass in one because we define the user ID to be one. We suppose it's going to be this user because that's the one that we're returning. Then we're going to say the same thing. So we're going to say then return. And this also returns an optional. So we're going to say optional of and then we're going to give it the credential entity. So credential entity. So the pattern is very simple, really. So you just put all of your dependencies as mock. You don't have to do it that way. You can do it with just simple Java object. But given that this is going to be a big project, then you definitely need to mock all of your dependencies or as much as you can. So we know that we're going to depend on these two because they're being called, as you can see here and here, when we're calling this method, which is the one that we ultimately want to test. So we need to tell the framework or the testing framework what's supposed to happen when this is called and when this is called. So then we're saying whenever find user by user ID is called with the value one as a string, then we turn this fake user that we just defined. And whenever we call get credentials by user entity, then we turn this fake entity that we just defined. So this is all of the range. All of this is still the range. Now we're going to act. 
Whenever you're going to act, that's when you're going to use your actual inject mark. So the instance of the service that you're going to actually call to test the method. So I'm going to scroll down and then we're going to act. So we're going to say in the act, we're going to call this method and then say get user by user ID, which is the third one right here. And then we're going to pass in the same parameter, which is the one, because that's what we're saying. We say when it's called with one, the value of one. So we have to keep the same one. Otherwise, we're making a different call. It's not going to say, hey, I know I'm supposed to return this fake user because I'm being called with one. So we have to pass in the same value. And then I'm going to set this to a variable user by user ID. That's just fine with me. So that's our user. So this is the act. And then we're going to assert. The assert is what am I expecting? Like what is supposed to be true from this situation, all of this situation. So I know in this situation, I have to assert that. So we're going to say assert that. So I guess we don't have a cert for J. So there's many different ways that you can assert. You can assert with just J unit, but there's like an assert for J library that is like really good for your assertion. So I'm just going to introduce you to it as well. So I'm going to open up the POM file because I need to add another dependency. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to copy this test dependency, then paste it down. And I want the org assert J like that. And then it's going to be assert j core. Okay, so it said j core. The scope is going to be test. And I'm going to give it a version. And I think when I checked it is three, or I can do control space. And you can see it's 3242. So that's the latest. And I'm going to right click, go to Maven, and then reload so that we can install this dependency. And then go back to our test. And I'm going to do assert that I'm just going to type it out and see if it's going to give me a suggestion to import it. So what do I want to test? So what do I want to see here? What do I want to check for? So I can say that the user by user ID. So the user that we get when we call this is supposed to be this user because that's what we said here. So we're going to say, well, in this case, we know that get first name is supposed to equal the first name that we define. So I'm going to say that equal or is equal. I think it is. And then we're going to say user entity that get first name because they're supposed to be equal. So the user that we have defined here is supposed to be equal to the user that we get whenever we make the call because we said that whenever this is called, we're returning this fake user. So this user should be the same because we're calling it with the same parameter, which is the one here. So we're saying in the assert, we're expecting the first name of this user that we fetch to equal to this user that would define here. And let's see if we can import this more action. And I'm missing a T here, so I'm going to put that. So, okay, this is going to help me now. There we go. So it's supposed to come from this library that we just install, assert J. And I'm getting an error here, and I think it's equal to. Okay, so we're expecting this first name that we get whenever we call the actual function or a method to equal to the fake one that would define up here. So let's go ahead and click on this green button just so that we can run this test. Usually when you write test, it's going to fail the first time. So you can see it's failing and that's because we have a compilation error. So I'm going to comment this out Then pass null in here. Uh, it's not taking null and I'm just going to control D and then return null like that. It might give us an error. I'm not sure, but let's go ahead and try it again. So I'm going to go here, run the test. Okay. It fails again. So let's see why. Okay. So it's saying that it cannot invoke local dig time to string because there is no such thing because it's null. Okay. So it's trying to call the get last login on the user entity and this is returning null. Okay. So we need to pass in the last login and update it and, and created that to these entities because obviously it's failing for that. So in the user, so we're going to say user entity that set created at, and then we can pass in a local date time. Uh, we can pass local date time of so that we can pass in a date. So I'm going to say uh, 1990, November 1st, 1. 11, uh, 11 minute. It doesn't matter. We can pass in anything. And then I'm going to duplicate this. So control D two times. And uh, I'm just going to keep the same date because it doesn't really matter. And then here I'm going to say set updated by or updated at. And then here I'm going to say set last login because we know that it's failing for these. And also I'm thinking we're going to have the same problem with the credential because we check to see when the credential was last updated. So in the credential, so I'm going to say credential entity that set updated at, and I'm going to pass in the same time, copy that and then paste it in here. Okay. So hopefully this fixed the problem. So let's run this again. And you can see the test is passing. This is giving us a warning, but this is coming from the, from Java. So that's not coming from our test, but you can see on the left here, 
test find user by ID, which is the display name that with the find up here is passing. You can see the green check mark. So this is how you would write your test. And you can see this is a little bit messy, but you would probably externalize like you would create a specific method to maybe do all of this or to give you a credential or to give you a user entity. Like you wouldn't have a messy test like this, but that's technically how you would write your unit test so that you can test your application. So I'm going to go ahead and run the entire class because sometimes when you run the test, it works just fine. But then when you run the class, then it gives you like maybe a different error. So let's make sure that we're good. So I'm going to run the entire class and all it's going to do is to just run this one test. And you can see that it's still passing. So we know that we're good. And we can also check for some other stuff. So right now we're just checking to make sure the usernames are the same. But we can do the same thing for the credential. So we can say assert that the user entity, so the same one, and then we're going to say maybe get um, user ID. And then we know that this is supposed to be equal to one. So we're going to say is equal to, and this is supposed to be one. So we know that is also supposed to be true. So I'm going to click on this green button, we run the test, and you can see now it doesn't give me the check mark. And you see it's saying it's expecting one, but it was null. So if I scroll up here, you see that we didn't define the user ID. So if we go here and then we say user entity that set user ID, and then we set it to one. I just want to make sure that I'm showing you the logic, how it works. So I'm giving you some errors and then show you how we can fix them because we're looking for the user ID. And we know that whenever we call get user ID, it's going to return this fake user that we just defined because we told it to do that. As you can see, we told it to return it whenever it's called with one. So now if we test it, this should equal because we set the user ID as one on the fake user that we told it to return. Okay. So now if we run it again, you can see it's passed. And another thing you can do, you can run this with coverage just so that you can see what piece of code is being covered. So if I right click here and then I run with coverage. So run test with coverage. So this is going to give me a little report. So you can see it gives me this report and it tells me that in the implementation, so this entire package, only 20% of it is covered for the class. 12% of the method is covered. So four out of 33. And it also told me only six lines is covered. And if I click on the user service implementation, you can see this little green bar on the left, which means this is what is covered. So if I close this off and then minimize this, well, if I close it off, the report will be gone. So let me run it again. So run with coverage. So I'm going to keep this here. If I close it, what I want to show you will be gone. So you can see this little, I'm going to collapse this one. So you can see all of these ones are red, which means they were not covered. But you can see here, this is green, which means this method was covered. And also the get credential by ID was covered because it's green on the left. And you can see everything else was not covered. And we're at 20% for this entire package. So another thing to know is every team and every company, they're going to have a certain threshold that you have to meet. And a lot of them is going to have 100% or 95%. It's going to be like a very high percentage because they want to have unit tests at least for every single method in their application. But this is how you would do that. So this is how you would test at least write unit tests for your code. And again, the reason that I wanted to do this, even though this is not a, a unit test course or anything like that, is because I know it's important for you to test your application. And if you're definitely looking for a job, you're trying to learn this so you can get a job, then you cannot write code for a company and not write tests to go with it. And that means unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests, at least to a minimum you have to write these three types of tests. And Spring Boot has very good support for writing tests. So I would encourage everyone to, you know, start writing some tests and make sure that your code is tested because you can't really write code and not test it and just run the application and use Postman. You actually need to run actual tests like what I just showed you right here. So just to test this one method, this is what we would do. And we would also clean this up by just creating, you know, private method to do some of this work for us so that we don't have to have such a bloated uh, method just to test a simple get user by ID. So that's what I wanted to show you. Now we have an example for a test, at least for unit tests, you should be able to write the rest of it. I'm assuming, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not going to be super hard. It's not going to be too easy because it's going to break a lot, but it's not going to be too hard either. Hopefully this gives you like a foundation on how you would do it. And at least you should be able to finish testing all of these different methods that we have in the user service implementation, because really it's only a matter of what is needed in the arrange or given before you call the actual method and make sure you give your when and then return statements because whatever is going to be called whenever you call the actual method that you're testing you need to tell the mark what to return so that's what we're doing here so hopefully you guys are good and if you're on the right test you have a, a starting point you can start with this class and i would try to just finish up all the methods that we have in there 
because ultimately you would have to create a mark for almost everything that we have here as dependency. So that's going to be like very good practice for you. But just remember given or arrange when or act and then assert or then. Okay, so given when then or arrange, act, and then assert. So now that you know how to test, I'm gonna close everything, and then we're gonna continue with the filter so that we can finish up the login feature. So that's what we're gonna be working on next.